escape from reality. As the years go by, more and more kids are getting their first taste of gaming on a handheld device. A phone or a Game Boy or a tablet. Being born in the mid 90s when there was barely any phone games to play, we were solidly in the Game Boy Color era, with the Game Boy Advance era soon to come. I didn't know anyone else growing up that owned a Game Boy, but by the time the Game Boy Advance rolled around, every kid I knew had one even the ones whose parents didn't let them have consoles at home. Kids were getting in trouble for bringing games to school, we would play in the car even if just for a 5 minute ride, and on more than one occasion we'd sneak the game under the covers and play way past our bedtime. In current day it seems like a no brainer, why not give people the chance to play your games anytime, anywhere? A quick break on the phone, a commute, a lame party? Handheld gaming wasn't always the sold idea it is now. Personally, I think a large player in this was franchise familiarity. Parents recognized the big games like Mario, Zelda, Donkey Kong, and Metroid, and with the Game Boy Advance's graphics, they looked a lot more similar to what we were seeing on TV. That and the ever-growing popularity of Pokemon, which was handheld only at the time, and kids just couldn't miss out on an opportunity to play the newest game in their favorite series. To the uninformed consumer, surely buying a small handheld console in the games must be cheaper than buying a whole setup for home that you can't even take anywhere. While Nintendo's mainstays have always had homes on handheld consoles, other franchises started to look at this handheld gaming thing as one of the biggest growing markets. And by the time the DS came out, lots of companies were eager to see how they could extend their IPs to the local bus stops and school playgrounds of the world. There were people out there who wanted to game on the go and didn't like Pokemon and they were all the focus group for these new experiments. Many franchises fit so perfectly into the handheld market they practically had seamless transitions. Animal Crossing, Final Fantasy, Fire Emblem, Mario Kart, and of course, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, which is so similar to the show, it's like basically playing an episode. But it's not a shock that Nintendo-based franchises had no problem with the transition. Most of them started as 2D games, platformers or top-down, and while many went to 3D on either the Nintendo 64 or the GameCube, when it came to going handheld, they simply just went back to the old 2D formula, and in doing so, created some of the most memorable video games of all time. But not every franchise that was making the jump to handheld started off as a 2D platformer, so there was no form to return to, and they weren't exactly games that would make the jump easy. Real-time strategy, first-person shooters, 3D dungeon crawlers, games with dozens of mechanics that would need to be either completely dumbed down or changed entirely. And with changing a game so drastically, say going from a real-time strategy game to a 2D platformer, you risk alienating a lot of your audience. There wasn't a ton of games back in the day that changed drastically from sequel to sequel. If you were to pick up Mega Man, and then pick up one several sequels later, you were more or less playing the same game, just with new maps and new looks. It was immediately familiar to you. In current day, there are people who refuse to play a game like Mass Effect 1 or Dragon Age Origins compared to some of the newer ones because the gameplay is so different, which leads to some people liking how some installments play, and really not liking others. Changing the game can make every game feel fresh, like a new start, but sometimes it can lead to a disconnect in the series. To change your entire identity, to change franchise-defining mechanics if they simply didn't fit on handheld consoles, was a risky move, and developers were left with a choice. Do they compromise on what they have, removing some things and adding others? Do they force it all in, regardless if it's too complicated and just hope for the best? Or do they try something so different that it might as well not be a part of the same franchise? 
the one weird black sheep in the game's gameography, if that's even a word. I personally happen to own a lot of these games. Growing up, my parents were hesitant to let me spend my little but hard-earned money to buy a game with a title that they or I had never heard of. But while buying Mario or Zelda was safe, it didn't necessarily interest me, and as such, I ended up with a large variety of games that I can only describe as a risk, because who knew exactly what you were going to get? Now this video is mostly going to be focused around Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS games, with a few Game Boy Color games here and there. I left out a lot of PSP games, mostly because the PSP wasn't nearly as limited as the Nintendo consoles were, and the main focus of this video is going to be on the compromises that some franchises had to make to fit within the limitations. As I said previously, a lot of franchises weren't in on the Game Boy Color, and some didn't even bother with the Game Boy Advance either. But by the time the DS came around, even the most shocking of franchises hit the handheld market. My theory is that a lot of companies maybe didn't realize what the DS could handle, and once games like Super Mario 64 DS came out, they realized it could do a lot more than they initially thought. And, you know, I'm sure all the money being made didn't hurt either. But the list of games I've chosen for this video are, for the most part, franchises that either tried too hard to hold on to their original concept at the detriment of the gameplay, or franchises that were bold enough to change everything once they realized their core mechanics simply would not work. This is not by any means the definitive list of every single franchise that went handheld. There's a lot that I've already shown you in this intro sequence that I'm not going to be covering. And I could cover them all if I really wanted to, and heck if you look at the video time you probably feel like I must be pretty damn close, but I wanted to pick franchises that I at least had some familiarity with, and ones that I thought made the most interesting transitions. There's a few in here where it's just, hey, they dumbed down mechanic A and mechanic B and they changed mechanic C and this is what's left. So I tried to pick different genres for these examples. I also avoided lots of repetitive things like spoilers, but I talk about Spyro quite a bit, but I didn't feel the need to also talk about a game like Ratchet and Clank or Jack and Daxter and all of those similar PS2 era games, although I'm sure they exist and there's good examples of them. Also, no sports. There's no need for me to talk about FIFA from the PlayStation to the PSP or something silly like that. I'm also primarily focusing on gaming franchises. While that might sound confusing at first, let's use an example here. Jimmy Neutron has some pretty well-known games on consoles, and while writing this, I have no idea if there's a side-scrolling Game Boy Advance Jimmy Neutron game, but I'm gonna tell you right now, there probably is. The primary focus of these games are not mechanics-based, although I'm sure he invents something in every game, but the games are character based, there's little consistency from game to game. There's no definitive Jimmy Neutron game experience, and the games exist not to build off of each other, but to build an entirely separate brand and media. And while yes, I could technically cover and compare both the PS2 and Nintendo DS versions of the Golden Compass because we all know there's thousands of movie licensed games out there, it's really just not worth my time to do that. At least not for this video, perhaps another time. Although I obviously played the Golden Compass games to record what you're seeing on screen right now, so here's my thoughts on a big pile of text on screen for three seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, moving on. Ultimately, I'll remind everyone listening and watching right now that I am making this video. I am not claiming that this is the entire list of every franchise and how they adapted to the handheld market, which is the second time I've said that, and I can choose the games as I please. Every video I make that has multiple games in it, I always get a comment like, I am so offended you did not include this. Or, what an insult that this game was not on your list, the disrespect I am feeling right now. And if you see any of these comments, please just ignore them. And if you rate these kind of comments, please consider therapy. I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not. Therapy is a good tool, and if you could afford it, it's always good to talk to someone, but you don't need therapy if you're speaking about being offended on behalf of a video game. Or maybe you do. Your therapist can tell you. Anyways, 
If there's a really good example of a game that I missed, perhaps I missed a hidden gem in my research of reading the Wikipedia articles for every game on these consoles six times, please do feel free to comment about it. I'm not saying not to. And if you do so in a way that is respectful and doesn't oddly imply that you'd like to do me harm, I will strongly consider covering the game individually on my Ghostboy259 channel at a later date. Now, I'm sure you've noticed this video is a little bit longer than what I normally make. We're a thousand words in already, and we haven't even really gotten to the dissection part of the video, although don't worry, that will still be the majority of this mess. So why is this video objectively too long? I believe that the purest and most clear way to communicate the changes in these franchises is, well, to cover the original games as well. I can tell you all about the Banjo-Kazooie Game Boy game, but if you've never played a Banjo-Kazooie game on console before, you would have no context to anything I'm saying. And it kind of leaves you in the dark and makes part of the video at least somewhat unwatchable. And I don't want to alienate anyone, I want to be thorough. If we're talking about video game mechanical comparisons, we need something to compare it to. I think it's important that we compare everything to the original. You could argue that because some of the handheld games are standalone titles, they should be treated separately from the rest of the franchise. But because these games are selling based off of the name of the games that we know and love, I think it's only appropriate that we compare them. You are buying these games with at least some expectation that it should feel like the game whose title it carries. And honestly, sometimes the games can be so bad it could be considered false advertising. So this video will break down both the original games as well as their handheld counterparts. It's like you'll be getting 25 videos in one to make up for me being gone for more than two years. And let's be honest, if you even clicked on a video this long, there's a good chance you're like me, this will be playing on a second monitor while you're doing something else. However, there are timestamps in the description and the chapter feature should be working and those timestamps will break down all the games. So if you want to skip straight to handheld games or you just want to skip to certain games, you can do that. I'll feel a little hurt that you didn't want to hear me talk and ramble on for 10 plus hours, but I get it. Just promise me that while this video is on your second monitor every now and then you'll look over and be like, ah yes, it's a video, because otherwise I will feel like I wasted a lot of time on these visuals. Because the comparison is just that, a comparison, and we're starting with one thing and comparing it to another, you may find that some sections cover the base game more than the handheld versions. If we're talking about a game and I spend 20 minutes breaking down the mechanics, and then we cut to a handheld version that's nearly identical, it's not going to take another 20 minutes to break it all down. It'll be, this is the same, and now on to the changes. That being said, I tried to pick games that didn't do that just for the sake of keeping things interesting, but there will be a few points where maybe I just don't have as much to say on the handheld version. I simply just want to explain before I get flooded with comments asking why I'm spending so much time on console and PC games and not just cutting straight to the handheld games. For me, it's all about making the video accessible to everyone and putting everything in context. Even if you played these games before, a refresher isn't the worst thing either. Lastly, yes, I've said it a few times already, this video is very long. It is long because I wanted it to be long. That is the beauty of YouTube, is that I can create content how I wish with little limitations. No network or advertisers telling me otherwise. Why no, it didn't need to be this long, but maybe I wanted it to be. So that's why it is. If you need to watch this over a week, or a month, or even a year, maybe leave yourself timestamps in the comments to remember where you left off, just skip around to the games that you recognize and not watch at all, that's all fine with me. You are free to consume this video in any way you wish. The longest video I've uploaded at this point is an hour and seven minutes long. No, we don't, we don't include the Fortnite April Fools video. This is obviously several times longer than that, and if you just wanted shorter content and this is too long for you, no hard feelings, I understand, but if you poke around, there's a lot of smaller content within this longer content. But I like long-form content, so I want to make long-form content. 
And with that, we're well on to page five of my long disclaimer because I'm honestly sick to my stomach just anticipating comments of people questioning why I did things certain way. Why I said this instead of that. Why I chose to do something a certain way, so I'm putting it all out here to explain myself the best I can. I know there's still going to be a lot of comments about things that I got wrong. There's a lot of information here, and there's no doubt in my mind that some of what I said is incorrect. But that's okay. When you comment on something I got wrong, which you will because every video I get something wrong and it shoots up to the top of the video, just don't be mean about it. It's just games, it's not life or death, we're all just here to have fun, and I apologize for any mistakes that I have made along the way. Now that we have all of that out of the way, you may look at some of the games that I'm covering and think, well, I'm not sure why they had to change anything at all. They could have made it work. And as a counter, I'd like to present to you Crazy Taxi on the Game Boy Advance. Does this look fun to you? Does this look like it captures the spirit of what Crazy Taxi was all about? They changed almost nothing, and as a result, the game does not really hold up well because of it. But not all of this video will be me bashing games. In fact, I try to make a point to do that as little as possible because I want to highlight the good decisions. I won't say the further we go, the better the games get. I will say the further we go, the more creative they get. But I've scattered everything around a little bit. And I will say that I enjoyed more games than I didn't while making this video. So, I guess it's time to dive right into it. My first video in over two years, a new era of reality escape has officially begun. Hopefully this time, I'm back for good. And with that, let us see what happens when franchises go handheld. Crazy Taxi! I already mentioned Crazy Taxi in my opener, but I don't want to just point at the game and go graphic bad, game suck, and leave it there, because I feel like that does a disservice to the game, a game that a lot of people have a large amount of nostalgia for. So what is Crazy Taxi? Crazy Taxi was originally an arcade game that was later ported to consoles in the early 2000s. The goal of the game is to pick up customers and drive them to their locations as fast as possible. Each customer will have a green, yellow, or red icon above their heads, which will indicate how hard the job will be. It's not so much a distance thing, but as how long you have to drive to that distance. Apparently, some customers would rather jump out of a moving car into oncoming traffic than be a couple seconds late. Truly, we live in a society. You have a timer in the top left corner which will increase when you pick up a new person, so you constantly need to be delivering people as fast as possible to keep the game going. Your final ranking depends on your score, which depends on your money. Your final pay will depend on how fast you get your customer to their location, but you can also get some extra money by driving really close to cars or going in between them without hitting them. There is no damage mechanic, there's no way to kill people for your car to break down, or any way to really fail a game besides just not delivering your customer on time. This means that the game, as you can imagine, is complete and utter chaos, filled with speeding, flying off ramps, crashing into cars, and making sure the person in the back gets to the Pizza Hut in less than 35 seconds, no matter how unreasonable that may seem. There's a few different modes, mostly where you just play for a set amount of time and try to complete as much as you can in that time, and there's some challenges that you can try and complete, but the base game really doesn't differ much from this. As a kid, I remember getting together with friends where we would all play a few rounds and try to see who could amass the most points. I, of course, was always the kid who wanted to obey the traffic laws, which is why now naturally, not only do I not know how to drive in real life, I also have no friends. It's fun, but it's just a little too hectic for me. I couldn't imagine playing for more than 15 minutes straight, but it's also a port of an arcade game, so I suppose that makes sense, and in that case, it's perfect for that. In 2003, they released Crazy Taxi Catch a Ride, which is almost the exact same game, unfortunately to its own detriment. It's just 
very hard to look at. It plays very clunky and a lot slower. The sprites blend in heavily with the background. It's a little easier if you can power through the eyesore, but generally you'll only get one or maybe two customers done. You can't really optimize your route or see ahead. It's more or less the one straight path to get to your goal. The creative director for the company is quoted, as per Wikipedia, saying it's about the most technically challenging game you can do on a handheld machine. Which at the time it came out is most likely accurate, but then the DS came out just 15 months later. Now graphically, while it's aged poorly, at the time it looked great, but at what cost? I honestly thought a game like this would be top down or have the gameplay change to be more about dodging oncoming cars. It feels like maybe they were so determined to make something technically amazing that they didn't bother to see if it was technically playable. For what it's worth though, they weren't the only company to do this and we're going to hop into a few more examples right now. Ah, the child of Ball has awoken. It is time for more... experiments. Now you might be thinking, holy smokes, wait what? They made a Baldur's Gate game for the Game Boy Advance? Eh, yes and no. It's not really Baldur's Gate, not the one you're probably thinking of anyways. For those who don't know, Baldur's Gate is an RPG that takes place in the official Dungeons & Dragons setting, The Forgotten Realms ironically one of the most remembered realms. The first two games, Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Om, came out in PC in 1998 and 2000 respectively, and I think they've been released on console and there's HD remakes, so they're still around. They are top-down RPGs with pause-style combat. They're pretty amazing, but also have a very large learning curve to them, especially when you're me trying to learn them when you're seven years old. Which is why I, to this day, still play on easy, and if you're gonna gatekeep me for that, just why? Let me enjoy the games how I want. In late 2001, they released Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, and later put it out on Steam in 2021, 20 years later. And it could not be further away from the vision of the originals. I can only imagine why they did this, perhaps they wanted to attract younger fans to the franchise with easier gameplay and a more digestible story, but interestingly enough, after Dark Alliance 1 and 2 came out, the franchise went completely quiet, until Baldur's Gate Siege of Dragonspear came out in 2016, which is an expansion for the original game. And now we have many people quietly anticipating the full non-early access release of Baldur's Gate 3 created by the same studio that developed Divinity Original Sin. I've seen bits and pieces, it looks great, I'm excited. Now that's not to say that Dark Alliance is bad by any means, it's just very different and probably not the game you'd expect. Now I'd love to dissect all the gameplay differences between Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, but that's, that's not why we're here, and this video is already long enough, so let's talk about Dark Alliance. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance is a hack and slash isometric dungeon crawler, and when I say those words, that is the bulk of what this game is. While there is some semblance of a story, the game starts you off immediately getting robbed by two thieves. You ask for a key to the sewers to find them, and embark on a long and epic journey. There's not a ton of story elements to it. Within the first hour, you'll probably spend maybe five minutes talking to people, 45 minutes hacking and slashing at rats and goblins, and 10 minutes walking back and forth to the tavern to sell your equipment and buy new stuff. There are three characters to pick from, Vaughn, the human archer, Cromlech, the dwarven fighter, and Adriana, the elven sorceress. You can technically have any character hold any weapon, but to get the most out of their efficiencies and abilities, you'll probably want to decide how you intend to play before you get too deep into the game. You can switch mid-game, but the experience points won't carry over so you'll be underleveled. And a nice fun fact is that if you're playing with a friend in multiplayer, you can actually import characters from single player games, including that same multiplayer file. As a kid, my friend and I would just import the same character, sell all the expensive items, and made sure we had the most expensive items possible before leaving. And we're going to get into this a little bit more in a bit. You can slash, block, cast spells, and that's kind of it for gameplay. There's not really comboing or anything. Most of your variety will come from switching the weapon that you're using. 
For the archer, if you're playing alone, you pretty much need to have a sword and shield with you just in case, because you probably won't have enough arrows and enemies will be charging at you. There's no dodging or anything outside of just running away from enemy hits. You can kind of jump around, but it looks really silly and it doesn't really benefit you a ton outside of a few platforming bits. The character has three bars on the top left of the screen, being health, experience, and mana. When your experience gets full, you gain a level and you can use an ability point to enhance one of your abilities or learn a new one. Every four levels, you get to increase the good old classic attributes of strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, or charisma. Beyond that, the game is pretty straightforward. There's not really any choices that need to be made or conversations to have. You'll be told where to go, you'll go do it, you'll come back, and you'll repeat. If this is something that interests you, then I highly recommend playing with a friend, even if you don't cheat like a 9-year-old me did. It just feels like it adds so much more to the dynamic and gives the game a little bit more semblance of strategy, as opposed to just pushing this box in the way and hoping this is what I was meant to do, which I'm pretty sure it's not. The game can be kind of brutal sometimes. You'll need to save pretty much any time you can, and I like the mechanic of having a recall potion to get out of dungeons, but when you just need a few health potions or just need to sell something, you have to walk all the way back out to the nearest store, which as you can imagine is incredibly frustrating. I would have liked it if you could at least teleport back to a save point or maybe the point where you use the recall potion, given that you're most likely to be stuck there anyways. There are tons of destructible items in the environment, and they can give you lots of valuable items, mostly potions, which you'll need a lot of. So the first time you go through maps, you'll be hacking and slashing at pretty much everything you can find, trying to figure out what's destructible. As I mentioned before, there is a little bit of platforming as well. Nothing too intense, but sometimes it can be a bit trial and error. The game is mega forgiving though, near the end of the first section you have to go through these little platforming trials and it's going to be trial and error, there's not really any way to get it right the first time unless you've played the game before, and in between every single one is a save point, so as long as you're using them, you'll be fine. Speaking of save points, we should probably talk about the most notable thing in this game. If you heard me talking about the recall potions and heard me talk about how annoying it is to walk all the way back to sell your stuff and then walk all the way deep into the dungeon again, and you said, wait, doesn't he know about the thing? Then yeah, you already know what I'm going to talk about. I originally debated whether I was going to include this in the video or not, but ultimately I think it's actually a pretty big part of the game. And while it's technically not in good faith of the game, maybe I think it's probably the best way to do things in some cases. I mentioned earlier in multiplayer the importing exploit, and that is absolutely something you can do at any time. Make a save in your current dungeon at any save point. Use a recall potion to go back to a tavern or a place where you can sell your items. Sell all of your extra items, since there's a weight limit to what you can carry. Save a different save. Reload the save from the dungeon. Import the character from the save in the tavern, and boom, you've made some extra gold and saved yourself the walking trip. This feels fairly innocent at first, what you're essentially doing is importing a character in between a couple of different worlds and avoiding the walk back. You could argue weight management is a part of the game, but if you can honestly say to yourself that you're the kind of person that would walk all the way back to the tavern every single time your inventory was full, sell your items, and then walk all the way back, I can see why this would be an easy thing to justify to yourself, because otherwise you would be wasting 10-15 minutes every time your inventory gets full just to sell items. But as I'm sure you figured out, you're about to see how broken this can make the game. Save at a dungeon right before a section that gets you a lot of money. Go through it, get the money, and then make a second save right after that. Load a third save in the tavern. Import the character that just completed the section. Sell all your junk, reload the save before you did that section, Import the character from the tavern who just sold all the items, and repeat as many times as you like until you can afford anything in the game. I mean, really, if you want, you can even just drop items in the tavern, import the same character, pick those items back up and resell. The only problem is sometimes the items disappear, it's not quite as consistent, but even if you have just one or two very expensive items, you can just keep selling those over and over as well. Now, I know what you're thinking, doesn't that just ruin the fun? And the answer is, eh, yes and no. It technically kind of does, but 
For a kid who just wants to find a way to cheat the system without technically cheating, aka using cheat codes, and slay all the creatures in one swipe, and also for the full grown adult making a video that's already way too long about handheld games and really only needs to play like 10 minutes of this game because he has 40 other games to play but also feels like it's a little low effort if he only shows himself playing the first dungeon and he wants to show the contrast to different levels to make it look like it works hard at his videos and it's 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 a little useful and not to call myself out here or anything but imagine doing all that and then definitely still dying at a few non-puzzle parts on easy with cheated equipment if you ever wonder if I'm good at video games, the answer is always no. Just assume the answer is no at all times. The game is really repetitive. There's barely a story. Most of your time is pressing the attack button and jumping around parts you've already walked around. But honestly, it's kind of fun still. I honestly can't complain. I don't know if that's nostalgia talking. I'm not sure it's something I would ever play again without having a distinct purpose to play it, most likely recording it or making a video with it. But if you just want to kill some goblins or thieves or skeletons or zombies or giant gelatin cubes or Chewbacca's, oh, I'm such a happy Chewbacca! there's something there. A lot of people enjoyed the game. One thing I'm confident in saying though is that the game is drastically different from its PC, the much cooler older brother of Boulder's Gate. And I don't know if there was much of a crossover with the audience. Around the same time, I think the same month of my research is correct, that Dark Alliance 2 was released, the first game was re-released on the Game Boy Advance. At this point, I'm guessing that due to Dark Alliance being pretty popular on its own, they wanted to continue that franchise separately. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe everyone from Boulder's Gate loved the game, but I don't think so. It just feels too different, and if I know people who play the Boulder's Gate types games, they're a little intense when it comes to their opinions on games. I just don't see them enjoying something like this. Boulder's Gate Dark Alliance on the Game Boy Advance feels very much like it's in the spirit of the original game, but some of it just feels so weird to me. Like maybe they were doing things they wanted to do in the first game but couldn't, but also maybe they were changing things they didn't care for. Instead of remaking it, it was like trying to improve it but on a system that couldn't handle the improvements. Immediately walking into the game, the tavern is noticeably a lot bigger, the dialogue is a lot more robotic and cut down. Everything has been basically summarized into emotionless, these are rats. Please kill the rats, thank you. The game is an isometric view, something that we see quite frequently with Game Boy games. The controls do feel stiff as expected. You can't jump, only running at the same pace, which makes walking sections feel a lot more tedious. And oh boy, are they tedious. There are no recall potions or multiple saves, which of course means no fun exploits of making money or XP grinding, but it also means a ton of walking through these levels. Unlike the original game, there's no indicators once you've finished a quest. You eventually just stumble upon a door, realize there's no way through, and just hope you're not wasting your time walking all the way back to the start. Again, there is a lot of backtracking in the original, and even more in this one because there's no way out of it. But at least this time, they respawn some enemies on the way, so it feels like you're doing something? I don't know if that's a positive or not, but it's something. Leveling up abilities is pretty much done exactly the same, but your initial stats are actually customizable at the very beginning. Choosing between a warrior, archer, or wizard, which is the same dude but in different color clothing. But once you make your selection, you'll be able to add points to your strength, constitution, intelligence, dexterity, etc. You get it. Combat is really just pressing A and continuing to do so until everything is dead. You can switch weapon types if you have them, although I can't manage to hit anything with this bow because basically everything's on an invisible grid. Speaking of invisible, between zones there seems to be invisible walls that enemies can't cross, so if you ever need a quick break, you can just hop over there and wait a little bit. There's also a lack of minimap, which is understandable because the Game Boy screen I think is a lot smaller than people remember. You have to remember you're watching this on YouTube, so everything's a little bit bigger. Even for people watching on mobile right now, the screen you're watching on is probably bigger than a Game Boy Advance. Given that the level layout is so similar to the original game, combined with the isometric view, it is incredibly easy to get lost. There are a few things that I do like about the game, and unfortunately there's just not enough of them. I like that the game sends you around Baldur's Gate. In the original, you only go to the tavern and then other places to get to dungeons quicker. 
Here there's actually some side missions and you get to go into people's houses or talk to people. Or the store is now in a different location so you actually have a purpose to walk around the city. I only wish that the town were designed a little bit more friendly so that walking around didn't feel so much like a chore. And for the record, because I brought it up quite a bit, I don't hate walking in video games or even backtracking sometimes. Lord knows I've played enough games like Dragon Age where there's a ton of it. And this isn't a conversation about fast travel or something like that. And I'm not asking for objective markers pointing out everything to do. The reason I bring these things up is because the original games had systems in place to make this part a little bit more easy to navigate and a remake that, while yes, had to be changed due to console limitations, removed some of these features and made the boring parts of the game that much more boring. The two biggest things that really make me not enjoy this experience as much as I'd like are both things to do with the combat dungeons. The first is that the isometric zones all look great for this era, but in some cases they've added doorways. While the ceiling isn't present, if there's a giant pillar in the room that they surely really doesn't need to be there, you have this giant strip of ceiling blocking your view. Maybe practically the pillar makes sense, I'm not an architect, but I still feel like this just takes up so much of your already limited view space. There are some rooms where you can literally only see half of the actual room, and overall, I just find it a really weird choice. There are literally pillars later in the sewer that are connected to no ceiling, so I don't know why they didn't just stick with that. And the original game didn't really have this issue, although I also acknowledge that it had a camera to move things around. The other thing is how they changed picking up items. In the original game, you would just walk over, spam whatever button it was to pick up things, and continue on your way seamlessly. The big issue with this was that you had to pick up everything that you were over, but it was a little easier to navigate your inventory. Here it takes you to a separate screen where you have to press A again to pick the item up. Combined with the fact that you have to manually save and you can manually save wherever you want, which is nice, these two things combined however are massive flow breakers in the game. You get into the tendency to save after every small encounter so you can avoid having to do it again and walk the long pathways for the third time, and anytime you pick something up, it just breaks the entire flow of the game. It felt so seamless before, which is why I think I didn't mind the inventory management parts of the game, but here it just feels a little too much like it's breaking the game up. Now you might say maybe I'm being too hard because plenty of other games use this cutaway screen mechanic for picking up items. For example, Oblivion. Once you kill something and go to pick up their inventory, it takes you to a separate screen. My point isn't that this is a bad way to do things, it's just very different from the way the original game did it, and it was something I liked about the original. It had good flow, and it did its best to speed everything up during parts that weren't the most fun, but this game doesn't make such compromises, and it ends up slowing everything down. The point of this video is to compare the two, and I would be remiss if I didn't bring it up. I'm honestly really conflicted about how I feel about the game. I admit the original Dark Alliance isn't an S tier game, maybe not even an A tier game, but it's still very enjoyable and you'll find no lack of people wanting to talk about how much they enjoyed it when they were younger. The Game Boy Advance game looks good and it feels a lot like the original, but just slightly worse and really, maybe that's the best we can ask for. PlayStation 2 to Game Boy Advance is probably one of the trickier transitions that franchises made and probably one of the most common. Maybe this just isn't the game for me, but if you play a lot of handheld games back in the day and you wanted a serious dungeon crawling grinder D&D style game, this is probably the best you're gonna get. However, needless to say, Dark Alliance 2 never received a handheld version or a proper sequel, but now that we have Baldur's Gate 3, you never know. I can't think of a better visual representation of the word video game than Pac-Man. It's an all-time classic, it's immediately recognizable to those who don't even play video games, and there's been no short of attempting to modernize it for modern platforms. Pac-Man is as clear-cut as it gets, we don't need to go too deep into it. You control the yellow circle, and you eat all the dots. Throughout the map, four ghosts will try to eat you, and you want to avoid them the best you can. If they get too close, you can eat the bigger dot, turning the ghost blue, and then you can eat them for extra points. It's as simple as that. 
The game is extremely accessible. They've made versions for pretty much every console imaginable. And handheld wise, there's Game Boy versions, Game Boy Color versions, Game Boy Advance versions. Heck, you can even play a Google Doodle on your phone or desktop. There's one game I want to focus on in particular. There's another I'll mention, but just because it's done in a way that could only be done on that specific console. Packpix came out pretty early in the life cycle of the Nintendo DS, and it actually features the bottom screen quite a bit, something a lot of games didn't actually do at the time. It involves you drawing your own little Pac-Man, and then using the stylus to guide him around in the direction you want. Every level will have an amount of ghosts to eat. Your job is to use the amount of Pac-Mans you've been given to eat them all. No large dots needed or any dot collecting or anything like that. You can do a few things besides drawing Pac-Man, mostly drawing lines to move him into a certain direction, and you can kind of tug on him if you need to, but it's he's kind of slippery, he kind of just falls around everywhere, so it doesn't really do a lot of good. If your Pac-Man goes off screen, you lose that life, and just keeping him on the screen can be a bigger challenge because the smaller you draw him, the faster he goes, but the bigger he is, the harder he is to navigate. One interesting thing is that you need to draw Pac-Man in the way it specifically tells you, starting with the top of the mouth and then going around. This is surprisingly harder than I thought it would be. It led to me accidentally creating some absolute abominations that would make Miss Pac-Man regret all of her life choices very quickly. It's more or less this the entire time. I only played for about 45 minutes, so if there's any major changes later on, I didn't get to them. I would have maybe chosen a different color for the background of the game, and it does feel weird that everything is so contained in such a small little tiny box. The game throws some obstacles at you, different types of ghosts, little bricks that you can bounce off of. As I mentioned, the bigger you are, the slower you go, but eventually you'll be too big to really navigate, so you have to go smaller because you need to get around these obstacles, and thus you go faster, and this is pretty much where most of the challenge comes from. I was playing with a mouse, so it wasn't too far off from the stylus experience, but I almost imagine it might be trickier that way because you have your hand kind of covering the screen half the time. You can also send your Pac-Man up this little shoot area on the top screen, and sometimes you either get points or extra lives or the cherries up there, and thankfully it doesn't have to be the perfect right size to fit in that tube. And personally, in my headcanon, Pac-Man really just enjoys the trip and appreciates you giving him a break, so I try to do it when I can. There's also some boss stages. The one I played was just making sure the mouth was big enough to eat them. Nothing really intense, but I guess it's a different way to end the stages. Overall, it's very simple, but it's neat. It's not something I would ever play again, but it's very cool that you can play this game without ever pressing a controller button. It feels like something that maybe I would have played as a flash game when I was younger, and it actually makes good use of the second screen, which is something that most games just tend to not do, although it's really more the touch aspect than using both screens. It's probably not worth the price of a full game, but if you showed this to someone in 2005 and said, hey, this is what the DS can do in an era where touch screens weren't so common, I reckon they would probably be pretty impressed. We've also got Pack and Roll, in which you use a stylus to roll Pac-Man around the various maps. This game has an absurd amount of story, like way too much for a Pac-Man game. And non surprisingly, this game is kind of hard on an emulator. It also has these lines that I'm pretty sure it's just an emulation thing. Those are not in the real game, but I thought it was worth mentioning, if only for a brief moment, that there are two. But in my opinion, Pack Picks is the more interesting of the two. And we move on. Dynasty Warriors, while often criticized for its simplicity and repetitiveness, has been around strongly since 1997, with nine main title installments, several expansions and spin-offs, and while there is no word of Dynasty Warriors 10 as of writing this due to the unpopularity of 9, many are still hopeful that it'll happen. It only makes sense that a game with such few core mechanics, at least in the earlier games, could be transferred to the portable market. We'll go up to the game that came out just before the portable games and my personal introduction to the series, Dynasty Warriors 4. The premise is pretty simple, there is one side versus the other side. 
These can be quote unquote historical battles, at least within the game's own canon, which is different from the books, which is different from history, or you can really just set up whatever encounters you want. On each side, there will be a commander and several officers who will lead their own group of troops and soldiers around. While sometimes the goal can be different for campaign, the standard goal is to defeat the enemy commander. Do that, and you win, be killed, and you lose. The game features mostly hack and slash gameplay with a little bit of combo combining here and there, but also just spamming the attack button as often as you can is a completely valid way of playing and will still get you pretty far. Besides pressing square and triangle to create combos, you also have a bow. This is pretty useless in the earlier games and takes too long to set up and aim in my opinion, although it's fun to use sometimes, so do whatever you want. It just doesn't do a lot of damage. You can also block enemies attacking you from head on, which is useful, but generally you'll find more often than not that you're surrounded by soldiers, and all it takes is one hit from someone on a slightly different angle to break your block. Two of the defining features of the franchise are that each character is given a unique weapon and a unique special attack that I don't know how to pronounce. I've always said Musou, but I believe it's actually Muso, so that's how I'll say it, but feel free to correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Once you do enough damage, your special attack bar will fill up and allow you to unleash it at any time. These have a ton of variety, some focus on single targets, which is good for killing other named characters, some are great wave clears. When you hit low levels of health, you'll unlock your true Muso, which does basically your special attack, but to a much higher and more devastating degree. It's also worth mentioning that when your health is in the red, you will gradually recharge your Muso, meaning you can use it more often. It's technically a viable strategy to go in with low health and spam it, but this can obviously backfire and will involve lots of running away from enemies. While some of the weapons are not historically accurate and many more would be terribly inefficient, the fact that not everyone has just a basic sword makes the game really fun and replayable. Some playstyles will just not fit the way you want to play the game, but chances are you'll find at least a dozen that will. In the older games and in the games after this, every character has their own story, with the game written in a way that you can play from almost everyone's unique perspective as you go through the story mode. Most of the time, they take the story into their own hands, and characters will live often past their actual deaths and achieving goals that they didn't actually in reality, so it can be hard to gain a true grip of the actual story if this is how you're exposed to it. However, in Dynasty Warriors 4, you're actually playing through the story with the faction, meaning you can switch characters in between, it doesn't follow just one story in particular. Throughout your typical battle, you will encounter many standard nameless troops with the occasional special troop. These are normally just archers that hit you from far away, but in later games there's a bit more variety. Other special troops littered on the map will be Gate Captains. These are soldiers who basically control little areas where reinforcements can come from, so controlling them will be to your benefit. Now, in most cases, like I said, the win scenario is killing the enemy commander, but the losing scenario is both your death and your own commander, assuming you are not it. This idea generally might not turn the tide of battle, but it's also not impossible that you've gone to rush the enemy commander, gotten stuck because of a puzzle or unfinished requirement, and because your opponent is constantly getting reinforcements, your own commander is getting slaughtered. This system is much expanded on and, in my opinion, vastly improved with the base system in Dynasty Warriors 5, which admittedly I'm way more familiar with, so apologies if anything I said here isn't 100% correct to Dynasty Warriors 4. The enemy also has officers, as do you. Your friends can help you out in combat, especially if you just hang around them, but they tend to travel slowly and will kill literally everything they see. When encountering an enemy officer, there is a slight possibility they can actually challenge you to a duel. Dueling is kind of a fun idea because you get to take on another officer one on one and it's this big epic clash, but with this combat it doesn't necessarily feel the greatest. And if you win, there's not much of a difference than just beating them normally, and if you die, well the game's over anyways. I recommend not doing this just because sometimes you need to run away and get HP or something, or sometimes it's a Lu Boo and you get slaughtered pretty much instantly. 
Obviously, it makes sense to go in and rush the commander, just avoiding all the small troops. And to be honest with you, the earlier games make this pretty easy to do. You may not have a 100% success rate, but the later games make this idea way harder to pull off and way more improbable. However, if you're doing this, I also have to question why you're playing these games at all. Not to say that you shouldn't play the game and win however you want, but it's objectively not within the spirit of the game to just rush the boss right away. That being said, I definitely did it a few times when I was 100%ing some of the older games, so I guess there's that. While the future games in Musou mode also make you play a set amount of missions, in Dynasty Warriors 4 you can actually skip some of the battles and just go to the last one of each chapter, or you can play through them all, level up different characters and do all that, and it gives you a bigger advantage in the final battle. So again, it's the same kind of energy. There are several game types in Dynasty Warriors 4. Musou mode of course is the main mode that we've been talking about, playing through one of the Three Kingdoms storylines. The way you level up characters here mostly carries over to the rest of the game, so it's important to note that if you have friends to play with and you've only leveled up some characters, you might face some balance issues. Dynasty Warriors 4 is almost a little bit of a step back in my opinion from previous games since you play through the Kingdom storyline instead of your own character storyline. They go back to this in Dynasty Warriors 5, which is my personal favorite of the series, which is also why I keep bringing it up because I just know that game really well. There's also some mild branching pathways in this game, but it's honestly nothing worth mentioning for this video. It's mostly just if you skipped a battle or not. What is important is that this mode is how you unlock a majority of the characters for the rest of the game. The only unfortunate part is that because you can only play through the same storylines over and over again, there's not much to do with those characters once they're unlocked. Speaking of variety, there's a versus mode, which as far as I can remember isn't in any of the future games, although that could be me misremembering, I'm not gonna boot every single game up to check. You've got escort mission where you have to protect your carriage, showdown which is just a 1v1 fight, encounter where the whole place is dark and you have to find them, although screen peeking kind of destroys the dramatic side of this, and influence where you use the imperial seal to gain allies and defeat enemies but it's just verses with extra steps because they hadn't allowed for player characters to respawn in battles yet and they wouldn't for unfortunately a long time. The big one thing missing is you can't have an all out war on a huge map with your friend, probably because of the screen sharing issues and again going back to the idea that if you just kill your friend right away the game ends. However this is something that I still don't think they have and something I still really want to see in a Dynasty Warriors game. Let me do Star Wars Battlefront Galactic Conquest but with China. It's also worth mentioning here that even in Musou mode, you can have a friend select an officer and play in the battle with you. In other versions, because there's a main character to the story, your friend's kind of always playing a side character, but because you're playing as kingdoms here, you can kind of go back and forth. You've got free mode here in the game where you can just play through campaigns as whoever you choose. In future games, they let you replace all the officers with whoever you want and customize it to your heart's content. Unfortunately, it's not an option here. And lastly, you've got challenge mode, which has just a few game types like defeating enemies as fast as you can, defeating as many enemies as fast as you can, destroying as many objects as you can, and knocking enemies off a bridge. You can also create a character and the bodyguards that follow you around. I say create, however, very loosely because there's very few options for customization, which feels like such a huge missed opportunity but again is corrected in the sequel expansion later on. I'm honestly shocked at how little Dynasty Warriors 4 holds up for me, and in a perfect world I would have just covered Dynasty Warriors 5, but because the first handheld game came out a little bit before the fifth game and is primarily based on the fourth game, I wanted to be fair. As much as I would love to get into the later games and why I feel in general they're so much stronger than what most people have been exposed to with the series, that's a video for another time. Let me know if you're interested in that, or don't, I'm going to do it anyways. I think the challenges of Dynasty Warriors in handheld is immediately apparent knowing what we know about the franchise. There is no way going to be nearly enough enemies on the screen to give it the Dynasty Warriors feel that we all want, and there's even less buttons to create combos on with a Game Boy Advance. 
and with a lack of enemy types you basically risk having a Legend of Zelda game without the fun parts that make it feel like a Legend of Zelda game. Also a quick note, there's some PSP Dynasty Warriors games, I'm not going to cover them, they're pretty much extremely similar to what we've already seen, they're just good solid Dynasty Warriors games that are in the 3D space. But I wanted to cover Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS because they certainly made some choices. Dynasty Warriors Advance. The first thing you'll surely notice is that we have an overworld map where all the movement takes place. This map shows all the locations of friendly units and enemy units and you'll have to slowly work your way across the map this way. As you land on a spot with an enemy or during an enemy's turn if they land on a spot with you, a fight will engage where you're sent to a mini map and have to defeat a certain amount of enemies within the time limit. Combos are pretty much no longer a thing, at least not in the traditional sense. A will do a charging attack, but not as in an attack that charges, but literally in an attack where you charge at an enemy, and you can't combo off of this. So the B button is a normal attack where you'll just do a generic strike as normal. You can technically combine these two, and there's a whole list of them in the tutorial part of the game. Like you can do a stunning strike by pressing B then A, a continuous attack that doesn't allow for counter attacks by pressing B, B then A, and then pushing attack, which you guessed it is B three times and then A. Yes, it's real combos, but it's not like button combinations to remember as much as it is press B to do attacks and then press A whenever you want the combo to end. The health bar and the muso bar both return, giving at least the bottom left corner of the screen a familiar look. Pressing L plus A activates the muso, with the gauge taking a little bit longer to fill now, presumably due to lack of enemies and how much longer it takes to kill them. You can still block like in the previous games, however there is no bow and arrow, which would have been a lot easier to aim in this game had they included it, but again, only so many buttons. The biggest difference to combat is the R button will give you a power up as indicated on the bottom right of the screen. There are 6 abilities on the counter and defeating enemies fills it up. Once an ability is full, you can press R to activate it. You basically start at the top and every fill you move to the next one. So if you're hoping for a way to select which one you want, I don't think you can, it's a little unclear and you're better off just using the ability as soon as you get it rather than holding on and waiting. However, sometimes you can lose these abilities by getting hit, so take that for what you will. The six abilities are Valor, Speed, Storm, Stun, Chain, and Reach. Valor is your weapon's special abilities, so basically unique to the weapon you're holding. Like sometimes it's just a boost in attack, for example. It's normally pretty underwhelming. Speed is movement speed, not attacking speed, unfortunately. And the rest are all just different versions of the basic A charge attack. Using these more often will also grant you better rewards and leveling when a map is over. So while you technically can ignore them, you might as well use them. Every character has different stats and different loadout, I guess, of their abilities and the order. This is also the first Dynasty Warriors game that allows you to use any weapon you've unlocked and not just your characters, which I'm pretty sure wouldn't come back until Dynasty Warriors 7 or 8. There are a few ways a battle can end, either a triumph in which you've dominated the battle with much time to spare, and it'll give you an extra turn of movement on the map, a victory where you just win and proceed as normal, or a close call where the time runs out and you skip your movement next turn, but you can just keep playing when the timer runs out, so it's not a real timer. I don't fully understand this one because I don't know how you would lose in a close call unless you just die, but you can also obviously just die and lose the fight, or you can run away and retreat, but either way the timer seems a little weird. Combat in general feels very slippery. I think you can probably see what I'm talking about just by looking at the screen, but even without the charging, you're constantly knocking enemies over. It's hard to just focus on a group of guys because they'll fall over and four other guys from outside the map will come from the opposite direction. There are other officers you'll encounter. It normally just ends up you forcing them into a corner and stunning them over and over and over again. They don't particularly feel any harder from any other enemy. Sometimes you can't even really distinguish them because they don't look that much cooler. There are three challenge types. Endurance, which again is defeating as many enemies as you can. Time attack, which is defeating enemies in the quickest time possible. 
and battle luck, which I don't understand and I'm not going to try. Despite that you have free mode and of course muso mode, I honestly can't imagine ever playing free mode, but to be even more honest, I can't imagine playing much more of this than I have to. Maybe this game is one of those that would have actually benefited more without the Dynasty Warriors name attached. I think by giving it the generic name Dynasty Warriors Advance, they may have tried to do that already, just to try to separate it from the main line of games, but considering the first game went from a one-on-one -on -one fighter and slowly started to become the Dynasty formulas we know and most of us love, this just feels like such a large departure from it. It feels like they both tried to do too little and too much at the same time. The abilities are cool, and I would guess the only reason they're there is to avoid just pressing B the entire game. But having 6 and no clear way to select what you want and going through the instructions to use them doesn't really enhance this experience for me. As much as I don't like the map movement because it makes one battle take so long, that's probably the one I'm most willing to give a pass to since it's the only way to make the maps feel large without having a massive field that takes hours to traverse. I don't even know if the Game Boy would be capable of that. Unfortunately, that being said, the maps that the actual battles take place on are very flat and boring and lifeless, somehow more so than the actual maps of Dynasty Warriors 4, which is pretty hard to do. I'm also not too annoyed about the small cast of characters, it's pretty expected. I try to look back at my criticism of the game and think if there's anything that they could have done differently that would have salvaged it for me. And honestly, I think this might have always just been a losing formula. There's something so right about the Dynasty Warriors franchise and how it looks. Even by the fourth game, the style and the gameplay was so cemented into my brain that unless they dramatically changed it up, I'm not sure they were ever going to be able to pull it off. And as a result, we ended up with a pretty disappointing Game Boy Advance game. But if you thought that was disappointing because this game does have people who defend it, Wait till I tell you about Dynasty Warriors DS Fighters Battle, because they are less people willing to defend this one. The game controls slightly reminiscent of the last one, where B will strike normally and A will do a charging attack. Now that we have extra buttons, the Muso attack is assigned to the X button and abilities have been completely changed into the obstacle wheel. As you defeat enemies, they'll drop coins. These coins will eventually cause the wheel to spin which is really just a randomizer of abilities, and pressing Y will unleash these obstacles, as the game calls them. Some of these are great, like Earthquake knocks over a large amount of enemies off their feet, and then you have this rock one which throws this tiny little rock that's almost always going to miss and just, it's completely pointless. You can be a bit more intentional about which abilities you use, which is nice, and we'll get into how you select these in a moment. During combat, we get an unfortunate callback to the number of enemies we need to clear a map. In this game, they call it your quota, which is a bit appropriate given how much this game feels like work versus fun. Once you've filled your quota, you can advance past the gate to the next section. Unlike last game, this game at least doesn't have the moving on the map system, you just go from map to map. As I mentioned in the Dynasty Warriors 4 section, in Dynasty Warriors 5, they have bases with guard captains. And because the Nintendo DS game is actually more based off of 5, it actually features these base guard captains. If you capture the boss or the guard captain or whoever, in this game it's always a hero that the enemy has chosen, it'll power your character up with different bases having different effects. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that in Dynasty Warriors 5, depending on the map you play, you may need to capture every single base in order to attack the main camp. In this game, this is mandatory. You must capture every base first, meaning the idea of rushing the enemy commander is effectively eliminated. While I was saying before that I believed it wasn't necessarily in taste with the game to do this, I'm also against removing the possibility entirely. But let's be real. If you've been looking at this game footage for a few minutes now, I'm sure you can tell most people probably didn't give this game that much of a second thought. It's also important to note that you don't need to be in control of all the bases, you just need to have captured your enemies. If your enemy has captured your base, there's nothing more you can do with it, it just stays theirs. Dueling also returns, but it doesn't defeat your opponent as much as it just sends them to a different spawn point on the map and allow you to advance uninhibited. We'll get into this in a little bit because I have a lot to say about dueling in this game. 
Lastly, we need to talk about the battle deck. Yes, Dynasty Warriors on the DS turns into a card game, and oddly enough, this will not be the last time we see this in this video. Battle decks are the way you choose the officers that help you in battle, not really help as much as just guard your bases. The big card on the left will guard your main base, and the other cards guard the smaller bases that are scattered throughout the map. The cards aren't just which officers you want, however, because debatably that's not really important. What's more important is the effects the cards will give you during your battle. Mostly which obstacles you'll have for your wheel, but some will also give you some stat bonuses. There is no real story mode or anything, and in fact you don't even get to play as any of your favorite Dynasty Warriors characters. The only way you interact with them is by these cards and fighting them. You play as one of three, I think, unnamed characters. I don't actually know if they have names, it doesn't show and you battle against the other player, which is one of the two characters you didn't choose. Earlier I mentioned how I was wishing there was a Galactic Conquest mode like in Battlefront but for Dynasty Warriors, and this is basically that. You and one character will go head to head several hundred times to take over all of China. It's actually pretty similar to Empire's expansions. Every game has a Dynasty Warriors Empire's expansion that came out. Uh, except it's missing about 95% of what makes Empire's mode fun. It's a bit hard to follow everything, and it's all laid out a little bit oddly. Like, you have your main camp and then your bases, and your bases are more closer to your opponent's camp than your own. I'm sure they did this so it's faster getting into combat rather than walking around for a long time before battling. But sometimes your opponent's layout is way more favorable than yours, no matter what. And before you can even consider going after bases, you have to worry about constantly defending your main camp from them. There is also so much dueling. As I mentioned before, dueling happened sometimes in Dynasty Warriors 4. Now, anytime you and the enemy are in the same spot, you will engage in a duel. As I've said before, this style of combat really doesn't mix well with duels, and simplifying that style of combat to this, surprisingly, didn't help a lot. There's also just so much of it, and it's often a repeat of hitting your opponent, waiting for him to get back up, and doing the same thing over and over. You also have to engage in these duels to win bases, and holy smoke, sometimes these things are so boring and take so long. In this fight, I had to beat Dong Zhuo, who was on some weird wooden tank chariot thing, which, for whatever reason, the officers will keep randomly spawning on if you knock them off. And eventually, I just trapped him in a corner, and I had to tap B for like two minutes straight until he died. And it's not a skippable thing like in Dynasty Warriors 4. It's very common and needs to be done several times because you have to capture all the bases before going to main camp. I think the main reason they didn't allow you to meet your opponent on the battlefield and they only allowed you to duel them is because if you actually look at the maps, you do not have any fellow troops. Even though there are different colored troops, every single troop you see is your enemy and against you. And I think it's for that reason that they didn't want it to feel like it was 50 guys on one at all times. This is one of the first Dynasty Warriors games in the entire franchise that allows you to respawn after death, which is nice, albeit not realistic. So even though you are making all the decisions in the game, you are never the commander. The only way you can lose is if your main base guard dies. I have no idea how the game decides where you respawn. There are a few spots on the map marked by little diamonds, but how it chooses which one you go to seems a bit random. Like, because of this, sometimes I inadvertently sent my opponent straight to my main camp, or they sent me straight to their main camp, which almost incentivizes the idea of not dueling with them at all and avoiding them at all costs because you could accidentally send them straight to victory. While it's probably not hard to tell that I didn't necessarily enjoy the game, I don't want to be completely unfair. The variety of level design is nice, it looks and feels different, like something you actually have to traverse. They have little puzzle bits like they did in Dynasty Warriors 5 and other games. For example, all the soldiers are transparent and invincible, and you need to smash all four pots in the corners of the center wood structure in order to make them physical and do damage to them. However, they don't tell you this, so if you didn't play the earlier games, I don't know if you would know that. For me, it was just pretty instinctive because I've been doing that forever. 
Most of the time, filling the quota isn't really an issue, but other times, characters will literally run away from you and you'll have to wander the entire map looking for them, which, let's be real, isn't fun in any game. There's really no incentive to kill anyone after the quota is filled either, you might as well just run by. Maybe I'm too hard on these games, maybe I'm too attached to the originals with almost all the games on this list really to be fair, but at some point while writing the script for this video, I would look on YouTube for gameplay footage, and with almost every single advanced or DS game, someone would say, I loved this game as a kid and people were too hard on it, but with these Dynasty Warriors games, I didn't find a lot of people who had a lot of good things to say about them. It feels like there's something there, but it didn't quite come together as maybe well as it should have or as well as they wanted it to. Like that feeling when you watch a movie and there's a mild continuity error right at the beginning, and ultimately it doesn't matter, but you spend the whole movie waiting for the moment that they address it and then they don't. It's just that anticipation of when does the game start and it doesn't happen. But for the people that enjoyed them, I'm glad they did. It's not something I ever have the want or desire to play ever again, unless of course you're interested in a whole series about the Dynasty Warriors franchise, then I guess I'll have to play them at least once more. While LEGO Star Wars isn't the first LEGO game I've ever played, that would be LEGO Island, LEGO Chess, and the racing one, it is the first in this new generation of LEGO games. Although not so new, now it's just commonplace, where you play as a licensed character and go through your adventures. It didn't worry about every piece of the game being a LEGO brick, the characters could bend their arms in positions that real LEGO could not, something that was not allowed before, and more importantly, most importantly perhaps, it was the first time the LEGO brand let their characters be associated with a lot of violence. Albeit cartoon violence, but we take what we can get. The original game combines platforming, puzzle elements, and really basic combat, and loosely guides you through the stories of the movies. Fun fact, this game was released before Revenge of the Sith came out, and it has Episode 3 as a completely playable part. And I played this game before watching the movie, thus spoiling it for myself. Imagine a 9 year old me leaving the theater and the biggest question on my young mind was, why wasn't Commander Cody a bigger part of the movie? Because he was a named character in LEGO Star Wars, where the heck was he? I didn't even realize which one was Commander Cody until after I got home and someone had to tell me. Not to get too off topic here, but can you imagine the outrage in modern society, a society with Twitter, if a LEGO video game spoiled the sixth movie and one of the most prolific movie franchises to ever exist? Anyways, the game has dozens of characters, some generally have different movesets and abilities, although not all. Most of the Jedi all play the same, outside of Yoda, who's probably the most different. Jar Jar can jump really high, shooters can shoot, and they have a gun that allows them to climb up to higher platforms, droids are pretty slow and useless, and there's Anakin who just kind of hangs out and crawls into vents. There's a lot of collectibles throughout the game, mostly the studs and the mini kits lying around. There's not really a reward for it, it's just for the sake of 100%ing the game. The mini kits you collect I think build a ship outside of the hub area, but that's about it. But if you're a completionist and you want to look for them all, there is a ton to do and you will have to go back and complete some earlier levels in free mode later on. The game is extremely forgiving. There's no game overs and if you lose all four of your health, you'll just respawn right where you are. The combat isn't anything crazy, it's not rage inducing, and the boss fights generally have some gimmicks to extend them a little bit, but nothing too crazy to figure out. All in all, they made a really solid experience that's perfect for younger and older gamers alike. And you won't find any shortage of stories of people who played the game with older siblings or parents as kids. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not crazy about the LEGO games. I have fun with them, but I have fun with them when I play with other people. It just feels too repetitive and going through the motions to play on my own. I feel like I'm just doing the same things over and over, trying to make jumps but the camera's a little bit weird, taking down enemies one by one while my 17 companions decide to stand there and do nothing. 
With a friend, you get to mess around, kill each other for fun, screw with each other, make fun of the movies. Maybe this is because as a kid, I spent hours with my best friend messing around and we would just duel each other in the cantina. So maybe just playing on my own feels a little bit more lonely. I'm not saying if you're playing the games alone that you're doing it wrong by any means. I just don't see the point of it for me personally. I think it's possible I've already reached the peak of the LEGO game experience, which was playing co-op as a kid. But hey, I've actually been thinking about making a what makes LEGO games good video on my second channel. So let me know if that's something you would be interested in seeing. And maybe I can prove myself wrong. Maybe after the LEGO Star Wars games, the games get better as a single player experience. When I was looking at the Wikipedia list of games for the Game Boy Advance for this video, I saw LEGO Star Wars and I looked up some gameplay. I initially thought, well, it's not very exciting, but maybe I can put it in an early section, talk about it for three to four minutes, a lot like Crazy Taxi. But then I stumbled upon a video by The Kitty Doll, who made a video called LEGO Star Wars for the GBA is the greatest game of all time. And when I clicked on the video and I immediately went to the comments, I was surprised at how fondly people remembered this game. Surely it was just a worse version of LEGO Star Wars, right? And then I watched the video and realized the title was definitely a joke and he's just bashing on the game the whole time. But nostalgia is definitely a powerful thing. So let's see what all the fuss is about. LEGO Star Wars on the Game Boy Advance is an isometric game, again, with a much larger emphasis on combat and significantly less on puzzles and platforming. At least, good platforming. I think the first section alone, I killed over 70, 80 enemies, which is probably more than the entirety of Episode 1 in the regular game. The game feels very awkward and stiff. I know I say stiff anytime I play a handheld game because of the D-pad, but it's even more stiff than you would expect. Much like Boulder's Gate, you kind of walk along an imaginary grid space, which again makes sense, but the perspective can get really confusing because of the platforming. I already had problems with the platforming in the regular LEGO games. This Jar Jar jump made me want to just flat out quit and stop right here. And it turns out there's literally no reason for it, I was just collecting extra studs. Because of the isometric design, it can be super unclear as to where you're meant to go, so you might think you're progressing the plot, but you're actually just getting some extra things that you don't need. The game actually functions quite a bit differently than the regular LEGO Star Wars games. Firstly, you have way more hearts than you do in the original, but if you die, you die in real life. No, 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 you, you just go back to the beginning of the level. However, it is absolutely relentless. Paired with the fact that you will constantly be surrounded by several enemies and take shots to the back that you can't really avoid, this game can be pretty brutal. I'm not opposed to a checkpoint system, but when you have no guidance, limited field of view, die, and then have to restart all the way from step one again, it's very hard to justify continuing when it wasn't even that enjoyable of an experience the first time around. You still have your regular force powers to build objects, mostly platforms that you'll need to jump around, but beyond that, any aspect of puzzling is pretty much gone from the game. The most you'll need to do is walk on some buttons on the floor to open a door. One thing that I actually thought was really cool about the game was that each character receives unique force powers, and you have a lightsaber bar that depicts how much you have left. It seems to recharge pretty fast to the point where I never really noticed it dropping, and annoyingly jumping and ground slashing counts as using force, but using the force to build items does not. Just want a little consistency. Obi-Wan has force push, which is the default Jedi move in the base game while Qui-Gon Jinn has the ability to go invisible to enemies. Jar Jar doesn't really have anything, but he's actually given a weapon at least, being able to throw some boomas, meaning he can actually kill people in this game and he has to kill a lot. I only played for about an hour, the platform was just really annoying me, and on a few occasions I made it to the end of levels just to get killed and then have to restart, which would have made me rage as a child. I actually gave up at this R2 gliding section because I just could not for the life of me figure out what I was meant to do and I had other parts of this video to make and I did not want to waste any more time here. The game lacks direction, 
a lot of direction, whereas the original would guide you very smoothly through a level you wouldn't find yourself getting lost, it was pretty obvious where you were meant to go. This game will drop you in a large open zone and give you no indication as to what to do next. I know that I need to rescue Padme who is in the wrong outfit, and once I have her, there's no arrow or even a mini cutscene to tell me what to do next. I guess you could be all, well, the game is harder and doesn't hold your hand, blah blah blah, I don't like quest markers. But there in itself lies the problem. That's never been what the LEGO franchise games are about. It's a family game. It's for kids. I think the game is fine just because I don't like calling a game bad. It's definitely not as forgiving as the original, and if I had to really narrow down my criticism to one thing, it's probably that the game doesn't necessarily feel like it needed to be a LEGO game. Even the graphics for LEGO pieces don't look as nice as I maybe thought they would. Honestly, if this was just a stylistic Star Wars game that had nothing to do with LEGO and played exactly the same, it wouldn't change my opinion at all. It just doesn't feel like it has the LEGO-ness to it. But I also understand that they're under limitations and obviously for branding purposes they wanted to name it LEGO. I just can't get over why they made it so much harder. Luckily there weren't many LEGO games on the Game Boy, and when the DS came around it was much more capable of doing the 3D LEGO style that we were all craving for. LEGO Star Wars on the DS, while a much more faithful recreation, actually makes some pretty interesting choices that take advantage of the second screen on the DS and make the game feel like a separate experience. The maps are pretty much the same as the original game with little differences and tweaks here and there. I don't know if something like importing the maps over was a thing they could do, obviously not straight importing but you know what I mean, repurposing the old ones, or if they just had to completely rebuild everything from the ground up but if they did they did a pretty good job and as you're playing along you'll definitely notice little parts of oh yeah this is just like that moment in the other version. While you can only have two characters with you at a time, you can freely switch between any of them at any point. I like this already, it means if you need to switch to a droid, it won't take several hours of walking over to the button once you've switched. Yeah, I know that's an exaggeration, but trust me, you have no idea how nice it feels just to be able to switch once you're already in front of the button. The controls feel very similar to that of a console version, with the biggest difference being how your character uses the force. Instead of just holding down B or whatever button to make a pile of bricks go through its course, you need to use the bottom screen and kind of swish around to find out exactly what you need to do. What's really interesting here, at least for me personally, is that the game tutorial specifically mentions using your thumb to swipe, which makes sense because holding a stylus and playing sometimes at the same time is a bit of a confusing task. But I also can't ever recall seeing a game straight up recommend using your fingers instead of the pen. Not that we didn't do it anyways. I am obviously playing on emulator which does make it a little bit difficult because I'm using a mouse but overall, credit where credit is due. The game uses the second screen and with a lot of DS games, most just use that as a mini map or stat screen. I'm not saying this is perfect, sometimes it does feel a little bit weird and clunky like you're not exactly sure what motion you're supposed to make, but like I said, I prefer it better than just pressing B and it's using the screen that's there. The other thing the game does is mini games when a droid opens a door. It doesn't seem to always do it, but you'll be pulled into some really basic mini games, mostly just matching brick to brick. It feels a bit Bioshock hacking-esque and some people will argue, oh it takes away from the game or it distracts from the experience, but honestly I never find myself being annoyed at little things like this that are just easy, fun ways to extend the gameplay experience and add a little bit of variety, make it feel like it's not just as easy as pressing a button because it shouldn't feel as easy as pressing a button. And we're talking about Lego Star Wars here, it's not exactly the highest form of art in video games. The game did cut out some maps and others will have sections that look pretty much entirely unfamiliar, but for the most part it very much feels like a handheld version of LEGO Star Wars with some extra things on the side to keep you on your toes, which I'm sure people will appreciate if you've already played the original ones to death already and you went out and bought this one. 
It's not perfect by any means. It does tend to lack some direction. There are sections where you'll have to kill everyone before advancing, but the game doesn't really make that clear. Episode 1 only has 4 levels in it, and 2 of them are Naboo, although they are a tad different from the base game, and Jar Jar was completely cut from the game, 0 out of 10, don't at me. The pod racing scene is also a bit interesting because sometimes with DS games they have one seamless screen and then the bump in the middle kind of creates the space in the middle, but this game seems to have factored that in and it leaves a gap, which makes playing this on emulator look like this, which is pretty headache inducing, and if I didn't snipe it at the very end like a complete boss in the last second, I probably would have just given up there. There's also a PSP version of LEGO Star Wars, but it's not really worth mentioning because it's pretty much the exact same as the base game. Overall, I think the DS is leagues ahead of the Game Boy version, and there's a cynical part of me that kind of says, eh, why did they even bother to make a Game Boy game in the first place? But really, this series has always been targeted towards a younger audience, and it would be foolish not to go in that direction. I think the best way to describe it is that it just feels a bit misguided. Honestly, as much as I mentioned in the intro that it could have been very easy for some of these companies to cop out a bit and just create some sort of basic side-scrolling platformer, I kind of wonder if this game might have been perfect for that. I think one of my favorite parts about the LEGO games and one of the reasons they feel so fun to play is the movement when force users jump. It really feels like you're just floating around. And had they transferred that kind of a jump to a 2D side-scrolling game and put that on the Game Boy instead? I don't know, I'd be curious to see how that would have performed because I, that sounds fun to me, but I don't know anything about game design. What we got was a bit of an isometric platforming nightmare with the difficulty amped up to a level harder than anything in the original, and when your target audience is younger kids, that's just not ideal, unfortunately. Continuing on the Star Wars train, one of the most popular Star Wars games of all time has to be Star Wars Battlefront 2. It doesn't matter that they remade it, it doesn't matter if they make 400 more Battlefront games like the originals, they will pretty much never replicate the magic that the first game brought and the second game subsequently improved on. There was 10 years in between the last PlayStation 2 Star Wars Battlefront game and the EA remake, which personally I've never played, so for a really long time, Battlefront 2 was all we had. Whether playing on PC or keeping the old PlayStation 2 around just to play what's now considered an all-time classic, back then there was nothing else like it, and even now, still. Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a first and third person shooter game which takes place in the Star Wars franchise. In terms of where it ranks in the world of shooter games, I can't really comment since I almost never play shooter games, but in terms of a Star Wars game, it is probably one of the best ever made. And the fact that I don't really like shooters like I just mentioned, but love this game should probably speak to how fun it is. There are two major aspects to Battlefront gameplay ground combat, and space battles. Ground battle places you on a map as one of four factions, the Confederacy of Independent Systems, or the Battle Droids, the Galactic Republic, aka the Clones, the Galactic Empire, aka the Stormtroopers, or the Rebel Alliance. You can't cross time eras, most likely because I didn't want people getting confused in Stormtrooper versus Clone games, so you have to stick between the Clone Wars or the Galactic Civil War, or the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy. Each faction is made up of four basic units, your standard infantry unit, a heavy soldier with a rocket launcher, a sniper, and an engineer who specializes in driving vehicles or repairing things. Each faction also has two special units, a commander unit which is slightly different for each faction, and a completely unique unit special just to them. The Republic has the Jet Trooper, the CIS have the Droidicas, the Rebel Alliance have the Wookiees, and the Empire has the Dark Troopers. Each faction also has heroes. Heroes I think are dependent on the map you're playing, I might be wrong on that, 
but after you've accumulated enough points from killing the enemy, you'll be given a chance to spawn as the hero. As a kid, this was always the coolest moment of the game, and the turning point for any galactic war you and your friends would be engaged in for several hours. Once you control a hero, each with their own unique powers and abilities, and not always Jedi, their life force will slowly start to drain if you're not actively killing enemies, and once you're killed as the hero, they will be unavailable for a little bit and can come back later. The maps are laid out to have each team start on opposite sides. In the middle are command posts, and in the most basic game mode conquest, your goal is to capture these command posts. To do so, you must clear the area of all enemies and then stand near it for a set amount of time. The first half of that time will be making it a neutral command post, and the second half of that time will be converting it to yours. This is an important distinction to make, as the benefits to command posts besides winning a game of conquest is that you can choose any command post you have complete control of to respawn from. So rushing to a far command post, holding on for dear life, and if you're lucky, managing to capture it can be a valid play. Ironically in this sense, the command posts are very similar to Dynasty Warriors bases, which I talked about earlier in this video. There are other modes of gameplay as well, like capture the flag or assault where it's just killing people, but the pure real raw gameplay of Battlefront to me and many others will always be conquest. It also should be noted that you don't have to win a conquest game type by capturing all the command posts, you can just kill all of your opponents until they have no reinforcements left, although non-surprisingly both will often happen close to the same time. Space battles are a very different vibe from the original combat of the game, but I think the variety really helps give you a break from too much repetitiveness. Each faction will have two ships available to them, a fighter and a bomber. The fighter is your standard fly around and shoot with a homing missile special, and the bomber is good for damaging the main control ship, but not much else. The main control ship is initially shielded, and you need to damage the shields and major points throughout the ship, like side turrets and communication arrays, in order to actually take the ship down. Alternatively, once the shields are down, you can actually land inside your enemy ship, and the game not only gives you this option, it actually encourages it and tells you to do exactly this in the campaign. Once inside, you can take out enemies to your heart's content. There are no command posts anywhere on the map, so anytime you die, you have to go back to your own ship and pick up a new fighter. But you'll also be able to go deeper inside your opponent's ship and attack the cooling systems, which does massive damage to the ship and makes the rest of the fight much easier. Of course, when playing multiplayer, your opponent can see that you're in there because of split screen, and so doing this successfully may take a while and even several tries. You can choose between a pilot and a pilot that's not as good but with better guns at the start of your life, so generally if you intend to land, you'll choose the latter. They'll often be fitted with explosives or something to help you out. Overall, space combat is pretty fun. I often find myself locking onto guys and shooting them with the homing missiles, but there is no cooler feeling in the world than shooting down a ship with no assistance whatsoever. Star Wars Battlefront 2 also has a story mode where you play as the clones of the 501st Legion. You start off as a clone in the war against the Confederacy during Revenge of the Sith, and eventually transition into stormtroopers of the Empire that go all the way to the Empire Strikes Back on Hoth. I love this because instead of playing as one special hero where you're the commander clone who lives for 30-40 years as the best soldier ever, you're basically playing as everyone. You're in control of everyone in the squad, in which they lose many members because it's a war, but because you're all going through the same experiences, it feels enough like you're kind of all one person. That's not a play on the clone thing by the way, but I can see why that would be confusing, but that's not what I mean. But basically what I'm getting at is that it doesn't remove the mechanic of dying from the game, something I find I have issues with when it comes to a lot of other shooter games like Call of Duty. There's also space battles in the campaign, but the game actually gives you an option to skip them if you don't want to do them. Without a doubt, my favorite memories of this game come from Galactic Conquest mode. You pick a faction and go to war for the entire galaxy. Every stage in the game is available to battle in, including battle over with space battles. And yes, it can get really repetitive if you're landlocked and going back and forth a lot, but let's be honest, the game would get repetitive if you were playing any other mode anyway, so it works. 
When you start off in Galactic Conquest, all you have is your most basic of units and things that need to be unlocked. To unlock things, you need credits. To get credits, you need to win battles and control as many planets as possible. Units aren't the only thing you'll need to buy as well, but there are plenty of bonuses that can turn the tide of battle, such as automatic turrets, take less damage, carry more ammo, regenerate health, and yes, of course, summon a hero to the field. It's a game of resource management and strategy, and you'll have to choose how to spend your credits wisely. Sometimes it's worth losing a few battles or faking out your opponent to ultimately take over and win. I played this mode with several friends for several hours as a kid, and as far as I know, I don't think you can play this online anymore, although if I'm wrong, feel free to let me know. Regardless, I would love to see more games do things like this. Even if I'm more of a co-op person than a head-to-head -head person, I would love nothing more than to play a game like this with someone one-on-one -on -one just several hours trying to take over the galaxy. So if anyone knows a game even remotely like this mode, please let me know. Alongside Battlefront 2 on the PlayStation 2 and PC, we received Battlefront 2 on the PSP, the PlayStation Portable. I wasn't originally going to cover the PSP Battlefront games because this video is more focused on mechanics, and surely the mechanics wouldn't be so different going from a PlayStation console to a PlayStation console. Ultimately, I decided that maybe they were really bad ports and that was worth mentioning, or maybe they were really good ports and that would also be worth mentioning, or maybe they changed one weird quirky thing about the games. While this video is mostly about mechanics and how companies had to switch things around to fit the portable platform, something we haven't really been talking about is when they keep the game the exact same, but have to change the control scheme to fit the new console. And so I figured we might as well use Battlefront as our all-encompassing example of how shooters go from console and PC to portable handheld games, because when I started digging around and doing my research, I actually found it extremely interesting. Now, like I said, going from PlayStation to PSP isn't that big of a transition as say something like PlayStation to Nintendo DS, as we'll see at the end of this section, but that doesn't mean there aren't going to be differences. The L and R buttons are cut from 2 to 1 on each side, so there's just one button now. And while a PlayStation controller has two joysticks on the front, one on the left and one on the right, the PSP has one. Well, it's not like a joystick, but I don't know what else to call it. This instantly becomes tricky when you're trying to port a first-person shooter, because if you've ever played a first-person shooter on the PlayStation 2, then you know that the left stick is your movement and the right stick is how you aim. While I played Battlefront for this video on the PC because I don't have my PlayStation 2 set up right now and I don't have a way to record it in decent quality either, I referenced the game as a PlayStation 2 game because I think that's probably where most people originally played the game. But even if you never had, I'm sure if you just imagine all the things you can do in Battlefront, transition that into the PS2 and then transition that into the PSP, it won't take you long to realize that we're gonna run out of buttons and we're gonna have to figure out a new way to aim. Right off the bat, before even seeing any menus, you are given four options as to how you want to play. Now, luckily you can change this mid game or play a few games and change, so you don't have to marry an option right away. There is default, which is using the stick to move, the buttons to aim, and shooting with R. Shooting with R at least feels natural, but not all control schemes do this. Basic, where you hold R to freely look around and aim, meaning you can't really move and aim at the same time. You can lock onto your target with square, so you'll always be somewhat facing the person you're shooting, and then you press X to shoot. There's advanced, which they personally recommend as the best way to utilize everything, where you move with the analog stick, press triangle to look up, X to look down, and shoot with circle. And lastly, they have Retro, which is movement on the face buttons, aiming with the analog stick, and firing on R. Before I even play, none of these look very good. I'm extremely hesitant about using the buttons in any capacity for looking because it's not going to feel natural in any way, but I decided to give each control type one game, maybe two, see what sticks. First off, I will ask, did they not want to put a second joystick? Was it considered but they didn't opt for it or was it not possible? I'd love to know if anyone else knows why they didn't put a second one on there because I feel like that's such a staple of the PlayStation controller. 
Game one with default controls where you use the buttons to aim certainly feels weird. And I will say thank goodness for a little bit of auto aim. It feels very choppy. I gave up trying to be a sniper almost instantly because once you're zoomed all the way in, you need to be way more precise than the buttons will let you be. Although I will note that I can't even play shooters with controllers anymore. Once I started playing on a PC, I just hated going back the other way in the lack of precision. Just a preference, please don't hate me. You can also see in the footage, I clearly shoot my teammates a lot. I swear it was an accident. And I'm trying to remember the controls and it's just not feeling natural to me. You also have to switch between your guns and your projectiles. So even in situations where it would be better to throw a grenade, I didn't want to be left without a gun, so I just opted to keep shooting instead. Next up, we try basic mode, where holding R allows us to aim around. This didn't feel as bad as I thought it would. I mean, it, it definitely still felt bad. The, the problem is to make any sort of quick turn, you have to stand completely still, making you extremely vulnerable. And if an enemy is running around you, well, then you're kind of screwed. You just have to hope the aim assist helps a homie out. I find with this, it's generally easier to not look up or down and literally just run in the direction of someone until your aim assist picks up and do it that way. The one nice thing about this control style is that you can shoot with a button rather than a bumper. Because they're not using all the face buttons and you shoot with a face button, you have access to your explosives a lot easier. You don't have to switch between the two, you can have them both simultaneously equipped. Next, we will try advanced controls, which the game personally recommends. Triangle is up, X is look down, and shooting is the circle button. Honestly, not nearly as bad as I was expecting. It's definitely a bit odd to get used to at first, and you can't move and strafe to the left while shooting forward at the same time. At least if you can, then it wasn't very instinctual for me, but it's definitely playable. When you walk in any direction anyways, you tend to turn in the direction that you're moving, so you don't really need the left or right buttons to move around. Again, the aim assist is also pretty nice here. You only really need to look up or down when you're near slopes anyways, and not all maps have that. Last is retro, and honestly, I can say this was the one I was most hesitant about, but none of the others even compare to how good this one feels. It's a bit weird at first to get used to because you're aiming with the left stick, which 20 years of gaming has not prepared me for. But once you get down the idea that all you really need to do is hold down triangle to move forward, the rest is in the bag. You can strafe, easily access your grenades, the aim assist fills in those little gaps for you. It's just so much more precise and the option that makes the most sense to me. In my opinion, when it comes to this, I would rather be able to aim more precisely than move more precisely, and that's exactly what this gives you. And you can walk and aim at the same time, which some of the other ones make it a little bit difficult to do. Honestly, I don't know why this is called retro. This should have just been basic. There's also an option to play first person mode, and my mind immediately read this and went, well, that would be kind of weird because Star Wars Battlefront is a third person shooter. Then I realized, all the footage I captured for this was on PC, so it was first person. And it was at this very moment writing this script that I realized that the PlayStation version is third person, but the PC version is first person. I can't believe I never realized this until now. Anyways, first person honestly feels fine, it works fine. The only thing is the aim assist will sometimes kind of drag you in weird directions, so maybe I would turn that off. Also, if you're going to do any sort of space travel, it was very weird driving a ship in first person, something the PC version doesn't even do. In general, the controls do take some time to get used to, and honestly, I don't think I'd ever play the game as like a sniper, but I don't know if I'd ever play as a sniper in any console shooter, to be fair. If I bought this game expecting a not great version of Battlefront, I would be pleasantly surprised. This is 100% playable. That doesn't mean there aren't glaring issues, and notably, the AI is the biggest one. The first few rounds I played were on normal difficulty, and I won every game in a matter of 2-3 to three minutes. The AI weren't protecting command posts, they weren't trying to capture mine, and my team's AI would have half the battle finished by the time I figured out which control scheme I'm on. I eventually switched to Elite, which me and the word Elite in the same sentence in any circumstances is laughable. 
and it at least becomes a little bit more even, but more or less it's not too hard of a game. I get that with the hardware limitations, you can't have too many enemies on the screen, and I guess they set it to 75 reinforcements because they figured if you're playing portably, maybe you didn't want to stay on the same map for too long. But the PC version gave us the option to add more reinforcements. It would have been at least nice to have that option if we wanted a longer game. Space combat is pretty much exactly what you'd expect. It controls very smoothly and feels exactly like the PlayStation 2. It's a little bit slow and maybe space feels a bit empty, but it is space and overall I was pretty impressed with it. There is no campaign, but there are three challenge modes you can do. The first one is Imperial Enforcer. You're basically sent down to kill a bunch of native species that live on the planets. The first one was the Gungans on Naboo, which was very easy considering the Gungans insisted on blowing themselves up with grenades for me. The second was Jawas on Tatooine, who were a bit more annoying. And the third one was Ewoks, and oh my god, the noise was constant. The grenades, they kept knocking me down on my ass. Seriously, play this level and suddenly Return of the Jedi makes way more sense. By the time I got to the last one, I was just searching forever. He was hiding and nowhere to be found. The second mode is Rogue Assassin. I believe you're on the side of the Empire trying to kill deserters of the Empire. It's all pretty easy and straightforward. You have targets to kill, they have bodyguards. It's a little bit more shooting and you might die a few times, but it's nothing insane. The guys you're looking for are also marked with giant arrows and there's no place for them to hide. In fact, most of them will straight up run towards you in those situations, so pretty easy. The final challenge mode is Rebel Raider, where you basically pick up items that are scattered throughout the map like Capture the Flag style. It's again pretty basic, everything is marked out very clearly. Most of the time there are multiple of the items and they're dropped very close to where you need to actually drop them off. And you can completely avoid combat and just keep running. There's also one where you need to board a ship and keep going back and forth and that's kind of the part where I noped out. Lastly, we have Galactic Conquest, and you know how near and dear this mode is to my heart, and I gotta say, I'm impressed. There were obviously some minor changes made, but they really cut nearly nothing. If I had this game as a kid, I would have gotten in trouble so many times because I was playing games instead of sleeping. I mean, I I did anyways, but now I it's a career, I get paid for it, so take that mom. The maps are mostly the same as Battlefront 2, just scaled down to be a little bit smaller, which I don't really mind because overall there are less people on both sides, so it makes sense to make everything a bit smaller. Overall, I went in very much expecting an absolute tire fire of a game. I know online play was also a big part of this, something I can't really replicate or comment on, but considering how much it feels and plays like Battlefront, color me impressed. Like I said at the beginning of this section, originally I wasn't even going to cover the PSP games because I thought maybe they would be too close to the real thing, and then I said, well, what if they're really bad, and then they ended up being really good, so I'm glad ultimately that I covered it, because I think this game might be setting a gold standard for taking your game to handheld and working within your limitations. Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron, on the other hand, is not the gold standard. One year later we were given Battlefront, Renegade Squadron, the first non-numbered Battlefront game. And while Battlefront 2 was a faithful adaption to the source material, they made some strong choices here that while in some cases enhanced the experience, in many others it kinda diminishes it in my opinion. There are only two control options here, default and alternate. Default is X to shoot, square to throw grenades, triangle to zoom in, L to jump, and circle to roll. You'll notice there's no aiming up or down. That is only available in the alternate controls which are similar to the default controls of the last game. I don't like to use the word unplayable when talking about games unless there is a literal issue with the game itself preventing it from being played, but alternate controls are borderline unplayable. In Battlefront 2, if you just naturally turned a direction while moving, you'd at least still be turning in that direction. But in Renegade Squadron, you will only ever face one direction forever until you move. You'll notice also it's pretty slow. I didn't have any of the sensitivity options up. I think that's something that you can maybe change. But the biggest issue is this little snapback thing that it does. 
I guess it wants to constantly center your vision. It doesn't want you accidentally getting caught looking all the way up or down at the floor, but it does so when you're literally in the middle trying to shoot. Not only that, but it snaps you higher than the soldiers you're trying to shoot, so suddenly you're looking at the tops of everyone's head, and it makes you unable to see everything that's going on around you. You can literally see in some of these clips, I'm just experimenting with it, and my mind is being blown at the fact that they let this happen. And while default controls are better, it's not by much. You move around with the left stick, and in order to aim at anyone, you just have to hold the right button, which will automatically lock you onto your opponent. You can technically try to do this without holding R, but if you encounter one slight hill, you're pretty much done for. It's not going to work out well for you. You're just going to miss everything. Taking the aiming out of a shooter game is definitely some sort of a choice, especially when they gave you four pretty decent options in the last game. While maybe they weren't the four best options, I can't imagine someone determined to enjoy the game couldn't find at least one of those modes tolerable. Overall, it feels like one of those games where the primary combat is melee, but sometimes you can kind of pull a gun out and shoot people, and they don't really have a way to make you aim, so you kind of just lock on automatically. I guess like Fable. Fable's probably the game I'm thinking of. Surely you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Does anyone know the weird specific niche I'm talking about? Anyways, what does Renegade Squadron offer the player? Well, it has a customization mode for start. There are no longer classes in the game. There are just three body types for each faction. Each body type has three different heads. You can change color schemes and do whatever you want. Just keep in mind if you do this, your options will stick even if you're not playing as that faction but against them, leading me to having a few matches where my white clones were shooting white droids, which admittedly was a tad confusing. The class system has been removed entirely and now you have loadouts where you just deal with your character's individual items. You get your choice of two weapons, an explosive, a special item such as a shield or jetpack or auto turret or just more ammo, a power up similar to commander abilities from the base game such as increasing damage output, reducing damage intake, going faster, recovering health. And lastly, you have health, speed, and command post capture rate, which can all be upgraded. Each loadout has 100 credits, so you can't just take all the best guns and best items, you'll have to prioritize. Personally, I went with one good weapon, the Bowcaster, a wrist rocket for better accuracy on my explosives, and then I just maxed out my health and upped my speed as far as I could go. I almost never found ammo to be an issue in this game with all the enemy drops, so your ammo and your extended health bar will keep you alive for a long, long time. I don't mind this, I just wish you could maybe save more than one loadout. It's pretty inconvenient to switch in the middle of a game and reconfigure all your credits and points and can take you right out of combat in the moment while doing so, but overall it's kinda cool just to be able to select what you want and look however you want. That being said, it also doesn't feel very Battlefront, and the classes tended to be a pretty big part of the game. If this was only available in campaign mode, I would understand it way more. In terms of instant action, almost every map in the game is brand new to the franchise, which is cool to see, although somehow they are even smaller than the Battlefront 2 PSP maps. On almost every map, you can see one command post from another, and the AI is somehow even worse? They will almost never march or try to take command posts, opting to stand around and wait for you so they can defend theirs. Should you come into their base and say, capture a flag, they will not even attempt to chase you back. Some of the maps are very odd to navigate, but the size really tends to be the biggest issue for me. Space battles are kind of a waste of time, you can't destroy anything once you're inside, it's ridiculously easy to get inside because the game has an auto dock feature, so you don't even have to do anything, just press the button and let it sit around for 30 seconds and it'll just, it'll just put you in the ship, that was the hardest part of the old one. I literally got inside and stood next to an ammo droid and launched wrist rockets at every respawning troop until my team won. At least it tells you on the minimap which parts of the enemy's commander ship has been destroyed and which hasn't, but unfortunately it doesn't tell you the health of anything you're shooting, making it all a bit pointless. Am I being too harsh? Perhaps. But did they do it a year before and better? Absolutely. 
I know perhaps they didn't want to just keep reusing the same system over and over again, but if it works, why change it? Something the game adds that Battlefront 2 PSP did not have is a campaign. You play as the unit known as Renegade Squadron, acting under the command of Call Sarah, a friend of Han Solo's. What's incredibly annoying about the campaign is that the first few stages all act as a tutorial, even if you said, no thanks, I already know how to play. And it is the most tedious thing ever. You do a small task, he tells you to switch your loadout. Do another small task, switch your loadout again, repeat, back and forth. Most missions involve eliminating certain targets, holding off enemies for a certain amount of time, or retrieving items and bringing them back home to the base. I'm not really sure where I stand on a campaign mode. At one point, I really like just, hey, you're in this battle, win the battle. But I also understand why some people would feel the need for more and want individual tasks so it's not just playing combat over and over again. I suppose it's something to do, but I would be 100% more compelled to actually finish it if it had Battlefront 2's control system. Unfortunately, going from that to this just doesn't feel very good, and I can see why some people felt that maybe it was a step back. There is a Galactic Conquest in this mode as well, but it's a stripped back version of what we've already seen. You and your opponent both control planets and how many troops are assigned to each planet, which of course will also cost you credits. You start off only being able to assign 50 troops to a planet, but you can buy tech under three different categories. Logistics, which can increase how many troops you have on a planet. Infantry tech, which will make you take less damage and also allow you to unlock heroes for battles. And the last tech is space tech, which unlocks more ship types for space battles. You can also unlock commanders, who give you special bonuses as well, such as troops dealing more damage, more credits per planet per turn, costs reduced, and even more moves on the board per turn. In the traditional game type, all of your fleet were on a ship. Here, when you attack another planet, you're using the troops from a nearby planet. You have to leave some troops behind, so at most, if you and your opponents have the same logistics level, you'll always be at least 10 troops behind. There's no troop bonuses or battle bonuses or anything like that. It's just a straight up battle, although you can sim and auto resolve any battle you want. So if you are greatly overpowering your enemy, you have the option to let that happen. I don't want to say it's bad because I don't think it's bad, but it is different and maybe not as in depth as to what we've seen before. That being said, I can 100% see the argument here that maybe they didn't want to put the exact same game type in. After all, it's not Battlefront 2, so technically they don't have to put in the exact same thing, and they've already changed everything else, so why not give Galactic War a little bit of a change? That logic makes sense to me, but I can also see why maybe someone who didn't buy Battlefront 2 and was hoping for a more enhanced experience would be a little bit disappointed that this was more of a step down. Overall, it may sound like I hate Renegade Squadron. I really don't, but I don't see myself ever playing it again. Battlefront 2 feels like Battlefront 2. It has my favorite parts of Battlefront 2. And while it's cool that it has a campaign, there's just not enough for me to recommend Renegade Squadron over Battlefront 2. If you had to pick, I would just go with the original. I really wonder if the game had an identical control scheme to the retro version of Battlefront 2, if I would like the game a lot more, because admittedly controls are a huge factor in whether or not you like a game. And while PC games are often completely customizable, PSP games did not give us this option. But now we go somewhere completely different, and in my opinion, a lot more interesting to cover. Because instead of going from PlayStation to PlayStation, we are now going from PlayStation to Nintendo. Elite Squadron is a game on the Nintendo DS and one of the games that actually inspired the idea for this video. I had borrowed it from a friend years ago and upon letting him know that I recently found it and offering to give it back, he had zero recollection of it. Upon replaying it again for the first time in however many years, I won't say it's bad, but it's not Battlefront. The game is an isometric dungeon crawling type game that's not exactly the right term but it's a very linear style of game nothing like what you would expect when you hear the words battlefront now i will say right off the bat i'm not opposed to the game not being in first or third person 
I've played some DS games before where you had to aim using the touchscreen. It's a nightmare to coordinate, so I think overall this was the right call. I think Call of Duty is one of those games that you have to use the stylus to aim. I didn't include Call of Duty because I don't care about Call of Duty, sorry, but anyways. While the game does have some instant action game types, the emphasis of the game is on single player campaign. There are no large scale team battles or anything even remotely similar to that of the original game, and here you are a single named character going through a set story. You play as X2, a force sensitive clone, but not cloned from Jango Fett, rather you are cloned from a Jedi. You and your twin brother X1 slowly rise as heroes within the clone ranks and ultimately are forced to kill your Jedi commander during Order 66. X1, your twin brother who calls you brother every sentence because exposition is important I suppose and you don't want to forget, goes full dark side, planning on killing innocent people during the Great Jedi Purge, and this causes X2 ultimately to defect from the Empire. X2 sides with the remaining Jedi and ends up going into isolation for 15 years before being rediscovered again and recruited into the Rebellion. X2 begins to deep dive into its force sensitivity, taught by none other than Luke Skywalker himself. And after the Emperor's defeat at the end of Return of the Jedi, X2 sets out to find X1, confronts him on Mustafar because that's a really original idea for a final clash off between brother-like characters, and ultimately leaves X1 dead and X2 a Jedi Master. I didn't get too deep into the story because I don't think it's worth too much dissection, but I will say that I've never been more confident in a game story being non-canon within 4 minutes of playing it. Every main character seems to know who these clones are, but they always just manage to stay out of the movie scenes. And before you say it, yes, I know most of the video games weren't canon even before the reboot, but never has a game felt more like fan fiction to me. Not to say that it's bad, it's just very tropey, even for Star Wars, which is saying something. Supposedly, this was the story for a Battlefront 3, which was eventually cancelled. And what we ended up getting here was a condensed version of that story. Which also makes sense because there's a character named Shara who's pretty underdeveloped as a character. She doesn't really do anything. Also, the funniest thing I found while researching all of this was someone saying, Yeah, I had no idea this game existed, but I was looking up original trilogy stuff on Wikipedia and was trying to figure out who the heck this X2 guy was because he seems to be in literally every battle, just off camera. Anyway, I digress. There are three modes of gameplay, on the ground shooting, in a ship or speeder, or something flying close to the ground, and then space battles. Ground battles are where most of the game will take place, and it's really not much more beyond what you see. You can do a weird dodge roll that's kinda useless, You've got a gun which you can just hold down the fire button forever with no worries of overheating or ammo, and the auto lock on feature means you hardly have to aim. Actually no, you don't have to aim, as X2 will always be pointing in the direction of the enemy. Throughout the game you'll have different classes or loadouts basically that you can choose from with stations littered around maps that allow you to choose, although some missions and parts of missions will actually force you to play as certain classes. You'll also have back to tanks and reload stations to refill your ammo, and your anti-personal weapons which also change per class. The first class you play as uses a grenade which has to be the most annoying way to throw a grenade in a game. Basically as soon as you press the button it starts to throw and it keeps going forward and forward and forward meaning you can throw at absurdly long distances. But also don't even bother trying to aim because it's not gonna happen. And before you applaud them and say, well, grenades should be harder to hit because they're so powerful, the game has an auto lock on feature for shooting. And before you say, they're not grenades, ghost boy, they're thermal detonators. To that, I say, I have made a severe and continuous lapse in my age. The game is extremely linear with constant reminders popping up of the thing you're supposed to be doing. Someone is constantly yelling at you and telling you where to walk, who to go after, how to do the next thing. Of course, it's all really just flavor text to kill all the enemies before advancing to the next part of the stage. Occasionally, you'll have mini boss fights as well. Some of these are really easy. 
General Grievous literally requires you to hit him with explosives into ships that are flying by. And then he basically goes, haha, neat, and walks away. That's literally the whole thing. Although I will say the ending boss is pretty infamous for being very hard, and most people will just end up using a gun and shooting him point blank. I'd like to tell you that the gameplay changes a whole lot once you get a lightsaber, but even then it still points you in the direction of where you want to hit. It's more or less the same thing, but with more walking. And if you look up videos of people playing the game, most of them will just continue to use the gun when possible. For the record, because I've mentioned it a few times now, I'm not blaming the DS for the lock-on system. In fact, the game is played with a D-pad, so aiming precisely in this matter would have been incredibly difficult and not worth it at all. But there are DS games that we'll talk about later that have a similar perspective as well as a lock-on system, and the games feel so much more challenging and alive and dimensional versus what we ended up getting here. I'm not saying I know what the solution is to this, but this just feels too easy. Speaking of all that, it's time that we talk about the space battles. Now, I don't expect anything remotely like the space battles we got in Battlefront 2, because that would be a little unreasonable for the DS, even though the PSP was completely capable. But I would expect to be able to at least fly up or down, but sadly, this game did not give us that choice. You are driving around on a flat plane, and all you have to do is eliminate targets. You have little homing missile things, but let's be honest, you don't really need them because all you have to do is aim at the red box in front of you, even if they're really far away, and chances are you'll hit your target and kill them because you're all on the same plane. The flat perspective has been done before in other Star Wars games. For example, Star Wars Trilogy Apprentice of the Force has a whole section but it's not hard to tell that these were executed very differently, with very different art styles, and for very different reasons. Lastly, we have this speeder section. It's not always on a speeder, but you basically have a meter at the bottom to speed up, but if you go too fast, you'll overheat and you won't be able to speed up for a little bit. Which is funny because they basically took the overheating from the guns in the PlayStation 2 game and put it on the speeders, but not the guns in this game. You've also got the occasional enemy who shows up from behind you and nicely speeds just in front of you so that you can shoot them or avoid them. There's also one section in the game where you man a turret and I mean it's nice at least you can move around a little bit but it's not a huge part of the game. I don't think this is necessarily a bad game I will say that outside of a few parts it's a very easy game and probably the most annoying part is that it's two maybe three hours long to beat. You might be thinking that's okay because at least you have free play or instant action and this is where the game really takes a big dip. The instant action is you and three NPCs, or you know, friends if you have them, playing just basic, find your friends and shoot them a lot. It's more akin to Goldeneye than anything Battlefront. The lack of armies is really disappointing, although again I understand the DS has its limitations. It's just not a substitute for the real thing, or even remotely a very fun thing to do on your own. I think that's one of two things that bugs me the most about this game. If you take the average time you're likely to play Battlefront 2 when you start that game up, that one session alone will probably last you longer than this game's entire campaign, and the one half of the instant action game you'll play before never playing it again. The second thing that really bugs me is the name of the game. This game being called Battlefront is the YouTube title clickbait of DS games. It's so detached from the original games, and I know they wanted to sell copies, but come on, it's Star Wars. I guarantee you in an alternate universe, they called this game something else, and people are demanding a spin-off because they enjoyed it without the expectations of it being a Battlefront game. I'm sure they tried to say, hey, it's called Elite Squadron, not Battlefront 3, and I'm not trying to make the argument that anyone thought it was Battlefront 3, but it feels very weird to me that they went from 1 to 2 and then made something not at all like Battlefront and called it Battlefront anyways. And now you might be thinking, well okay, we call it just Star Wars Elite Squadron, is that good enough? And if you really wanted to add a tagline to still sell copies, then you probably could have named it Star Wars Republic Commando Elite Squadron. 
This is totally off topic, but if you've ever played the original Republic Commando game, you'll know it's way more this style of linear shooter than any of the original Battlefront games. It is at least a game where you play as a singular named Republic Commando, which is not unlike this game. It could have started a whole wave of spin-offs of games called Republic Commando where we just play as different commandos at different points of the timeline. Now, of course, I'd be remiss if we didn't go back to the PSP once again to talk about the PSP version of Elite Squadron. Yes, that's right, they actually released more Battlefront games on the PSP than they did on the PlayStation 2. Right off the bat, the game controls exactly the same as Renegade Squadron, and also contains the same Galactic Conquest, except the menus are now a little bit slightly more annoying to navigate. I don't want to cover too much because it's more or less the same mechanics, but it is worth noting the campaign is the exact same story as the DS game, but actually kind of cut down and there are different parts to it. For whatever reason, the DS has way more story elements to it, and the PSP, while having nicer looking gameplay that feels more like Battlefront, just doesn't. There's a lot of it cut out. I'm sure there's a reason why, but what that reason is, I don't know. It is cool to hear some of the dialogue get spoken, I will say, and while I just went on a rant about how the Nintendo DS version shouldn't bear the name of Battlefront, this one feels a little more at home. Don't get me wrong, it still doesn't feel amazing. Again, this could just be me too attached to the PC version and not being patient enough with the handheld adaptions. The game sometimes makes some weird decisions like it wasn't thoroughly thought out all the way. For example, they take away your blaster rifle and they give you a missile launcher to take out some spider droids right at the beginning of the game, but then they don't give you your blaster rifle back, so you have to go through the entire first stage using a really weak pistol for some reason. There's also a lot of space action in the first bit of the game, which really isn't the most exciting, and the enemies don't always show up on radar, so sometimes you just have to fly around and hunt for them. I still think it's a step up from the space combat on the DS game, but maybe overall I just don't enjoy space combat as much as I thought I did. Honestly, it feels great on PC, so maybe it's just console space fights I don't like. I don't really know. I don't want to feel like I'm being unfair. There are some parts that are really messy. They clearly tried to make it more of a story mode. So for an example, there's a Grievous fight where Mace Windu hands you a staff and you have to fight alongside with him as if you had a lightsaber, but you can't really tell what's happening. You're kind of just pressing X until you win. And then more Magna Guards showed up and then they disappeared right after. If this was really meant to be Battlefront 3 and they just smalled everything and dumbed it down, I can see why maybe they had a hard time choosing what to keep and what to ditch but it just feels a little incomplete. They basically had to cut things down from the PlayStation version to make the PSP version, and then they had to cut down from the PSP version to make the DS version. I think it just goes to show how much of an advantage the PSP having a joystick was, although in terms of Nintendo DS versus PSP, I know it wasn't really that close of a fight. And what we have left is two incomplete pieces of the same game. So, if anyone is listening, remake the DS story with the PSP gameplay, release a console or PC version, or heck, even a 3DS version or Switch version, whatever, and you're welcome. Someone will buy it. I think in the vacuum of all Star Wars games, this is definitely on the weaker scale. Now, if you enjoyed the game, that's fine. I can appreciate it for what it is. I still enjoyed playing it, but it wasn't like a mind-bending experience that I had to tell all my friends about. Don't let my negative thoughts about the game take away any of the enjoyment the game brought to you. There is still charm in this game, and of course any story told in the Star Wars universe is fun to watch and go through the first time. Maybe if I played this back in 2007 when it came out, I would appreciate it and love it for what it is. But now, in 2023, I'm just not sure it could possibly hold up to the nostalgia of a childhood classic name like Battlefront. To end off our Star Wars section, let's go ahead and talk about the Force Unleashed games and their few handheld ports because they all did some pretty interesting things. The Force Unleashed games always just felt like the ones that got away from me. 
Being a huge Star Wars fan and loving a lot of the games, you'd think I would have been all over this, but I attempted to play at two different points in my life. The first time, my Xbox entirely broke, and the second time, my PC was just not strong enough to run the game because I wasn't really playing a lot of games, so my PC wasn't that good. The first Force Unleashed game came out in 2008, which if you're about my age and you remember what it was like then, it was kind of an odd time to be a Star Wars fan. Everything was so popular because of the movie, but the last movie had come out three years ago, the last Battlefront game came out three years ago, at this point we were pretty convinced we weren't getting another of either. The only property running at this time was the Clone Wars cartoon, which if you weren't interested in that, and initially a lot of people weren't because the movie wasn't that good and it wasn't the highly regarded series that it is today, then The Force Unleashed was kind of the only chance you really had to have a brand new story set in the Star Wars universe. Star Wars The Force Unleashed is the story of Darth Vader's secret apprentice, continuing on with the idea that the rule of two is always meant to be broken, as Vader intends to use his apprentice to take out remaining Jedi, as well as eventually kill Emperor Palpatine so that he may take his place. Along with a droid and a pilot, you as Starkiller travel to several planets and do whatever Vader bids. Since Starkiller is a secret to Palpatine, Vader gives you orders that you can pretty much kill anyone you encounter, meaning you will be taking down both rebels and stormtroopers alike. I've never finished the game myself, so there's no spoilers from me here. I've actually been wanting to do some videos on Star Wars games for quite a while, so let me know if any of that sounds interesting to you because I have like 8 games that I just love to make a ton of videos on, maybe release them in May sometime. The game has two main components to it, fighting and dueling. Fighting is what you'll be doing 99% of the time, so if you don't enjoy the combat in this game, you're probably not gonna like most of this game. It's primarily the hack and slash type, very classic action adventure game with lots of tapping the same button, but once you learn more force powers, you can do a lot of combos and make it pretty interesting. The combat itself is very basic, but the force powers are really what make it fun. There's lots of abilities you can learn and upgrade. I just love throwing heavy objects around to completely decimate groups of people. The destruction of the environments is great, getting your choice right off the bat on how you want to kill people is really fun. The game starts off with a Vader section where you basically have everything unlocked and you just get to slaughter everyone, very end of Rogue One feeling. Personally, I've always loved it when games do stuff like this, it gives you a great teaser of how the game is going to feel after you get into the game, and then as long as they don't send you back too far in terms of skills and moves, you get to enjoy working your way back there. Although I totally acknowledge that that's an opinion thing, I know some people hate it when you give stuff to them and then take it away. The other thing you'll do is duels which are mostly boss fights, basically being in a closed arena with a camera that doesn't change angles. It's a bit awkward, you're not always lined up with your opponent how you think you are, and these are normally reserved for, like I said, boss fights or special fights. Your opponent will have some cycles you need to avoid or counter, and once their health bar is down far enough, you'll have to do everyone's favorite mechanic, a quick time event. Honestly, I'm truly shocked that it took until this long in the video to get to a quick time event, and I'm even more shocked that it's not even in the mobile game we're talking about, it's in the base game. The exploration in between these moments is pretty linear, although there is a lot of open space. The minimap pretty much tells you where to go. There's tons of collectibles and extra things to grab if you're into that sort of thing. Occasionally you'll have a puzzle to solve, and occasionally your enemies will spawn right near a cliff and you'll get to fall down once, and you'll get to fall down twice, and you'll get to fall down three times, and you'll get to fall down eight times before you learn your lesson. It's part of becoming a true Sith Master. There's also some cool costumes you can choose from, a lot of them just being other characters you can make Starkiller look like, but I always feel weird doing this because it's too immersion breaking. Well, I'll accept this one because let's be real, this is how the movies should have ended. The game is really fun and annoyingly I've never taken the time to just sit down and finish and enjoy it and I'm gonna have to make the effort to do that, maybe I'll do it on stream someday so I can just finally say that I did it. Because I've seen cutscenes of some of the alternate timelines the game kind of fiddles with, and they look pretty sick. Please no spoilers in the comments.
There are three versions of Star Wars Force Unleashed on handheld, a PSP version, and then a DS version, and then Force Unleashed 2 also received a DS release. Surprisingly, no PSP release for that one. I obviously haven't played the sequel because I haven't finished the first one yet, so I can't tell you whether or not it's exactly the same as the first game or not, but I can tell you why when we get to the sequel DS game that it won't matter if the first game and the second game are identical, you'll see why soon enough. Starting with the PSP edition, I was honestly quite surprised to learn that they remade every level, but just slightly different. It's definitely a lot less open, more closed in and directed to where you're meant to go, although the map makes it a little easier to get lost. All the levels are pretty much the same, except everything is just a little more tightly condensed, not only in map size, but in how many enemies are on the screen too. I think the reason they most likely changed the maps is because of limitations around how many people could be on screen, and they would feel pretty empty with just a few guys scattered here and there. Gameplay wise, it's mostly similar, but with only one joystick, there are some differences. Throwing things at people doesn't feel nearly as fun or natural. It's still possible, but I struggle with it quite a lot. Oftentimes I'll start walking when I intend to be aiming something and it quickly becomes something I just scrapped from my repertoire entirely. The plus side is that they give you lightning a lot earlier and it slaps hard. I ended up using lightning for every single battle because it stuns, it does tons of damage, it chains to other enemies, and as fun as throwing stuff around is, I will never complain about just frying someone up. The cutscenes are all there and voice acted, although a lot of the locations have been slightly changed for whatever reason I'm not sure about that one. Maybe they were just in a, well we might as well redo everything mood. One thing that really surprised me is that this game actually has additional levels. Twice I played levels I didn't play on the PC console version, where Vader directed Starkiller to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant to kill Sith projections in order to further his training. This is really cool because it gives you a unique experience that you couldn't get on console, but also a little baffling that these aren't in the base game considering how cool and fun they are. What's even more surprising is that the PSP has a whole extra mode attached, the Force Unleashed mode. In this mode, you can do force duels where you can play as different characters dueling others, Order 66, which is a wave fighter to see how long you can survive, or historic missions where you can play as some other characters entirely, like Luke Skywalker on Tatooine in Return of the Jedi. I don't terribly mind these not being in the main game, they're fun, but not a make or break feature, although I'm shocked there isn't a Force Unleashed HD remake with these versions added to it. Also one really weird choice that I cannot really explain, but the apprentice holds his lightsaber more typically in the PSP version, as you'd expect him to, whereas in the console versions, he's holding the blade facing the other way because he's not like other girls. I'm not exactly sure why they made this choice, the only thing I can think of is perhaps they already had Jedi animations with the lightsaber facing forward, or with the mix of other game modes it was too much to add in. But it was kind of off-putting when I first started the game. I mean, as a kid, that was the coolest part about him. He was like, oh my god, he holds his lightsaber differently. This guy's awesome. While I do think the console and PC versions are much better, just because I really like throwing things around, if this was your only exposure to the Force Unleashed, I think you'd be very content in your experience. You've got all you wanted from Force Unleashed and then some, which is really cool. The DS version's a bit of a different story. Looking at this screen, there is a lot to process, so we obviously need to start from the most important thing. Darth Vader cannot use Force Lightning. That would just be silly. Darth Vader is a cyborg, and the lightning would almost certainly short-circuit and kill him, as it pretty much does in Return of the Jedi. This has ruined the game and the entire franchise for me, and I will now act like a child on the internet as a reaction. For real though, this game feels very uncomfortable to play. You move around with the left d-pad, and then all of your actions are done by pressing the screen at the bottom. You've got push, lightsaber throw, grip, and lightning, with striking and jumping in the middle. If you want to do any sort of combo, you just drag over two different things. Besides just how awkward it feels to play this, there's a lot of little things you start to notice. The camera is fixed on a track, making it very straightforward where you need to go, but there are brief moments where you need to look around to find something, and it's very confusing. 
On the other hand though, the puzzle elements where you previously needed to pull things away or push doors open now have the option light up, so you don't really need to figure it out for yourself, it's kind of just an action. During duels, instead of quick time events, whenever you enter Saber Lock, you'll have to drag your lightsaber to make sure it is crossing with your opponents until the meter is full. It's probably one of the cooler and more creative things a second screen has done in this video, but it's also extremely easy because the bar just moves so slow. Outside of combat, you'll also have Feel the Force events, where the bottom screen will turn into a vortex surrounded by energy orbs, and you need to drag the orbs into the vortex, but not the red ones, to complete the feat. I don't actually know if you can fail these because the story is contingent on you completing them, and the vortex will also go around the screen on its own, so sometimes it just picks up half the things anyways. The other annoying thing about gameplay is that using the force can actually go beyond your blue bar, but it will go into the negative, so you don't always have time to look when you're trying to pull off a combo quickly because you have to look down at the screen to see what button you're pressing. So sometimes you're hoping the force will bail you out and it's not there, and it's also not there for even longer than you thought it was not there for. Beyond that, it's very much just walking through and slashing away. There's not too much different. The boss fights have become way easier, a little bit more generic. Even the Vader level at the beginning, which is meant to be fun and awesome and show how powerful you are, just feels like a grind. And the Apprentice starts with all the same powers anyways, so Vader feels more like a tutorial than a showcase of strength. When it comes to creativity and uniqueness, I have no choice but to give it a solid 10 out of 10. It's certainly a unique combat system that I've personally never seen, and maybe it was just done this way to be a gimmick, or maybe they were trying to revolutionize the console and the touchscreen. But the rest of the game is mostly dumbed down, and it's kind of the barest form of the Force Unleashed experience. As I said, I haven't played the sequel, but there is a sequel on the DS, and not surprisingly they chose to go to an entirely different combat system, although I wouldn't have guessed that this is the direction they'd go. I thought perhaps we'd see a more traditional playstyle, but instead we were greeted with this. Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2 on the DS is a side-scroller and again follows the same formula of moving with your left hand and holding the stylus permanently in your right. In order to attack, you need to swipe either sideways or down. To jump, press up, and to boost, double tap in the direction you want to boost. Before we get into any other mechanics, this feels incredibly awkward, and I don't think I ever really got the hang of it. The game has a lot of platforming moments where you'll need to boost by jumping up and then dashing into that direction, but if you are already in a dash, you can't jump, and if you try to jump before the dash is 100% finished, it will not work. This combined with the fact that a lot of platforms are made so you're actually jumping to ledge grab and not land on the platform, and the fact that you need to be able to dash, then jump, then dash, so your thumb has to be able to hit both buttons kinda at once, while your other hand is free and tapping the screen to use the force, this section where you have to go fast straight up made me quit. All the footage you see is from before this level, I died here so many times, I was just done with it. In the game you have four different force powers. Push, lightsaber throw, lightning, and grip. You'll be switching between these constantly in order to get everything done. The levels basically consist of the same formula. Kill enemies, you can use your force powers if you want to, but along the way you'll see a box that needs to be lightninged to work, or a platform that you need to throw your saber at to have it fall, or a door that needs to be pushed in, or a platform that needs to be gripped into place. This is the whole game. This mixed with a combat system that tries to tell you it has combos, but really only has one that's noticeable anyways, and constantly trying to kill enemies while dash jumping, while making sure you have the right force selected, it can definitely be a challenge, but sometimes it just feels like a huge loss of momentum. You'll be slashing along and suddenly you've got to stop what you're doing, pick the right force, struggle to get the box to activate for a few seconds, fail at the jump a few times, and then you get a 25 second stretch, if that much, before you do it again. You don't even have to figure out which force to use, everything's color coded for you. It's again, a very odd choice, but not one that I think is worse than the first one. I think they're both equally weird. And I couldn't tell you which one I prefer more, although I lean towards the first one just because of the awful platforming in the second one. But they both feel uncomfortable in their own special way. 
and yet very similar in others. They're very crammed, very easy, they don't really let you explore enough, not that the main games did anyways. And while the PSP got a very faithful recreation, the DS got two watered down products that yes did use the DS's functions, but did they use the DS's functions well? Whether you feel the mechanics and controls were a good decision or a poor decision, you can't deny that these are very unique games that couldn't exist on any other platform. Gimmicky? Sure, maybe a little bit, but not the worst. The WWE games are very near and dear to my heart and a huge part of my childhood, and in fact I got into the wrestling games before I started becoming a fan of pro wrestling myself. Starting with WWE Smackdown Shut Your Mouth in 2002 as a 7 year old who really understood none of what was happening, to rediscovering the series with Smackdown vs Raw 2007 as a of course fully mature 12 year old. The games are what eventually got me into wrestling and it's still something I follow to this day. I have many memories of waking up two hours before middle school started just so I could play WWE Smackdown vs Raw 2008, only to run straight home afterwards and play again until dinner time, and then after dinner, play again until I slept. Creating my own wrestlers, playing general manager mode, creating my own universe and storylines and keeping books with all my notes in it so I could remember who beat who for what title, holding these long epic matches far greater than anything the real product could possibly produce. Just trust me on that, there was no Logan Paul in my version so therefore it was better. The WWE games have always had one major difficulty behind them. Pro wrestling matches are cinematic. While the matches aren't necessarily scripted move for move like some people would believe, the ending is of course predetermined. It's two wrestlers working together in unison to tell a story for a live audience. In the video games, wrestling is real. It's no longer wrestling for the sake of entertainment, it's just a fighting game. It's not about what looks pretty, it's about what gets you the win. And in the earlier games, it was a lot less common to have a fight that both looked good and got you the desired outcome. A standard WWE match, which I should specify this is both in the game and I guess in reality on TV as well, is ended by pinfall or submission. A pinfall is keeping your opponent's shoulders on the mat for a three count, a submission is making your opponent tap out with some sort of painful hold. There are multiple match types as well, with WWE Smackdown vs Raw featuring over 15 different one-on-one -on -one types, although some are very similar. I'm only going to cover normal matches here, I could extend it and I could do all the match types, but I think we're just going to stick with the most basic matches here because we're going to be talking a little about season modes and story modes, and normal matches are what you're going to be doing the most in those. Throughout the match, you and your opponent will have limb damage, so more moves that target specific parts of the body or head will aid you greatly, whether just generally damaging your opponent for the pin, or creating weak points to get to the submission. In this case, it's actually a little bit like a real wrestling match. There's some chemistry there, there's some intent and strategy about can I take out the arms, can I take out the legs. Eventually you'll get to the point where you can't damage a limb any further, so if you don't intend to submit your opponent, you'll likely need to spread around the damage a bit, so don't just only focus for the head or only focus on the back. You have quite a bit of freedom in the wrestling ring. You can run around, climb the top rope and jump off, exit the ring, use weapons if you're allowed, Heck, you can even use weapons if you're not allowed if you knock out the referee first. Wrestlers also have these specialties in the game that give them an all-powerful ability like stealing your opponent's finisher or getting a free break out of a submission. This is exclusive to 2008 and they kind of bring this system in and out and they tinker with it a lot in later installments, but it's not really relevant to the games that we're going to be talking about momentarily so we're not going to focus on it too deeply. One of the best parts about professional wrestling, and as well as the video games, is the finishers. You have to build momentum by using a variety of moves, and once you can, you can use your finisher. A finisher being unique to every wrestler, although some have variations of the same move, and it will attack your opponent's weak points for massive damage. 
I don't exactly know how this mechanic works if maybe there's a higher percentage of winning off a finisher or if it just deals that much damage so you're more likely to win off of it. And it is possible to win without a finisher, but in the games it's a little bit rare to do that. And in professional wrestling it's even more rare. They always like to have an emphasis on the finishers being the end of the match. It's there to get the crowd hyped up and also to set up some of those false finishes we all love so much. To get a pinfall, simply do enough damage and pin your opponent. If you're on the pin side, you'll need to simply button mash as much as you can to break free. For a submission, you'll enter a mini game where your opponent is looking for a specific spot on a lock, like for your gym locker, and the submitter will have the option of wrenching the submission or not. The opponent won't tap out if they're not being wrenched, but if you wrench the whole time, you'll run out of stamina and have to let go, so you kind of have to go back and forth. But if they are damaged enough, then you can just wrench once and you're good. There are four main game types to do outside of just holding tons of regular matches that don't really mean anything. GM mode, where you get to play as a GM and compete against AI or friends to see who can create the best show. This is probably one of the most popular modes in the game that doesn't involve actually playing the game, and after 2009, it was removed for many years for no real good reason, and eventually it was only brought back, ironically, because of a gaming channel owned by WWE wrestlers who made it so popular by playing the old versions again. Now that is true power to the people. There's tournament modes where you can play random tournaments, either existing ones or ones you've made up. There's Hall of Fame where some are unlocked just by doing certain tasks, like win certain tournament or match with such and such wrestler, or you can recreate classic all-time main events in WWE history. And winning these will unlock things within the game, sometimes characters or movesets or more costume options. The last one and the one we'll focus on the most here is 24-7 mode, or Become a Legend, where you can use any wrestler, or your created one, and go through a year of being a WWE wrestler. I didn't touch on creating a wrestler before, but my favorite part of any wrestling game is getting to create my own wrestlers and perform with them. It's great because now I have a chance to show the world how I feel on the inside. And no, I don't want to talk about it. And no, I don't think I need therapy. Getting to create a wrestler's look, their entrance, their finishing moves, Heck, even creating a customized championship belt for them, I think is where the WWE games shine the most. Most wrestling fans at one point or another have wanted to be a wrestler or fantasized about it on the backyard and the trampoline. And playing to this advantage by making a mode where you get to be an original character amongst your heroes is exactly the thing these games should be playing off of. And while maybe the games don't do it amazingly well, to their credit, they do make it a main focus. But let's talk about 24-7 mode, the main feature of this game. You will start off as an unsigned wrestler with two choices, either SmackDown or Raw. This is the first game to introduce ECW, which was an old company that WWE had just brought back in at the time. But there were so few wrestlers on ECW, they don't actually let you pick it as a brand in this game because they were using it to debut new stars, and of course the wrestlers had to be made in the game several months before the game came out, so it doesn't really spell great things for the future of ECW, but I'm sure ECW will be around for a long time to come. Whatever show you wrestle for, you'll wrestle on that day and have the rest of the days of the week off to do whatever you want. You'll be given a multitude of things to do. You can do training exercises to increase your stats, which trust me, you will need training. You can choose to play these out or simulate these. They're honestly not really worth playing. They're pretty much just doing a normal match, but told to do X move Y amount of times for five to 10 minutes and doing it will just make it feel like the game takes forever. You can do skill improvement, which costs money and focuses on out of ring activities, basically training you to cut better promos, which is completely irrelevant in this part of the game, or recover from injuries faster, which is also kind of completely irrelevant in the game. And then you have events and activities, which are things like fan signings and publicity stunts. This one's kind of funny too, because one of the plot lines in the game is that there's a big match to determine who gets to be the hero in a WWE produced movie. And one of the options in this part of the game is to be in a hero movie. 
So apparently it only takes one day to film an action movie, and I don't really see what the big deal is. Almost all of these activities will give some form of fatigue to your wrestler, which makes getting injured way more likely, but at the same time you can't miss matches because you're injured, so it just means you have a harder time winning battles and fights. There's a few options you can select that will not increase your fatigue, but they are for minimal gain, so it's almost not really worth it. And there is an R&R option where you get a massage to lower your fatigue, but for some reason you lose popularity with the fans, because apparently the WWE crowd is anti-massage. Beyond this, you'll kind of just go through a cycle of a couple of set stories and whatever the game tells you to do. It'll look at how popular you are, what titles you may have or not have, what allies you have or not have. You'll have to work to sell merchandise, get a higher paid contract, fight to become the number one contender, or do a bunch of other random things like fight for a movie contract. There are some storylines that only come into effect when you hold a championship, and a few for if you never get there. I think there's less than 25 or 30 in total, with each taking about two months, and oftentimes they make you wrestle the same guys over and over again, probably because of voice acting, they didn't want to have to bring in every single wrestler to do a bunch of lines, and you know, some guys weren't wrestling on TV as much, they didn't have anything better to do. My biggest problem with this is that while it is kind of nice that it's fluid and not just one set storyline so everyone has a different and unique experience, the stories don't really connect that well together. In fact, sometimes the stories don't even connect with themselves. In my first month, I won a number one contenders match and I never got a shot for the championship. In other parts of the story, I would win the match and then the game would act like I lost. So if you can just ignore that and play the game, you'll probably be fine, but don't look for any story cohesiveness because you won't really find it. There's a guy that you could hate one day and then he's your tag team partner the next and that's just kind of how these things go. There's a few choices or decisions, but nothing that really affects the outcome of how your story goes unfortunately. And this definitely improves in later games before eventually taking it all away and then adding it back and Truthfully, I haven't followed any of the WWE games that closely, but I know there's been some less than stellar additions to the story, and I'm looking forward to playing them again eventually. I'm not going to spend any time on the Game Boy games or PSP games, mostly because the PSP games look and feel very similar to that of the console games, or just missing a few buttons. And the Game Boy games are kind of just a return to form, like the old 2D sprite pixel wrestling games of the NES era or something like that. There's only two buttons available, it's just not that interesting to me. But the DS has lots of buttons and two screens, so that's pretty cool. Let's check those out with SmackDown vs. Raw 2008, 2009, and 2010. Being a big fan of wrestling as a child, and of course my parents knowing as much because they had to pay for all the things that I wanted like pay-per-views and action figures, I was gifted WWE SmackDown vs. Raw 2008 on the Nintendo DS to play WWE portably, and I remember being excited and then kind of disappointed, but then I actually played the game for quite a while before I hit a point where I just had to stop. Before we get into the games, just like every other DS game on this list, I am playing on emulator, so I'm playing with my mouse which I'm hoping will give a similar experience to that of a stylus. Right off the bat, SmackDown vs. Raw 2008 on the DS was always going to be different. Because let's be honest, we pretty much know which features are going to end up being cut right away, and which ones are not. And the list won't surprise you in the slightest. There are no ladder matches, there are no big rumble matches, or tag matches or any matches that have more than two people. You cannot create a superstar, there is no GM mode. You only have two different ways to play. You have free play mode, which is just matches, and you have season mode. And of course, the structure of the match is completely different. The entirety of the wrestling match and even the game is played just using the stylus. You don't have to press a single button in this game. In any situation in the ring, there are three options given to you. A light option, a medium option, and a harder option. The light is generally a strike, just involve tapping it and then swiping in the direction it gives you. A punch, a kick, nothing that will get you out of the position you're in, but enough to kind of mess your opponent around a little bit. The medium and heavier ones will require a lot more work. Spinning in a circle, tapping multiple times, swiping multiple directions, 
swiping the same direction multiple times. You can technically back out once you've selected your move, but it's better to just commit to what you've picked because your opponent will also be doing all of this exact same thing and chances are they will just pick one thing and complete it before you have a chance to go back and select the right move you want. It can be a little bit tricky because sometimes you just never really know what you're going into until you select it, but surprisingly, you actually start to get very familiar with the moves and the situations, and slowly you'll start memorizing certain moves. And oftentimes for me, I just keep picking moves that I know are easy to do and I can do them quickly. As I mentioned, your opponent is invisibly going through all of these choices as well, and I can only imagine how hype this would have been playing against another person if only I had friends growing up. Every situation in the game has these options, meaning if you are the wrestler on the ground or you are being grappled in a headlock, you can do light strikes to interrupt your opponent's process. You can do your own medium and heavy attacks to break free and reverse, putting you in an advantageous position. There's always a chance to reverse and get back on top in every situation, and it makes the game feel like a mix between a chess match and agility contest for writing with a tiny pen. Once you've done enough damage to enough of your opponent's limbs, you can pin your opponent, which just becomes a tapping spam challenge, or you can submit them, which is just rolling a circle around until the red bar is full. The only way to really slow down the opponent to make this possible is to get more than one part of the body red meaning if you're just doing the same moves over and over again and you're just hitting the head that's already red, you're not really doing much of anything, you will have to switch it up. So I suggest finding at least two moves, damage the head, damage the body, and go on from there. This is basically what every match is. I played this game a decent amount as a kid, but always had lots of difficulties. First off, you can only spam tap so fast before you accidentally miss the mark, or you're shaking your DS around and you almost break your screen because it really starts to hurt your wrist after a while and you're inadvertently putting way too much pressure on the screen because, you know, all of us hit buttons and press them too hard. It's the same thing with the screen. You can get full momentum in this game like you can in the original. I have no idea what it does and I don't really understand how finishers work either. Initially, I thought you could only do them once you had full momentum, which would be a really short span of time to do them in. But then after a while, you get the ability to just use your finisher as often as you want. And you can literally spam it as many times as you want in a row. Although, as I said, if it's only doing damage to the same parts, eventually there's not much of a point. But if your finishing move is a submission or goes straight into a pin, then you never know. The other thing is that finishers require specific setups depending on the finisher. And the game does not really tell you what this is because the game doesn't have names for specific situations. So sometimes you'll just finish a match without ever using the finisher because you simply cannot find it. For example, jumping off the top rope is like a six or seven step process and you can't be interrupted for any of it or you'll have to restart. You have to punch them several times and then do this and then do that and then you can make it to the top rope. But if you don't know that, you're never gonna find that top rope finisher. Personally, I recommend playing as a character whose finisher is very easy to find and access, something that can be done very quickly at neutral position, and I recommend going for pins over submissions, but if you can't really spam clicks or taps or however you're playing, what I really recommend is not playing this at all, because even when you feel like you're doing the best, sometimes it's just not enough. For the life of me in this game, I cannot break out of a pin. Submissions sometimes, but generally if I get pinned once, that's it. I can be full health and I cannot get out and I do not know why. I swipe and swipe and it doesn't seem to matter in the slightest. And since the game kind of gets harder the more you play in season mode, the more difficult it becomes to win. You basically have to play a perfect match every single time or you're done. And unfortunately, this is where I had to stop playing as a kid. The season mode isn't quite like 24-7 mode, there's really not much to do. You can talk to people, most who don't want anything to do with you. You can do a little mini workout games, which is pretty fun, they're a lot more interesting than the ones on the console version. You can power up certain moves if you do well in the mini games, or you can just let it go on auto if you can't be bothered to swipe for 30 seconds in a row. You can also collect more time in the locker room with these little time tokens or find weapons to use or you can make allies to help you in matches. You only get to walk around on match days, 
So while in the other previous version, you couldn't just walk around and talk to wrestlers whenever you wanted, here you can because they're always going to be there whenever you have control, but you lose the other six days of the week to train and do whatever you want. The story is pretty boring and basic. There's not really a story. You're kind of just being told to be a wrestler and to go wrestle people. And in the season that I played for this video, I was world heavyweight champion in a month, which should literally be the end goal for any of these games, not the first thing I do. As I mentioned before, the stories in the WWE games are always a little bit underwhelming because to tell a good wrestling story, you need wins and losses. And these games, especially back then, would not advance if you didn't win. So the only real storyline you can have is you're the guy who never loses. There is quite an expanded roster, 21 wrestlers in total, which is actually more than I thought there would be. Although most wrestlers have the same generic movesets depending on how big they are. And oftentimes you'll see wrestlers doing very odd moves that they would never do in person, but I get that you can't be too picky with something like this, they only had time to make so many moves. It's also funny because I had a match where Kane was very clearly smaller than Rey Mysterio, which in real life their size difference is closer to this. Overall, the roster is pretty impressive, it's got all your favorites from the era. However, there are no female wrestlers on the roster, which is a really disappointing. I get that female wrestling has come a long way in the last 10 years, and there are quite a few women wrestlers now that are better than most of the guys. However, there were still some incredible women wrestlers back on the roster then too, and objectively all of them were more interesting than Hardcore Holly. The game is very unique, and I definitely applaud how inventive and different they were. I would have maybe liked some difficulty settings because right now it's just way too hard to be precise. I don't know what that rhythm game is called. It's Osu, 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 that game. I'd love to see someone like that play a game like this. Get two people who have never watched wrestling before but are really good at that game and play head to head with this. Someone make it happen. Looking back at comments and reading thoughts, it seems that people do not look too kindly on this game in the past, and I understand that maybe it hasn't aged the best, but for what it's worth, I really enjoyed it as a kid. It just got to a point where it just physically was not possible for me to keep playing, and the season mode kind of loses steam after two weeks once you realize nothing is really going to happen. But I appreciate the fact that it made use of the touchscreen and made it a selling point and main feature. It's by far the most unique wrestling game I have ever seen, and a risk that I think should be applauded. SmackDown vs Raw 2009 changed up the gameplay significantly, and while I do think it's a step in the right direction, I do also have some complaints, and we'll get into that. Visually, the game started to use models from the console games, but scaled down graphically. So this game will actually look very familiar to any console players. It also has Create a Wrestler, which honestly shocked me because I thought there was no way a DS could ever handle something like this. And since I was a kid, I loved to just make numerous, numerous, very serious, very legitimate looking wrestlers for fun. And so I thought I would create what I imagine the typical Reality Escape fan looks like. I hope I did you all justice. Feel free to tweet me your cosplays of this. Or maybe don't because I would never sleep again. All the moves are still done with the stylus, but now you have the ability to move around freely with the left D-pad, including double tapping to run. We've gone from an all stylus to now a hybrid system, and this opens up the whole ring and gives you a very similar vibe to that of the console game, since you can run around and perform the strikes you want when you want to. They've basically taken the right side of the controller and turned that into motions you can do with the stylus. For example, on console, you would point a direction and press the strike button to perform a strike. Now you hold a direction and you tap the screen and that's your strike. On the console versions, you needed to flick the analog stick and here you need to draw a circle for a quick grapple or two circles for a hard grapple. Once grappled, press a direction and do the desired move. Both of these also apply for opponents on the ground and so you'll be doing some variation of circles or jabs the whole time. I often forgot this and I tried to swipe a lot instead of just tapping to hit, wondering why nothing was happening. Honestly, while I do think it is a step up from 2008, only in the sense that they couldn't possibly redo 2008 all over again, 
it does feel very much like they maybe made the controls just for buttons and then said, oh wait, we have a stylus, we should probably use the stylus, and then replaced all the buttons with just tapping the screen. To use a finisher, you just need to hard grapple your opponent and press L, the last remaining button on the left side of the DS. And then you'll use your finisher. Easy as that. It doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what the setup is, you will just automatically use your finisher, which is very, very nice because then you don't have to take a long time finding the exact situation. Unlike the last game, you can't spam finishers, you can only use it when your meter is full and blinking, which makes way more sense that they return to this given the pace of gameplay. When you're knocked out on the ground, which does happen frequently if you're me, you need to slide the stylus back and forth to get back up. It's not as satisfying as spamming buttons, but it is what it is. If you are pinned, the numbers 1, 2, and 3 will show up on the screen, and you have to tap them in order to kick out. The more injured you are, the quicker they disappear, but honestly, they kind of disappear pretty fast regardless, and you can kind of just get unlucky because you can only react so fast. I don't even know if you can tap the number 3 or not, or if the number 3 only shows up as he's counting, so you really only get two shots to kick out. In theory, it's nice, but I would have liked something a little bit more active, this just feels too luck based for me. To break out of a submission, a white body with the affected part colored in will appear, and you need to tap the affected part as fast as you can to break out and minimize damage. The body will move around sporadically on screen, and once you put someone into a submission, you'll actually get to see the other side, which is moving the body around yourself to make it so your opponent can't tap it. It does feel a little bit silly and pointless with the AI, but again, I imagine this versus a friend would be incredibly hype, and I have a feeling that's most likely what they were going for, although it probably would have been better if it was single card play. Buying the DS wrestling games already feel like such a risk, to find you and a friend both willing to take that risk, I can't imagine it happened too often. Here is my problem with the game. It's hard and I suck. I played 5 matches my first go around, and I lost every single match. And I don't know if it's the game, or just because I'm accustomed to the console games, but it's just off enough to not let you do what you want to do. When you strike and grapple, you stop moving completely and you can only do it from a standing position. If your opponent is moving backwards, they will just easily walk away, and sometimes they will catch you while you're off balance. Alternatively, with a grapple, you'll be in the middle of drawing your circles and maybe you'll be off by a split second, or you'll be an inch too far away because again, you've stopped moving while these circles are being drawn, and your opponent gets the upper hand and they happen to grapple you the second right after you try to grapple them, so they catch you instead, and oftentimes I'll be grappling and completely unsure of who the person making the move is and who's the one getting grappled. I'm not sure if it was a limitations thing or whatever made this the case, but I would have loved to be able to move and do things at the same time, because without all of the movement, it just doesn't feel very much like wrestling to me. The other major thing about this game is that there is no reversal system, which is arguably one of my favorite parts of any real life wrestling match. With the console games, a quickly timed left or right trigger press could get you out of almost any jam, and it at least felt like if you saw something coming, you had a decent chance to get out of it unscathed, which is kind of the point. It's fair. If you think someone's going to strike, you should be able to get out of that. In the last DS game, every situation is a tie-up, so reversals always had a chance, but it added to the back and forth element of the game. Here you can sometimes make vague circular motions to break free, but if you end up being thrown into the ropes, or into the corner, or knocked to the ground, you're out of luck. You're gonna get hit, or you're gonna end up in a submission, and after a few of those, that's gonna be the end of the match. If there is a way to reverse, the game does not tell you how. I don't want to be completely negative because there is a season mode which is actually pretty cool. You get to walk around backstage, albeit at a pace that's so slow that even my uploading schedule looks fast by comparison. You can talk to wrestlers, most who again are super aggressive and hate you right away. You can go to the gym, do more mini workout mini games, which I enjoy much more than the old ones, although one involved a microphone that I couldn't do. But the other ones were like keeping bars up for as long as you could, or keeping your stylus within a box. It's basic stuff, but it's a nice flavor. As for the story, I couldn't tell you because I kept losing to the same damn guy 48 times in a row. I just 
could not beat him. I could hardly get any attacks off. And thus, I never advanced the story. Which is a shame because when I lost the match, I wasn't just repeating the same week over and over. I was still advancing weeks, so I was genuinely interested in where the story was going to go. The beginning kind of hypes you up for a story. I mean, I, I can't imagine it would have shattered expectations and been incredible. But I never made it far enough to see where the story actually went. So... If you played this game and can actually win a match, please let me know down in the comments what the story is. Otherwise, I got nothing. WWE SmackDown vs. Raw 2010 was the final WWE game on the DS, and thus is the final evolution. A system that uses no touchscreen whatsoever. Instead, you just play like it's a normal console wrestling game. B to grapple, hold B to hard grapple, X to run, Y to strike. Although you can't really run and strike or grapple at the same time, so there's not much of a point in running. To pin, you just press L and cover. No mini game, and I think it's the same for a submission. Just put in a submission move and hope for the best. To get out of either situation, just spam B as much as you can. There's a little bar, so you'll actually get a good grasp of just how far away you are. And it's much easier than all of this swiping nonsense that I only say is nonsense because I'm bad at it. There still doesn't seem to be any sort of reversing system as far as I can tell, but that doesn't mean that there aren't reversals, because there's actually quite a few. I honestly just tapped random buttons because I just felt like that was the right thing to do. And the game tells you that by pressing L you can dodge, which kind of suddenly backs you up in order to avoid a grapple or a hit. But sometimes if you're in a grapple, the game will just reverse for you. Like I had my controller down at one point and I was just letting a match go. Here I'm literally moving less than someone watching Ninja on New Year's Eve in New York, and I'm still reversing these moves, so I guess I'm just that good. The thing with the game is that there's not a ton of variety in your moves, I find. Like, I barely did strikes because there just really wasn't much of a point. As I mentioned, running strikes aren't really a thing, and the one time I went to the top rope, my opponent just walked away from me and waited for me to get down, so not a lot of whipping your opponents around either. The game is really easy, and it mostly just consists of doing as many grapples as you can. I actually don't mind that they switched the control scheme. I know that this whole time I've been advocating for using the DS's features properly, but in here it feels like a proper evolution in that they went from full touch controls to half touch controls, and now to no touch controls. So in theory, if you were living in the present and you wanted to go back and play a WWE DS game for some odd reason, you'd at least have your pick of playstyles. I'd say at most it's an underutilization of the DS's potential and it's definitely playing it safe, but there's so many improvements in every other aspect of the game that this one is by far the one I played the most and felt the best to play. If you wanted a portable WWE game experience that was exactly like the consoles and you didn't own a PSP, then this was your option. This is probably the close you're ever going to get. Create a Wrestler is still thriving, which is nice. It actually has more customizations than the console game, which is kind of funny. I accidentally created some sort of Fred Flintstone abomination, and I won't apologize for that no matter how much you make me try. So go ahead and cancel me. It won't work. Season mode is back, and this is probably the best out of all three as well. It might even be better than the console version, but keep in mind I'm also comparing this to the console version of 2008, and this is the 2010 DS game. There's all new workouts yet again, but unfortunately these still don't use the touchscreen, they just wanted to keep everything to button pressing I guess. So all of these workouts are just button tapping or mashing to different timing. It's a little disappointing, but I suppose expected. Although, admittedly, button mashing on a DS isn't the most fun and comfortable thing ever when the screen is moving like crazy and you're trying to mash. You can run now backstage, thank god it doesn't take forever to get from place to place, and there's a lot of places to visit. You can do things on any day of the week including training, invading other shows, even going to the hospital to rest up. I just have to say, it is so surreal to see a setup like this with WWE characters. It feels like a Yu-Gi-Oh game, or like a Phoenix Wright game, or some other property where you get to go to familiar locations and interact with your favorite wrestlers. In fact, I'm pretty sure there is a Yu-Gi-Oh game that has a very similar setup to this. The music is really cheery and jovial and animated, and not at all what you would expect from a wrestling game with lots of evil demonic characters. Not saying it's bad by any means, it's just a very weird tonal shift from what I'm used to growing up. 
There's a lot more to your interactions with people now. You'll often get little choices on how you respond to someone when talking to them. Usually it's either be passive or be aggressive. And sometimes it can lead to a lot of backstage brawls or you'll get hurt right before a match and you have to deal with that extra damage. There's also little bits of storyline here and there that are really cool, such as I got a call from Vince McMahon telling me that he needed to see me, and then right after I got a call from Kelly Kelly and she told me she was in the hospital and also needed to see me. So naturally, I went to the hospital, where Kelly told me that it was a test and that I had failed, and then Vince called me and stole over a thousand dollars from me. Which, in hindsight, is a pretty classic Vince move. You earn a lot of money in the game, and the money is used in the shop to buy new moves and unlockable items for your create a superstar. And also, cards. You've probably seen that whole you can't use a card shenanigans if you're watching the screen right now, so I'll explain. During your wrestler's entrance, you'll get a list of all the cards available to you, and you'll be able to select up to three for your match, although I think you lose them regardless if you use them. Sometimes it's extra damage on grapples, or an instant kickout card, or it will automatically put you into a specific situation, or your finisher bar will instantly be filled. Some of them are more clear than others. I had one that said if I was down, a superstar could come and help me, but I couldn't figure out how to use it. I'm actually really surprised with how much I enjoyed season mode, and I found myself having to hold back because otherwise I'd end up recording several hours of footage for this small section that I did not need, which is a normal problem I have with any game I cover. Either way, I got to a point where I was skipping training just to get to the next story beat, but if I was playing in my free time, then I would probably be doing training every day, and that would actually extend your season time significantly just because it's a lot of time to go there and do the thing and then come back. There are moments when you're walking around and everyone is being rude as hell to you. Jack Swagger made this comment and there's no shot this is considered PG or T for teen. And for the bit I played, I got to go through a bit of a storyline where Miz and John Morrison were constantly giving me hell and trying to mess things up for me. The game also gave me some options to completely avoid some confrontations too, which is really cool. Like there's Vladimir Kozlov who wants to destroy all of ECW. And I simply told someone, I don't want to deal with it, and then I went to Raw and never had to face them. Overall, I think the fact that the game isn't voice acted like a lot of the console ones makes it a lot easier to get into because the console games always have such horrid voice acting, and I will never understand why because these wrestlers are literally actors and performers, but they can't do a voice line to save their own lives. 2010 was definitely my favorite of the three, but also it's not hard to say that it was the least adventurous of the three. However, it offers something different from the console version, to the point where if I was at home with this game and the console version, there's actually incentive for me to play this over the console versions, which I don't know if I could honestly say that about the other two. It's pretty easy, and it's nothing insanely challenging, but for a WWE game that's mostly par for the course, nothing is too intensely hard. It feels like a really great translation and import, and I'm a little disappointed that this isn't the game I had as a kid. It also is kind of the most boring of the three, because it's just another WWE game. In terms of using the console features creatively, 2008 and 2009 obviously did their jobs and created some very compelling game systems. Maybe not systems with lots of longevity, maybe they didn't age as well as others, but it makes for some nice novelty. They were fun to go back and tinker around and experiment with. If I was a kid paying full price back in the day, maybe I wouldn't be too happy, but I appreciate now that they didn't just reskin the first game and they kept making an effort. They were trying new things. Ultimately, the DS didn't last forever, so it's not like they had to keep trying to find something that worked for the future. They only went for three games and then stopped but they didn't stop trying for those three games. They could have released a 2011 that was the exact same reskin of 2010, but they chose to stop there. It's a little bit ironic that I'm complimenting the DS games for trying to invent new things when, ironically, the console versions themselves stopped doing it. In fact, the game started to get so repetitive, one game was reviewed so badly, it canceled the sequel shortly after coming out, and they took a whole year off to revamp everything. And from what I hear, the series is doing a lot better now. 
If you are a WWE fan or even if you're not and you have played any of these DS games, please let me know what your favorite systems are and why because honestly I was so impressed at what I ended up seeing. And if I missed anything, maybe the PSP systems are completely different and I just completely skipped over it. Or maybe there's a Game Boy game that I really should have looked at. Also leave a comment down below, let me know because I think the wrestling games on console aren't perfect, on handheld they aren't perfect, but there's so much of a history in these games. They've been around for so long that it's just fun to see how they tried to change the game up. Well, it occurs to me that a young generation most likely associates Spyro with the Skylander series, at least before the Reignited Trilogy came out. Many, many hours of my childhood were spent playing the original three games on my PlayStation. Spyro the Dragon, Ripto's Rage, and Year of the Dragon. For the sake of quality and ease in recording this, by the way, the footage you'll be seeing is from the Reignited Trilogy, but there's really no difference when it comes to game mechanics. Now there were three original games and we're going to cover them all before moving to the handheld games. The reason Spyro interests me so much is because they released so many handheld Spyro games. There was nine in a seven year span. And they made some pretty interesting decisions like releasing a DS exclusive but then the next game released went back to the Game Boy Advance. So I think this will be an interesting way to look at how the games evolve over a short amount of time. The plot of the first game is relatively simple. An evil gnome orc thing known as Nasty Nork has turned all of the dragons into statues and you as Spyro were for some reason unaffected so you're the only one who can go and rescue them all. I'm not gonna lie, while the gameplay is fine, it's fun, it's great, the story itself in the first game is a bit odd and clunky, but overall it factors very little into the game. You can pretty much ignore the story in this one entirely and you'll enjoy it. The dragons you rescue always end up being really vague, saying things like, all I can tell you is this, but why can't you tell me more, Nestor? Would it really hurt to tell me just a little bit more? How are you benefiting from withholding information from me? None of the dragons seem to stick around and help, they all get thanos shortly after you free them, and I'm not sure if there's a story reason for it, or maybe they all just hate Spyro, or maybe it's just a kid's game and I'm being picky. One of my favorite aspects of this game, and really the franchise overall, which surely someone will comment on how it's their least favorite aspect of it, is characters telling you how to play the game. If I'm playing a game and it's a dragon telling me to press the action button, you know I'm going to be pressing that action button. And as a kid, it felt way more engaging having the characters actually talk to you directly and teach you how to play the game. The gameplay really centers around three main mechanics, Spyro's Glide, Spyro's Charge, and Spyro's Fire Breath. Gliding is pretty self-explanatory. You get to a high point and you glide your way across. There's a few tricky ones that will take a while to get the grasp of, and if you're charging and then trying to charge into a glide, the charge will override it so you can accidentally dive headfirst into death. Otherwise, it's mostly used for platforming, nothing particularly hard or difficult, but it adds some nice dimension to all of the levels. It makes you want to climb to the top of things and fly around to see where you can land. I'm curious if the plans or temptation was ever there to make Spyro be able to fly around freely, which is something they ended up playing around with in the sequels, but for this game, I like this decision quite a bit, just being able to glide. As we mentioned before, the primary target of the Spyro games was mostly young kids, and this is simple enough for them to be able to pick it up and nothing's too hard or rage inducing. Enemies can be defeated by either charging at them or flaming them, and it's really just a trial and error when you first encounter them. You'll see enemies running around wearing silver plated armor, which to me says you'll have to flame them because the armor protects them from the charge, but it's always the opposite. It's you have to charge them because the armor protects them from the flame, and I never seem to learn this lesson. It's not the most instinctive, but it is pretty forgiving. 
Spyro can take up to four hits. Your life counter is indicated by the color of Sparks the Dragonfly who follows you around. If you die, you restart from the last checkpoint, and if you run out of lives, you just have to restart the level all over again. The game blends its platforming with its enemy placement really well. It's not uncommon to fall off a ledge trying to take on some enemies, or take a hit that you're a bit annoyed at because it feels very avoidable. I wouldn't describe the game as hard, but it's maybe frustrating at some points for sure, and you'll probably have to repeat a few sections on your first go around. Overall, the variety of enemies is slim, but for here it's fine. Most of them revolve just around timing or which attack to use. The environments are fun to fly around and see what you can find, and it's still enough of a challenge that you won't make it through the game without dying on your first playthrough, but also 100%ing this game shouldn't be too hard. It's mostly just looking around every corner that you forgot to last time. And if you're a thorough casual player, you may be able to 100% some levels accidentally without ever needing to backtrack. There are six bosses in this game. The first five are completely unremarkable and barely worth mentioning. The first is Toasty, a pumpkin-headed scarecrow which just ends up being a sheep on stilts. Very easy to beat, just charge at him and breathe fire. Dr. Shemp, he can only be damaged by being burnt in the butt because butts are funny. Blowhard, really it's just a matter of avoiding his attacks, which if you rush him, he won't even get a chance to attack. Metalhead, all you have to do here is avoid the attacks from his minions while you destroy the metal poles when they don't have that electrical charge surrounding it. The penultimate boss is Jacques, which besides the last fight is probably the hardest. Lots of platforming to chase him around, avoiding attacks as you go. Look, I got perfect on this one. Uh, ignore the rest of the clip where I immediately proceed to fall into lava. Finally, we have the Nasty Nork himself, which really is the best showcase of mechanics in this game, and this is definitely going to be frustrating for anyone the first time. This fight has four different stages to it. The first stage is chasing around after this egg thief, which we'll talk about what an egg thief is, but also this one's not really an egg thief because he's holding a key. The second stage also revolves around an egg key thief. Except this one will take you to an outside area with some sharp turns, meaning if you're not careful, you'll fall off and die, and you'll have to do the first part over again. The third stage is chasing Nasty Nork around on a set track with, again, tons of sharp turns and ways to die in it. You can't actually hit him in this stage, but basically he'll pause right where you first encounter him, and you need to make it back in time to hit him before he leaves again. The last stage is a bunch of tricky platform jumping, and the platforms are receding slowly so you need to make sure you get to him in time. Dying even at this part will mean starting from stage 1 all over again. Overall, it's by far the most challenging and hardest boss in the game, and my issue isn't that it's so hard and takes me several tries, it's that it's the only hard boss in this game. It's such a rapid increase in difficulty, and I would have liked to see them utilize these things a little bit more for the other bosses. The boss fights do add a nice touch, it kind of amps things up a little bit, but with no real story to attach you to these villains, and no mechanics made especially for these fights, they end up feeling a little bit hollow. And I bring it up only because I want to talk about how much better it is in the second and third game. If you want to do a full completionist run of the game, there is a few things you're going to need to do, and most of that is collecting the gems that are on the map. Each map has a set amount of gems, some in enemies, some in chests, and most of them just hanging out in the open. Chests will also have different ways to open them. Some can be flamed or charged, some only charged, some only flamed, and then you have to jump into them. There are occasional special chests where you need to fire off something like a cannon and have it aim at the chest to open it, and there's even a few where you need to find a key somewhere hidden in the level to unlock the chest. The hardest way to get gems, but necessary if you want to collect them all, are the flight levels. Spyro will be flying around with a timer, and you'll have four objectives of things you need to do in that time. Mostly something like flying through rings, flying through some weird electrical gate, flaming chests, and then taking down an enemy. It can be pretty difficult to get the timing right, sometimes you're just a little bit too far up or down, and you may have to repeat these a lot if you're like me to get it right. The earlier stages are pretty straightforward as to what you should do first and what comes next, but some of the later ones may have you wandering the map for a few times just to figure out what the best order of things to do is. Another thing you'll find yourself collecting are dragon eggs, the things I mentioned earlier, the thieves carrying the keys, except this time they're carrying eggs. Throughout the game there are 12 in total and you need at least 5 to beat the game. The blue thieves that carry them will run around a set course and you need to chase them down. 
As a kid, this was always the worst part of the game for me because I was just straight up chasing them. I wasn't trying to cut any corners or anything. You need to be really precise and learn the path and cut all the corners if you can in order to catch them. Sometimes you can be really close and maybe you try to flame them and suddenly lose all your momentum. So it's always better to kind of keep charging unless you're really confident. This is also where you notice how hard it is to turn while charging and how the camera will often work against you when you need to make sharper turns. Overall, it's not bad and this is a mechanic they bring back in the later games and we see it a ton more. The first Spyro game left a very decent impression on me, but it's probably and understandably the weakest game of the original three. Pretty much everything I didn't like about it was the focus of change and improvement in Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage. And to this day, it's the one I have the most fond childhood memories of playing with my friend every day after school until we finally beat the game. The story begins with Spyro wanting to go on vacation to avoid the rain when we find someone known as the Professor and two of his helpers rigging a portal to bring Spyro to help them. They don't have dragons where they're from, but they need the help of one to help defeat... Uh, this man? Cre creature? Thing? Uh, named Ripto. The group accidentally summoned Ripto to Avalar, and since he saw a world without dragons, he decided to conquer it, and now they need Spyro's help, a dragon's help, to stop him. The portal is destroyed, so Spyro really doesn't have much of a choice but to stay and help. Within the first few minutes, it's so apparent that this game has much more to offer to the player. Whereas your main goal was to kill enemies and simply make it to the end of the level before, there's incentive to do pretty much everything here. The level design is a little bit more linear than the first game, not to say that there aren't places to go or things to do, but generally you'll start off a level by talking to someone from there who will then ask for your help in getting rid of Ripto's goons. Your main objective is to simply make it to the end of the level, helping whoever needs help along the way and collecting a talisman at the end, which there are 14 in total. Throughout your journey, you'll still have gems to collect and enemies to defeat, Enemies will no longer drop gems, however, but spirit particles, which you'll need in order to unlock special gates that will help you access more of the level. Oftentimes, these aren't necessary to do, but they will contain little side challenges to get more collectibles. Each level has a few side challenges in which the reward for completing it is an orb. You'll need a certain amount of orbs at certain points of the game in order to unlock certain levels, and in the third act of the game, you just collect orbs instead of talismans. So if you can collect the orbs while you're there the first time, it's better to do it so you don't have to do as much backtracking. Honestly, the whole thing is pointless because throughout the game, Hunter seems to have half of the orbs anyways. Dude's holding out on us. Challenges are really fun, it's really varied. Light all the lamps before time runs out, prevent thieves from stealing the lightning stones, or play hockey and score five goals. Every level has a few, and the game even gives you a star difficulty rating of each one. You don't need to complete them all, but some will be a fun challenge for the 100% completionists. But don't think you can skim on the gems either, and that's because of the existence of the most insufferable, annoying, awful, dreadful, wretched, disgusting, vile, nasty, horrid, ghastly, foul, atrocious, horrendous, appalling, unpleasant, hideous bear known as money bags. I hate you money bags. Leave me and my gems alone. I swear if I see any long form paragraph comments defending money bags and how he's actually a misunderstood hero, I will give you a solid thumbs down. Leave your fan fiction somewhere else. Money bags will show up in various levels and you'll need to give him a specific amount of gems before moving on. Sometimes he'll open up bridges or elevators you need, other times he'll actually teach you new abilities which we'll get into later. He's mostly there just to make sure that you're not just running through the game and that you do have to do some gem collecting. The levels feel like a tremendous step up from the first game. It feels like there's direction and purpose to everything. Allies who can help you with creative mechanics, 18 unique and different levels. It's a collectathon without feeling like one, and there's tons of extra things to do for the player who wants to do it all. I know some people prefer how open and non-linear the first game was, but I kind of like the idea that you have your main objective right in front of you, but tons of little things to get distracted by. 
Mechanics wise, the base game is pretty much the same. You can still charge and flame with the addition of the occasional projectile that you can pick up and shoot at someone. Otherwise, the biggest difference being that you can now hover at the end of a glide for a little bit of extra height, which is a very welcome addition. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a few mechanics that you can learn from money bags, which will not only help you in your journey, but allow you to go back to older levels and unlock parts of it that you previously couldn't. The first one you'll learn is swimming, which gives you access to new maps and levels based underwater. It can take a little while to get used to, and I'm not sure anyone is super in love with water levels, but it's also the 90s, so you kinda had to have one. You can also learn how to climb up walls where there are ladders available, normally to unlock challenges or orbs, and then you can head bash, which is a bit like a ground pound, which allows you to open up rocks and certain chests. Throughout the game, you'll also find power-ups unlocked by soul particles, as we mentioned before. These can contain things such as jump that will launch you to a new area of the map, a fireball flame breath, freeze breath, invincibility, even the power to fly around freely for a little bit. These abilities are only temporary and they're almost always tied to exploring more of the map to get more gems or orbs. Speedways also return and I'm still just as bad at them as I was in the first game and I don't have any further comment to say about that. There are a few boss fights in the game, but I'll cover the main three, which are Crush, Gulp, and Ripto. And it's nice because we have a story in this game, so not only are we more exposed to them and thus the fight means more, but they're also very fun and challenging fights. Crush is the first and easiest of the three. It's mostly just avoiding taking any damage. Once he's in the circle barriers, you can't do anything to him, so you need to catch him in between these circles while avoiding his ground pound waves. You won't actually do any damage to him, the damage comes from him angrily pounding at the ground with his club, causing parts of the ceiling to collapse on him. Eventually he will chase you and it's more or less the same, just don't get hit and it should be an easy W for you. Gulp is my least favorite as evidenced by my reaction when I died to him for the 47th time. Twitch.tv slash Ghostboy259 if you like watching me be tortured. Between charging, jumping, explosives, pounding on the ground, and laser cannons, he has many ways of hurting you. And you have to do everything you can to avoid getting hit while sending barrels towards him and aiming these rocket pickups at him. It can be a pretty long and grueling fight, and you can only take 4 hits to his 10. I have a lot of memories playing this as a kid and getting stuck forever, and thankfully, I can relive all of these playing as an adult and continuing to get stuck forever. Finally, you face Ripto and you get by with a little help from your friends. Using the orbs you've collected, Hunter will throw them into the arena and you'll basically use whatever you can to defeat Ripto. Ripto can also grab these orbs and so you'll have a barrage of attacks to use against each other. Luckily, you'll also have some sheep thrown occasionally to allow you to regain some health during the fight. Ripto has a second stage where he's on a giant mechanical version of Gulp, and the gameplay is more or less the same, he just has more and different attacks to send your way. The third stage is probably the most unique as the entire arena pit is engulfed in lava, and you basically have to shoot him out of the sky. I wouldn't say it's the hardest boss fight by any means, but it's by far the most satisfying. The only thing that would make it better is if I could also set money bags on fire. Everything about Spyro 2 feels like a proper upgraded sequel. Dialogue and story and characters already go a long way, but the new mechanics, the really fun hub world that I didn't really talk about, better boss battles, more things to do inside the worlds once you're there, reasons to backtrack. It feels like everything you loved about the first Spyro game, but just better. I have to believe that some of these mechanics were probably already well in design before the first game came out, given that there's just a year between release dates. Lastly, we head on to Spyro 3. Spyro Year of the Dragon was the third Spyro game in three years, and it's not as big of a step up from 2 because 2 already had such an incredible jump up from the first, but it's a great consistent return to form, and that doesn't mean it didn't bring some amazing things to the franchise, but if it feels like I'm glossing over this one a little bit, just gameplay wise, it's very similar to 2. The game story features an evil sorceress who has her minion Bianca steal all of the dragon eggs and bring them to the Forgotten Realms, and yes, that's the same D&D setting we heard about earlier in Boulder's Gate. So, perhaps they, uh, there's gonna be a crossover. 
Stealing the eggs is obviously a big issue as throughout all three games, I don't know if there's a single female dragon in the entire game or if they're just off camera doing something else, but either way they need all the eggs they can get. During the game you get some really cool lore and world buildings about the dragons disappearing and how it affected the world while also furthering Spyro's relationships with his allies, mostly Hunter and his dragonfly Sparks. The layout of the levels is more or less the same as two, with the exception that you'll be collecting eggs throughout the levels, and once you've helped enough allies, they'll help man a balloon that will take you to the next hub world. In terms of gameplay mechanics, your biggest and kind of only difference is the fact that you will not play this entire game as Spyro. Throughout the game, you'll be able to take control of several different allied characters, including Sheila the Kangaroo, Sergeant Bird the Penguin, Bentley the Yeti, and Agent 9 the Space Monkey with a laser gun. Video games are cool. There's even a few levels where you can play the game as Sparks, the dragonfly who acts as Spyro's health indicator. And anyone who has played this game will probably tell you that these are some of the funnest and most memorable parts of the game. Sheila has the ability to jump high and kick, Agent 9 turns the game into a third person shooter and sometimes a first person shooter, Bentley is slow but obviously smashes everything in sight with ease, Sergeant Bird probably has the most variety of gameplay. He can walk around, fly up and down, send rockets out to attack enemies, and pick up weights and torpedoes to use as weapons. Sparks levels are a top view shooter where Sparks shoots these weird laser ball type things. Can dragonflies really do this? And there are a multitude of power ups that he can pick up as well. Looking back, it really amazes me how there was no spin-off made of any of these characters, unless they're in Skylanders and I just don't know it, but if they are, I couldn't find that information online. I can understand that maybe a full game with some of these mechanics wouldn't be amazing, but the addition of these characters were extremely popular among my friends and one of the best parts of the third game. It kind of helps break up the gameplay monotony, especially now if you're playing the entire trilogy back to back to back. It's a great fresh of breath air, breath of fresh air. This video has a lot of words. I've forgotten how to speak a little bit. Spyro is a fantastic franchise, but the levels can definitely blend into one another after a while as they're pretty formulaic. I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. The franchise at this point definitely had a young core audience, and with three games being released in three years, it's honestly very impressive how much they managed to add into the games and take the experience to the next level. Now, I could keep going on about Spyro 3 and how much I enjoy it, and honestly, if this was a Spyro retrospective series, I would go over all the games even longer, but this is a long video as it is, and it's kind of getting away from me. As it is, I've already cut a lot out of the section you just watched, which might be hard to believe. <laughs> now, in the Spyro franchise, there are 10 handheld games, although some are Game Boy Advanced and DS versions of the same game. There are console ones in between that, but I'm not going to worry too in depth about those. I might mention them here and there, but they're really not that important. We know what Spyro is. It's charging, flaming, collecting, platforming, and gliding. It's about helping those in need and stopping the big baddie. But handheld games in 2001 weren't the most technically advanced. And while yes, I showed the reignited trilogy of Spyro in the footage, all of those mechanics were there in a year 2000 3D game. So how would they translate to the Game Boy Advance a year after the third game and just six months into the Game Boy Advance's life? I'm not going to break these games down super fully, I'm not going to get too involved in the story or anything, just because there are 10 of these games to get through, and for some, there's not a lot of depth to them, you kind of can figure out what's going to happen within the first hour, so I'm only going to be playing each game for about 30 minutes to an hour, just so we can focus mostly on mechanics. Our first game is Spyro Season of Ice on the Game Boy Advance, which came out one year after the third Spyro console game. Season of Ice brings us back to that old familiar isometric view, and our main mechanics of charging, fire breath, and gliding are all present. Right off the bat, navigating the map will definitely get confusing. 
In the original PS2 Spyro games, there was no minimap as far as I'm aware. I think it was just added for the HD versions. But regardless, mini maps are a bit too small for a Game Boy Advance. It's easy to forget about how small these screens really are, especially when you're watching a video online. But if you're watching this video on a phone and not horizontally, that's probably about how big the screens actually were, so there's not a ton of room for finer details. This makes navigation a lot more complicated because obviously they wanted Spyro to be big enough to have significant detail, he's the main focus of the game. And to their credit, he looks amazing in pixel form. But as a result, you only have so much room on the screen to see around you, and dashing may very well end in disaster. Luckily, if you go off an edge in this game, the fairy's magic will bring you right back to land, and they teach you this pretty early on, and then immediately betray this because this is only applicable in the hub worlds. Anywhere else, it's instant death. The plot of the game is that while finally on vacation, Spyro receives a letter from fairy Zoe, who says her and all her other fairies of the world have been kidnapped and frozen into ice, and we must go around and free them. It's very reminiscent of freeing the stone dragons in the first game, although there is some side quests kind of like the later games, where sometimes you'll get a task to light the lighthouses or kill the birds, and your reward will just be a fairy encapsulated in ice. It kind of already felt weird enough when people were holding eggs and using them as bargaining chips. Keeping fairies captive and not giving them back until you do them a favor feels a little bit different. The platforming doesn't feel amazing. Most of these games, they almost never feel amazing. Spyro does have a shadow, which is really nice, and most of the platforms you can see the steady incline up and put two and two together. Where it gets really tricky is when you're dealing with platforms of different height and you can't tell if something is on the same plane as you. This is a pretty common issue with isometric platformers, but I will say this feels leagues better than LEGO Star Wars on the Game Boy Advance. Enemies are killed in the same way, either you charge into them or flame them. All the level layouts are kind of similar to one another. You're basically on some sort of floating island where there's lava or water or you're high up in the tree so if you fall off the map it's death. And while you need to charge to kill enemies and you'll be tempted to charge so that you can travel the map faster, you can't see that far ahead of you and you'll have to do these little stutter charges or just accept the fact that you're probably going to die a lot. Dying and losing a life takes you back to the beginning of the stage. There's no checkpoints, which is fine and it makes sense, but it is really hard to find your way back since all parts of the level look exactly the same. There's really no difference in section to section. So unless you memorized where you took your rights and where you took your lefts, sometimes you may never find your way back to the quest you were working on. You might think that they could have added a checkpoint system, but these levels aren't exactly linear. They're more like the first Spyro game, where you're kind of given an open space and you can go around and do your own thing. There's no ending to the level or last mission you'll complete, you'll kind of just leave when you're done. Special chests come back with keys that you can collect to open them. There's not a ton to do outside of collect gems and fairies. The small missions you'll get from people to get fairies are the things you'll need to do. But they also don't have the same level of guidance as the previous games. For example, in the console games, someone will say, hey, can you do me this favor? And then they'll kind of point you in the direction and that favor will be a little more contained. Here, the favors will be everywhere on the map. For example, one mission I was given was to push these spike plants into these geysers that would fly up and kill these birds. Which, side tangent, it's very hard to do that with these controls because you cannot be even remotely precise. The first one is right next to the guy who asks you to do it, but the others are completely scattered across the map. You'll just have to find them and stop and do them when you see them. And if you're just wandering around the map looking for one, well, tough luck for you, you have to find it on your own. It's not as centralized as the previous games maybe would have had it. And I think part of it incentivizes you to make sure you explore every corner to do it. But then it also gets really confusing when you die and you don't remember which ones you have done or which ones you need to do again. You'll start off with a few levels that will be unlocked for you. The rest will be unlocked through fairy collection or... Ugh that guy. 
I don't even want to say his name. It makes me so angry. His existence is just built off of pure greed. He has no real substance in his life. Like, sure, he may have riches, but if you define success by money, then that's honestly pretty sad, right? I mean, like, does he have any friends? Like, I've never seen him hang out with anyone. And maybe if he's focused on other things in life, maybe he'll be able to build healthy relationships that don't revolve around money. And that kind of reminds me of the White Lotus and Tanya when she's talking about that whole thing, and she doesn't want to give that person money even though she's kind of dangling. Both Sparks Levels and Speedway's return. Sparks Levels are interesting. They're not as good as the old ones. Not that I expected them to be. I think it's just because you have such little vision around you and the enemies move so fast that it's very easy to find yourself surrounded or trapped or taking ton of hits. You have to kill these anthill things to stop the enemies from spawning, but there's like three that are all within range of each other. And if you don't know to kill one while the others are off screen, then you'll find yourself screwed pretty quick. It's still fun, but it's a lot of the same thing, just straightforward shooting, trying to aim your shots precisely and being unable to. Speedways also make a return as we take the camera behind Spyro and basically play a POV game of shoot the small group of pixels because you don't know if this is an enemy or a rock or gems until it gets closer. I was pretty surprised by its inclusion and I'm also surprised that it's not really the same thing. The timer here is way more generous. The old ones were go through the hoop 12 times and they could have recreated that here but instead it's more of a don't run out of time and if you miss a few hoops that's okay but going through them will help you it's just way more forgiving which is probably nice considering how hard the rest of the game is and it's also got a hard difficulty too so just in case you want to do it twice there you go the levels are bright and fun and colorful the big issue is that they just blend in with themselves a lot. If I showed you two completely different parts of the game, you wouldn't be able to tell me if you were in the northern part or the southern part or the eastern part or the western part because it all just kind of looks the same. You can kind of tell it's very much a case of them deciding this is what the ground will look like in this level and then not changing that at all for the entire stage. So again, they look nice, but navigation is a huge issue, but also an expected one. I imagine they very well could have had transitions in the landscape, but that also doubles, triples, maybe quadruples the work that those people have to do. I will say I am extremely impressed that they didn't just repeat or remake levels from the original three games, which would have been incredibly easy to do given how many there are, but they actually just made completely new levels, and that's a great attention to detail and shows how much they cared about the storytelling and the franchise and the branding of Spyro at this time. I didn't play far enough to get to the boss fights, but there are some of those too. The first one just involves running around in circles to avoid hits and charging when there's an opening. Nothing too complicated. You'll see two types of comments when looking up conversations about this game. Number one, lots of people had this game as kids, which just shows you how popular the Spyro franchise was. And two, most of them who had it never finished it. It's a little hard for me to talk about difficulty in games because I'm terrible at games. So from my point of view, all games are hard. But the fact that there aren't any checkpoints, the game is pretty unforgiving, which seems to be a trend so far. A lot of people, my childhood self included, just never got to see the end. A year later, we got Spyro 2 Season of Flame, which is a direct sequel to Season of Ice. And visually, it looks very similar, with the background and items in the landscaping probably looking the most different and upgraded. All the fireflies have been taken this time because we're just moving down the list of things we can steal, meaning dragons can't breathe fire and the dragon realms are getting so cold that the dragons might be forced to move. In this game, Spyro trades his fire breath for ice breath, Yes, I know, Season of Ice, he shoots flame. Season of Flame, he shoots ice. Iceland is warmer than Greenland. Get over it. In this game, once you see a firefly, you'll have to freeze it so you can capture it and bring it back to the elders. Beyond the visual changes to the level design, which is the most apparent thing, it's way more detailed looking, I'd say the worst part about this game, in my opinion, is the camera movement. Before, the camera was very robotic. Spyro was always in the center of the screen, 
And now it's very bouncy and will float when you're not moving. Very Lakitu from Super Mario 64-ish. And this causes my motion sickness to go out of control and makes it really hard for me to play this game for longer than a few minutes. I'd like to take this time to shout out Long Play Archive, who you've already seen. I used a little bit of footage of theirs already. They have posted videos of a playthrough and they have in their channel description that people are free to use snippets occasionally in their videos. So I had to use a bit here just because the camera was actually making me sick. And when I'm trying to record gameplay and then it gives me a headache, I can't do anything else for the rest of the day, sometimes for the rest of the week, depending on how bad it is. There's a few more things that return from the console games in this game, such as power-ups to make your breath more powerful, and our trusty companions are back from Spyro 3. Sheila is back and can jump up and down on her grid-based platform where you'll have to grow some plants and time some hits on enemies. The grid is cool, and it's neat that they didn't just create different levels to platform on or reuse the old ones, but they actually change the mechanic a bit. I'd say the hardest part is it doesn't necessarily feel natural. Sometimes you'll press up and you think you're moving to the right, but you'll move to the left and you never really quite figure it out. So that's probably the hardest part. Maybe some sort of directional grid or some kind of indication as to which direction you were going to go would have been a little bit better. But beyond that, I just like that it's different from standard Spyro play. Our monkey friend Agent 9 is also back and his levels are side scrollers, which thank goodness because I think trying to shoot with this isometric view would have made me lose my mind. Beyond that, there really isn't a ton to say. The game is extremely similar, keeping along with most of the previous game's features and unfortunately, the same issues. Just two months after Spyro 2 Season of Flame came out, Spyro had its next console release, Enter the Dragonfly, which is very much in the spirit of the originals on the console, and the year after that, we got Spyro Attack of the Rhinox, or Spyro Adventure on the Game Boy Advance. And wouldn't you know it, it's the exact same thing again, except with more collecting and a decent chunk more platforming. I want to set the record here. I don't think there's actually anything wrong with this at all. This may seem like a cop-out because it's easier for me to cover when the games are like this, but I think this is a really smart formula. You found games that work and that people enjoy. Spyro Season of Ice sold over a million copies, putting it 41st best-selling Game Boy Advance game of all time, which maybe doesn't seem like a lot, but that console was around for a long time, and there was a lot of good games on it. Not only that, but most people in publications rated Season of Flame better than Season of Ice. And so if you have a working formula, all you need to do is create some new levels and stories. I'd say go for it. Nowadays we have DLC or episodic updates, but imagine playing and loving Season of Ice and then growing up and getting two more games exactly like it. I've always called these games Mega Man sequels. So many early Mega Man games are the exact same game, same engine, same mechanics. They just have new levels for him to jump around in. Visually, they look the same. Control-wise, they all play the same. The market at the time wasn't demanding new mechanics and crazy updates for every sequel like they are now. They just wanted more of what was good. At the time, the main line of Spyro games was still going strong, and so there wasn't a need for the Game Boy games to do anything else but expand upon what was already there. I think the Game Boy era is really the last time we kind of got to see stuff like this. Maybe with indie games, people are a little bit more forgiving, but I often think about how different Dragon Age Origins is from Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition, or how I know a lot of people who personally skipped Mass Effect 1 because it's so different from 2 and 3 mechanically. Nowadays, I think most people would probably riot if they released a game like, say, Elder Scrolls 6 that didn't drastically change the experience and played exactly like Elder Scrolls 5. People want innovations, they want new mechanics, they want new gameplay. But it was just a different time back then, and it's that era that allowed Pokemon to release so many similar games over and over again and remain successful, whereas now we see them changing a lot of mechanics and kind of dividing the audience because some people wanted something different and some people wanted more of the same. And while these Spyro Game Boy Advance games aren't necessarily my thing, it's hard to argue against the success that all three games had. 
This would be the last Spyro game made by Digital Eclipse, as the Spyro handheld games would move on to a different company, so we know whatever the next game is, it's going to be different. And oh boy, was it different. The next game released would be Spyro Orange The Cortex Conspiracy, a crossover between the Spyro and Crash Bandicoot franchise, where Crash's game was called Crash Bandicoot Purple Ripto's Rampage. The games were released in Europe under the names Crash Bandicoot Fusion and Spyro Fusion. This game is very weird. It perhaps feels more natural as a Crash game than a Spyro game, but it is a Spyro game nonetheless. The game consists of side-scrolling Spyro who can glide or dash and honestly I'm shocked it took this long for a primarily side-scrolling Spyro game. There is top-down gameplay, generally with Spyro flaming someone or shooting them in a tank. There are some auto-scroller levels you'll have to fly through, some other auto-scroller levels where you'll have to shoot through people. And there's this weird little defense game where you're on a castle and you have to knock the enemy down before they can knock you down while throwing Molotov cocktails? Jesus. I'm sure the PlayStation games probably had some gnarly stuff in them that I'm not remembering at this exact moment, but for some reason it seems so much crazier seeing it in Game Boy form. You've also got this one game where Spyro is in a giant walking robot that can go upside down and attach to the ceiling. And he's killing what I'm pretty sure are meant to just be, like, normal human scientists. Honestly, should have just called this game Spyro's Finally Snapped. The entire game is these little mini-games with tiny little platforming in between, each being about 90 to 120 seconds long. There's no health pickup in any of these games, and if you die, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. And sometimes, it's just plain not fair. In the robot one, you can't see the platform above you or below you, which would be fine if you were just avoiding the little electric fences on the bottom, but sometimes there's electricity randomly on the top and you can't see it until you're moving up there. In the tank one, if you have not committed to the right direction, you won't have time to make it to the other end of the level because there's a block that makes you have to go backwards, and if you do make it, you won't be able to shoot the bombs in time, so you're guaranteed to take damage. It's just unfortunately more frustrating than it is fun. It's both too slow and too fast at the same time somehow, which is impressively hard to pull off now that I think about it. This combined with the emptiness of the world to get from minigame to minigame, eh, it's, it's not for me. It's very Crash inspired for sure, it's just such a weird reality to see Spyro shooting projectiles and driving tanks and going into space. He has flame breath, he can fly, where are those games? Why am I playing Breakout right now but with Spyro? Who asked for this? Even the Crash version of the game feels a little bit more fleshed out, more actual platforming and side mechanics and projectiles. The Spyro version kind of feels like it was just thrown in. Even Mr. Moneybags is here and he wants to know if we want trading cards. Like he's become a Pokemon card YouTuber now. Now I kind of pity him. I don't know what's happening anymore. Let's move on. The next game was a console game, Spyro A Hero's Tale, which again followed the same formulas as the previous ones. And I'm sure someone's going to say, actually, it was pretty different. I'm overgeneralizing because we're not talking about these ones. But it would be the last console game that was like these Spyro ones because Spyro was about to go under some pretty major changes. In late October 2005 came Spyro Shadow Legacy on the Nintendo DS, which would be the end of this Spyro story. After this game, they ended up rebooting the entire franchise for the next year, renaming the series as The Legend of Spyro. And after three Legend of Spyro games, Spyro was done. Spyro Shadow Legacy is a DS exclusive, the first one that wasn't built like the old ones or a weird Crash Bandicoot crossover which I don't want to talk about anymore. It's... slow. That's the, that's the best I can say about it. A lot of things have changed. Gone are the days of single hit enemies in Spyro. Everyone including Spyro himself have health points now. Spyro has abilities that have to be unlocked throughout the game, such as double jump or different types of hits. 
I don't know if Glide is in this game. If it is, I did not unlock it in my first hour of playing. The main plot of the game is that another realm, the Shadow Realm, has opened up and Spyro has to switch between the two worlds to save the Elder Dragons. And yes, that does sound like that Legend of Zelda game, and yes, I did say Shadow Realm. It looks like you're going to the Shadow Realm, Jimbo. Have fun! Oh, it's just down the street, next to the Chick-fil-A. This is basically a Spyro action RPG. You need to traverse a map, have a wallet of gems to buy things, collect accessories that give you certain abilities and perks and stats. There's tons of dialogue. I'm pretty sure these opening scenes have more dialogue than the first two games combined. It's just so slow. The first bit is really a drag. There's so much dialogue, so much explanation of lore and these new RPG mechanics. Even movement is slow, you can hardly tell the speed difference between walking and charging. And as I said, I have no idea if you can even glide in this game. There's a ton of platforming, it doesn't feel very comfortable. I had several points where I clipped through the side of a platform and fell, or more commonly I would catch an edge somewhere where I just couldn't move until I jumped again. Combat is a little less than stellar, you have some basic kicks and tail whips or whatever. And you need to just guess if an enemy has armor to know which things will be more effective. Fire Breath is just a continuous stream as long as you hold the button, and enemies will just sit there and take the damage. It's very fetch questy, you have to run around and free Elder Dragons and then do the same thing kind of over and over, at least in the first hour or so that I played. It just doesn't really feel anything like Spyro. I associate Spyro with speed and quick paced combat and sassy remarks. Here Spyro is a silent protagonist and you're kind of just wandering aimlessly with no real map until you stumble on the right places, gaining XP to level up, which just doesn't feel like Spyro. The thing is, is I struggle to say it's bad, a lot of people in the comments said they were very nostalgic about the game. It's just not something I enjoy, especially when you keep the original in mind. I mean. Can you imagine such a fast and quick paced franchise going to the DS and then going extremely slow? I'm certain this is the only time that that's going to happen and we're definitely not going to talk about another one very soon, wink wink. The game was pretty much declared mid across the boards, no publication had anything amazing to say about it, but none completely trashed it either. I don't even mind the whole Shadow Realm thing, it's definitely a lot darker than what we're used to from Spyro, but if you thought that was dark, then wait till we move on to the next thing. As I mentioned earlier, this was it for the original continuity, and what a shame they couldn't have ended it in classic Spyro game fashion. In 2006, 2007, 2008, they rebooted the franchise with The Legend of Spyro, and once the trilogy ended, it not only ended a streak of releasing a game in the franchise every year for 10 years, which is incredibly impressive, it ended the Spyro franchise altogether, with Spyro heading over to the Skylanders franchise for a little bit. These next games are actually the reason I included Spyro on this list. They interest me a ton, and not just because it's based off of the new Spyro, but because Shadow Legacy was a DS exclusive. So you would think from this point on they were only moving forward. However, that was not the case, as both Spyro A New Beginning and Spyro Eternal Night both had different Game Boy Advance versions and Nintendo DS versions, which of course were different from the original. And the final game of the trilogy, Dawn of the Dragon, only had a DS game. But before we get into the last five handheld games in the Spyro franchise, let's briefly talk about at least the first Legend of Spyro game. After all, it's a new beginning. One with Elijah Wood and Gary Oldman and David Spade. It's true, the prophecies spoke of the purple dragon destined to put his stamp on this age. But the prophecies didn't foretell the devastation that surrounds us now. Maybe you're right, but I'm willing to try. I want to take the first step. You're actually going to go along with this lunatic. The first thing you'll notice is that visually it is quite different. It's a lot darker and grittier. A lot of that bright colored world and comedy is gone. It seems to me that perhaps the originals were targeted more towards children, and in this PS2 era, kids were starting to play darker, grittier games a lot younger. 
So my guess is they wanted to bring in new young fans while also try to maintain the old ones and just kind of zapped all of the childhood fun out of it and went in a very different direction. The game again has tons of dialogue compared to the original three, not surprising as they're wanting to start fresh and actually create a proper lore this time. And there's lots of long cutscenes and lore explanation. In this game, Spyro was one of the last living dragons after they were all attacked, and is just now realizing he's not actually an abnormally large dragonfly, but a dragon. Upon meeting the other last dragon, he's told that he is actually a dragon of prophecy, where a purple dragon once every 10 generations comes to save the world. Sparks talks up a storm in this game, and it is all just pure sarcasm. I, I have to wonder what that pitch meeting was like, right? I mean, I don't even hate the idea of David Spade playing Sparks, but who came up with that idea? Who who at the meeting said, oh, you know, you know the person who first comes to mind? David Spade. The thing about Sparks, however, is that his role has been greatly diminished because there's not really much else for him to do. The game has gotten rid of these single hit enemies again. Both Spyro and the mobs you encounter all have HP bars. While Spyro can jump and breathe fire and charge and all that, combat is now more akin to something of the Spider-Man PlayStation games. It's very beat-em-up, button-mashing style with lots of combos, and I do mean lots of combos. There's straight up a 15-minute section that makes you do all the combos multiple times in extremely precise ways, just to make sure you really know them. I forgot about how different this game was from the others. I don't want to say it's bad because I'm obviously coming from a place of nostalgia. I have so many childhood memories of the Spyro games and I remember my disappointment when this one came out because it was just nothing like what I loved. Obviously they rebooted for a reason, perhaps the older games formula was not succeeding as much as they would have liked. To be completely honest, I can't even recall if I ever played the other two after the original trilogy. But it's different. It goes against a lot of what Spyro was for many of us. But I'm sure there's also a whole generation of fans out there who love these three games, and I'm not trying to take that away from you at all. But I don't want to stay here forever. This was meant to be just a brief rundown. This is not my opinion on the full Spyro game. Maybe I can do that one day if you really want to. Leave a comment, leave a like, give me $5,000 and we'll see. But now that we've cleared that out of the way, let's do the last five remaining handheld games in the Spyro franchise, and let's go ahead and start with Spyro A New Beginning on the Game Boy Advance. And yes, there it is, the side-scrolling platforming handheld game we were all expecting sooner or later that wasn't, of course, a crossover with Crash Bandicoot. But it just makes sense, doesn't it? iconic character, a few distinct mechanics that are relatively unique to the franchise at the time, throw them all together and someone's gonna buy it. I don't want to call it lazy because that would feel disrespectful to the people who put in hard work and hours to make the game, but at most I don't think it would feel far off to say this game is probably at most uninspired. It's generic, it doesn't really feel special, doesn't feel like it had to be a Spyro game, they weren't really trying to tell the story in a different way or advance the story in any way, it's kind of just there. The game is mostly unremarkable. For some reason, enemies still have a health bar, which if you were going to go back to the old style even for just a bit, you would think it would be here. There's still a bit of that beat em up flavor, you can charge, but there's almost no point because the charging doesn't really speed you up. It's mostly platforming and walking up to enemies and then just spamming attacks. There's no combos because there wasn't enough buttons for combos. When attacking enemies, you can breathe fire, which holds for a little bit of time and stun locks the enemy. And you'll have to recharge your meter since it can run out. When charging as an attack, you just have to charge in the direction of the enemy and you'll make contact because it's not 3D so it's a lot easier to do and it'll stun the opponent and start doing little hits over time as if Spyro were standing still and then charging with no wind up over and over again. This is basically all there is. This is all the combat in the game. You just hold forward and B and you'll pretty much kill anything you encounter. There's no collecting, no gems or anything, which feels very weird because you would really expect that in a game like this. Of all the mechanics that didn't transfer over to the handheld, it's very weird to me that gems are the thing that got cut. 
There wasn't going to be a ton of exploration in these worlds anyways, at least give us something to pick up while we're walking through them. Once you kill enemies, they drop little orbs. These orbs aren't collectibles or anything, they actually replenish your bars. The bottom bar, which is your fire, or your top bar, which I guess is like magic or fury, I think they call it sometimes. When you have the bar full, it's pretty much enough to instantly kill everyone on screen, and if you kill about three guys, sometimes that can be enough to just instantly fill your bars again, so use it when you have it. I think this is the first game of the Spyro franchise so far that really lacks a solid purpose. That might sound a little deeper than I intended it to, but the first three games seemed pretty straightforward. Release a trilogy of Spyro games on mobile like you did on console, and they did that. Spyro Orange is weird, but it's a crossover which is probably good for marketing, so I give that one a pass, and Shadow Legacy was experimenting with a darker, grittier RPG style, one that they ultimately followed through with for the reboot. The game feels like they made the game just to make a game. I get that it was kind of a weird point in the handheld market. It was late 2006. The Game Boy Advance was five and a half years old at this point. The DS was hitting about two. I personally don't think I had a DS until late 2005, early 2006, and consoles are expensive. Not every parent could afford to buy new consoles and games for them. It makes perfect sense that they would want to make a version for both systems so that people could play them regardless of what system they had. After all, these are the first Spyro games that are not telling their own unique story. They are supposed to be retelling the story on a different system. And in that case, you would want it to get to as many people as possible. But there's a cynical part of me that almost wonders why they even bothered. It doesn't really add anything to the Spyro experience, but in its defense, it doesn't take away anything either. Except for, you know, maybe a few hours of time and however much money it costs you to play. The experience on the Nintendo DS is much deeper, and while it may look like Shadow Legacy on the surface, it's actually pretty far from it. As I mentioned earlier, both the Game Boy version and this version have the same story as the console version. This one is just a little more in-depth than the Game Boy one. It actually has some cutscenes and there's way more dialogue, some of which is ripped directly from the game. Side note, has anyone ever noticed how unnatural some dialogue can seem when you see it written instead of spoken? I think actor's cadence really plays a huge role in receiving information, and it just sounds so robotic and filled with fake emotion without it. The first thing you'll notice in this game is that there is no charging, making it just the second Spyro game to not feature it after Spyro Fusion. And it's such an odd choice that of all the things they chose to not keep, they got rid of one of the most iconic mechanics in the Spyro franchise. It's synonymous with Spyro, and yet it's not here. I know they went through a reboot, but charging is still in the Legend of Spyro games, and it just feels so weird without it. Especially in a setting like this where it isn't a side-scrolling platformer, so there's actually world to explore. It would be more easy to understand and maybe even a bit justifiable if they left it out of the side-scrolling games, but they put them in there, so I really wonder what their reasoning is for leaving it out. With more buttons on our system comes a few more combos, and this game also makes pretty heavy use of the touchscreen, for better or for worse. Most of your combat will still be just pressing Y to hit. You can tap on an enemy to lock onto them, but hitting the left bumper will also do the same. Some enemies, however, you will need to tap. In the first few levels that I play, there are these little crawling things, and they need to be tapped to be killed. I think you can still kill them without tapping them, but it's a lot harder, and you take a lot of damage trying to do it. And there are other enemies that carry shields, and you need to tap on them at least once in order to knock the shield away, I guess, before you can do any damage to them. In the interest of full transparency, I absolutely hate this stuff. I don't mind when it's a little tap of the thumb, which I think is what most people probably did anyways, but I hate grabbing a stylus and having to do things with it while also trying to run around and still wanting to use the attack buttons while I'm tapping. It's a lot to handle, and there's a few games out there that do this, and I admire the fact that they actually use the touchscreen at all, because so many games just chose not to, but oftentimes I prefer 
a little bit of separation, a clear moment where you're meant to touch and a moment where you're meant to press buttons. I understand that I am more than likely completely on my own here, and that's fine. It's just an opinion. It's fine if you disagree with me. But as a kid, I always just hated having to either hold the stylus while pressing the buttons or putting it on a table and then panicking when I needed it, and then I would drop something and everything would break around me because I'm very uncoordinated as a person. We still have the magic bar for fire breathing and other types of breath that get unlocked throughout the game, with enemies dropping the same kind of gem pickups for us. Pressing A will let out your flame breath, and pressing X will shoot it out like a projectile, which I assume does more damage, but I'm not sure. When you tap or lock on an enemy, it'll oftentimes have their weakness to which element will do more damage to them, so you can switch between your breaths to make sure you're doing more damage. Enemies will drop different colored gems, mostly to refill health or magic, so the chances of you running out of anything is pretty slim, but it does happen, and some enemies are very difficult to hit with melee attacks, so you do have to be careful. Later in the game, during the section where you have to do like 87 combos in a row, there's luckily a lot less here, but you do get some extra moves, like a fire shield that surrounds you and can be used to attack enemies, and a fury attack, where using all of your blue bar will pause time, highlight all the creatures on screen, and you have to touch them in the order they were highlighted in before time runs out. Doing this will essentially destroy everyone on screen. While you're walking around, you'll find crystals and mushrooms and other things that you can tap on, and if you tap enough times, they'll get destroyed and they'll have gems in there for you. But beyond these gems that refill bars, there is none of those typical gems that you expect from the older games. There's nothing really collectibles going on. There's white gems that I think drop whenever you kill an enemy. And these go straight into your inventory and can be used to increase the power of Spyro's abilities. But there's no need to collect gems as currency anymore since money bags isn't in the game. And that's why this game... And all other games moving forward should be labeled 300 out of 5 stars, no questions asked. Occasionally you'll see chests, and these are sometimes optional things to give you more gems, or sometimes you need to do them to open up gates. And it's most comparable to a Bioshock hacking minigame, which I'm sure every minigame gets that comparison, I may have said it already at the LEGO Star Wars section. Here you basically have a laser and mirrors and you need to use the mirrors to guide the laser into the gems. No time limits, not anything challenging. It's not bad. Again, I can't say anything negative about it because I kind of defended something similar with LEGO Star Wars. I will say this is very odd. There's never been anything revolving anything like this in Spyro ever. The choice of lasers and mirrors feels so random and unrelated to the subject matter. You know, why not make this a Sparks minigame so he has literally anything to do? Or just establish that maybe Sparks is the one placing the mirrors? I don't know, it's just so weirdly disconnected from everything else. My initial thought was that these games were placed in just so that they had touchscreen mechanics, but there are touchscreen mechanics, so it's kind of just unnecessary. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. As slow as the game is in terms of just playing it, it doesn't feel like you're moving very fast or doing a lot of things quickly. It definitely feels like an extension to the PlayStation 2 game. While you're obviously not going to get the full story and emotion and not nearly enough David Spade, a game like the original Spyro to Shadow of Legacy felt almost like different franchises. Whereas these two games complement each other quite well. I definitely like this system a lot more than Shadow Legacy. It's still not something I'm crazy about, but I would definitely complete this game if I had it as a kid. It's very linear, it's very straightforward, there's not a lot of thinking to do, and if you enjoyed A New Beginning on PlayStation 2, you'll probably enjoy this one too. Now I'm not going to play The Legend of Spyro The Eternal Night on the PS2, mostly because I believe the gameplay is pretty much exactly the same as the first and we're not really talking about the story anymore, and also David Spade doesn't come back and I refuse to live in a David Spade-less Spyro world. However, The Eternal Night did once again have a Game Boy Advance and DS version, so let's take a look at the final Game Boy Advance game in the Spyro franchise. Whew, I'm getting weirdly emotional about this. It's surprisingly not the same. In fact, it's actually quite different. Right off the bat, visually, there's not even a comparison to be made. The Eternal Night looks so much better. 
Spyro is much more detailed and current looking. It's a lot darker, which fits the tone of the new Spyros quite a bit better. The backgrounds change quite a bit and even have these annoying little things in the foreground that sometimes cover the action like Eterna Noctis, which really pisses me off, but I get it. It's aesthetic. You do you. Gameplay wise, you've got your B to attack, your A to jump or double jump, right bumper to shoot out flame, jumping up and down, holding different directions allows you to do combos. There's a tutorial that lasts quite a while, but it really explains everything in depth and you're constantly learning new abilities. The gem system from the New Beginning DS game is back. You can level up your abilities again, and once you feel you're strong enough or you've learned the right abilities, then you can go to the temple and unlock even more abilities. Come to think of it, this game is really reminding me a lot of Iterna Noctis. I only recently started playing Iterna Noctis on twitch.tv slash ghostboy259, so if you want to come watch and hang out and tell me how bad I am at the video game, but it's just an odd coincidence that these two games have these two very glaring similarities. You've also got this combo meter in the top right. You basically need to defeat enemies in quick succession and continue to bridge attacks, and doing this will get you more gems to upgrade your things with. So basically style points. They've also given Spyro some new movement. Outside of what we could do before, like double jumping and gliding and also being able to climb up a ledge, we can now do wall jumps, which opens up the world quite a bit. I think they realized that they needed to lean in a little bit more into the platforming aspect if they were going to continue with the side scrolling. And the maps definitely feel bigger and more alive. Occasionally you'll run into a thing that says you don't have the right ability yet, you might have to come back later, and honestly, I'm sorry, that's not happening. I won't remember what map it's on, I won't remember where it is on the map, I won't remember what ability I need, it's a nice thought and I generally don't mind it when games do it. Side scrollers on the other hand, I never have the motivation to return, so that will just stay a secret to me forever. The game is actually pretty difficult too. My biggest complaint is that every enemy is a massive HP sponge. Is that the right term, HP sponge? I think, I think that's the, is that the, is that the thing I meant to say? I don't know anymore. <laughs> Basically all the enemies have a ton of HP, so you get stuck on these tiny encounters for way too long. I wasn't sure if this spider was a boss or not because it had no health bar and it took so long to kill. And then I shortly encountered another one right after, which, Unfortunately, gave me my answer. Whenever Spyro takes any sort of damage, he also jumps backwards a pretty decent distance, making this part with lava pools pretty difficult because as soon as he gets hit, he gets knocked back, then you fall into lava, making him take more damage and knocking him back even further, and it's just an awful roller coaster that I don't want to ride. Just a small gripe as well, but my other big thing would be the leveling up screen. There's no numbers anywhere, so I can't see how much experience I have versus how much I need to pour in to level it up, and I don't even know how much I have to pour. Just small confusing things, but it's pretty minor compared to everything else. It feels like a very complete game to me, like the game they probably wanted to and perhaps should have made back then. Honestly, I could probably say the same for both A New Beginning games. One felt like a game just because, the other felt like Shadow Legacy, but the mechanics were slightly different. I think this is just one of the things that comes with releasing all the games at once. Something we saw earlier in this video was Dark Alliance, and there was a year and a bit in between the console and handheld release of those games, but the Spyro games all get released at the same time. And it's amazing what just an extra year of development did for all of these games and all of these concepts now that we're seeing them fully fleshed out. It's still not my thing, it was never going to be my thing, but by far the superior of the two and a fitting end to the Spyro franchise on the Game Boy Advance. Next we have the DS version of Eternal Night and we finally have a 3D handheld Spyro game and I gotta say it plays like a very good mix of the console version and the DS version of A New Beginning. Now before we go any further, this is extremely important warning. This is the most important thing I'm going to say all video, so if you're kind of half toned out and watching and not really watching, just listening, this is the most important thing I'm ever going to say in this entire video, so please pay attention. If you experience any sort of photo sensitivity or you're affected by flashing lights in any way, this game has a ton because anytime you connect with a basic hit, the entire screen flashes white. 
It is incredibly annoying. As someone myself who has motion sickness and I get headaches at flashing lights, this was a nightmare to play. And I wish there was any way to turn it off, but sadly there is not. So, if you need to look away during this part, or close the video, or do something else, or fast forward until this section is over, please feel free to do whatever you have to do to make sure that you are safe and healthy and all that stuff. This is fortunately the only game that does this, but it does suck, and I will let you know when this section is over if you're just listening, like, audibly. But I apologize, there was nothing I could do to stop it, and I hated it too. Right off the bat, unless it's unlocked later at a point that I never got to, there is again no charging, which is incredibly weird for a game that looks like this. It looks so much like the original Spyro games on console. I know I mentioned charging like it's the hottest topic of every game, but it's also the weirdest one that constantly keeps getting cut in and out of the games. It's seriously weird that of all the games not to have it, it's this one, the one that plays so much like the console games. It definitely feels like something's missing, like I keep hitting random buttons hoping I'll find a random obscure combination that allows me to do it, or if it is unlockable and I just didn't play far enough to unlock it, then that's stupid and it should always be there. I'm sorry, it's just a mainstay mechanic of Spyro, why is it not in it? If the side scrollers can add charging by double tapping a direction, surely we could have done it here too. Even if it does such little damage, it just feels so much better to have it there. Now the game doesn't exactly feel or play like the PlayStation versions of the games, but the base of it kind of feels the same. Lots of tapping Y to attack, pressing B to jump and change it up a little bit. Flaming uses that bar again and you need to collect gems to refill the bars. While the gameplay isn't exactly similar to that of the PlayStation versions, there doesn't feel that much of a disconnect between this game and its Game Boy Advance counterpart as A New Beginning did. The cores are very much the same. One of the more interesting mechanics in this game is that when you hit an enemy with enough moves, they will fly up into the air, and if you jump into it, you will enter this mini-game, where if you swipe the right direction three times, it'll do extra damage, normally killing the creature, and drop extra gems for your leveling up. What's really funny about this is something I criticized the last DS game for was having moments where you were expected to be pressing buttons and tapping the screen at the same time, and I mentioned how I personally wasn't a fan of having to suddenly switch. Apparently, someone in development must have agreed with me, because once you knock an enemy in the air, it'll actually stay on the screen with the words touch, just floating there until you're ready to go for the three swipes. I swear, I did not know about this when I wrote that last section. It's just a really funny, crazy coincidence, and obviously I enjoy the pause. I'm sure there's going to be a hundred comments telling me why I'm wrong for enjoying it. Of all the things that make a return from the last DS game, because who needs charging when you have puzzle boxes with mirrors in them? They actually play a pretty big part in this game because the game will lock you in the level and you have to collect the mirrors needed to complete the puzzle. Not every level has this, some you just need to go through and get to the end, but some will wander around and have you find all the mirrors you need to complete the box, thus making some rocks vanish into thin air and allowing Spyro to go on his way. The boxes are the same, nothing too challenging, very weird and out of place. My biggest issue with them this time would just be the background textures are very artsy and fancy. Maybe a little bit too much, it's not the easiest to distinguish from the wall sometimes. Like I feel like they could have made it just a little bit easier, but you know what, it's not a game breaker. The game features a ton of platforming, more than the original Spyros and more than the reboots for sure. Lots of timed flying, which can be a little awkward when you can't quite turn in every direction. And when you're holding forward and double jumping, sometimes you'll start flying forward before you hit the peak of your jump. Meaning you'll have to jump twice not holding a direction, and then hold forward, which pretty much goes against every gamer instinct I have in my body. It's very easy to get lost, you only have so much vision, and the mini-map up top suffers from being a little bit too stylized, so it's not really ideal for navigation. I have no sense of planes or height or direction on this whatsoever, but it's also just nice to have a map that works in real time where you can see where you are, which is the first of the series for all the handheld games incredibly enough. 
the game is both forgiving and not. Like, if you die, you'll spawn right back at the beginning of the section. There's no lives or anything like that. You don't have to worry about resetting. The downside is that when you die, you respawn back to the beginning of the section with the same health that you entered the level with. This means if you struggled once because of low health, you're going to struggle again because of low health, and then several more times because of no health. It just seems a little intense, and if you told me that it was like a weird oversight, I would actually probably believe you. It's like this one aspect of the game that's oddly hard and punishing way more than anything else. And the thing is, is that you certainly will take damage. Enemies are pretty hard to avoid, and your best bet will always be to bat them up in the air so you can take them on one at a time and take advantage of their vulnerability rather than just fighting them head on. It's by no means that golden Spyro experience, but it's one of the easiest to just pick up and play, albeit you might get a little bit lost without the context of the other games like the puzzle boxes because they just feel so weird. What's most surprising about this game is you'd think after making the top down ones and moving to this format, they would keep this look and style for the third and final DS game, but no. They went with something completely different, and to be honest, a little baffling. Also for people who maybe weren't looking at the screen because of flashing lights, that stuff is over. Everyone, please welcome them back, come in single file, and uh, please make sure your phones are on silent, thank you. For The Legend of Spyro, Dawn of the Dragon, the final DS game in the Spyro franchise, they went back to side-scrolling. Now, in their defense, it is the best side-scrolling Spyro game by far. It's the most interesting one to play, it's the one that I played the most, but it feels like a sequel to the Game Boy versions of the games rather than the DS versions. Whether it be a time crunch or something else, for whatever reason they made all three of the DS games in the reboot very different. One aspect that's very different from the others, and I believe this is actually true for the console game as well, but I didn't play it so I might be wrong, is that you can play as Cinder, whom I had no idea who she was until very recently. <laughs> the tutorial does a pretty good job at showing you and explaining how to switch, how to use movement mechanics such as wall jumps and whatnot, which is good because I would guess that most people who played the DS versions probably didn't go back and play the Game Boy versions, but you just know out there there's that one person who played the Game Boy version of the first one, the Game Boy version of the second one, and then jumped to the DS version of the third one and thought, oh, just another side-scroller. <laughs> this is also the first of the handheld games where you just start off with all of your abilities at once, all your different types of breaths, nothing needs to be unlocked. And that kind of gets a little confusing. The tutorial doesn't really explain to you at all what any of Cinder's abilities do, Spyros have remained the same since the beginning, and it's refreshing to start off with all of them right away, but either they explained Cinder in a previous game or the console game, or just assumed we would figure it out, and it can get a little bit lost and maybe a little bit hesitant to switch over to Cinder. There's a lot less tapping in this game, there's no puzzle boxes or anything like that. The enemies once again have way too much HP, and again there's no health bar so we can't really see where they're at, so you just do a lot of smacking away. With the first DS game, when you locked onto an enemy, you could get a glimpse of their weaknesses, and with this game just being in the general vicinity of an enemy, you get something similar. Some enemies are immune to certain abilities or even immune to all physical hits, and some have weaknesses that do double damage, and your top screen will actually show you little indicators as to which ability does which for both characters. Now this is very useful, but sometimes you'll encounter two enemies close together. Perhaps one will be immune to all physical attacks and one immune to a ton of different magics, and then you just have to spam anything and everything until it works because it'll constantly switch back and forth between the two. The nice thing about being able to switch between Spyro and Cinder is that your magic bar will slowly recharge for the character that isn't being used. Sadly, it does not do this for health, which I really wish it did. And if one character dies, you don't get to switch to the other like I would have hoped, maybe you get to go to a checkpoint and bring the other one back to life. If one character dies, you're done, you go back to the beginning or some invisible checkpoint. There's really not a ton to say about the game, it plays very similar to the Game Boy Advance version of the last game, just updated graphics and maybe feels a little bit smoother. I think the fact that I don't have a lot to say is probably a positive rather than a negative though. The last bit of gameplay that's the most different from anything else here are these flying sections. 
Again, you can still swap between Spyro and Cinder here, and you're basically on a set course with tons of enemies and projectiles flying at you. You can shoot at them by tapping the screen, but there's no real incentive to killing them. You can kind of just avoid their hits if you want. I made it to one boss fight, this large rock golem thing. It was honestly pretty difficult. I felt like with a lot of their attacks, there was just no avoiding it. He could just pull back his arm to swing and I had no idea if he was going up or down and there just wasn't enough time for me to move out of the way. I would sometimes switch dragons as hits were coming so there was no dragon on the screen to get hit which may have been intended, I'm not quite sure, sometimes I couldn't get the timing right. And I would also have Cinder tank the hits because Spyro's flame was way more useful than whatever Cinder was shooting. Again, would have loved a mechanic here where if one dragon dies, you can continue to play as the other, because all it takes is a few hits on one and they're basically not an option anymore. They become a liability rather than a help. Overall, I would say it's easily the best side-scrolling Spyro game, but I couldn't tell you if it was the best of the DS games. I honestly couldn't tell you which I prefer the most. They're all just so different. The Spyro handheld games have such an interesting trajectory. Instead of remaking the first three games on handheld, they made three brand new games with new worlds and advanced the story forward. They made a crossover game, which eh, I don't really count or care about, but then once the reboot came, the philosophy changed. It wasn't about creating new games to expand the world and the story, it was about making the old worlds more accessible. And I can't tell you if this was a good thing or a bad thing because there are massive benefits to both. There's a franchise that we'll cover later in this video that was focused so much on expanding the world with every release on every console, it created a huge disconnect between a lot of fans who were trying to keep up. But there's many, many more games that just focused on giving you the same experience, but slightly different. The six Spyro games we subsequently got feel so scattered. They feel like such a missed opportunity, a lack of creativity. From Shadow Legacy to Dawn of the Dragon, every game felt like it was close to being the game they wanted to make, and once they found their rhythm, they had to move on to something else. When we covered the WWE games earlier, I applauded the fact that they made every game feel different. And perhaps it's a little hypocritical of me to say, but I feel the opposite about it here. The WWE games weren't trying to tell one cohesive story throughout game to game. Spyro was. If you're a fan who could only experience the games through the DS, you have three very disconnected games that don't feel like they're working together on one thing, but rather what three different people had envisioned for Spyro. The Game Boy games at least had a little bit more consistency and fluidity to them, but the DS games kind of feel like afterthoughts that took more time and effort to make. Don't get me wrong, I think individually they're all fine on their own. As much as I don't love them myself, I totally get why so many people like these games. But I think together, the overall picture, it just feels a bit weird, like there's something missing to link them all together. It was an incredibly weird journey to go from something so consistent to really having no idea what you were going to get anytime you picked up a Spyro game. From three games nearly identical, all about expanding the universe, to three games that couldn't be more different about retelling the same story. It's that evolution that made me so interested in talking about these games in this video. Was this the natural transition? Or did Spyro just change up their vision for what the handheld market could be? If you were around and played these games while they were being released, I would love to know what you think. Even if you're just a hardcore Spyro fan or played any of these casually, please let me know. Honestly, at the end of the day, it was kind of cool going through all these games. Because regardless of whether I liked them or not, the Spyro franchise was such a huge piece of my childhood. And reading comments on videos... It's good to know that even if it wasn't my Spyro they grew up with, tons of other kids got to grow up with Spyro too.
BioWare was surely and slowly creating an incredible legacy of storytelling mastery in video games, and their games were quite literally defining genres and are still considered the gold standard by many today. It started with the first Baldur's Gate game in 1998, a game that we mentioned briefly earlier in this video. In 2002, they followed up with Neverwinter Nights, followed by Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic in 2003, Jade Empire in 2005, and Mass Effect in 2007. In late 2009, they would release Dragon Age Origins, simply put, one of the best games to ever exist, so much so that it's still explored and talked about tremendously to this day. And yeah, I'm obviously a big Bioware fan, so what, get over it. But in between launching their behemoth franchises in Mass Effect and Dragon Age, Bioware also wanted to tackle the handheld market. They felt like they could bring what they were known for, deep characters and dark storytelling, and use it to breathe new life into a pre-existing franchise. And if you're like me, just hearing this gets you excited. What old famous franchise could Bioware use its Bioware magic on, and how are we currently living in 2023 and a majority of us probably have no idea what game I'm talking about unless you've already seen a weird niche video about it already. Viewers of YouTube, I present to you Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood. Now, I'm sorry, but if you don't know what that is, I'm just going to have to throw that name out there and tease you with it for a little bit while we briefly cover what Sonic is. Just for the few that maybe don't know. I'm going to be honest right off the bat, I have zero emotional attachment to Sonic as a character, as a game, as a franchise, any of it. I didn't own any Sega consoles growing up, nor did I know anyone that did. I didn't really watch the cartoons, I love Ben Schwartz, but I haven't watched the movies, and to be completely honest with you, there's a pretty good chance the first Sonic game I ever played was actually the infamous Sonic 06. Obviously, the RPG made by Bioware is going to be very much not the original Sonic, but for the sake of consistency, let's just go over what Sonic is. Sonic the Hedgehog is a platforming game where you play as Sonic, who can run and spin around at incredibly high speeds. Throughout the game, you'll fly through loops or jump off of slopes, bounce off of springs, also encounter enemies that need to be ran into or bounced on in some way to defeat them. While zooming through the courses, Sonic will collect rings, which also act as his HP. Should Sonic get hit by an enemy or fall into a pit of spikes, he will lose rings, and getting hit with zero rings left will be back to the checkpoint for you. And if you have no lives left, then it's game over. At the end of every main zone, you fight Dr. Robotnik, who has attempted to steal the six Chaos Emeralds. Honestly, as a non-Sonic fan, the plot doesn't really mean a whole lot to me, although I know it's very minimal in the first game, as in there's really none. The boss fights are pretty easy, just bonk him a few times while avoiding whatever he throws at you. Of course, I'm saying this only having played the first few levels, perhaps it gets really hard and I've just insulted every Sonic fan. I'd also like to apologize for those of you who are not only just listening to me speak, but actively watching the video, because the gameplay is awful. I am so bad at this game. I just want to go fast, and I have to keep slowing down to do things, and all I can think of is, thank god for save states because otherwise I would be permanently living in Act 1 of the Green Hill Zone. Sonic has left a long-lasting legacy, they are still around, they are still making games to these days, while some people's opinions have faltered a little bit, and it seems like the characters are inconsistent from game to game, and there's a lot of rebooting going on. It is still beloved by many, many fans. Sonic can be found on dozens of consoles, tons of mashups and crossovers with Mario. And while the gameplay will obviously vary from game to game, most of them at their heart are some sort of platformer. However, there is one outlier to that, and that is the turn-based RPG, Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood. And no, not the Dark Brotherhood like from the Elder Scrolls, however, that would be sick to see Lucy and Lachance show up out of nowhere and tell you who you have to kill. God, there's really no other word to describe how seeing the Bioware logo on a DS next to the Sonic and Sega logo make me feel, outside of the word surreal. 
Now obviously there are more Sonic games on the DS besides this, but you'd have a hard time selling me on the idea that any of them are even as remotely interesting as this, so we're gonna stay in this lane for this section of the video. This game is pretty lore heavy, and as I said before, I'm not a Sonic fan, so I'm very interested going into this game with no previous lore being known, no attachment to any particular character, or really any overall knowledge of the series. I don't know if this game is meant to be a sequel of a different Sonic game, or where it fits in the chronological order, or if it even has a chronological order, or maybe it's like the Zelda games where there's a bunch of different versions of it. But there seems to be a lot of backstory that I don't know that the characters like to bring up a lot about killing Dr. Robotnik and Amy and Sonic are dating but not quite dating and Sonic disappeared for a long time. I don't exactly know what's going on. The two things we'll notice right off the bat with the gameplay are moving with the bottom screen by holding the direction we want to go and the dialogue mechanic. Moving by using the stylus has never felt very natural to me, and funny enough, when I think of unnatural feeling movement in games, Knights of the Old Republic using just the mouse to move always comes to mind. It takes a little bit getting used to, and even when they put things like little loops to run through on the map, it's cute, I guess? It doesn't really feel like it adds a whole lot, it's really just there to make the map feel a little bit bigger, like you need to have certain characters to do certain things. If they were trying to make it feel like Sonic had any sort of speed to him, it did not work. Sonic feels very slow when you're just holding the stylus waiting for him to move. The other thing you're exposed to early on is the dialogue system. BioWare is no strange to dialogue systems, in fact they own a patent on the dialogue wheel from Mass Effect, that's how important it is to them. Seeing any sort of conversation mechanic in Sonic setting is nothing short of a fever dream. The fact that this random guy asked me for help and I can straight up tell him no is incredible. And I really want a Mario game where Mario just tells Toad to go save the kingdom himself for once. Unfortunately, Goody Two Shoes Tails had to get in the way and remind me to be a good person or some nonsense. Throughout the game, you'll be able to walk around and find little loops to speed through, or ledges to fly over, boxes to smash. Characters all have different abilities, and as your party gets bigger, you'll have to factor these decisions in as to who you bring with you. There's also people standing around asking you to complete quests. Normally it's just, hey, kill this thing, but there's a few puzzles where characters will have to stand on certain platforms and figure out things, which is very Bioware if you have played Dragon Age Origins, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It does take a while to get used to, and sometimes the background can be a little bit tricky to navigate. You can't necessarily tell if there's a ledge in front of you or if it's just stylized. But fortunately, the minimap on the top screen helps quite a bit with this, so oftentimes I just found myself looking at that. I guess we should talk about the combat, because, you know, it's an RPG. Combat in this game is turn-based, which is absolutely incredible given that this entire franchise is so closely associated with the three words, gotta go fast, and there is a game where the combat is literally the slowest type of combat you can have in a video game. On the top screen, we'll see the stats of our team and the enemies, and we'll get to see our HP and POW points. We'll also get to see the turn order. The game doesn't tell you why Sonic gets three turns and everyone else gets two or some only get one, but according to the wiki, all characters have a hidden priority stat which decides how many turns they get in a round. The order itself depends on the character's individual speed. In a round of combat, you will have five options. Attack, which will use up all of your slots and all of your moves for that character will become an attack, so it's kind of like a default option. If you want to use an item or use an ability, you have to do that first and end with an attack. Your second category is your POW moves. As you can see on the top, you only have a certain amount of POW points, and these abilities are incredibly powerful and very useful. Some are powerful attacks, some can stun, weaken, poison, empower a friend, curse an enemy, heal, shield, pierce armor, tempt the enemy with your feminine wiles? What? Each character has five POW moves, and you can actually unlock special POW moves using multiple characters that do even more damage. 
However, it does cost both characters the amount of POW points. So for example, if Sonic and Amy team up to do a move, it'll cost them both four points. Each POW move has three levels to them, and when you level up a character, they get five points that they can use to upgrade these POWs, with the cost increasing by five as you go up. I didn't make it in the game far enough to see if this game is one of those, well, you put your skill points in the wrong tree, so tough luck games, but from what I've seen so far, that doesn't seem to be the case, but the game is actually pretty hard. Another thing about POW moves is that it's not as easy as just selecting the move and it's done. They will come with actions that you need to play out with your stylus, including a timing one, keeping your stylus in a moving circle, or tapping a certain number of times in a row. These can be pretty surprising if you're not expecting them or you're just hoping to set your moves and forget them. You always have to pay attention, and missing them can make your POW move miss completely or do such little damage that it's a pure waste of points. Defending is just that, defending. It can lower the damage you take and that's about it, but if a character defends, they can't use any joint POW move. There are various items throughout the game that you'll collect. It's exactly what you expect. Your typical healing, restoring POW points, reviving a fallen character, removing a status effect, and our last option, which is sometimes grayed out depending on if it's an important fight or not, is fleeing, which is nice because it's the only way you can actually make Sonic do any running in this game. That's not actually true because sometimes enemies will flee from you, and the minigame is actually the same, it's just if you're the chaser or chasey. During the flee minigame, there are boxes in the way which not only slow you down, but you'll actually take damage if you hit them. It's pretty minor, it's only like one, but still annoying. And there's also little boosts which if you do nothing, you'll hit and be fine. But it's not uncommon to freak out and just spam jumps when you're trying to keep your eye on four different guys, and it's also not uncommon for enemies to get away. It's kind of a weird double-edged sword because Obviously, sometimes you want to encounter an enemy and kill them for the experience, but sometimes you just kind of want to let them get away, but you don't want your characters to take damage from the boxes. It's not a bad system, I just think it needs a little bit more tinkering. That is pretty much combat in a nutshell. The only thing I didn't really mention is that there are enemy attacks that will do the same kind of thing as a POW move. You will have prompts that you have to complete in order to minimize the damage or make your opponent miss. Although sometimes, even if you miss every single prompt, your enemy will still miss. But either way, this is not a game where you can just set your turns and watch what plays out. You have to be actively focused and make sure that you're ready to defend. The missing attacks thing is kind of annoying, especially early on. You just miss attacks a lot, and there are stats that you can level up to help out with that. Even the smaller encounters can cause you a lot of trouble, and you don't regenerate health or POW points after a fight. And throughout the map, you'll find these little safe houses, and sometimes it feels like there's a bit too many, but they end up being pretty important, as when you enter the house, it'll heal you and your POW points when you leave. The game is surprisingly tough sometimes, and it will straight up just surprise attack you when you least expect it. Right near the beginning of the game, you're about to encounter an enemy, and Tails will not stop telling you to save the game, so you go and save the game, and it kind of feels like it's going to give you a warning before a hard and important fight. But later, there are points where you enter a safe house, not healed up because that's why you're entering the safe house, and an enemy will straight up come and attack you, and it ends up being a really hard battle when you're not at all prepared for it. As I mentioned before, after a certain amount of fights, your characters will level up based off that little XP bar you can see on the top. They don't all level up at once, they level up individually. I don't think there's a way to make one level up faster than the other, and when you get new parties into your group, they tend to level up right away to match everyone else. With leveling up, most of your character's basic stats will go up randomly, and you're awarded one bonus point where you can put wherever you want. It's kind of interesting to see how they award stats to characters, because obviously they don't want every character the same, but because it's a turn-based RPG, there are rules to fill. For example, Sonic is your well-rounded, very fast character, Amy doesn't really have much of anything, but a lot of good POW moves that can debuff your opponents. And Tails is a tank with tons of defense and support spells, which is definitely a choice. You'll also collect tons of equipment that you can add to your characters to boost their power. Some have restrictions or can only be worn by a certain character, 
And these have a wide variety of effects. Sometimes it's just upgrading a single point of attack or defense or speed or luck, but some can recover one POW point at the end of each round, which is obviously very useful. As mentioned before, we also have consumables that we can use during fights. The biggest problem with these is that once you're in battle, there's no description of the item. So let's just say you're in battle and you want to recover 100 HP, but you can't remember if Health Seed or Health Leaf does 50 or 100, and so you might end up using the wrong one. Likewise, there's POW Gum versus POW Candy, although most of the time you can kind of figure out, just based off of the quantity of each item, you'll tend to have more of the lesser ones. But even then, just a little description would be nice so we know what we're using. It's just an extra step I would have liked to have seen, especially considering it's a turn-based game, so you can cut away from the action to look at your items and read descriptions, something like Pokemon. Lastly, we have Chows. Yes, that's right, there's a Chow Garden in this game, and it's incredibly lackluster and underwhelming. They're there, that's about all you can say. You can't do anything with them, you can't really interact with them, they kind of just sit there and groove out. But, you can bond them with a character, and this is where the power of the Chows are really felt. Each character can have one Chow bonded to them, and the Chows all have effects. Some are like elemental shields to help you take less damage, some have elemental boosts to help you do more damage, but some are outright insane and incredible, such as helping characters hit targets more because missing is a huge issue, to my favorite which is automatically succeeding all POW moves. This means there's no tapping or stylus minigame for you to have to do, and there is no chance your attack can miss. You can just do it as if it were a normal attack. And this is so useful to have a guaranteed cannon in your back pocket when you need it. I was gonna go into a whole story discussion, but I don't think it's that super relevant. And nothing I've talked about is even remotely spoilers, so I'll just leave it open and say, hey, if you want to play as Sonic and his friends and kill some robots in turn-based fashion, this game might be for you. I will comment a little bit though on how much of an asshole Sonic is in this game. Tails tells you that because Sonic is fast, he may be a little impatient with people, and that the Sonic head icon will get you out of conversations back to the action faster, whereas the rest will help you build lore and gain information. The winky face is Snarky Sonic, who when Tails says, try asking Amy something to help her feel better, Sonic can just respond, I don't want her to feel better. Wow, what an asshole. The game is desperately having Tails tell you, yeah, you can skip dialogue, but please don't, and Sonic can just answer sarcastically at every turn, and it's hilarious how little he cares about his friends. I don't know anything about Sonic's personality outside of this. I know he's supposed to be a little bit arrogant, but this makes him both super unlikable and super hilarious, and I only wish Bioware just went all out with approval sliders and relationship statuses just so I could watch how all my teammates absolutely hate me and refuse to help me. The game certainly throws a lot at you at once. It can be really confusing to try and dissect a heavy story, map movement, experience, the combat system, the chase system all at once. That being said, it surprisingly comes together really well once you get into the groove of things, maybe after an hour or so. Obviously, the biggest question most people will have is, why Sonic? And while the answer is obviously for sales, I'm very curious how this mechanic would have done with any other setting. I don't think something like this would work with Bioware IPs, but perhaps they wouldn't have had the support they needed to make this without Sega. But ultimately, I wonder what the legacy of this game would be if it was a completely original game, one of those that just people remember years later, and tons of people clamor for a sequel that never comes out. As it is, this game was reviewed surprisingly well, and many people remember it fondly, and a sequel was planned but cancelled after EA acquired Bioware. Still, if you were to tell me that I would enjoy a turn-based Sonic RPG as much as I did, I'm not sure I'd believe you. This game really feels like a basic starter set RPG game that someone with tons of experience and someone with none in the genre can still enjoy. It's just so weird that it's Sonic.
This video is sponsored by absolutely no one who would sponsor this. I haven't uploaded in two years. Why would anyone even consider that? But uh, if you're watching this far, thank you. Please like, comment, subscribe, and all that stuff if you're enjoying it. Uh, take a stretch if you've been doing this all in one sitting. You know, stretch out the arms, look away from the screen for a couple seconds, stuff like that. Drink some water. Uh, and, I, and if you don't mind... I'm just going to take a few minutes to kind of talk about some other things I have going on that you might be interested. There's some a lot of extra content that you do not have access to right now, but you could with just a few easy clicks. So I will talk to you about that. First off, Reality Escape is not my only YouTube channel. I have a few others going on. I have the Ghost Boy 259, which is my personal channel, and I have some like solo indie game kind of breakdowns on there. So if you're interested in just more content similar to this, but not as nice and pretty and polished. Uh, I've got that channel going on over there. I've also got a Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash ghostboy259. My current goal for 2024 is to stream at least two times a week, sometimes three if I can. And uh, right now I'm kind of in an awkward situation where I'm living at home and I have to only stream at night, so it's not super ideal. But if you want like that idea of stream content, but you can't make it to streams, I have Reality Escape Plays, which is another YouTube channel. And that is all highlights from my Twitch streams. Right now I'm starting with only once a week, so it's gonna take a while to catch up, but I do intend to increase that more if the viewership gets more. So if more people are watching the highlights, I will start uploading more frequently on the highlights because they don't take a lot for me to do. I've also got another essay-like channel. It's called The Other Side of Reality. Currently, there's only one video on there, which is me doing a dissection of the Daniel LaRusso and Miyagi from The Karate Kid. And I'm going to be doing the second and third movie and talking about how that relationship evolves. But that is for less editing, more just like writing stuff. And I'm going to be talking a lot about music and movies and TV shows over there. So if that is something that interests you, then feel free to go check that out as well. That stuff's really good to just throw on a second monitor because there's the visuals are absolutely nothing. I've also got a Patreon, which I probably should have mentioned first, but if you're interested in helping support me and the channel financially, uh, you can also become a YouTube member. I have channel membership set up. You can look at each and see which one is like cheaper in your region. I tried to match it up. I don't know if it worked, but just choose the cheaper one for your sake. Don't worry about my end of the split. All support is I'm extremely thankful for. And we have a couple of different tiers going on for the Patreon and the channel membership. First off, we have a Discord. You can join the Discord even if you're not a channel member or Patreon. But if you're in the Discord, you get a special little role. You also get your name in the credits of every video for the $1 a month tier. So at the end, I'll flash all the credits and you can see your name and you can point to it and say like, that's my name, woohoo. Uh, the second tier, which is $5 a month, is not only a more special role in Discord, um, but also you'll get access to main uploads early. If you caught my last video I uploaded last week, basically anyone who signed up for Patreon or a channel membership got the video you're watching right now a week early. It won't always be a week, but sometimes I'll maybe upload a little bit earlier and give you guys a taste of what's coming, or you guys can point out mistakes that I can fix for the final version before that comes out. Also note that in this section here, my Ghostboy259 channel, those videos will go also in this tier before they go on the Ghostboy channel. Along with the special Discord role, there's also some extra Discord channels just for paid subs. And you can also go on Twitch, and if you sub through Twitch and connect your account, you can also get the same benefits through that as well. Lastly, we have a $10 a month tier. And with this, you get access to a production diary vlog. Every video I do, I do a little bit of a breakdown, unscripted, and I just talk about um, the making of the video, the idea conception, anything that I cut out. There's a game that I cut out of this video entirely. And if you want to find out, you can, you have to, you have to go to the production diary and hear me talk about why I cut it out. These will be released uh, either a week or two weeks after every upload. And I'll be responding to top comments on the YouTube video. But also if you're a tier three patron or channel member, I'll take your comments and respond to them directly in that video as well. So it's kind of like a mini Q and A session about the video as well that you get to participate in. How cool is that? If you cannot afford any of these and you just want to support me, but you can't do so financially, first off, I totally understand. I very much appreciate the sentiment. Watching any of my content 
helps. Sharing it online. You can follow me on Twitter slash X slash whatever the crap it's called. I have the blue sky thing as well. Uh, we have a Reddit. We have a Discord. Just interacting with the community, watching us. Uh, interacting with us participating that stuff helps me a ton but if you can support me financially and you wish to then i have some options for you and i've done my best to make sure that you at least get something out of that but again no pressure whatsoever take care of yourselves first all the links are at realityescape.ca so just the name of the channel realityescape.ca that will take you to a link tree and there are so many links in there and all of them are me <laughs> so if you are interested in any of that feel free to check that out thank you very much for watching thank you very much for listening and let's take you to the last part of this video because we got some doozies coming up doozy that's is a doozy a word it must be a word but like what does it mean okay so we're going to switch it up a little bit and do a bit of a speed round none of the games i'm about to cover in this section were actually going to be in this video i was wrapping it up i had 82k words in the book less than an hour of video left to edit and then suddenly i had 17k more words because i knew that if i did not include this every comment would be why didn't you mention this game why didn't you mention this game and a lot of these games I just didn't play or have any emotional attachment to, but I do think that they are worth mentioning in some regard. So for these next few games, it's going to be very bare bones, just kind of surface level thoughts. I'm not going to go into near as much depth on the originals, we're just going to focus on the handheld versions, mostly because I feel like these mechanics are pretty universally well known, and I figure their inclusion is better than not. I didn't play any of these games for too long, maybe 15 minutes to 45 minutes max, just to get a taste of each one. So if there's any mechanics that I've missed or anything like that, feel free to let me know. But here is a speed run of some of the most popular gaming franchises of all time, just to say that I included them. It's the ultimate bro game. Look, I'm not a huge Call of Duty fan, but obviously millions of people are. I'm not here to crap on it, I respect it. It's a huge franchise that has remained relevant throughout its entire existence, and that's no simple feat. Whether you like it or not, clearly tons of people do. As a kid, I enjoyed playing 2 and 3 with friends. Back during the only time in my life where I had Xbox Live, my best friend and I would use our crappy headset mics and swear at people who were clearly much better than us and much older than us. Yes, we were those kinds of kids. We only did it a few times because then we got too scared and eventually stopped out of fear that someone would find us. I haven't played any of the modern Call of Duties. The last one I played was 3. I just really loved this era of the game. Old guns with long reload times. Not a lot of fancy mechanics going on. I'm sure there's a dozen Call of Duty purists who are either praising me or shunning me right now, so I'll remind you again, I'm not a first-person shooter guy, and I would reckon throughout the entire Call of Duty in Black Ops franchise, I played a total of 30 hours, maybe, and most of that is in 2 and 3. In the original script of this video before adding this section, I specifically called out Call of Duty as a franchise I just personally didn't care for or care to cover. And plus in my research, I saw Scott the Waz already did a video on it, and there was no chance I could add anything to what he said because he was going to care way more than I did. Not to mention before I started writing this video months ago, but I had just initially come up with the idea, he came out with two videos called From Handheld to Console and PC Games on Console. And I'm not gonna lie, I've been sweating ever since that he was gonna come for this one, but now I'm a little confident that he might not go into as much depth as I have for this video. I don't know if I would call it the perfect shooter or anything like that because God knows that would start a comment section war for a subjective statement, but it really feels like a game that most modern shooters built off of. I really loved this era, the older guns that needed to be reloaded after a single shot, the rushing with your fellow soldiers, it wasn't futuristic, the storyline didn't involve anything crazy or supernatural, it was just a fun shooter with some objectives to do in the middle. So yeah, when I say I never played shooter games online that much, 
When I say I play Call of Duty for the story, I guess I really mean it. But in terms of Call of Duty on handheld, it seems so weird to me that they would bother getting on the DS. I wouldn't think the fan bases would cross over that much, which is silly because the DS isn't a franchise or anything, it's a console. But Call of Duty was releasing games like crazy on every possible platform, so I guess it makes sense they would get their shot on DS somehow. I'm going to keep this brief, the only game I played was Call of Duty Mobile Warfare Modernized. Swap that, Modern Warfare Mobilized. <laughs> using the buttons to move and left bumper to shoot, all the aiming is done using the stylus and moving it around to aim. You can't reload without emptying your gun, all your weapon changes are done with the bottom screen, same with looking down the sights. It plays exactly how you think it plays. This is a very small handful of first person shooter games on the DS and you won't be surprised to hear that most of them are Call of Duty games. This is really the only way that such a game could be done. We saw earlier how Battlefront decided to change gameplay altogether and I honestly could never imagine Call of Duty going that route. I can only imagine them trying to figure out how to do first person on DS and they did. There are several more games, all of them play kind of the same, I'm not going to dive into them any deeper than this, and as much as I don't really enjoy the controls, I will say they do feel a lot more comfortable than I expected. Don't get me wrong, they don't feel great, but in terms of getting a first person shooter experience on the DS, this is probably the best you're ever going to get, and I respect them a lot for sticking to their guns, no pun intended and knowing what their audience wanted. They released, I think, five or six of these, so clearly someone was buying them. But if you want to know more about them, maybe just go watch Scott the Waz's video. I can't think of a game that I casually mention more in videos than Super Mario 64 and for good reason. It's one of the most popular games to ever exist. It's a game that almost everyone has seen or played or knows about. And of course, it's a speedrunning community that I've been somewhat involved with since 2020. I even prematurely released a trailer for a project I'm working on. And yes, if you're wondering, that's still happening. It just the answer is yes, it's happening. I've had a lot of things going on. It's still happening. Don't worry. It's one of the most quintessential platformers, the game that almost all 3D platformers inevitably get compared to, and it was made back in 1996. Nowadays, the game is accessible through a multitude of means, such as emulators and virtual consoles and Switch versions, but before most of these became mainstream and super accessible, they decided to re-release the game on the Nintendo DS, making several changes and calling it Super Mario 64 DS. I know that this is kind of breaking my own rules, it's not really a pre-established franchise that wasn't already on handheld or something like that, it's technically both a re-release and not, but I knew I'd get a few comments if I excluded it from this video, so here we are. The base game is pretty simple, you play as Mario going through various stages in order to collect at least 70 stars in order to face off and defeat Bowser. There are 120 stars in total with lots to do along the way, such as races and boss fights and collecting 100 coins in every stage. The game is also riddled with little secrets and things you have to discover on your own, although most are pretty well known at this point and kind of been spoiled for everyone, but at the time you never really knew where you'd find something new and exciting hidden in a level. When you hang out in a speedrunning community, it can be pretty easy to forget just how hard this game can actually be when you're not playing and practicing it 24-7. The biggest thing with Mario 64 is the camera. They literally put C buttons on the Nintendo 64 controller to have better control of the camera. And the DS notoriously has camera issues on 3D games. So not only do we have them trying to bring a new energy to the game, remaking it, remastering it, they've got to do that without one of the key features of the Nintendo 64 game. Mario 64 DS manages to feel so familiar and yet make everything feel so different. It's a weird feeling I can't really describe. Everything screams at you to rely on your muscle memory, but the second you try, it will betray you. The camera is very much like the Mario 64 camera with two ways to control it, either tapping the screen or holding L and then pressing left and right. 
neither feel great, but due to other decisions the game made, pressing L to center the camera and then pressing left or right feels way more intuitive. But I also think the camera in general is a lot better than the Nintendo 64 camera, so while I definitely still need to be able to adjust it on the fly, I wasn't moving it every 3 seconds like I would be in the original game. There's also a mode of the game where both the buttons and the d-pad all do the same thing and you can use the touch screen to move around. I can't even begin to describe how uncomfortable this is and if you played this game this way, I would legitimately love to know why you chose to do it this way. Like I don't even mean it in a mean way, like why, what made you want to do this because it's so inconsistent, I couldn't control if I was walking or running and overall it was just a mess of a time. By far my least favorite decision of the game was to make Y need to be held down to run. Your character will walk otherwise, and while I understand that sometimes you need the slowness and preciseness, especially when you're not doing speedrunning strats but playing casually, sometimes you just walk to stars, you need to be able to run freely a lot more often than you need to walk, and all of your movement actions now become a little bit more complicated than they need to be. In order to long jump, you need to be holding run, then hit crouch and jump. In order to do a side flip wall kick, you need to walk the other way, hold run, turn around quickly, then kick, only to figure out that the star you're looking to get doesn't even exist in this version. It's just an added step where you're trying to figure out how to press two or three buttons with the same thumb and it just feels so unnecessary. The reason I suggested holding L to fiddle with the camera earlier is simply because you'd have to either stop moving or at least stop running to move the camera otherwise, and there's just way too many things in this game that you'll always need to be on the run to some extent, and moving your fingers to the screen just takes too long. Still, there will be times you just fly off the edge because you didn't turn with the camera like you expected, although to be fair, that also happens in the original. Controls aside, the gameplay content itself I quite enjoy. It's not the original Mario 64, and it's not pretending to be. Well, it kind of is. Some things will be exactly as how you remember them, and others will be different just a little bit, or require unlocking other characters, or there's some cool unique boss fights, or there's more secrets to discover. It's very surreal when you turn a corner in a level you played the same for 25 years, and suddenly there's a new land. It keeps you on your toes, and secretly, I think the developers played off the idea of wanting people to come in thinking they could easily get all 120 stars, then counting on the playing time being drawn out by them realizing it wasn't all going to be exactly the same. Overall for me, I think the controls work, but the running thing is such an odd decision and makes it really hard for me to get into the game seamlessly. It always feels like I'm making an effort to play. Anytime I want to do a quick action, I have to stop what I'm doing to figure out what combination of three buttons to press, and then if the camera's in the wrong spot, then I have to mentally reset myself, and it just takes me out of the game. But that could also be because I'm so into the speedrunning community, I'm just so used to having to go fast, and sometimes you don't have to go fast, but it just feels so good to go fast when you're Mario. During the two hours I played, it never really got to the point where things started to feel instinctual. And that's a shame because I really like all the additions to this game and I would love to go through all of them and explore them more, but I just think it would be too much of a constant fight for me to want to 100% this. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell is one of those games that I've heard so much about, but I've never actually taken the time to sit down and play or watch any gameplay of, and I get jump scared so damn easily that as soon as I hear that someone can see me and I can't see them seeing me, it's all over. I just get freaked out. Admittedly, recording footage for this section, the first game feels a bit rough to play in modern times. The tutorial gives you a ton to do, mostly climbing, ducking, hiding, wall kicks, which is cool and nuts, and lots of ways to stealthily take out people in your way like guards, beating them to gain information or using their faces to open scanners and then having to hide their bodies from other guards. Your first missions are then immediately nothing like that. You're running into a building that's on fire because you're working for the NSA, you have clearance to just kill anyone you see fit that helps you succeed in your mission, which is... 
Yeah. I don't think I've played long enough to get to the deep essence of what Splinter Cell is, nor do I think I would be good at this kind of game and I would need to play on super easy where no one can see you even if you're standing in front of them, but I get at the core, it's pretty easy to tell what it's about. You stealth, you kill people, you get information without being noticed, and how you go about that is kind of up to you. I think one of the best ways to describe the feeling this game gives you is that there's a section where I was in someone's empty, mostly ransacked house having already killed the two intruders inside, and the entire time I walked around the house I stayed crouched because I was so paranoid that someone else was going to walk in while I was doing things and I needed to be ready to hide. You really don't know what's around any corner who is standing and waiting for you, and while the controls didn't feel the best in modern age, maybe they feel a lot better on console, the intensity is great and that is not something that you can just replicate or just manufacture. It has to feel real and it does, and I can imagine it only gets better as the series goes on. There's a few main mechanics to the Splinter Cell series, at least the first game I played. You've got a bar telling you how much noise you're making or how visible you are. Doing things like crouching or hiding in the shadows can help. Your biggest things to avoid are cameras and people. Cameras can't see you if you're well hidden in the dark, and people are more prone to noise, so sometimes they can hear you without seeing you. You can do a few things with people, mostly knocking them out or beating them for information, and you'll have to hide any bodies if any other guards are near. You can also shoot them, but that's dangerous and a lot louder. You've also got these little lock picking mini games. It's nothing complicated, but I appreciate the effort and I imagine they can be quite stressful when you're in the thick of things, although I don't know if it pauses the game like an Elder Scrolls game or if NPCs are still moving. Splinter Cell had four handheld titles. The first two games, Splinter Cell and Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow, were released on the Game Boy Advance. Chaos Theory was released on the Nintendo DS and Splinter Cell Essentials was a PSP exclusive. While I can guess the PSP game is probably close to a true and good Splinter Cell experience, I'm going to guess that those Game Boy Advance games may not quite have the stealth mechanics people will be hoping for. I was very interested in the first Game Boy game for that reason. I knew stealth was going to take a huge step back, but what was going to replace it? And the answer was platforming. A lot of the gameplay mechanics in the Game Boy Advance version of Splinter Cell is platforming, and it's actually not bad. All of these mechanics you learn in the tutorial of the console version of the game, you learn here, but you use them way more. Minus wall kicking, you can climb up and down poles, hang from bars on the ceiling including hooking your feet on it, which let's be honest that's the Splinter Cell image right there, and run past dangerous weak platforms, and these make up a majority of the game. The first level especially, there's tons of fire, so there's virtually no stealth, you're just avoiding the flames and trying to get out alive, which in this case it kind of makes sense because it helps you understand the platforming aspects of the game more. The mini games are back, there's two main ones, a lock picking one where you need to hit the glowing button, and then the safe one where you just have to rotate the gears, nothing too complicated. You also have your gun, but just a simple B press will take down any guards you see. There is no shadows to hide in, but there's no need to hide the bodies either since it's a side scroller, so once you take a guy out, you're generally safe unless they ring an alarm. If that happens, you have to turn off the alarm before time runs out, and there's a very, very small window. Failure to reset the alarm in time, or any death during the game, will reset you all the way back to the last checkpoint. Which is very in line with games from this generation, but extremely frustrating with how many times I had to repeat certain levels because I kept dying at the very end. One of the biggest problems with the Game Boy Advance game and the games on it is lack of vision, and luckily Splinter Cell accounted for this by giving you a way to move the camera without moving the player, allowing you to see platforms above and below you to better plan out your movements. Not only that, but it allows you to see the sightline of the camera when you're trying to make your way through them, which is a really great mechanic. It doesn't make sense from your perspective because he wouldn't be able to see that if you're looking from an ominous stage audience perspective, but it doesn't matter, it's cool, okay? Just let him have it. You still have a gun and the bar that tells you how loud you're being, not that there's any way to really avoid it. Crouching doesn't really make a difference. There are little spots you can hide in, but you can't exactly make a noise while in there, so that kind of irrelevant. Some of the levels have been rearranged to cater more to platformings, like there's just a lot of ceiling pipes in the office or empty elevator shafts you can climb in. Honestly, 
I'm genuinely impressed. They put all the effort into the right places, emphasizing the platforming aspects. They simplified stealth instead of overcomplicating it or promising a system that didn't work. They found a way to work within the Game Boy's limitations to still see your surroundings so that you weren't at risk of walking off a ledge or something. And while it sure can be frustrating to restart sections all over again, I genuinely really enjoyed this game. Every time I died, I didn't get frustrated or annoyed. I wanted to play it again and do it right and do it faster. I'm honestly kind of shocked this game doesn't have a bigger speedrunning scene behind it. Maybe that can be my next thing, I don't know. They could have very easily made a very generic beat-em-up, but they chose to rework the mechanics they have into a very engaging game. Is it the Splinter Cell you love and expect? No, but I think it's its own thing, and I personally think it's very well done. The sequel builds off the foundation of the original with some new mechanics that favor stealthier gameplay. I know they favor stealthier gameplay because I am much, much worse at this one. Most of the gameplay is the same. The only real different mechanic is that you can now go up against the wall, useful for such things as sliding behind pillars in the middle of hallways or hiding behind curtains. They've also added lots of very long hallway sections with tons of peoples and tons of cameras. You now have to be very careful, pick your spots, and check for cameras, otherwise you will constantly be setting off alarms. They've also brought back some mechanics such as grabbing onto people but not knocking them out so you can use them to open eye locks or whatever. It's more or less the same, but just a lot harder. It feels like they really just built off of what they had before, added a little bit more stealth mechanics, and then made it a whole different experience. I didn't play for long enough into the later levels to see if they go back to more platforming related things, but overall I think this was the right choice if the goal was to get the games to be more like the original Splinter Cell games. Splinter Cell Chaos Theory was on the DS. An experience. An experience I could not play past the tutorial because it pained me so much in the few minutes that I played it. It's tried so hard to be the full Splinter Cell experience and it's made some absurd decisions that make the game feel almost impossible to feel fully comfortable with, which some may say is the point of a stealth game, but I say, eh, not exactly. Chaos Theory is in 3D, and a common problem with 3D games on the DS is camera movements. The way Chaos Theory decided to address this was by making the bottom touchscreen the camera movements. Now the camera still moves on its own automatically, it won't just be completely still but trying to use the camera when you still need all the buttons on the right side of the controller is extremely inconvenient to use. The buttons are used quite a bit. Y does all of your interactions, X does your jumping, B does your crouching. You can also go first person for your gun and the button to do that is the right bumper. And I know what you might be thinking, but don't we use our right hand to aim? And yes, that's correct. In order to shoot, you need to press R, then use the stylus to aim using L to fire. But if you pulled out your gun early or need to change something quickly, then you've got a whole ordeal on your hands. You pretty much have to stop what you're doing to get in position to shoot. And then once you're there, it's going to take a while to get back. I know there's a large portion of people who are probably thinking, well, that's not a big deal. Just use your thumb. But you have to remember that using your thumb can sometimes be very unprecise. And some of us have very large thumbs. And there's even a percentage of people who just don't like using their fingers on touchscreens back then and prefer to use the stylus because that's what it's for. We all knew that one kid that refused to touch the screens. Let's be honest with ourselves. Maybe you're that kid. Regardless, the shooting mechanics in this game mean you really only have one way to do it and that's very slow and calculated when stealth games often involve speed as well as stealth. The game has pretty much every mechanic from the original game. It's the full experience of Splinter Cell, but it's so slow and clunky and awkward, and even regardless of the shooting, which you don't do that often in the tutorial, the camera plays such an important part of the game, and you're constantly fighting it during critical moments because you can't see what's going on around you, or you have to stop moving to set it in the right direction. Maybe if you're a hardcore fan of the original, I could see you enjoying this, but of all the methods I've seen on how to get good cameras on 3DS games, this has to be my least favorite. At most, you could have just made it so the left trigger and right trigger move the camera left and right, and then maybe there would have been something. Naturally, you'd expect camera issues to be on the PSP as well, because there's no second joystick, and you'd be right. Splinter Cell Essentials is, however, a PSP exclusive. 
And I think that without the expectations of needing to copy another game in the franchise, maybe they were a bit more freer in being able to choose how to design levels around whatever camera system they chose. There are two control schemes, both centered about how you use the camera. The camera is operated by using camera mode. Essentially, you'll press a button, lose the ability to walk around, and you'll control the camera instead. Default is holding circle to activate the camera, and then you'll move the joystick around to look. Alternatively, you can hold down on the D-pad and use the face buttons to move the camera. However, unlike the DS game, the camera will not move in this game unless you move it. It is locked in, so you're going to have to get used to managing this. It's not a perfect system by any means, but luckily the NPCs in this game have the vision of your typical Skyrim bandit, so you generally have time to find a good place to hide and plan out your attack before going for it. Shooting also has a much bigger role in this game. It's a lot more action-based as well as stealth, but a lot more action. You just straight up fire and kill people, although that's more game design than mechanics, so maybe that's where the series was leaning at this point. I don't know because I haven't played the later games. I think this PSP game is probably what that DS game wanted to be. It just feels so much smoother, overall runs a lot better, the camera works a lot better, still awkward but better. I haven't played Splinter Cell on a console before, just the PC version of the first game, but if this is how the games feel on console, with obviously a right analog stick to control the camera, I could see myself enjoying this quite a bit. It's not as detailed as the first game, but beyond the camera mechanics, I can't imagine any fan of Splinter Cell being upset if they picked up this game. I really enjoyed going through the evolution of these games. It felt like they played to their strengths with the first one, focusing more on platforming than stealth, found their ground for the second and built off of what they had already made and improved it, much to my dismay. And I think with the DS game, they just got too bold. Maybe they pushed the limit a little bit too far. And I think with the PSP release, they could fully do what they wanted, and I think it's a really solid addition to the franchise. And when I say they, I know very well it's not the same people who make all of the games, it's a general they, it's the people who make the big decisions and approve these games. The Splinter Cell series has been quiet since 2013, and while I've heard there's a remake of the first game in the works, which I definitely think is a good idea, something tells me there won't be any more handheld games in the future for this franchise. Assassin's Creed is another one of those franchises that just got away from me. I've seen bits and pieces of the lore, it's always really interested me. I've intentionally stayed away from deep dives and playthroughs and spoilers for all of these years because it is something I one day want to go experience for myself from beginning to end, and really just get lost in that lore. You might be thinking to yourself that with Splinter Cell just being covered before this that maybe I just don't play a lot of stealth action games and you're 100% correct. I didn't have a name for it back then but it was just something I avoided and now I know it's just because I'm way too anxious when I play these games and I jump at literally every movement unless the stealth mechanics works exactly like the Elder Scrolls. Assassin's Creed has a lot to offer the player right away. Within the first hour, you'll be introduced to dozens of different collectibles or map checkpoints, lots of little side missions, and lots of people to fight, and just enough story to keep you invested, but not so much that you're overloaded when you're trying to learn the game. Seriously, putting this game down for this video was actually hard. After just an hour, I was pretty hooked, and eventually I think I'll just take a month or two, stream every Assassin's Creed game on my Twitch channel, and then maybe I'll make a video about that when I do that. The gameplay seems to be broken in two main segments. You're sneaking stealth sections where you're doing a mix of parkour, blending into the crowd, hiding from Templars, and then the sections where you're just blatantly fighting and everyone is staring. The stealth sections do take a while to get used to because there's a lot of different mechanics, but luckily at the beginning of the game, it's pretty forgiving. The fighting sections are pretty fun, albeit a little bit immersion breaking once you kill off several guards and people kind of just stare at you while you're wearing a very obviously assassin-y looking outfit. What I really enjoy about the game is the consequences to so many of your actions. If you're running too fast, the guards notice that there's something suspicious going on. Pushing through people is an option, but there are also many times you'll just want to be as slow as possible to avoid any notice and any conflict, and it honestly surprises me that a game that has so much of that 
has so much success considering that. I guess now I think a lot of modern games are just action heavy every minute. There's always got to be fighting or explosions or something big happening. So to have moments where you really just need to be walking at an absurdly slow pace in order to stay hidden, and a game back in 2007, and for that game to do as well as it did, was really refreshing. I'm really curious on how, if at all, the handheld games will feature these stealth mechanics or if they'll lean more into the action side of things, which is what I suspect they'll do. I know there's a bunch of games that are released on the Vita, but we're not going to focus on those. I just want to focus on the first three handheld games in the series. Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles, Assassin's Creed 2 Discover, and then very, very briefly, one sentence, I just want to mention something about Assassin's Creed Bloodlines. Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles for the DS actually acts as a prequel for the first game in terms of story. It's not open world like the original game, and if you're expecting it to be, that's kinda on you. In terms of the DS game trying to give you an Assassin's Creed experience, I admit I think this does quite well. More or less it has the same mechanics, maps are normally divided into two sections, the streets and then the top of buildings allowing lots of space for parkour moves, but also some moments where you have to hide among the crowd. They try to make it not all 2D by bringing you into the foreground and background a bit, Unfortunately, some of these jumps are kind of tricky and I end up overshooting a lot. When the parkour does work out well, it feels great. You're running a straight line, slide down ramps, do some cool unnecessary flips. It's everything you want out of an assassin game. On the ground, you have people and lots of Templars, all of which are indicated on the minimap, which is the entire touchscreen. Normally, I would complain that the entire touchscreen is just a map and nothing else, but in this case, you can't see too far in front or behind you because of the perspective, so it actually helps quite a bit. There are indicators everywhere for where to go, either there are circles to walk into or giant arrows pointing to where you need to be, but the arrows don't always point you in the right direction and the circles can sometimes be unreliable, and sometimes you just end up skipping things if you go far enough. The pathing isn't the best, it's a little easy to get lost, and sometimes you'll wander around in circles for a few moments. The game gives you two ways to do things, either you can stealth around the Templars, or you can be like me and accidentally drop in on them constantly and end up fighting them. Sword combat feels fine, there's tons of weapons to unlock later, but I didn't play long enough to get any of them, so I imagine it changes a little bit. You've also got two mini games you can do with the touchscreen, pickpocketing and interrogation. Pickpocketing will have you uncover the screen, find what you're looking for, most likely a key, and then getting it out of the bag without touching anything else within the bag. For interrogating, you have pressure points along the back that you need to press when the circle gets within the smaller circle. This one is okay, it's not very colorblind friendly, but you don't need to nail all of them in order to succeed at the minigame. And I like the use of the touch screen here. It makes sense to incorporate it somehow, and these mini games give you a little bit of extra interactivity and makes it feel like these tasks are harder than just pressing a button. The game is pretty forgiving. I died a ton because I'm trash at games and there's tons of checkpoints that keep you right in the action and there's different difficulties as well. So maybe the Templars are harder to fight or they detect you easier, I don't know. Overall, I think it's a great representation of the Assassin's Creed mechanics on the DS and I can't imagine being upset at this if I was a fan of the series as it was growing back then. Next up is Assassin's Creed 2 Discovery, and for what seems like the umpteenth time in this video, we see a company go back to yet again a side-scrolling game. The gameplay is very basic. You move, jump, roll to the side, kill guards when they are or are not looking, and make it to your end goal as soon as you can. There's not always a time limit, sometimes there is, but at the end of the level it always tells you how fast you went anyways. I'm not exactly sure why, but I think there's maybe bonus points or unlockables or something. During missions you'll be given an objective, but mostly it's just go to the right or to the left. There's no variation or way to really get lost, and I didn't read any objective, I just kept moving forward and eventually found what I was supposed to be doing. On some missions on the top right you'll have a triangle with three sections. Anytime a Templar or a guard notices you, one section gets filled in red. And if you get more than three, then it's game over and you have to restart that section. This incentivizes you to kill them sneakily, which the only way is to walk behind them when they're not looking and attack. But also the levels are all pretty short with plenty of checkpoints, so sometimes I'll just keep going as fast as I can and take my chances as to which direction they're facing. 
If you don't do an instant kill when they're not looking, then combat is just tapping Y. There's really nothing to it. You can do a follow-up strike after your first one is blocked, but the timing is really weird and doesn't always work. And if you're blocking, right as your opponent is winding up, you have a chance to reverse the hit, to which they'll normally respond by immediately blocking and putting you back into that cycle. It feels like they intended you to do stealth everything and to avoid combat, so maybe they didn't put a ton of thought into it. I like the parkouring aspects, they're quite fun when you're going fast and low-key feel like you're playing Assassin's Creed Sonic, which let's be honest is the crossover we've all been asking for for years. And at its foundation, it's not bad. I like the concept, it just doesn't feel like a fully fleshed out game to me. Like if you told me this was a Assassin's Creed mobile app, I would believe you. If you combined the first DS game with this one and made this like an escape mini game you had to do at random points. I actually think that would be a great combination and be the perfect Assassin's Creed DS game. But on its own, it maybe feels a little bit too simple, and I really miss the use of the touchscreen. The last game we'll touch on is Assassin's Creed Bloodlines, and it's about what you expect. It plays nearly identical to the base game, it's well done, and the main reason I even wanted to mention it is just to say that the camera is done by holding L and using the face buttons to change direction, which is odd, but it works. The camera has of course been a reoccurring issue for a lot of these games, and while nothing will feel perfectly natural, the in-game camera is actually pretty good already, so the moments where you need to alter the camera are far and few in between. Unlike the Splinter Cell games that we covered earlier, the Assassin's Creed games had the challenge of adding stealth mixed with action, and overall I'm not terribly surprised that they both leaned more into action with fake stealth mechanics. Ultimately, I think they both created two solid halves of one game, and had they combined them together, I think you would have had a really solid Assassin's Creed game. While I wouldn't say any of these games are necessary to enjoy the Assassin's Creed experience, I don't think you're losing a whole lot either except for, you know, the time it takes to play. Civilization is the ultimate turn-based city building game, the game that someone is always playing on our Steam list, and they never just have 100 or 200 hours, it's always 5k plus easily. People live and breathe this franchise, and the main reason I don't want to break it down entirely is because I don't want to super offend any Civ players. I'm placed even below a filthy casual with only 45 hours played which I don't even think is a full game of Civilization, but it's also more hours than I've played some of my favorite games of all time. The game that we're talking about is Revolutions, which is a bit interesting since it's the DS version of a console game, which is the console version of a PC game. The fan base seems a little divided on this title, so much so that the fandom page said Sid Meier was supposedly quoted saying, this is the game I've always wanted to make, and I genuinely wasn't sure if it was sarcasm or not. If you're not familiar with Civilization, it is a turn-based strategy game. I know I'm showing you gameplay from 5 when it should be from 4, but I barely play this one, I wasn't gonna buy 4 just for a few minute rundown. And I know there are some differences and that Revolution is mostly based off of 4 and it's weird for me to feel nervous talking about this game. Why do I feel nervous talking about this game? Every video there's always a handful of comments telling me how bad I am at games I'm showing and I badly just want to blur this whole thing out so no one can judge me. Because this is part of the video that we're kind of speedrunning things, I'm not going to go too full into things and break down Civilization as a PC game. I'm going to assume that Revolution was intended to get players who hadn't played the PC versions into the game, and just break down those mechanics on their own. Hopefully that makes sense, but I feel like we could be here a really long time if we get too deep into it, as evidenced by the fact that if you YouTube search how to play Civilization, the first thing that pops up is a six part video tutorial where it's a combined three and a half hours. If you're a big Civilization 4 fan or even a Revolution fan on the console, feel free to leave a comment telling me how the DS game compares to those. In the meantime, I'll just give you my general feels on it. The game feels like traffic. It's very crowded and very slow. 
Now I know the words slow and civilization go a bit hand in hand. It's a turn-based strategy game. It's not exactly meant to be fast paced, full of explosions and fireworks, but everything feels a bit unintuitive. And the things they've added to the game to make some processes go faster kind of work against you if you don't know how to use them properly. I thought maybe perhaps some of the research time would be sped up, but it's not. Everything still takes 7 turns or 21 turns. So there's a lot of turns near the beginning where really not a lot is going to be happening. Units are a plenty and they can only move one space a turn. I don't mind this, but if you want to say set them 3 or 4 spaces ahead, it locks them into that. The other thing you can lock a unit into is defending a space. Now this isn't inherently bad, you've set them on a course and they're seeing it through, but it does make changing things on the fly pretty difficult. If a unit is defending, it will not even be available during your turn when you're cycling through units that you can do things with, unless you deselect the unit that you're on and go into scroll mode where you can look around the map, and then you highlight that unit and then tell it to stop defending. With movement, you're stuck no matter what. Even if you go into scroll mode and select that unit, it will just continue to see its movement through. You can't stop the movement part way. After your moves are all done, the screen will simply tell you your turn is over, which is kind of frustrating, especially when you have a unit moving to a place you may no longer want it to go to due to new information. Because of this, the best way to do things is really just to move every unit one space at a time, which really drags the game and feels counterintuitive. The other thing is that it's not really a fatal flaw, but something I noticed a lot that bothered me while playing is that the default mode is not scroll mode, but having a unit already selected. When you've finished an action, perhaps you've set your cities to what units you want them to build, instead of sending you to scroll mode where you can go around and click on anyone you want, and then maybe having a button to press to select a unit, or maybe having another button to press to find an idle unit that hasn't moved yet, it will automatically snap you onto another unit. Meaning you have to again press A to go back into scroll mode and do this every single time. I really could not get the hang of this. I had so many accidental movements because of it, especially because my first game started me off on an island. So the only way to get off the island was to place everyone on a boat so I put the boat in between two land gaps and had them walk through. But then I would accidentally move the boat and stop the entire process. There's a few other things that are really small in particular to complain about. The top screen really only acts as a constant reminder for the controls, which isn't bad, but it feels like it could have maybe contained more information. The tutorial is also really annoying. You'll get feedback on how to do something and it'll tell you to press A, only for A to open up a chat menu where you have to select OK. Like I said, they're really small things, but when the experience is already so condensed, it really feels like it jams everything up. Again, I'm kind of comparing the game from the PC to the console to the DS, so I don't know how accurate everything is, but beyond that, there's not really a ton I can say. I just don't know enough about Civ to know how this combat system works, if it makes any sense, if it's like the PC version or if it's like the console version. Based off of my reading and my hour playing, if I had to guess this is like the most bare bones stripped down version of Civilization that you could get. Maybe not in the sense that it's great for beginners, but if you're a big fan of the franchise and wanted to play on the go, I still think there's a lot of enjoyment to get out of this. Lots of things felt very familiar to me considering I'm not an expert in the original games by any means. The essence is definitely still there, but for me personally, I would have a hard time buying into the idea of playing this game for 60 hours just to have one battle. Grand Theft Auto on handheld gaming is such an interesting concept. While admittedly, I'm not much of a fan outside of playing with lots of cheats as a probably way too young child with my best friend, I never really made it past the first few minutes in the fourth game. When I heard there was GTA games on Nintendo consoles, it was hard not to be intrigued. I don't know if it's just in my head or what, but Handheld gaming has always had this stigma around it that it was mostly for a younger audience. 
Nintendo specifically still seems like it caters to more of a family friendly audience. And in my head, it was always Nintendo for the Pokemon fans and Mario fans and casual gamers, and then the hardcores who were super into violence went to Xbox and PlayStations to play games like Grand Theft Auto. Regardless, Grand Theft Auto initially started as a top-down driver, so porting those mechanics to the Game Boy would in theory be a lot easier than, say, porting the 3D games. However, just like pretty much every franchise on this list, it's that damn Nintendo DS port I see off in the distance that intrigues me the most. If you are somehow not familiar with Grand Theft Auto, you can probably at least guess the mechanics. It's a lot of driving, a lot of shooting, stealing cars, and just kind of messing around. You can do story missions, but as a kid, my friend and I would literally just drive around and do our best to see how long we could survive with the most stars, which is quite honestly still just as fun. This is the most I played of 4 since the year it came out. I've never really looked at 5 outside of watching other people play, and I know the PSP Grand Theft Auto games are extremely popular, but they also play very similar to the console games, so I'm not really going to be focusing on them for this part of the video because it's basically just GTA. For this section, we're gonna focus on GTA Auto Advance, an exclusive for the Game Boy Advance, and then GTA Chinatown Wars on the DS. Grand Theft Auto Advance, the perfect game for your Game Boy Advance that's also covered in Pikachu stickers. Visually, the game doesn't look bad at all. It's a top-down 2D game like the older games, but for whatever reason, they've chosen to give the buildings this tinge of 3D-ness where you can kind of see the buildings look like they're wobbling back and forth as you drive by them. It's awkward to say the least. It makes the game feel significantly more janky than I think it had to feel, and I do think the word janky is the perfect descriptor of this game. The game is mostly driving, occasionally you'll get out of your car and beat some people up, but for the most part you have your radar and your map and you just go where it tells you, you chase someone down, or you lose someone that's chasing you. The other cars are slow enough that you can drive at a decent pace without having to constantly slow down to make sure you don't hit anyone, and the game seems to be more lenient towards you running over pedestrians, although maybe that's just because I only played the earlier levels of the game, so maybe they get a little more strict with that as we go on. Either way, it happened a lot, and most people did not seem to care about vehicular manslaughter. Beyond that though, the driving feels good, and it makes me wish that Crazy Taxi played like this because weaving in and out of the cars and streets is actually pretty fun. Playing the game not in a car feels a bit weird. It definitely feels like it took a backseat to the driving aspect, which makes sense. It's a little hard to figure out where you're hitting or who you're swinging at. I didn't manage to hit anyone with my gun, but I could be playing a game with 100% auto assist shooting at a wall and I would still miss the wall, so that's nothing new for me. Overall, I think my favorite part of the game is the fact that when you walk up to a vehicle, you won't run into it, but you'll jump over it. So when you get a really long vehicle, hilarity ensues because it's just a bunch of people trying to jump over your vehicle. And then it becomes even funnier when they start to get stuck because they don't know how to get out. GTA Chinatown switches to a behind-the-back third-person perspective, and overall, I was really impressed by this game. It's very story heavy, it feels a lot more like the mainstream line of games, at least the few bits I played of them. Driving feels pretty good, civilians are walking about way bigger than they should be in comparison to the cars, but honestly I think it's funny so I don't have an issue with it. Shooting and fighting feels a lot better, you can press R to lock onto your target and then press A to do some martial arts like fighting, or you can use your gun and it locks onto the target. There's a few scenes where you can chase people and vault over fences, which feels pretty fun. And then when you're in a car, you press A, you'll start doing a drive-by shooting and randomly firing at people. So you need to be careful because you can't really aim this and sometimes you just forget and press A instinctively and then suddenly you've murdered someone. The touchscreen is actually used. They have a hot wire mini game, but it's also used to manage your phone and your emails and your quests, which is pretty good considering how often those are used in the mainstream games. Normally, I have a complaint with games that only use the second screen as a map, but given how iconic the map is to the GTA franchise, it actually feels like it fits in perfectly. It honestly felt pretty good. It took a while to get used to, but it's a pretty complete feeling game. I genuinely can't imagine what they could have done different or better, and overall for me, it's just surreal to see how such a violent and drug-filled game was on the DS, the same console where I played 
many hours of a game where you capture a little cute electric mouse and travel the world together. The Tony Hawk games have a special place in my heart, as growing up my best friend was a huge skateboarder. He was constantly on the board, it was hard to get him off the board, and I have no coordination whatsoever, so our way to bond over this interest was the Tony Hawk games. Well, I was a little bit more of a Disney extreme skate guy myself, it's hard to ignore the impact that these games have had on the world, especially bringing skating to such a spotlight. Recently, Tony Hawk and Jason Ellis were on Dr. Mike's podcast, and one of the sentiments that was brought forward by Tony was how skating brought forth such an amazing community of misfits because when nobody fits in, everyone does. There are a lot of Tony Hawk games, even more than meets the eye when you consider that some games had multiple versions for multiple consoles. Pro Skater was on the Game Boy Color, Pro Skater 2 was on the Game Boy Color and Advance, Pro Skater 3 was on the Game Boy Color and Advance, Pro Skater 4 was just on the Advance, same with Underground, but Underground 2 was on the Advance and PSP, American Wasteland was on the Game Boy Advance and DS as American Skateland, Downhill Jam was on the Game Boy Advance and DS, Project 8 was on the PSP, Proving Ground was on the DS, and then Tony Hawk's Motion was a DS exclusive and that ended that line of games. It shouldn't surprise me considering how many Tony Hawk games there are that there would be just as many if not more handheld, and I'm expecting quite a few to be extremely similar games, but let's speed run this section and find out. Pro Skater on the Game Boy Color has three modes, Half Pipe, Tournament, and One-on-One -on -one via CPU. Half Pipe is exactly what you think it is, it's just skating on a half pipe, holding the direction you're going to go faster and building momentum and speed and then using A to do a lot of tricks. Initially I thought you could only do ollies and it was just a game of how many rotations you can do, but then I realized that it does ollies if you hold left and right and different tricks for up and down, so it's all about combinations. It's a bit weird that the B button isn't really used at all, but overall I really like this mode, it's just obviously not a full game. The tournament mode and 1v1 mode are different sides of the same coin. In tournament mode, you'll be competing against three other skaters, but not in a race, just to get as many points as you can. The only way you can get points is by grinding on objects, so really it's just timing to get your jumps right and making sure you're not hitting any walls or objects that will stop momentum. And at the end, the winner is whoever has the most points, it doesn't matter what order you finish in. In 1v1 mode, it's just a straight race. Because of the way the courses are all set up, they're mostly set up for the tournament mode, you'll end up doing a lot of tricks just to go faster anyways, and chances are you won't really see your opponent at all for any of the race because of how wide it is. It's not bad, this mode isn't as polished as the other one feels, the visuals certainly are a little bit lacking in this mode, but overall I think they're both fine, and after about 15 minutes of playing, I felt pretty much done with this game. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 on the Game Boy Color builds off the ramp from the first game, which is the right decision. Some levels are straight side-scrollers, some have a little bit of back and forth movement to them, but I find these a lot harder to navigate because as nice as the levels look, there's not a ton of depth to them, and the game still has a lot of grinding tricks, so I found myself missing a lot of the ramp tricks. The game feels a lot more like console Tony Hawk games, you can chain tricks together including several grinds in order to get a bigger score and multipliers, but if you fail to land you just won't get any points for it. There's also a career mode here used to unlock more stages, at the beginning of the level it'll give you a checklist to earn some extra money, and then you play the stage for 2 minutes and at the end collect whatever money you've earned. If you don't do the things on the checklist, you'll make like $10 and unlocking stages later on costs upwards of $3,000 so it can be a bit of a grind but if you're good at the game and you want to do all these challenges, I'm sure you could knock it out pretty quickly. Pro Skater 2 on the Game Boy Advance looks incredible for a Game Boy Advance game. Full 3D game with isometric view, it feels like a really solid handheld port of the game. Now you can do full half pipe tricks and you have the difficulty of being in the right orientation to land them. The addition of the bumpers onto the Game Boy Advanced really helps you get a lot of variety to tricks and combos. 
My only complaint isn't so much mechanically, but game design wise, you only get one level to start off with in career mode, and while your checklist is huge, there's only two for getting points, and the rest is just kind of a collectathon. And besides the two checks for getting points, just doing tricks won't get you anything, so really, you're better off spending your time looking for barrels or Batman signs or whatever you're looking for. It's not bad, obviously career gives you a reason to play, but I'd like a few more starting levels or incentive to actually pull off more tricks in the game, because discovering when you have such a limited range of view just isn't that fun. Pro Skater 3 on the Game Boy Color has gotten a bit of a visual facelift, with everything again being played on one line, unless you hit a ramp, then you can transfer up or down to a new line, but this isn't always consistent, and I'm not sure how to do it, and it kinda screws me up a lot. I'm not sure if I just don't know how tricks work properly or what, but sometimes I had good airtime and I couldn't do anything. I do like that it has more levels openly ready, but for the most part it's the same thing with different visuals. Also, every character skin is way darker for some reason. Like, I'm no expert skateboard follower, but I'm pretty sure Rodney Mullen never tanned this much. Pro Skater 3 on the Game Boy Advance is more or less the same as 2, just new levels and some new coats of paint. It's really fun to do tricks in these games, I just have no desire to do these checklists where it's like find all these things and grind on all these poles, which I know are core mechanics to the original Tony Hawk games, but on handheld I just want to play and skate and do cool tricks, which I can still technically do in free skate mode. If you're a fan of the originals and you want something very similar on the Game Boy Advance, you got exactly that with this. Pro Skater 3 was the last game to be on the Game Boy Color, and Pro Skater 4 only received a Game Boy Advance version. Pro Skater 4 on the Game Boy Advance follows the same pattern as the previous two. Again, just really solid gameplay, but the career mode has been changed. Now you can freely skate around, and when you come up to someone, you can accept their challenge, which will have you completing a goal for them. The only problem is that sometimes it'll say something like, do a trick, and you don't know what that trick is or how to do it, and it's not in the views trick section, so I genuinely don't know what to do. The other problem is mostly camera perspective stuff, like I'm terrible at skate games and it took me 80 seconds to pick up this damn letter S and I still don't know why or how I managed to get it or what I was doing wrong. Tony Hawk's Underground moved away from the pro skater name and comes with an actual story mode rather than just a career mode of doing random checklists. And you can even customize your name and character. Naturally, I chose suit on top with camo pants on the bottom, and I did this just because I wanted to say camo in a video, because there's a video on my channel with 1.1 million views where I said cameo instead of camo because I would record and edit at like 4 in the morning when I was half asleep, and that mistake will haunt me for the rest of my life. Regardless of how dapper you dress, the story seems to be that you're a young kid who lives with mom and owns a blog about how much you love Tony Hawk and want to meet him. Your friend Benny is teaching you how to skate, and you can pull off some pretty gnarly tricks considering you're just a beginner. The format is the same as the last game, but in this one as you're wandering around, you'll meet people, and as you do their requests, you'll unlock more parts of the stage. One thing this game has, which is the first for the handheld series, is being able to get off your board and just walk around. It's kind of awkward, you can't just hold a direction to walk, you have to aim your walk and then hold A but if you don't run in certain places that you technically aren't allowed to be in, you'll get kicked out. One thing I liked is that your skills upgrade and you unlock new tricks the more you use certain types of tricks. So if you grind more, you'll unlock more grinds. If you flip more, you'll unlock more flips. Very Skyrim-esque, although I didn't play it long enough, so it's possible you might get screwed over if you don't do a lot of tricks evenly enough. Tony Hawk's Underground 2 on the Game Boy Advance is more of the same formula. Tricks feel just as good, there's a lot more story in these ones, and 100% more Stevo than previous games. I really enjoy the evolution of these games. The core of the Game Boy Advance games hasn't changed in the slightest, but every game it's adding more features and making it feel more open. And let's be honest, skateboarding games are kind of sandbox anyways. All they really needed to do was add new levels and fans would be content, but at least it feels like they were continuing to up the stakes and further the games. Underground 2 on the PSP is exactly what you would expect and want it to be. It feels great. It's the exact same game as the console version, same cutscene, same absurd story with jackass characters. And you can create a lovely monstrosity. I'm only three years old. 
But otherwise, there's not much to say about it. It's just a good Tony Hawk game. It's the same Tony Hawk game. Just by default, you wouldn't possibly get any better than this because it's just the original game in its purest form. American Skateland, which was renamed from American Wasteland for some reason, was on the Game Boy Advance and DS. The Game Boy Advance is business as usual. If it's not broken, don't fix it, which let's be honest, the Tony Hawk games followed that formula for a long time. And they all sold incredibly well because they were incredible games and I genuinely had no idea the Game Boy Advance games would be so good. American Skateland on the DS was the first Tony Hawk game on the DS and they made no risks or changes whatsoever and because it's the first, I 100% applaud this. There was no PSP version of Wasteland so if you wanted a fully functional portable DS Tony Hawk game, this was it and they nailed it. I never would have imagined a DS skateboarding game feeling this good. Like, they still make use of the touchscreen for freakouts and whatnot, but honestly, the game just feels great without it. It just, it's a great Tony Hawk game. If I had this as a kid, I would have spent so many hours in it. Again, Tony Hawk games weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. They were about putting out a formula and improving on it every time, and their handheld games follow that formula. That being said, Tony Hawk's downhill jam on the Game Boy Advance feels like a step back in a lot of ways. Graphically, it's just not appealing to look at. The prior games all felt really stylized and they worked. This is in 2006. Like, it feels like something that maybe would have been really impressive on the early days of the Game Boy Advance. But at this point, the DS was already out for two years, so I guess in my head, I just expect anything on the Game Boy that's out this late to be the cream of the crop. The game actually goes back to the formula of the first Game Boy Color game, where you were racing several other skaters to the bottom of the hill, doing some basic tricks and lots of grinding along the way. You have a speed boost bar on the right, which can be filled either by doing tricks or collecting pickups, so you can't just ignore tricks completely. You also need to be holding forward, otherwise you won't be going as fast as you can, which is a bit weird and unnecessary, but I guess it's the only way to give you some semblance of speed control when you're approaching corners. Besides racing, you'll also be able to do challenges on tracks, which is do a certain amount of this move and a certain amount of this move on this track before reaching the end, or just a general point one where you have to get a certain amount of points. Winning gets you money, money can be used to upgrade your board. The system is a bit odd, you basically unlock new boards and you can upgrade them with the money you win, but then you're constantly getting new boards so there's almost no point in spending the money. And then you don't really choose to equip the board, I assume the equipped board is the last one you have on screen before you exit, but it doesn't really say that and you can't really verify through visuals so I have no idea. It just feels really slow for a racing game, a bit like Snowboard Kids or Mario Kart but without the projectiles. Ultimately the other racers are completely irrelevant because you can't interact with them in any way, it might as well just be a time trial, which I know this is criticizing the mechanics of the original game and not this one specifically. The only thing that can really get in your way is not landing an ollie properly, or you mess up a grind, or the environment doesn't render an obstacle properly until it's way too close to you and you have no time to react. Now I should also note, I've never played the PlayStation version of Downhill Jam, but I've looked up footage and I gotta say, it actually looks pretty sick. So I can imagine they were just trying to go for a faithful recreation and maybe this was just the closest they could get. It should not surprise you in the slightest given the last DS game that Downhill Jam on the DS is far superior in every way and it's not just because of the graphics but also because there's so many more buttons that allow you to do so many things. There's also a lot more game modes in this one instead of just the usual three of race points and tricks this one has elimination races or getting points over a gap or getting collectibles. It takes a lot longer to progress, but overall it feels so much better to play. The tricks are a bit more forgiving and while the concept is still a bit odd, it's definitely the better version of the two. If I could go back in time as a kid and have two Tony Hawk games to play on handheld devices while growing up, it would be this one and Skateland. Easily, no questions asked. They just feel really, really good. Tony Hawk's Project 8 on the PSP, it's Tony Hawk on the PSP, I'm sure it's got a story or something, but it's the same thing as you expected. Tony Hawk Proving Ground, yep, you guessed it, 
it's it's Tony Hawk on the DS. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. Why would you? It's more or less the same thing yet again, and it still is fun and good yet again. The last one I can't really talk about was Tony Hawk Motion because it requires a Game Boy Advance pack called the Motion Pack, and it uses motion controls to turn, which I didn't even know that's a thing the DS could do. There's a video online by user Zach G where you can see some gameplay, but according to him, it isn't that good. I'm on the outside looking in on the Tony Hawk franchise. I've played my fair share of some games, but I haven't bought or played them all as they've all been released by any means, so I don't know the general opinion of the Tony Hawk games. But it doesn't take much to figure out that they pretty much found a solid formula early on, and every game afterwards follows that formula. Even the handheld games follow this exact style. The Game Boy Advance games up until the end followed and improved upon the same thing over and over. The Nintendo DS games followed that trend, and the PSP games play exactly like the console games. They could have taken risks, and normally I applaud games that do, but in this case they delivered a game that was exactly the same as all the other games, which also happened to completely dominate a market and very specific niche. And at the end of the day, I can't imagine they would have gone through the trouble of making 16 different handheld games if they weren't selling them. Alright, look, I drop quite a few references to Kingdom Hearts in my videos, and the idea of including it in this video seems exhausting just to think about, but the idea of excluding it would make it feel incomplete. Kingdom Hearts is indeed known for many, many things, and one of those things is the absurd amount of game systems you need to play the games before the HD versions or remixes or remasters or whatever you want to call them came out. PlayStation 2, Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS, PSP, 3DS, Japanese phone, browser game, mobile game, and finally a PlayStation 4 or 3 or 5 that lets you play almost all of the remakes, and now they're available on Switch and PC, so they're a lot more accessible. As you can probably guess, this is by far going to be the longest section of this video, because we have a lot to cover, and it's not all about mechanics. What interests me about the way Kingdom Hearts integrated the handheld scene into the franchise is not only did they write stories in such a way that the player could technically skip them and not be too lost on the overall plot for the main console games, but also in ways that fans will vehemently defend these games as proper sequels and not just filler. But no handheld game is like the one before it. Each game chose to experiment with mechanics that made every game feel truly unique and its own individual experience, and some mechanics ended up being popular enough that they made their way into Kingdom Hearts 3. Now I'll do a brief, and I do mean brief, story dissection on the games because it's relevant to how the handheld games fit into the franchise, but also because uniquely to this video, Kingdom Hearts is a story-based franchise. Unlike most of the other games on this list, and really even Spyro to an extent, the story in Kingdom Hearts matters a lot. It's the reason to play the game. A lot of other games on this list are pick up and play. Star Wars Battlefront, you play a few games and call it a day. Kingdom Hearts doesn't start and end with one game. It continues on throughout every game in the series, something very unique to the games on this list, and while there will be some borderline major spoilers of the first game in this video, the rest will feature just minimal story setup rather than focusing too heavy on the plot and resolutions. I'll do my best to be as quick as possible with these, I would honestly love more than anything in the world to do a full breakdown of every Kingdom Hearts game, so please, comment and tell me if you want to see it. Even if you don't want to, please just give me a reason to do it. If this video hits one likes, I will do it. I swear I'll do it. Sora, Riku, and Kairi are three teenagers who live on Destiny Island with a yearning to one day escape and see other worlds. That opportunity eventually comes when their island becomes engulfed in darkness, being attacked by creatures known as Heartless. Sora begins to fight off the darkness with a magical weapon called the Keyblade, but Riku more so embraces the darkness, and the trio end up split up from each other. 
Sora ends up in Traverse Town where he meets Donald and Goofy, who have been sent on a mission by their now missing King Mickey to find the Keyblade Wielder, as they believe he's the only one who can stop the worlds from disappearing. Sora agrees to go with them, mainly for the sole purpose of trying to find Riku and Kairi. As they travel to different worlds, they encounter Disney characters and their villains and essentially help them through their stories. We are also introduced to the villains behind the Heartless, led by Maleficent of Sleeping Beauty. She is after what she calls the Seven Princesses of Heart, which can be used to unlock something called Kingdom Hearts. Generally, at the end of each world, if there's a princess you've been helping, she goes missing by the end, or perhaps she is missing the whole time. At the end of every level, Sora will use the key to lock the worlds, thus protecting them from being destroyed by the Heartless. Riku ends up being found by Maleficent and is manipulated into believing that Sora no longer cares about him and Kairi, only Donald and Goofy. It's also revealed that he has Kairi, who seems completely lifeless and out of it, unable to speak or really do anything. Eventually, Riku and Sora meet up in Hollow Bastion, where Riku reveals he was always the intended true Keyblade wielder, and the only reason Sora got it is because Riku didn't have control of the darkness in his heart yet. Donald and Goofy temporarily abandon Sora, and then they get together and defeat Maleficent and confront Riku, who is now completely possessed by someone named Ansem, Seeker of Darkness. It turns out Ansem is the one truly behind it all, as he has been the one telling Maleficent what to do. Ansem in Riku's body tells Sora that Kairi is the seventh princess they've been looking for, but her heart was transferred into Sora during the destruction of Destiny Island, and thus we need to use Riku's special keyblade on him to unlock his heart and set Kairi free. Sora wins the fight, but ultimately decides to set Kairi's heart free anyways, turning himself into a heartless. However, after roaming around as a heartless for a while, Kairi embraces Sora and the power and magic of friendship turns him into a human once again. Sora and friends travel to the end of the world, which is meant to be the resting place for all the worlds that were successfully destroyed by the heartless where they finally confront and defeat Ansem the Seeker of Darkness. In Ansem's final moments, he calls upon the door believing Kingdom Hearts to be complete darkness, but it turns out to be completely light and destroys him. King Mickey finally arrives, asking Sora to help him close the door for good. Riku helps Mickey from the other side of the door as they group close the door and lock it with their keyblades. However, the worlds begin to reform, including Destiny Islands, and Kairi is sent away, with Sora promising to find her once again. We last see our trio off on a journey in search of Riku and the King. That's all well and dandy, and probably about as minimal as I can get with the story. It's about 20 years old now, and it's only one of many, so I don't feel too too bad about spoiling it. And if you listen to it after I've warned you, well, I'm sorry, that's on you. Now, I want to get into the mechanics of the game, so we can talk about both mechanics and story with the first handheld game. But if this is your first time being exposed to the Kingdom Hearts story, it might be a little tricky to remember all that plot that I just told you. So if you have to watch that section back again before moving on to the story part of the next game, that's okay. It's not the easiest franchise to get a hold of, although the first game isn't too too bad with that stuff, and honestly, I commend you for even watching this section if you've never played the games. So I'll touch on combat first, and then we'll talk about all the things to do outside of combat. Also note here for the people paying attention to the visuals, I am indeed playing the 1.5 HD Remix. So there are minor control differences, such as the game using the triangle button more for certain actions, and the camera being controlled differently with the stick instead of R2 and L2, and beyond that, it's really nothing notable, but I will bring it up again later. Outside of camera movements, which varies according to which version you're playing and jumping, all of your actions will take place in the box on the left corner. Sora's health and magic bar are on the bottom right of the screen, with Donald and Goofy's stats right above his. Throughout the game, Sora will level up, gaining magic and health points, and these can be altered depending on equipment and keyblades that you choose. Throughout combat, when magic is used, a thin yellow bar will start to form anytime Sora lands a physical strike with his keyblade. When the bar reaches past a full depleted blue bar, it will refill the magic points by one point. 
This is extremely useful so that you don't have to rely on enemy pickups to refill your magic points. It also means that when you have more than one magic, you regain those points slower, but if you were say using 4 magic points, and you had at least 4 of the yellow lines filled, the game does compensate for this, which is pretty nice. On the left side is your combat deck. Your top option is attack, which will always be there in combat situations. Using the d-pad to scroll down, your next listing is magic, which it will give you a list of all the spells. Spells are mostly attack, such as fire, ice, thunder, and a basic heal spell, but there are some unique ones. Arrow is a defensive spell, which creates a sphere of wind around you that reduces all damage you take. Gravity will flatten enemies caught in its sphere, but it's pretty slow to use so most enemies can move out of the way, and the sphere isn't very big. It is however useful on large, slow enemies and can be used to solve some puzzles. The last spell is Stop, which will freeze enemies and will allow you to hit them without them blocking or moving, and after they are unfrozen, all the damage will hit them at once. It's also worth noting that by naturally playing through the game, most of these spells will slowly get upgraded and become more powerful. Some spells will use different amounts of MP, which will also factor into how much you use them. A spell like Stop using 2 MP might be too much to use if you're not using a lot of magic and need to make sure you have a cure ready to go. Your third option will be Items. Now this isn't a list of every item available to you, but rather what you have equipped. You can only change your equipment when you're out of combat, so if you use any of these, you'll need to refill them outside the encounter. You can also give some of these items to your companions as well, and while you can use the AI to help program how they use them, there's a good chance they'll waste them anyways because they're just trying to be good supportive friends and they don't know how. Be patient with them. Remember what matters most is that your intentions are good. There are potions and high potions for healing health points, ethers or ethers if you want to call it that for restoring magic points, elixirs for restoring a little bit of both, and mega versions of all three items that will not only affect you, but your teammates as well. You can also use the solo versions of these items on your teammates, but it can be a little tricky in the middle of a fight to scroll down twice, scroll to your desired item, then scroll down some more to pick your desired teammate. Picking a spell might feel the same way, which is why holding L1 will give you access to a quick menu where you can assign the X, square, and triangle buttons to three different spells or items for quick and easy access. I generally find that I put the main spells I use here, but then I have a problem where I almost never go back and use the spells that aren't on my list. And traditionally for 20 years, I have always gone with cure and X, fire and square, thunder and triangle. The biggest change from the original game to the remixed combat is this last menu here. In the original game, it was dedicated to abilities. Throughout the game, Sora will learn abilities that will also use magic points like spells, and will often be used as combo finishers or really strong finishing attacks. Originally, they were found here at the bottom, which again is pretty awkward to use in a fight, especially because they're so situational that by the time you realize you have the option to use it, you've scrolled down, the option is gone, and now you're pressing X but no longer attacking because you've no longer selected attack. They've made a tremendous improvement for the HD Remix, Final Mix, Remaster, whatever you want to call it, and made use of the mostly barely functioning triangle button. So now they are much easier to use and way more noticeable when you have the opportunity to use them. The bottom option now is summons, which used to be so buried deep in the magic menu that they were pretty difficult to use. Summons will replace your companions and have unique effects to help you out. During combat, you are likely to jump around and get a lot of mid-air combos, and you can also lock onto certain enemies if you want to focus on one specifically. Pressing triangle with no abilities available will call upon your companions to attack whichever enemy you have selected or locked onto. Enemies are likely to drop one of four things, health and MP pickups in the form of varying sizes of green balls and bubbles respectively, money, which are little blue and yellow balls, at least I think they're yellow and blue, I'm colorblind, and occasionally they'll drop items as well. Items can vary, from equipment such as the rings that give you bonus attributes, items like potions or elixirs which we discussed earlier, or most commonly, synthesis materials which we'll get into a little bit later. The combat feels a little weird and clunky at first, especially something like pressing X to attack which was really untraditional at the time. Anytime I come back to Kingdom Hearts after a long break, 
It takes a whole adjustment period again, but after maybe 15-20 minutes, it feels just as natural as it did when I was a kid. The camera was awful in the original game using L2 and R2, and the HD Remix changed it to use the right stick, and it just feels so much more natural that way. And that mixed with the commands using the triangle button, I would argue there's pretty much zero reason to ever play the game in its original PlayStation 2 form ever again, unless of course it's monetary restraints, or maybe there's a speedrunning reason. There are also several Keyblades you can collect throughout the game. Most are just from finishing levels, but there are a few that you need to go out of your way for. These will change your combat style, with some changing how combos work, some are maybe shorter so they don't have as much length but they're more powerful, and there are others that are weak but they give you more magic power. It's also important to mention here as well that the more total magic points you have, the stronger your magic is, so if you're playing a magic build, the more magic the better. Leveling up is a thing that happens, and while it may seem completely random, it's actually related to how you answered the questions at the beginning of the game, and what weapons you picked and sacrificed during the tutorial. This means for people who are starting a new game and really want to metagame and get the best build possible for their playstyle, there are specific options that you can pick that will help you. When you level up, along with certain items you can equip to your Keyblade, Sora will gain ability points, and Donald and Goofy will have their own unique setup as well. You can use your AP or ability points to equip abilities as long as you're within your limit, and these will help out a ton. The most common one is Scan, which allows you to see how much HP your targeted enemy has, but there are others such as Lucky Strike, which raises the chance of a rare item dropping, Berserk, which increases attack power when you have low HP, MP Rage, where you recover magic when you're hit, and many, many others. There's also some shared abilities you'll lock as you beat levels in the game, such as High Jump and Glide. These abilities are also where you can select some triangle commands, although it's important to note that these commands will use up some of your MP as well, so you don't want to get too reckless with them. Now I could talk about enemies here for a long time, and I won't be able to go on about all of them, so I'll give you a general rundown. There are Basic Heartless, Basic Heartless in World Appropriate Costumes, and then World Specific Heartless. The most common in Basic Heartless are the Shadows, Soldiers, Large Bodies, and the Floating Heartless named after musical composition types. Shadows are basic enemies that sometimes go into the ground so you have to wait to hit them. Soldiers will rush you but otherwise you just need to hit them back. Large bodies can't be hit from straight forward, so you will need to either jump to hit their head or hit them from the behind. The spellcasting Heartless are quite interesting and equally as annoying. The Red Nocturne cast fire spells, but will actually be healed if you use fire against them. Blue Rhapsodies are the same with Blizzard, Yellow Operas do the same with Thunder, and the Green Requiems are healed by almost all magic and cure other Heartless in the area. These you'll find almost anywhere, and then we start to get into specific Heartless for the world. Monkeys for Tarzan, Bandits for Aladdin, Jellyfish for Atlantica, Skeletons for Halloween Town, Pirates in Neverland. These are not all, but just some of the examples of what you'll encounter in these worlds, and they make each world feel very different and unique, despite the fact that for the most part, you're fighting the same enemies. In Hollow Bastion and later levels, you'll find more generic Heartless and powerful Heartless, like the Dark Ball, Defender, Wyvern, and Wizard. These all take a while to beat and often have patterns you need to pay attention to to defeat them, but overall represent a solid evolution of difficulty for the most basic enemies. You've also got White Mushrooms and Rare Truffles who won't attack you, but rather you can do some minigame things with them and get some items because of it. When visiting a world, you are likely to have one or two boss fights. These are often Disney villains, but sometimes are specialized Heartless, like the Dark Side from the very first fight on Destiny Islands. A lot of these bosses are just hack and slash, but quite a few of them are very unique fights with set phases and stages that you need to remember to get your timing right. In order to travel from world to world, you'll be boarding a gummy ship and doing gummy missions. I'll be honest, it's not the most exciting thing in the world, you're basically in a ship and going through a set course. It's something you do once and then you kind of get the general idea, but you have to do it several more times, and then later on they give you the option to skip it by allowing you to teleport anywhere you've previously been, but it is worth mentioning since it is a mainstay in the console games. 
The game is an all combat, there will be plenty of moments in the game where there is no combat whatsoever, and the game generally has a few puzzles here and there for you to figure out, such as Deep Jungle where you have to find the right vines to get across, or getting lost in Monstro, or pretty much all of Wonderland. There's also two special worlds that don't function like any others, that being Hundred Acre Wood which is just mini challenges, and Olympus Coliseum which is just battle trials and a few boss fights. Throughout the game you'll find plenty of chests in hidden spots, and sometimes not so hidden spots, and some might need abilities like higher jump or glide in order to reach. And these chests can carry literally anything from keyblades to potions to synthesis items to dalmatians, which there are 33 scattered across all worlds, and you can return them for rewards. Chests can also contain Ansem's reports, of which there are 13 in total, and of course all of these are needed to 100% the journal. There are also marks of three hearts on the ground called trinities, and there are five types total. Blue, trinity jump, red, trinity charge, green, trinity ladder, yellow, trinity rush, and white, trinity detect. In order to use these trinities, you must have Donald and Goofy with you, and the three will perform some sort of action that can have varying effects. Normally items, but can also contain gummy ship parts, the aforementioned Dalmatian puppies, synthesis items, transportation, or access to different previously unreachable areas, and sometimes even weapons or keyblades. While some of these are mandatory and you must do them to advance the game, most are optional, and since you unlock the ability to do some trinities later on in the game, a lot will require backtracking. In fact, even some of the mandatory ones, like in Traverse Town, will require backtracking anyways, but the game is normally pretty good about this and guides you to where to go. Lastly, we have item synthesizing, which I have already mentioned several times, and I imagine I've had to do each of those takes several times because of my damn lispy mouth. Throughout the game, you'll find many items in chests and dropped by enemies that will allow you to synthesize items. Some will be as simple as shards to make potions, you can also make accessories to increase your party stats. You'll need to synthesize a total amount of unique items in order to unlock the new tier of items, and at the top of the tier list is the Ultima Weapon, the most powerful weapon in Kingdom Hearts. It is an absurdly long grind to get in any game, and guides are definitely your friend to make sure you're getting the right items you need. This is the first Kingdom Hearts game in a nutshell. A way too limited spaced nutshell, but this is the gist of pretty much everything you can do in this game. The first Kingdom Hearts game was released in early 2002, and after two and a half years of waiting, we finally got our sequel. Although to most people's surprise, it was going to be on the Game Boy Advance. It almost feels like a crime for a game that looks so good and relies so heavily on its amazing cutscenes to be smooshed into a tiny Game Boy Advance, and nowadays there's an HD remake which actually adds those cutscenes and the 3D gameplay that were missing in the original version. The good news is that in terms of full story spoilers, I don't have to do that anymore. There are five handheld games in the Kingdom Hearts series, and I'm only going to talk about four, and they all branch off of the first game and the beginning of the second game, which, nicely enough, I also don't have to go into the ending of that. I'll explain about why I won't talk about the fifth game, Dream Drop Distance, when I get there, but in the meantime, expect minor spoilers for Chain of Memories, Recoded, 358 over 2, Birth by Sleep, and some spoilers for the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2, and virtually no spoilers for Dream Drop Distance. Firstly, I am going to make a confession. I have never finished Chain of Memories. In fact, I don't think I've ever played the game for more than 10 minutes. And you'll see why soon enough. The gameplay is completely different, and still divides the fan base to this day, with some praising its uniqueness and loving it, and others who have never absorbed the full story of the game just because the combat scares them away. I was one of those people, I was also 9, and this video marks the first time I've made a serious effort to go through the game. Now of course before we get into mechanics, I'd like to talk about the brief bit of story that I want to talk about and why I think it's so genuinely genius and creative. 
Sora, Donald, and Goofy are seen walking down the same pathway from the ending of the first game when they stumble upon Castle Oblivion. We meet a hooded figure who tells the group that the farther they will travel into the castle, they will begin to lose their memories. That's it. That's all you need to know. Now, if you're a hardcore Kingdom Hearts fan, you're probably thinking, oh my god, Ghost Boy, that's not even close to anything that happens. But that's the beauty, is that if you've never played this game before and you want to go from Kingdom Hearts 1 to Kingdom Hearts 2, that's all the information you need. Now, this may sound like an extremely overused cliche, but for 2004 and a young audience who maybe hadn't been overexposed to a cliche where the main character has amnesia, and in a universe where absurd things happen to time and memories anyways, it fit in perfectly. One of the best literary devices writers will use in fantasy settings is introducing a new character who is unfamiliar with that setting, so that the person experiencing the story can learn the world along with them. Luke Skywalker has lived an extremely sheltered and protected life. Frodo and the Hobbits hadn't left the Shire before beginning their journey, the kids obviously hadn't been to Narnia before, and Junie and Carmen had no idea their parents were spies. Don't ask me why I ended with Spy Kids, I wrote a comma, so I had to add one more, and for some reason, Spy Kids came to mind. Sora is new to the Kingdom Hearts worlds in the first game. He learns of other worlds, interworld travel, the idea of hearts and darkness and nobodies, and by the end of Chain of Memories, his mind is so scrambled that he, along with Donald and Goofy, are put to sleep for a year so that they can rebuild their memories from the ground up. When Sora wakes up in Kingdom Hearts 2, he remembers the events of the first game, but he remembers nothing from Chain of Memories. I feel like it's less so now, or maybe I just pay less attention to this sort of thing, but growing up for me, there was a huge brand supremacy and loyalty when it came to console wars. You were a Nintendo kid, a PlayStation kid, or an Xbox kid. My dad is an IT guy, he's into technology and gaming, and so I was the only person I knew growing up that had a mix of company consoles. Because of this, I think they were smart enough to know that they wanted to get into the mobile market, but also realized that maybe the same people who were playing PlayStation 2 wouldn't necessarily have a Game Boy Advance, Although, I think when it came to handheld gaming, there just wasn't many other options out there, so it might have been a safe choice. By Sora forgetting the experiences of Chain of Memories, it puts us on the exact same track as him if we didn't play Chain of Memories. Sora gets main points of the game summarized to him throughout Kingdom Hearts 2, but not everything because not everything turns out to be relevant. It allows the player to get the main points of the plot, while those who played Chain of Memories to feel like they know just a little bit more than the character and the average player. Because I never played the game as a kid, there are still things I'm unsure about when it comes to the plot and how it affects the other games, but they were written in such a way that it wasn't completely necessary, and if I needed to know something, someone would summarize it and tell it to me again. That being said, the stuff that gets lost in between isn't a waste of time either. Now you may say as a counter argument, clearly nothing interesting can happen that advances the plot because Sora forgets it all and it must just be filler. And to that I say, mm, yes and no. Yes, it is kind of filler, but it's filler that pays off years later with other games. There are subtle details that you'll understand if you've gone through these extra steps. And if you go to videos about Chain of Memories, you'll see people defending it and saying it's not filler, it's not a spin-off, it's a proper sequel. People who love this game really respect it, and it does have an important place in the story for those who have played it. I think the best and probably most popular comparison in mainstream media would be Star Wars and Rogue One, which is my favorite and the best Star Wars movie and comments will be closed at this time. If you were watching the movies in chronological order, which, why would you do that? You could watch episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and get a full, satisfying story. However, if you watched Rogue One in between episodes 3 and 4, maybe add Kenobi and Solo, heck, if you want to go back and watch all the Clone Wars cartoons and the Rebel Alliance cartoons, just go all out. 
you're still going to get the full and same experience as the next guy, enough that you can relate and say you both love Star Wars, but you have that little bit of extra sweetness as a reward for having seen it all. Little clues that tell the viewer, hey, we know you've been paying attention, and we thank you for it. Nowadays, if for some reason I couldn't play a game in a series, I could watch a plot summary on YouTube, or when I was younger I could watch a Let's Play because maybe I didn't own a 3DS to play the Last Kingdom Hearts game, okay guys? But back in 2004, this wasn't an option, and even though I didn't really like the combat of Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, I never felt left out because of it. Now of course you know I own a Game Boy Advance, half of this video is about games I owned or played at some point, so why didn't I like the combat in Chain of Memories? Well, I certainly tried to like it, but the gameplay did something very, very different. And while it's definitely creative and I give them 10 out of 10 points for that, it's been very decisive among all of my friends who have played the games and overall the Kingdom Hearts community. To this day, I still see people debating on whether or not it was a good call, and, well, that's kind of the point of this video, isn't it? So, what did they do? Chain of Memories is a deck building game. No, ser no seriously, it, it, it's a deck building game. But it's not played like a card game exactly, but it uses this rather unique system that I don't think I've seen anywhere else, and maybe it hasn't been done anywhere else? Maybe that's for good reason? I don't know, that's not up to me to decide. Everything Sora knows and loves, including Donald and Goofy, has been turned into cards for completely unknown reasons upon entering Castle Oblivion. And so, every battle, Sora uses a deck to determine the actions he takes. I'm going to apologize to the Chain of Memories fans right now because I don't 100% know if I understand exactly how the combat system works, if I get something wrong or I miss something, please bear with me. I've had people try to explain it to me. I've played the game now myself, and even then I'm not 100% confident. So if I say something that is completely out of line, it is all my friend's fault and none of mine. Got it? Good. At first look, the game looks great. Kingdom Hearts really had a nice, solid, clean transition to 2D, and this would be one of the only 2D Kingdom Hearts games. During combat, Sora can walk around and jump freely, and pressing A will use the current card selected on the bottom left corner. Each card has a number value that will determine whether the card works or not. If your enemy isn't using a card, then you're good. If they do play a card, as long as your value is higher, your attack will go through. If your value is lower than theirs, they'll attack you, and if it's a draw, it'll be a card break and nothing happens, the cards just disappear. Zero value cards are the only exception where it will always break your enemy's card no matter what. Once you run out of cards in your deck, you will have to hold the refresh icon until the deck comes back, and the more times it runs out, the longer it takes to refresh. There's not just basic attacks in the cards as well, but pretty much all of the mechanics that we mentioned in the first game are now limited to cards. Spells, potions to heal, summoning your allies to attack, such as Donald and Goofy. Throughout your journey, you'll collect more and more cards to add to your deck. Your deck can be up to 99 cards, but you also have a limit of CP, card power. Things like Cure don't require MP or anything like that, there's no more magic points, you just need to have the card. And items like the Potion now recharge all of your attack cards without having to wait and do the refresh. You can also get Heartless cards that increase things such as hits to combos, value of cards, randomizing values, and a bunch of other crazy things. Of course, these only happen when you put them in your deck and specifically go to select them so you can plan ahead for these wacky effects. One thing you can do is stock cards, hitting both L and R at the same time to basically save three cards together and then pressing them together again to unleash an attack of three strikes at once with the value equaling the three cards you selected meaning they're pretty powerful and hard to break. You can also use slights in combos, combining cards into one attack, basically doing the same thing. However, when you use a slight, the first card you've used for the slight is basically locked away from the rest of the fight. So if you go crazy, you risk having too many attacks and having to recharge a lot, and again, each deck recharge takes longer than the last. 
You'll get plenty of cards as you play through the game. Some can be found throughout the level in random areas, some one after battles, some you can buy at the store, all with a card power level. Unlike in the original Kingdom Hearts, you can actually choose what happens when Sora levels up. And two of the consistent options are more HP or more card power. While you're wandering around these worlds, you'll need to unlock doors. To do this, you need, you guessed it, more cards. Most doors will require a certain power level of cards. These cards are earned by defeating the random Heartless in the area you're in. Not only that, but these cards can actually affect the room you're unlocking them with. Some will cause less Heartless to spawn, some will cause many more to spawn, which is good if you're trying to get Heartless cards. Some will make the Heartless that do appear even stronger, or maybe they'll be sleeping and easier to attack, or there's a huge variety of other things. I'll also note here that while a battle will start if Sora walks into a Heartless, you can also strike the Heartless to start a battle and get a bit of an advantage, similar to Paper Mario. Some of these doors require specific keys to open. Sometimes these keys are collected through story cutscenes, or sometimes you just have to wait for the right one to drop. This can get confusing, and there is a great forum post on GameFAQs with an explanation, sick of people asking them. So thanks, ColdStare underscore 4. I'm thinking of you, wherever you are. We pray for our sorrows to end, and hope that our- I'm sorry, what? I got- I got sidetracked. What were we- what were we talking about? It's really not that hard to see why the Chain of Memories combat system is so decisive. I don't even know if you understand how it works and I just explained it to you. I don't even know if I understand and I just explained it to you. I know quite a few people who really like it and the most I can bring myself to say is that it's okay. And that's kind of hard for me to say. I think a part of me resents this system so much because it prevented me from playing the game when I was younger. I never got a chance to really involve myself heavily in the lore, and while I call myself a hardcore fan of the series, it took a long time to actually go back and learn all the events of this game, most of which I'm still a bit unclear on. I don't really mind the card system, I just wish it was… slower. I find myself spamming A like it's just a normal attack, then realizing I have no cards, or my health is low, or I've been spamming Ice Magic at Ice Heartless because it's just in my deck. Like I mentioned in the first game, there are specific Heartless who get healed if you cast their spell at them, and it can be a lot harder to avoid these things when you're just spamming through cards. Taking your time, switching cards to make sure you're not casting fire at a red Nocturne Heartless will inevitably get you attacked as you stand by and do nothing. You have the ability to go through your deck and choose what card you play next, but it's just too fast to do any of it effectively. You're more likely going to be tapping A and just hoping for a favorable outcome than rather meticulously selecting which card you want to use in what situation. They actually remade this game, Re-Chain of Memories, and to the surprise of many, they didn't change the combat system one bit. I think a lot of people were hoping that the move to 3D space would have them change it up and it would just be like a console game so that people who didn't understand the card system the first time could follow along the story now. But they chose to stick to their guns and I respect it. I will say that the game feels totally different and weird in 3D. It's basically a brand new experience, all the levels are different, but I get that it's the most accessible way to play it nowadays. And also hearing some of the cutscenes voice acted is pretty cool. In terms of things to do outside of combat, this is where the game kind of falls flat. There's no puzzles, no real platforming, no trinities to find, or really much of a journal to 100%. More so, the only extra thing to do is to collect cards, which, you know, it's like what Kaiba said, gotta catch them all. You fight, have some dialogue, fight some more, walk around a pretty much empty room, grinding out fights to get more cards. It's completely understandable that people who didn't like the combat didn't really have much of a motivation to keep playing the game because besides combat, there's really not much else to do in this world outside of 100 Acre Wood because, you know, of course, you gotta have the most mundane mini games possible. There's also no real items, so therefore there's no real item synthesizing. It's all just there to create cards to get in the rooms. Boss fights don't really feel as special. You can't really have cycles with this style of gameplay. They more or less feel the same as the other fights. The only difference is that you might need to lose, then reload your save, customize your deck a bit, and come back with a different approach. 
Another aspect of Chain of Memories is the fact that the premise of the game is Sora going through his own memories. Outside of Tarzan, which they only had the rights for for the first game, almost every world that you visit is from the first game outside of Castle Oblivion itself and an original world called Twilight Town. Now, again, this was the first sequel to the original Kingdom Hearts game. I don't think it would be crazy unreasonable for a lot of people to expect some new worlds and story advancement, but this very much felt like the middle game in a trilogy. Kingdom Hearts kind of stands alone, but Chain of Memories really just serves as a setup to Kingdom Hearts 2, which in its defense, it did that job pretty well and Kingdom Hearts 2 wasn't that long of a wait. Mixed with combat that some people really didn't like and no new worlds to explore and barely getting to explore the old ones in this new format, I can see why people passed. But as I said, the story was written in such a way that made it possible without getting too lost. Is it a filler game? I will actually strongly defend it and say no it's not, despite the fact that I've never actually finished the game myself. Is it a necessary game? No. But if you're a hardcore Kingdom Hearts fan and you've never played it, I'd say give it a shot. It's not very long, if you grind enough I'm sure you can just brute force your way through a lot of the battles, and ultimately there's some great story stuff that's never mentioned again but still gives you the feels. And of course, before we move on, if you are a fan, you're probably saying, well, you should probably mention that you can also play as a Riku. Yeah, it's cool. It's the first time you don't play as Sora in a Kingdom Hearts game, although it's only the second game, and this would actually become more and more common as we continue the franchise. Riku's deck building is a lot different. You can't customize it at all. And again, it's just going through the same levels again as a different character. If you didn't like the combat the first time, you probably won't love it the second. In terms of story, we're really just seeing Riku confront that darkness that he struggled with so much in the first game, but we also start to get into the concept that there is more than one version of Riku floating around, and maybe if you're not familiar with Kingdom Hearts, you've seen the meme where it's like all seven of these people are different people, but it's all the same person, and yeah, I don't wanna, yeah. When people say this game is just filler, I do think it's really unfortunate because so much of Riku's character development comes from this game, and he really does shine and become a fan favorite here. Without this aspect of his personality, we'd basically be hopping onto Kingdom Hearts 2 with a few scenes on Destiny Island, a few scenes on Hook's ship, and a few scenes on Hollow Bastion. And while yes, they are touching, and they are some of the highlights of the game, it just doesn't give you enough time to really dig down deep into the real Riku. On to Kingdom Hearts 2, we luckily don't need to talk about it too much or spoil anything in terms of story because we're not really covering any of the handheld games after the second game chronologically. You might be thinking, well wait, isn't there Dream Drop Distance that came out after 2? And yes, but we'll talk about why we're not going to talk about it when we talk about it. Also yes, Recoded takes place after Kingdom Hearts 2 of course, but Let's be honest, the story to that game does not matter, and we'll talk about that very soon. Kingdom Hearts 2 starts off with a character named Roxas, who is brand new to the story and the player, regardless if you play Chain of Memories or not. What you will recognize if you play Chain of Memories is Twilight Town, where the beginning section of Kingdom Hearts 2 takes place. I did not even know that Twilight Town was in Chain of Memories until making this video. And now it feels so much cooler when Sora goes to Twilight Town later in Kingdom Hearts 2, because he feels connected to the town and has no idea why. It's very obvious throughout this intro bit that Roxas is connected to Sora somehow, they don't really try to hide that, but luckily we don't need to reveal just how he's connected for this video. Eventually Roxas will play a part in waking Sora up from his sleep from Chain of Memories, and Sora gets to go on some adventures in new Disney worlds as well as some familiar old ones. Mechanically, Kingdom Hearts 2 feels very much like a proper step up from the first game, the biggest change being reaction commands. Much how like Kingdom Hearts 1, specifically in the remastered version, changed using abilities to triangle, this was kind of inspired by the original design of Kingdom Hearts 2. 
While in KH1, it took until the remaster of the game to change these commands from the bottom of the menu to triangle, in Kingdom Hearts 2, it was always triangle. Reaction commands are like abilities, except sometimes they are specific to Heartless you were fighting or the companions in your party. And it can also be used in boss fights to give them different cycles or make it differ from just standard combat. This became a pretty big part of the gameplay and some of the most memorable moments of the game are because of these commands. The other big addition that Kingdom Hearts 2 added is drive forms, of which there are a few different types. A drive form will consume one or sometimes both of your companions, but turn Sora into an incredibly powerful version of himself, speeding him up, enhancing his damage, and giving him unique attacks and abilities. I was going to go deeper and talk about each drive form separately, but drive form doesn't actually return in any of the sequels or handheld games, at least not in the same sense that it does here. That being said, the reaction mechanic, or really the idea of pressing triangle to do something other than a base attack, does return, and plays a huge factor in the upcoming handheld games that we're about to talk about. Four years after the release of Kingdom Hearts 2, we were given our next handheld game, this time on the Nintendo DS. 358 over two days. You can debate on me how you want to pronounce this, I do not care, I've heard every option under the sun, as far as I'm concerned, it's up for interpretation, but as far as I'm also concerned, 358 over 2 is objectively correct, and feel free to leave your comments below, I will be sure to delete them. In Kingdom Hearts 358 over 2, you play as Roxas, the character from the start of Kingdom Hearts 2, except you play as Roxas throughout the entire game. As we had no idea who Roxas was at the start of Kingdom Hearts 2, this game details Roxas' story up until the beginning of the second game. During the second game, there is information revealed about Roxas that includes him being involved with a group known as Organization 13, the main antagonist group of Kingdom Hearts 2. That isn't a major spoiler by the way, it's revealed within the first like 30 minutes. In 358 over 2, you play as Roxas during his time in the organization, and naturally in true Kingdom Hearts fashion, even at the beginning of this game, he has no memories, and so you will get to learn everything alongside with him including the world of Kingdom Hearts and how the organization works. This may seem very hokey if you're not familiar with Kingdom Hearts as a series, losing memories and amnesia just to give the player a fresh start and heck, for Roxas they did it twice. And a part of me also feels like, yeah, it, it kind of is. It's certainly very convenient. However, once you truly get to know Kingdom Hearts and its story and how it operates, which is basically the cheesiest anime ever with Disney characters and everyone talks about the importance of friendship, you'll find this is such a minor thing and still justified enough in the story to the point that most people just don't really care about it that much. 358 over 2 feels a bit like a sequel to Chain of Memories, not just because it's the second handheld game in the series, but because they both give us an insight into Organization 13. In Chain of Memories, there's a lot of characters whom you never actually meet in Kingdom Hearts 2. There's not even 13 members in Organization 13. And in 358 over 2, the story basically begins around the same time Sora steps into Castle Oblivion. We get to meet all of the Organization 13 members and get to know each one individually, including the ones that Sora defeats in Chain of Memories, and we learn how their defeats affect the remaining members. It's not entirely set in the idea that you're playing in the villain group to justify their actions or make them seem like good guys from their point of view. Most of them are pretty consciously evil, but every character is very unique and vibrant and even though some kind of look alike so you get a little confused, they all have very strong personalities. Really, that's what people enjoy about this game. It's learning about how their personalities clash with each other, and it's not really a big surprise that they weren't afraid to lean on these personalities later on in the series. Due to Roxas and his friend Gion being the two newest members of the organization, you get to learn the insides of the organization from two completely new perspectives of characters that really understand less than we do as players. Again, the filler debate comes up every now and then, but many will argue this game has one of the strongest stories in the series. It's really the story about Roxas and giving him a little bit more life. He was really just a side character to me, but this game cemented him as probably my favorite character in the franchise. 
I can't really dive into it without spoilers, and while you can't play this game on the remastered versions, you can watch a movie version of all the cutscenes. I will say though that if you do intend to play it, please play Kingdom Hearts 2 first. It may seem like you'd get more information playing this game before Kingdom Hearts 2, but the game and really the series presents itself in such a way that I believe it's best to play them all in release order. But while many people praise the story of this game, that's only one half of the coin. A lot of people will also argue that while this has the strongest story, also has the worst gameplay the series has ever seen. Is that criticism justified? Well, let's look into it. 358 was the first handheld game for the Kingdom Hearts series into the third dimension. But naturally with the DS controls, you can imagine it's a bit awkward and uncomfortable. However, this was where most DS games were headed. And so it only made sense for Kingdom Hearts to do the same. 358 over 2 at first glance may seem like it's just going to be the same hack and slash gameplay we're used to, with a menu that's a little harder to navigate, and without using a joystick and gamepad. But soon we come to realize that we will be using a panel system for leveling up. Roxas has a grid which has a set amount of panels allowed within the grid. Everything to do with the game, every ability connects to this grid. Weapons, items, spells, abilities, all of it is organized within your grid using panels that you'll unlock and purchase throughout the game. Even leveling up is a panel slot. You must be thinking, surely I would just run out of slots and fear not because as you play through the game, you'll unlock slot releasers, which extend your grid. Why not just make leveling up extend the grid? I don't know. Some panels take up different slots, some panels can have panels put inside their empty connected slots. For spells, however many times you put that spell in is how many uses you'll have of that spell on your mission. In Kingdom Hearts 1, you had mana bars. In Kingdom Hearts 2, you had one bar with percentages taken out, and somehow that evolved to only having as many uses as you brought with you. Potions like ethers or ethers become way more important because they will actually replenish all the magic you brought with you, but using magic with any sort of regularity is kind of dead, or at most it's a lot to organize and handle. You can also synthesize panels or gears or whatever they're called, which is always a welcome addition back to the series. Now the core gameplay revolves around missions, and before every mission you'll basically be told to fiddle around with your loadout before you go. The game straight up tells you that you may have to reload your save a lot and pick new loadouts if you get stuck on a mission or a boss fight. What is combat like besides these abilities? Well, it's very much like playing Kingdom Hearts without a lot of spells or extra movements, but there still is a few extra things. You have chaining, which once you defeat a Heartless, it will create a circle on another Heartless, and will increase the amount of heart points you collect if you continue to defeat the Heartless within the circle. A lot of missions revolve around collecting these heart points, it's just exactly what it sounds like, you just kill Heartless to get heart points, so it kinda becomes necessary to complete the missions in some cases. One thing that's interesting about 358 over 2 is the limit system. Now, in Kingdom Hearts 2, I mentioned how reaction commands became abilities you could use with Triangle. These are actually called limits, and in 358 over 2, they introduced Limit Break. When your health gets low enough, you have a chance to activate Limit Break, which basically makes all of your attacks a lot stronger and look way cooler. One thing to note is that this in no way heals you, so once you're out of your limit form, you not only still have low health that got you that form in the first place, but the bar to activate your limit form again actually becomes thinner and you'll need to move even closer to death to get it. Fair, but if you're using this as a last resort and you don't defeat all of the enemies while it's active, you're pretty much caught in the same position that you were in before. I guess now we have to talk about missions and this is probably where the game loses a lot of people if the panel system didn't already confuse people to oblivion. The entire game is made of missions, where the organization sends Roxas to some place to do some task. In total, there are 93 missions, although this includes some tutorial. There are basically two kinds of missions, Kill the Thing and Reconnaissance. The first one is pretty self-explanatory, it never really changes beyond how it starts, 
collect these items, get these heart points, kill these things, break this item, eliminate this specific heartless. If it weren't for some of the strongest story in the series holding up these missions, it would essentially feel like you're playing a free play mode in a game where the important things have already happened. Even the characters seem annoyed that they're being made to do these mundane tasks. What's worse is that there's so much repetition and only seven different worlds where the gameplay actually takes place, and all of these worlds were worlds that were previously featured in other games. Now I don't mind that fact that much because I wouldn't expect the game to be Birth by Sleep with a ton of new worlds, which you know we'll talk about Birth by Sleep in a minute, but one thing the game is missing is you don't really interact with anyone from these worlds in any meaningful kind of way. You might as well have just made a few more for the sake of some variety. Most of these missions have a pretty defined finishing point, but you'll also learn some missions have extra parts. Basically, if your goal is to collect a certain amount of heart points, you'll be offered the chance to go above and beyond for the organization and collect even more for a bonus panel or something. The game already gets mega tedious with the missions. It can be even harder to justify staying longer when you already know what you need. The other type of mission is the reconnaissance missions, of which there's about 10. These are absolutely brutal. There's no other way to put it. If you thought the missions where all you do was fight was pretty tedious, this is 100% worse. You just have to walk around, hugging every wall, looking at anything that may or may not stand out, and just hope that you find all of the interesting points you're meant to be looking for. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. The idea is that Roxas doesn't understand normal people things, so he needs to go out and learn. But you as the player have no concept of what Roxas has no concept of. In the very first recon mission, one of the things you're meant to inspect is the barrier to tell you that you can't go to the next part of the level. The game tells you specifically before this that the organization put it there to keep you focused on the task at hand and we as the player know that it's obviously meant to just keep us in bounds of the playing area. So why would any of us think to walk up to it if we knew we couldn't pass through it? How is that interesting? It was already explained to us. Honestly, don't waste your time with these. Look up a walkthrough, follow them thoroughly. Occasionally I'll see comments that praise the recon missions because they add variety and change up the repetitive mission gameplay. But if you're replacing an already scrutinized mission system with an even more boring mission system, I don't think that's the break that you're looking for. I know I'm being a little too harsh here. I know tons and tons of people went out and enjoyed the mission system, and that's fine. But there's a large amount of people who will not replay this game ever again because of these systems. And it's unfortunate because the story is good. It's just so far away from the original Kingdom Hearts game. The discovery, the puzzle aspect, the platforming, the interactions with characters, the story beats, the item collection. It feels so lifeless and robotic. I know that the roboticness is an aspect of the story in the game, like it's kind of meant to be that, but the gameplay doesn't need to match the story that well in every case. The last thing to touch on is mission mode, in which, yep, you guessed it, it's a free play mode where you do more missions. To be fair, it's a little bit more than that, but at its core, that's what it is. It's replaying missions, but using other characters of Organization 13. Playing as other characters would be pretty fun, but not with these missions and not with this style of gameplay, unfortunately. More or less, you just spam A until you've done your monotonous mission. It's literally the same missions, by the way. There's nothing unique about this mode. Your list of missions to choose from are the exact ones that you've already completed in single player story. What's that? Single player story? Well, that implies, yes, 3582 actually featured multiplayer. The first time in the Kingdom Hearts franchise. I can't really showcase this because I have a severe lack of friendship in my life and even when I was younger, I didn't have any friends, so I've never got a chance to do this, but... Honestly, I can't imagine this being a ton of fun. I found some footage on YouTube. The core idea was that you'd be competing against the, your teammate, but not really teammate. So you'd be attacking them while also attacking the Heartless, or just achieving the goal that was set. However, you would also need to cooperate with them in order to move to the next zone. So there are barriers around doors where you can't hit each other. Still. 
All it takes is that one stubborn friend who doesn't want to leave the zone to completely stand still your game. Although I feel like this is unlikely to happen as most missions drop you off, guide you towards the end of your goal, then make you walk all the way back before finishing, still the idea of playing any Kingdom Hearts game with someone else is a dream unfulfilled for me that will remain unfulfilled for now. Overall, the incredibly strong story just doesn't get the support from the gameplay that it needs. And I know I'm teasing you by telling you the story is amazing and then not going into any details. If at most I've convinced you to play the game, I'm sorry. If at least I've encouraged you to watch the movie version of the game, hopefully the experience still comes across just as well as it did for me. I haven't watched the movie cutscene version, so I can't say for certain whether or not you still get that full experience. I mean... I get it, it makes sense in theory, you're a part of the organization, there are missions to do and someone has to do them. I just feel like there's not nearly enough variety or breaking away from the norm. It's kind of the equivalent of if the entirety of the Portal games just kind of stayed normal the whole time and never went crazy and off the rails behind the scenes. It's still fun and I really don't mind the monotony, especially at the beginning of the game when you're trying to establish a formula. but things kind of need to fall apart after a while, and it just doesn't happen here, at least maybe not soon enough. And I think it's a big reason why maybe this game didn't deliver what people were hoping for gameplay-wise. Especially when you consider how well the original games blended meaningful combat and gameplay with the story, these two just feel so disconnected that if you told me all the missions were designed before any story was added, I would believe you and I would not be surprised if that was actually the case. 358 being on the DS and the main series primarily being PlayStation based meant the game has not been remade for current console play, even on the Switch versions. As I mentioned before, the newer versions have little movies that you can watch through the cutscenes in HD, but it's unknown if the games will ever be remade for modern console despite the fact that the touchscreen isn't actually used at all. If the game was incredible and super beloved, which, let's be honest, every Kingdom Hearts game is someone's favorite, I really believe that they would have remade it by now, but I don't think the demand is there, so maybe one day we'll get our final mix version. Perhaps the very moment I've typed these words up, I've manifested it so I can get tons of comments with a timestamp saying, Pepe laugh, he doesn't know. But for now, I wouldn't hold your breath. It's been 14 years. You'd surely die from not breathing that long. With the addition of 358 over 2, we've entered our third console and our second handheld console, and now it's time to go even farther where most games didn't dare to go, the PlayStation Portable. By late 2010, the PSP was already 5 years old, and I didn't know a single person who owned one. I'm not saying it was a failure, truth be told, I simply just don't know enough about it to comment on whether or not it was a good successful product. What I do know is that instead of a 5 year wait for another Kingdom Hearts game, it took just 1 year to get Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. Birth by Sleep's development actually began in 2005 and was even hinted at at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2. It follows the story of three friends, Ventus, Terra, and Aqua, 10 years prior to the first Kingdom Hearts game, and kind of talks about what life was like before we got there. Think Knights of the Old Republic to the prequel trilogy of Star Wars. By the time we get to Star Wars, the golden age of the Jedi and Sith are over, and just like in Kingdom Hearts, we get to see what the world was like in this era of the Keyblade Wielder, where we learn that many others can also wield a Keyblade. Ironically, this isn't even the golden age, but that's putting the phone games in there and I'm not getting into that. Also Mark Hamill is there and he's your master, and there's other comparisons, but spoilers. While young Sora and Riku and Kairi all make appearances throughout the game, and the game actually offers story explanation as to why Sora and Riku can wield Keyblades, this game doesn't feature Sora as a main character, so there's no need to memory wipe him at the end of the game. And again we hit a point where this story, while very important to the overall foundation of what Kingdom Hearts is and its underlying themes, maybe doesn't feel that necessary as the others do. Now, I definitely think this was the overall vibe that most people got, but now living in a world where 9 years after the release of this game we finally got Kingdom Hearts 3, I would argue this is probably the most important handheld game story-wise. At most, I'd imagine you'd be very confused playing 3 and not knowing who any of these people were. 
In terms of the three characters, yes, their stories are very important, although again, maybe not completely necessary, because in the main games you play only as Sora, and Sora wouldn't know everyone's specific story anyways. In that sense, just the acknowledgement is enough, but again, you miss out on a lot of those little extra tidbits of information not knowing their story, and I would probably argue that those little extra tidbits are actually some of the bigger and best moments of the games. But if you're strictly role-playing as Sora for some reason, you'll be fine. They kind of fill in the gaps for you. However, besides story implications, the game also covers a lot of world-building, such as what Kingdom Hearts is, how to unlock it, stuff about Keyblades, and even though it's not made perfectly clear because it's Kingdom Hearts and God forbid they tell you something instead of making 87 goddamn metaphors, it still helps tremendously understand the main premise of Kingdom Hearts 3 and even clarifying things from 2. It showcases some new, unique worlds and more unique characters made just for the games to really give you the feeling of Kingdom Hearts without relying too heavily on Disney. Something I think really helped establish its own identity and that people really appreciate now. This was also expanded upon in the mobile games, which we're not covering because I don't know anything about them outside of what I've seen from other videos. However, that doesn't change the fact that the creator of Kingdom Hearts, Tetsuya Nomura, often refers to Birth by Sleep as Episode Zero, and believes the story to be just as important as the mainstay games. Which again makes you question why they put it on PSP and took so long to remaster it for consoles. Regardless, this is one of the easier games to play now in the remastered form. The game not only covers backstories for some of our heroes, new and old, but also for some of our villains. A lot of the worlds that you travel to in Birth by Sleep are the worlds of the seven princesses of hearts, like Sleeping Beauty and Snow White and Cinderella. People who had surprisingly low screen time and mention time considering how important they are overall to Disney. And we even get to see Maleficent for the first time plotting her plan. When I was a kid, once a year we would get a big gift, either for Christmas or our birthday, and I almost never asked for anything because I knew I would be happy with whatever I got and I didn't want to be that guy who's saying, oh I want this and this and this, but 2010 was different. I told my parents I wanted a PSP, and I only wanted a PSP so I could play Birth by Sleep. To this day, it is the only PSP game I own, and my PSP battery is all broken and blown up and puffy, so I can't even use it anyways, but it was worth it just to keep experiencing new Kingdom Hearts. Unlike 358 over 2, this game was remade and put into the remix and HD version of the game, which is the footage you're seeing here. I could have played it on PSP emulator, but I hadn't played the remakes and this was a good excuse to do that. Plus it just looks nicer. In Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, the primary enemies you fight in the game are the Unversed which are basically the Heartless, but not quite. And it's actually explained later how they showed up and why they're there. After going through the pretty basic tutorial, you'll have the option of picking one of the three to start your journey. Each character will visit the same worlds, albeit in a different order, and you won't really know until you're there what order they're in. There's very few worlds, and the ones you visit are very short. It still manages to feel a bit repetitive since you go there three times, but since you finish one story before playing the others, you're not doing it all at once. Still, I can understand why you'd have an issue with this, although you're not even always in the same locations half the time, just the same world. And not that you asked, but I recommend playing in the order the game kind of naturally gives you, Terra, Ventus, and Aqua, because I think it just flows the best in terms of story, and also flows nicely into Kingdom Hearts 2.8. Oh god, imagine trying to follow along with everything I've said, having never played Kingdom Hearts and hearing the words 2.8 come out of my mouth. If you are still here trying to follow along, you're a brave soul and we salute you. Welcome to the family. It's also notable to say that the three characters all play pretty differently. Terra is more physical with heavy attacks, Ventus is more quick and ability based, and Aqua is more magical based. Although as we'll get into the command decks, you'll see this part of gameplay is pretty easy to customize. While we aren't really covering the story, it's worth mentioning that just by playing Kingdom Hearts 2, you'll be at a bit of an advantage with certain knowledge over the characters, something that doesn't happen a tremendous amount in Kingdom Hearts. And generally when it does happen, it's just, oh, the villains are talking to each other, but nothing super revealing will be said. 
and I'll put a very, very minor brief spoiler warning here if you want to skip ahead 30 seconds. But here, we know the name Xehanort due to it being said a lot in Kingdom Hearts 2, which came out five years before Birth by Sleep. And it doesn't take long to realize this is somewhat of an origin story for him. The characters don't know during the prologue that Xehanort is evil, but we do as viewers, so the game doesn't really try to hide that in any way, and actually uses that information to help us build the world more. But that's enough about the story, as there's no need for me to dive into any more specifics than that. So let's talk about the combat system, because oh boy, is it a combat system. I don't mean anything by that. I don't mean like it's a good or I, it's literally a, it's a combat system. That's it's birth by sleep was on the PSP, which has buttons and configurations very similar to that of the original Kingdom Hearts game. This means they could have very easily replicated the exact same combat system. But again, they chose to go bold and adventurous. I don't know if they did this because they saw the game as an experiment for Kingdom Hearts 3, which was still nine years away at this point, or if they did this just to make the overall game stand out and feel different. But while it wasn't as dividing as Chain of Memories or 358 over 2, there are still some things that felt awesome and others that just didn't feel so great. Just looking at the screen, it's a bit easy to get overwhelmed. You have focus, D-links, a command deck, a command bar, and pretty much everything you're looking at is completely customizable and will change just based off of how you play the game. Attacking is the same as normal Kingdom Hearts, X to attack, circle to jump, which if you're a typical gamer, that will sound backwards, and we all agree, but it is what it is. The triangle moves, which were formerly special abilities and then reaction commands, are now your command deck. Your command deck is anything that's not a basic attack. These are a range of physical attacks, spells, potions. The more you use these abilities, the more you can upgrade them to level 3 which will increase the command's power. You can also meld two commands together along with one synthesis item and combine them. Some commands have abilities like how Sora gained them in the first game. These can be things such as combo plus or more HP or money or better drop rates or even things like scan to see enemies health bars. Each command has a cooldown, so it's not just as easy as spamming attacks. However, in later fights when you unlock a ton of these commands, it does become a little bit more common. I'd say my biggest personal issue with this system is the fact that potions get mixed in with everything else. You only get so many potions, and while you can skip using them during a fight, it's a little bit of management that's a little too hectic to do at a quick glance. Much how like in Chain of Memories, it's a lot harder to intentionally choose your cards, the same goes here. It makes me just not want to put my potions in my deck for normal fights, for fear of accidentally using them when I already have full health, and since I can't edit my command deck mid-fight if I'm suddenly in trouble, well, it's tough luck for me. This is really only an issue until Cure comes along, and even then, depending on the fight, you still might want to be wary of using it and skip to the next command. During your fights and uses of commands, your command bar atop your deck will fill up. When it's full, you'll hit your opponent with a finisher. In actuality, the finisher was a part of the original console game. It was kind of like a hidden mechanic thing, this game just added more emphasis to it and made it a more public term. The finishers are also upgradable, and there's actually a level tree to help you unlock more powerful finishers. These will often have requirements that are probably best to look up ahead of time to figure out what exactly you want, and they can be such things as use this command style 15 times, which I'll explain to you what that is in a few seconds, collecting a certain amount of money with the finisher equipped, or defeating a certain amount of enemies. All roads eventually lead to one ultimate finisher at level 6, so again, if you really want to, you can look up and try to figure out what you need to do to prioritize that. Additionally to finishers, if you use enough commands or certain ones enough times during the fight, you'll actually unlock a command style. There are 15 in total, some of which are tied to certain characters, so it's more like 5 or 6. These command styles basically give you a completely different fighting style for a full bar, normally with increased strength or magic power, as well as a more powerful finisher. You can use certain commands to influence which command style will appear. For example, Diamond Dust will activate if you just use Ice Magic, Firestorm for Fire Magic, Thunderbolt for Thunder Magic, you get the idea. But you can also just play however you want and take whatever has been given to you. These basically feel like mini drive forms to me. I'm not sure there's a way to stop it if you don't want to do it, but they're pretty cool to unlock and can make even basic wave clearing of enemies a little less repetitive feeling, 
it's something you have to use once it's given to you, so it's not like you're going to hold on to it forever and wait for that fight. If you have it, use it. There's no harm. Another thing you can do with the command links is the D link, don't chuckle to yourself, or dimension link. Once your bar is full, you can use D link, stop chuckling, that you've unlocked throughout the game that basically changes your entire command deck to a completely unique and custom set inspired by another character you've met. It can be a little confusing at first because the first two you're given are the two other characters you didn't play as at the beginning, but it's not a swap system where you play as other games and use their abilities. The abilities are always the same, but it's just inspired by the character, or similar to what their starting command deck would be. Some of these command decks contain completely unique commands and that can only be used in this way, such as Snow White and all of her seven dwarves being a command. These abilities are all over the place, so it's definitely worth experimenting around with them during non-important fights to see what can help you out in a pinch, like how some will have cure or defensive magic that you may need. There are not that many, and honestly you can probably go the whole game without ever doing it. I'm pretty sure the first time I played I didn't even realize you could do this until the very end. But with the customizable command decks, command styles, D-links, this game gives you a lot of different ways to change up even the smallest of combat encounters. The last bar we're going to talk about is the focus bar, which is used for the shot lock ability. By holding R1, you'll go into a first person mode with a large circle, or crosshair I guess they're called, and you'll be able to lock onto as many enemies as you can in a short amount of time. Letting go will cause you to attack all the enemies you see in rapid succession, again depending on if you're playing as Aqua, Ventus, or Terra depends on the attack. These are really great for wave clearing a lot of easy enemies, and although they aren't necessarily the strongest or most powerful moves, they will allow you to hit someone from far range, and of course the more you use it, the more the ability levels up. Shot locking, whether popular with the fans or the developers, is one of the few mechanics from any of the handheld games that returned in Kingdom Hearts 3. And I'll admit, I'm a pretty big fan of it, I think it's just fun to watch him zoom around. The last thing I'd like to talk about, and probably the weirdest addition to the game, is the command board. What's that you might ask? Yeah, it's not the command deck, it's a command board, and it's a board game. It might look like Kingdom Hearts Mario Party at the start, but rest assured, it's definitely bad Kingdom Hearts Monopoly. I was going to skip explaining the game because why would I waste my time explaining the game to you, but let's be real, if you're still here watching this video, I don't think a few more minutes will kill you. Basically you can play a 2 or 3 player game where you walk around the board and claim squares using your commands. Yet commands is in the actual commands that you've been fighting with throughout the game. You have a GP counter, which I can only assume stands for game points where the top counter is how much you have to spend on things, and your bottom counter is how much you have to spend plus what you have on the panel. When a character steps on the panels, they owe you GP and vice versa. You can also upgrade your panels so it costs more, and if you can't pay the fine, you have to sell your spaces in order to pay it off. There are four check marks around the board. This is important because they'll refill your command deck hand thingy, and after hitting all four and returning to the starting space, aka the keyhole, you'll get a little bonus. You'll also have access to a ton of abilities that opponents don't have, such as rolling extra dice, choosing which direction to walk in, stunning an opponent, but these do require using commands, so you may run out of commands and not be able to buy spaces. Once you hit the keyhole with the allotted amount of GP, you win, or probably lose because I simply do not understand how this game works despite just explaining it to you. The good thing is that win or lose, it only really costs you time, and it will upgrade your commands, like when you're using the commands and putting them down, you're actually gaining command experience, although I would argue that simply just using the commands is a much better and more efficient way of leveling these up. But moving on from board games, there's really no reason for the game to be built this way, especially considering the PSP was basically capable of anything a PlayStation 2 was. A lot of people really don't like the combat system, and it's definitely hard to get used to, and in general the bosses can be pretty brutal in this game. Especially as Terra early on due to lack of healing options like I mentioned. One thing I didn't even mention is just pressing square to dodge your block, and you have to do that a ton as all three characters to make any sort of meaningful progress against bosses. Personally, I think this is my favorite gameplay of the handheld games. It just feels the most seamless to me. It feels like Kingdom Hearts, although maybe that's because it's just on a PlayStation console. 
Although I can admit it's not without its problems and the game can be very hard and unforgiving. The one thing I will say is that while combat is unique, it is also unavoidable. When I talked about Chain of Memories, I mentioned there's a bit of a play style where you can kind of grind to get the best cards, and then from there just spam the attack button as if you were playing a normal Kingdom Hearts game. And while that's definitely not an optimal way to do it whatsoever, it is an option just in case you need to brute force it. Here, not only do you need the commands to succeed, you need to do the extra. You need to upgrade your finishers, you need to use D-Links if your command board isn't optimal, you need to shot lock, and most importantly, you need to meld those commands together to create the most powerful commands by the time you reach the end of the game. It's also a bit annoying because since you play as three different characters, you have to restart the game twice, and you build up these characters with a bunch of commands and moves you like, and then you have to restart all over again, lose all the commands, and wonder if it's even worth trying to build up those same ones or do you try something different? There's a good reddit thread that explains how I feel about it where you slash lady with the crazy cat explained you can't play it like you play Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. And I think maybe because it wasn't on the gameplay or the DS but on a system that felt like a PlayStation, many people thought they could play it like Kingdom Hearts 1 or 2, child ghost boy included, and playing it that way can lead to a lot of frustration. That being said, if the game just used Kingdom Hearts 1 or 2 combat systems, would it have worked? Perhaps they intended to make the gameplay feel that way, perhaps that was never the plan, and that every handheld game had to have a unique gameplay system. I'm more inclined to believe that this is the case, just based off the fact that this is the first time they had a handheld game on a system that almost exactly replicated the controls and capabilities of a PlayStation 2, but they actively chose not to do that. Overall, however, I just have to say, I love the story of the game. I think it adds so much depth to the world that Kingdom Hearts solely needed to break out. And as much as I love Sora and his adventures, by this point Kingdom Hearts had its own universe and rules and this game really helped establish a lot of that for the player. The gameplay feels leagues better than 358 over 2. It feels like real Kingdom Hearts to me where you get to explore and interact with people and have strong story beats and complete puzzles, all those things I missed with the last game. And as annoying and frustrating as some of the boss fights end up being, ultimately I still have mostly positive memories from Birth by Sleep and I think it ages probably the best of all the handheld games. It's just an opinion though, please don't get mad at me. Just a few months after Birth by Sleep, we were blessed with the appearance of Recoded. And while many people will defend any of the other games from the filler title, this game will probably not get nearly as much affection or protection. Within the lore of the series, the journal entries are all written by Jiminy Cricket, and on this particular day, Jiminy opens up his journal to find it completely blank and empty, aside from the line, their hurting will be mended when you return to end it. Which is... not the best poetry, I will admit. Confused as to what this means, he takes it to King Mickey, who has Chip and Dale digitize the journal and create a data version of Sora to roam through the journal, breaking up the glitches to recover the journal's data, and trust me if you're listening to this for the first time and going, what? This was the reaction from most of us. What's worse too is that, chronologically, this is the first game that takes place after Kingdom Hearts 2, meaning we waited six years for this. I think Universally Recoded is probably the most skipped and non-played game of the series, and while many people will praise its gameplay, especially over that of 358 over 2 considering they're both DS games, it's not without its issue. Mostly the fact that nearly every mechanic has brand new terminology, making even the most hardcore fans of the series have to take notes. These terms are all super generic too, and are very easy to blend in with each other by accident. You have clock abilities, stat chips, the stat matrix, the command matrix, the gear matrix, yes those are all different things, CPUs, command chips, system sectors, back doors, sector debugs, terminals, links, blocks but spelt with an X so it's cool. It's truly incredible how confusing this game will make leveling up in every different handheld version of the franchise when in the first game it was so simple and it made sense. I know the desire is to make things unique, but does everything need to be that unique? The game looks and feels a lot more like the first Kingdom Hearts game, and that's probably due to the fact that it was just another revisiting of all the levels from the first game to restore the journal. Like we've mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily feel great moving around a 3D space with a D-pad, and the camera was always going to be a big glaring issue no matter what. 
Thankfully, as a Kingdom Hearts fan who played on the original PlayStation 2, I know how to navigate a bad camera. The attack button feels very much like the original, same animations and everything, and for some reason just Sora jumping like that adds a certain familiarity that I really appreciate about this game. The game was initially put out for mobile phones, and I don't mean in the era of smartphones, I meant a very specific Japanese phone in 2008. So gameplay had to be remastered and remade to fit the DS, and whether it was people not liking 358 over 2, or just the pattern of them changing gameplay for every single game, we once again got something completely different. The screen looks awfully crowded with the menu and the indicator on the bottom corners. As I was writing this, I was thinking about why I didn't mention that at all in the 358 over 2 section. That's because it doesn't feel nearly as chunky. I don't know why it has to be there at all. I get the menu since it's a little bit synonymous with Kingdom Hearts and you want the information close and quick to see. But you also have an entire second screen at the bottom, which is just a glorified map, and I'm sure you could have used it for something. In this game, we have another command deck. Pressing X uses the command in the middle, and in order to switch, you need to hold L and press whatever it shows you to go in that direction. It's, again, a little bit of a handful to try to do all at once while you're also trying to fight an enemy and stay alive. You need to use both L and R to lock onto an enemy, which I do recommend, otherwise the only way to change the camera angles is to press R to have the camera immediately go right behind you. The first of our new mechanics is overclocks. As you fight and defeat Heartless and Blocks, your clock gauge will fill up. Note that the clock gauge is the thing that says level 1 on it, and there's really no other indication that that's what this is. As you continue to fill this bar up, you'll move to the next clock level and activate the next ability. These abilities can range from things such as making healing magic more powerful, reducing damage from specific attacks, to striking advantages like faster hits, potentially freezing your opponents, to even using the abilities in the original game, such as Magic Bracer, which is a playoff of Leaf Bracer, where you can use magic commands and not have them interrupted by taking damage. These overclock abilities come in branches on your clock ability tree, and so you can use your second screen to select which tier you want to go down, making the second screen in this game already a hundred times more useful than in 358 over 2, and really in any game we've seen so far in this video. Once you've hit the end of the tree, one more fill of the bar will allow you to unleash your finish command, which is just a big, fancier, more powerful attack. The clock level then returns to level 1, and all the abilities you just unlocked will deactivate. You can't really intentionally avoid this unless you want to run around in circles and wait for your bar to lower, although it's unclear if that also removes your temporary abilities, so maybe you don't want to anyways, but I guarantee even just thinking about this is overthinking the entire game. Either way, after enough combat, you'll get enough experience for a level up chip, because simply leveling up is way too easy. Here we get introduced to the stat matrix. Your stat matrix has a predetermined set of slots on there, and you will basically need to fill them up with various other chips that you'll naturally collect throughout the game. This gives you a bit more customization over how you level up Sora, because if you really wanted to, you could metagame and only use attack ups or whatever, but it also requires that you have to get those chips to do that. Every time you complete a world, you'll unlock a new section of the stat matrix, which has its own CPU that you can use as a starting point, or you can connect that to your old CPU. Connecting to your old one will double all the chip stats in between the two CPUs, which is called dual processing, and then you've got wiring, which is when you have a completely separate object on the board that requires power from the CPU, but they didn't want to make you fill out all the blocks in between, and sometimes these require two connections, so you'll still need to get more chips. I apologize if you're lost on all the terminology, by the way. This is just what the game calls it, and even reading that was confusing for me. One really interesting thing about this screen is that you can also change the difficulty settings. As far as I'm aware, this is the only Kingdom Hearts game to have this feature, as every other game gives you a very clear and strict warning at the start, letting you know the difficulty cannot be changed later on. Funny enough, if you go to the menu and look up the tutorial, this is under the heading Perform Great Feats with Cheats and is listed as the Difficulty Cheat, where the game straight up tells you that you can get better drops by turning up the difficulty, which reads to me very much like this was intended to be taken advantage of. One of the better things about the game is the command deck system, which of course is different from Birth by Sleep, and the way that you customize it. And I think when people say that they really enjoy the combat mechanics of the game, 
this is probably what they're referring to. As you unlock new commands, you have an option as to what you do with them. By entering the command matrix, you get a look at your command deck, which can eventually get up to 8 commands. Each command has two slots. If you have just one command in there, you just simply use that command. But by putting a second command in there, you get a hybrid command. For example, a physical attack mixed with a fire spell gives you a physical fire attack. Similar to Birth by Sleep, commands will level up with use, and once both are fully leveled by gaining enough CP, and they have the exclamation point indicator next to it, you can permanently convert them into this new command. If you choose not to, the game technically calls it test converting, but really you can mix stuff around as much as you want without fully converting it. You'll also notice memory in the bottom corner, like computer memory, and as far as I'm aware there's no way to get more of this, so even if you work hard to get a ton of insanely powerful abilities, you may not be able to use them all, which quite frankly is really annoying and unnecessary, but also I get it. There is no traditional item synthesizing and recoded, it's all done through these commands, which honestly is quite enjoyable and fun to experiment with, albeit I don't find the actual combat itself that much fun, but making these commands and using them is probably the best part. Items are also used like in 358 over 2, where you don't need to buy a physical amount of potions, but you'll only be able to use a set amount during the fights themselves, and it will reload after. It's very interesting reading people's opinions on Recoded versus the command decks of Birth by Sleep and 358 over 2, which of course didn't have command decks. Some people seem to prefer command decks that reload fast and allow you to spam powerful attacks, while others are quite opposite, and in the end the only thing people can really seem to agree on is that no one can really agree on what the perfect command deck is. The majority of the gameplay is cruising around the worlds you've already seen, doing mini quests which pretty much relate to go find this or talk to this person. It's not as free exploration as the original games, they kind of force you exactly where they want you to go, but there's enough direction that unlike 358 over 2, you're not wandering around lost forever. The maps are the same as Kingdom Hearts 1, with the addition of these large red glitch blocks and the occasional prize blocks. Many of these have items or other things inside, so there is an incentive to smash them all open, but it's also not necessary and technically avoidable. Throughout your adventures, you'll inevitably find a place that you can't properly reach, and this introduces system sectors. Basically, you'll have to look around to find a back door into the system sector, which the map will flash and beep to tell you once you're close. Once you discover this, you'll have to debug the sensor by going into the datascape and eliminating the glitches. Once you defeat all the heartless glitches in the area and destroy all the blocks, a terminal or link will show up. A terminal will send you out, a link will send you to another floor that must be cleared first. This is all terminology the game uses, and ironically Tron's not even in this one. While inside you'll be killing Heartless and collecting SP or sector points which you can redeem after the battle. These can be used on a multitude of things, mostly panels, but at the end of the level they can be redeemed for XP or money as well if nothing in the shop floats your goat. These levels are plentiful and they kind of remind me of the Oblivion Gates from The Elder Scrolls 4, in the sense that it's really cool and different and unlike anything you've ever seen the first time you go in there, then by the 4th or 5th time the novelty wears off, and by the 30th time you're kind of wishing you never had to look at one again. These levels also feature a ton of platforming with which this camera setup is not ideal in any way, and honestly it triggers my motion sickness to no end. At the end of the levels you have your usual boss fights, and this time there will be blocks to bash and side enemies to defeat, and depending on how well you do, as in how fast you defeat the boss and how high your HP is at the end of the fight, you get better rewards. I don't mind this, it changes up the gameplay a bit, but sometimes it makes the bosses feel more like a mini game rather than an epic fight. I will give the game credit where it's due and point out that the visuals are a little bit nicer than that of 358 over 2. It definitely feels like it's held up a lot nicer, and I would say that it has aged okay, probably near the top of the DS spectrum from what I've seen from DS games anyways. One criticism I have, which is similar to that of 358 over 2, is that you don't really get to explore a lot of the new worlds, although some worlds do have new areas not seen in Kingdom Hearts 1. The sector systems are cool, but maybe a little bit too repetitive for my liking, but I will say that the glitch effects are super neat and I really enjoy that aesthetic. 
It's almost in one way that the blocky textures serve as an advantage to the game because maybe it would look a little too clean in a remastered setting. One thing I discovered about the game is there's actually quite a bit of variety to break up some of the standard gameplay. Sometimes the game turns into an auto-scroller, sometimes there's a stealth section. There's a section where it becomes a Final Fantasy meets Paper Mario game. I was honestly shocked at how much variety there was to be found, and while I maintain that I personally just don't enjoy the game that much, there's a part of me that's sad to see so many people brush off the game entirely as I foolishly did as a child so many years ago. Like seriously. When reading comments about this game like I have for years, no one was talking about these parts. I didn't even know they existed, and I have no idea why, because they stand out so much to me. If you're someone who needs a deep and interesting and compelling story to motivate you to keep playing, I don't think you're going to find that here. There's nothing wrong with the gameplay-centric games, there's tons of them on this list, and again, that's not to say what's happening doesn't have larger story implications, because it does, but the rewards for paying attention that we talked about earlier are so small and minor, they might as well not be there. I feel like the game made it so difficult to get into just because of its need to overcomplicate everything. Almost none of the terminology is familiar, and using all the computer terms in ways that don't really make sense just to get behind the data theme really overcomplicates the issue, unfortunately. The fact that there's several different matrices and dual processing and CPUs and data chips and sector systems and all this stuff just kind of makes it really hard to track in your head, and I think that's a huge part of what makes this game feel so different from everything else. Seriously, some of the language in this game reminds me of when I was a kid and me and my friends would play hacker games without knowing anything. Before we wrap up this incredibly long Kingdom Hearts section, which surely the fans of the series are enjoying and everyone else is rolling their eyes, I want to talk about the remakes though. I played the remake of Birth by Sleep because it just made sense. The game has virtually no changes from PSP to console outside of having a few more bumpers and easier to move the camera, and it just looks nicer, so why not? With Chain of Memories, I chose to play the original, because while there is an HD 3D remake, it does feel surprisingly different. Different enough that, while it is the same mechanics, just the 3D sphere makes the game feel very different. Not to mention the layouts are all very different, and there's just so much more to look around and look at in the remake, so it wouldn't be fair to judge the game based on that version. 3582 and Recoded, as I mentioned several times, don't have modern console remakes, and unfortunately, it's very likely that they never will. While 358 was praised for its story, people really didn't enjoy the gameplay, and with Recoded, it's the opposite. Both of these games were made with the DS in mind, and while they barely use the second screen, the games would feel pretty different if they were to port it over. They would have to completely rebuild the games from the ground up for stories that, while yes, are important, are less important than the others, and the movies probably fill you in enough. It's pretty well known that they lost the source code to the original game when they were preparing to create the final mix and had to do a lot of reverse engineering and remodeling, and while teams were focused on that and the inevitable release of Kingdom Hearts 3, I'm just not sure anyone would think it would be a smart financial move to dedicate lots of resources to this. Regardless, you can't really say there will never be a remake because Kingdom Hearts is always surprising us, but with each passing year, it becomes more and more unlikely that it'll never happen. Although, fans will definitely hold on to the idea as long as they can. In the meantime, grab an emulator, or even an old copy if you can get your hands on it, and enjoy some Kingdom Hearts games if you've never played them before. They're maybe not as amazing as the other games, but they're still Kingdom Hearts. Those little moments of dialogue with piano in the background, it's still there. Someone saying nonsense about hearts and darkness and saying it in a matter-of-fact tone despite the fact they don't understand what they're saying. You got it. Lastly, on the 3DS in 2012, we were given Dream Drop Distance, which would end up being the last major release for the franchise until Kingdom Hearts 3 arrived in 2019. No, 2.8 is not a major release. I already said I didn't want to spend too much time on this game, and I'll tell you my main reasons why. Dream Drop Distance from 3DS to console feels almost completely transitionless. Obviously, some mechanics were changed here and there. The 3DS actually utilized the second screen, but by this point, the 3DS wasn't limiting what they were doing in any way. If it wasn't apparent already, they probably didn't want a normal Kingdom Hearts game on handheld, but Dream Drop Distance is probably as close as it gets. We once again have the Command Deck system, most similarly compared to Birth by Sleeps. Linking from Birth by Sleep also returns, although this time you link with Dream Eaters, which are the new creatures of this game, and they also act as little companions that follow you around. 
There's dive mode, which is a bit repetitive, but also it's the only handheld game to do anything even remotely similar to Gummy Ship, so I guess kudos for that. The biggest part of the game is the drop system. Throughout the game, you're playing as both Sora and Riku, and when your bar empties, you'll switch over to the other character, and you can use items from one character to boost the other during the switch. It's a fun gimmick, albeit a little bit frustrating if you're just trying to play the game and not wanting to get lost in a ton of mechanics. And it's not really a mechanic they created because of handheld limitations, it was just a conscious decision that they wanted to do. And trust me, the story is well complicated enough without switching back and forth in the middle of it. I still stand by that Kingdom Hearts didn't get that complicated until this game came in and just kicked it up a notch. Beyond that, there are new mechanics and touchscreen things that I've already kind of mentioned, but nothing I can really show you here. I borrowed three people's 3DSs to play this game the first time I played it back in high school, and I never finished it. But once I got around to playing it on the PS4, it felt much more seamless and easier to get into. I can't really explain why, but I've just spent a lot of time on Kingdom Hearts in this video, so we're probably at the point now where we can move on. I apologize if that's a bit anticlimactic, I just don't know really how else to describe how I feel about putting this game in the video. The mechanics are either already done previously in other handheld games within the franchise, or they've been added for whatever reason, nothing to do with handheld limitations, it was just something they wanted to do. The only thing that would really be worth diving into maybe a little bit deeper is how you interact with the Dream Eaters, but I can't really show you that because I only have the PlayStation copy of the game, but just think of Nintendogs, but with Kingdom Hearts and you pretty much got it. The Kingdom Hearts franchise will forever be controversial for many, many reasons, but among its own fanbase, it will always be known as the series that was borderline impossible to follow from console to console. I acknowledge that due to the fact that my dad plays games, I am in tune and lucky enough to get consoles as major gifts or save up for games on my own, but I'm willing to bet a lot of kids were not so lucky and didn't own a PlayStation 2, Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS, PSP, and 3DS. Nowadays we're very lucky because all you need is one console to play almost all of the games and I think that's great and really helps make the games more accessible. That aside, how do the games stand on their own? Well of all the games I've covered in this video, they debatably have the most story attached to them. The games progressively went from content that would be considered filler to becoming more and more important and if you played Chain of Memories and decided to stick to console games and skip the rest and did that all the way to Kingdom Hearts 3, you'll undoubtedly be pretty lost. And even now finishing Kingdom Hearts 3, maybe I underestimated how important Chain of Memories and Recoded really are to the story. In terms of gameplay, they didn't try to maintain the same gameplay. Rather, they made every game its own unique experience by doing anything but replicate the same gameplay as the originals. Every game has different mechanics, different combat systems, different explorations. Unfortunately, a lot of them have the same worlds, but at the end of the day, every game still feels like Kingdom Hearts. Whether it's the best part of Kingdom Hearts or the worst, however, is up for debate. Whether the experiment was intentional in trying to find the golden formula before they released the long-anticipated Kingdom Hearts 3 after 14 years, or they really just wanted to experiment with whatever mechanics they could to keep things interesting. What they did was keep fans invested for that 14-year gap between console releases and give us endless debates on which methods we prefer and why. Whether it was speculation of what the third game would look like, which mechanics would make it over, what storylines would be relevant, the fact that they went so long in between console releases and that people were extremely excited for console remakes just shows you how good they were at keeping people engaged. Whether you like the game mechanics changing for every game or not, just like the extremely convoluted titling system of the games, it simply wouldn't be Kingdom Hearts without it. Utska. 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 Age of Empires 2 has to be one of the most classic and timeless RTS games I've ever played. It's just so easy to come back to time after time. I've played the first one, I've played a little bit of the third one, I just discovered there's a fourth one, but Age of Empires 2 Age of Kings will always be where it's at for me, and for many others as well. 
Just that opening cinematic alone gets me right in the mood to conquer civilizations every time I see it. As a kid, I was so used to Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 2 graphics, which for the most part, all the games kind of have similar looking styles. So for me, looking at this game for the first time, I wondered why the characters were so small and undetailed them. Why not make them bigger and cooler? But of course, I had much to learn about how RTSs worked. A note here before we move on, I am playing the HD edition on Steam and not the definitive edition. From what I understand, there are quite a bit of changes in the definitive edition, including it looking nicer, new civilizations, and some quality of life improvements. However, I only have the HD version. I'm not at a point where I can buy the definitive version just for this video. And the HD version is much closer to what I played as a kid, so it just kind of makes sense for me that that's what I cover. And we really just need to know the basics. In a traditional game of Age of Empires, you start with a town center, a scout, and three villagers. Even this can vary from game type to game type, such as Nomad, where you don't even have a town center and all of your villagers are scattered randomly on the map, or Arena, which gives you a set of walls to start off with. This is my personal favorite game type because I'm a very anxious boy and I need to have a sense of security or I'll panic myself into losing three minutes into the game. Villagers are used to collect resources, consisting of food, wood, stone, and gold. Food is generally the easiest to collect. You start with foraging bushes, but once you can create farms, it's pretty self-sustainable. However, you need food anytime you build a unit, so you will deplete it pretty quickly. Wood can be really easy or difficult depending on your map choice. Trees don't grow back despite the fact that thousands of years have passed within the game to advanced ages. But if you are playing a heavily forested map, then you shouldn't have that much of a problem. Gold can be obtained in a few ways, mostly by mining. But once you build a market, you can trade resources for gold at an obviously ludicrous price or send trade carts to a friendly marketplace, albeit the latter not that much gold is made. Stone is probably the hardest and most finite resource. You can buy it with gold, but it will be pretty costly and generally this is something you'll be sending out villagers and small armies to go look for since you're given such a limited supply to start. Besides resource collection, villagers can also be used to build things such as houses, barracks, archery ranges, monasteries, castles, universities, gates, walls, docks, wonders, and probably a bunch of other things. Houses are probably the most important building as you need them to increase your population total. Without them, you won't be able to create very many units, although this does become a little bit easier in the later stages of the game once you build castles as they will also add to your population total. A majority of the buildings you'll be creating will be centered around building an army. There are basic troops that almost every civilization has like swordsmen, archers, and mounted units, but there's also siege weapons that have advantages for taking down buildings and monks for healing your troops and converting enemies. Every civilization also has a special unit once they're able to build a castle, something completely unique that no other civilization has. These army buildings can also perform research, generally related to the unit they're building. Making soldiers harder to kill, doing more damage, you can only do one research per building, and you can't build troops while doing research, so choosing which you prioritize early on is going to be a big decision you'll have to make. Other buildings such as the blacksmith and the university are created for the sole purpose of research, while other buildings have some niche purposes such as the market which allows you to do research but also trading, and the monastery which allows the creation of monks but will also allow you to generate gold if you find a relic. Now of course if you know anything about Age of Empires you know that there are exceptions to pretty much everything I've just said which is why choosing a civilization is so important to properly match your playstyle. For example, the Huns don't require any housing whatsoever to get to max population, making them ideal for early game rushes or maps where you may not have a lot of space. The Aztecs and Mayans don't have gunpowder units or horses, but make up for that in other aspects with some unique upgrades that other civilizations don't have. Some research will not be available to every civilization as well. Some will not be able to fully upgrade or max out champions or horse units, 
Some buildings may not contain certain upgrades, some units will be more expensive in some civilizations, and some units naturally stronger in others. Personally, my favorites have always been the Mayans, the civilization, not the motorcycle club. Their plumed archer special unit is incredibly quick and does a ton of damage. They have special researches to help archers do more damage to buildings. They start with an extra villager. Their resources don't deplete as fast, and units are actually cheaper later on in the game. However, you sacrifice guns and horses, so that's a trade-off you have to be prepared to make, which can be a lot if your enemy specializes in those things. Alternatively, I also really enjoy playing as the Chinese, which, being half Chinese, I played as them quite often as a kid, because they also start off with extra villagers, very powerful archers, and their technologies are a lot cheaper. You probably noticed a pattern, I really like archers in video games. There are various different map types in the game, some maps containing no water and others containing a lot, meaning you might be forced to go into water combat as well. However, there are fishing boats and other things you can do in the water, so there is more advantages to that style of play. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of these types of maps. I generally play large landlocked ones with no bodies of water, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Literally, because yeah, you get it. This has been a long video. There are a few ways to win depending on the game type. The most common is simply winning by conquest, destroying your opponent completely until they have no units and no way to build more. Beyond that, a standard game type can also be won by building a wonder, an extremely expensive building that takes a long time to build. And once it's built, it signals everyone as to where it is so they can come along and destroy it. My friends and I always played very resource oriented games when we played, so we almost always turned off wonder because it can kind of be a bit of a disappointing way to end. You can also do a time limit or win by score, but let's be real, who's doing that? Kill people, that's the point of the game. The game at its core, along with most RTS games, is management of resources and human power. You could be controlling three groups of soldiers in three different battles, only to check in on your base and realize all your farms have died, you have no one chopping wood to replenish them, and a fourth battle is about to ensue right outside your gates. You have to decide whether it's worth the risk to make more troops, or make more villagers to get resources to create buildings to create even more troops even faster, figure out what your opponent's army looks like, and figure out which units are best to counter that. There is a ton of on-the-fly decision making, and that is why I am trash at this game, and any RTS game to be completely honest. And it's not because I don't consider myself a fast thinker, truthfully I think I'm very capable of creating successful plans and following them through. Of course until one tiny minor inconvenience gets in my way then everything crumbles and I break down into tears. The problem is, well, like I said earlier, I'd really just rather not do a lot of the fighting, I just like the resource collection part. And oftentimes when I play multiple AI, I will always have teammates to do the fighting for me. I spend all my time building a second or third town center in the trees, and I leave my units idle more as a defense instead of actively invading. And then my teammates steal my relics and build things right in the middle of my setup, ruining everything. It's called aesthetic, Genghis Khan. Get with it. I know I said earlier I'd rather not win by wonder building, so it maybe seems like a contradiction that I like resource collecting but don't want to win by resource collecting. I do like the combat part of the game, I just tend to prioritize it way too late into the match, like when people are attacking me and I have not built a barracks uh, late into the match. And this is why I have teammates to bail me out. Please come help me immediately, I am about to die. On the topic of AI, I don't know if it's just an HD edition thing or what, but unfortunately the AI seems a bit broken. At times you can play a game against 7 easy PCs for like 3 hours and when it comes to invading, suddenly you realize none of them have ever mined stone ever. Like it's just not a thing they even bothered to do. And I don't understand how that happens, like often times if I'm not watching my villagers they will start mining other things by accident, so you almost have to go out of your way to not mine stone. 
as I said, I am 100% confident the definitive version is much better. There's a reason it's the definitive version and why everyone plays it more than the HD version. People actively recommend you don't play the HD version. And if I played this game more than once every four years, I would certainly make the Switch and buy the definitive version. Besides your regular game type, there is also a campaign mode, a campaign mode that I've never really touched outside of the beginning of one mission, just because I really like the way this one guy says, And seed will fall to my blade. Whenever I'm playing some sort of combat focused game, I will mumble this to myself and no one understands why. I think I'll eventually play through the campaign, just more out of curiosity than anything. I think it feels a little bit more strategic because there's not a lot of traditional playing within it. It's not like you build a town center, build villagers, it's more, here are your troops, go win with these limited amount of troops. And the fact that I've enjoyed this game on and off for 20 plus years without ever touching the campaign, I think speaks volumes to how well the base game holds up without needing a campaign. Eventually, the Age of Empires games got me into other RTSs, which eventually got me into being really bad at Warcraft 3 for a brief period of time, which got me into getting into tower defense games, and I guess inadvertently now I have almost a million views because of RTS games, so thanks, I guess. Just like for many others as well, this game was my introduction into learning about many civilizations and cultures from the Middle Ages, which sparked a lifelong interest in medieval fantasy game settings for years to come. I say fantasy and not history because, well, if you could see my report card from high school, clearly history wasn't my thing. But also, just back then, it wasn't as easy to look stuff up you didn't know on Wikipedia. Especially during that era, all you ever heard from teachers at school was that everything on Wikipedia was fake and that you couldn't trust any of the information on it. But joke's on you, Mrs. Librarian. I know for a fact that everything on Wikipedia is true. They told me themselves on Wikipedia's Wikipedia page. Oftentimes, you wouldn't really know why things were the way that they were. You didn't know what the Franks were, if they were French. You didn't know if the Britons were British. We'd only heard about the Huns from Mulan. And so, instead of hearing rumblings on the playground of, I heard if you use this code, you can unlock the character, which, yes, I used many cheats while playing Age of Empires, we were talking about, Oh, I heard the reason the Aztecs don't have horses is because someone stole them all. Come on, we were we were like 10. G give, give, give us a break. I don't remember how I stumbled upon the fact that there was an Age of Empires DS game simply called Age of Empires The Age of Kings. I can't imagine I'd ever buy something like it, although I suppose it's possible, but I'm more willing to bet it was a gift from a family member who recognized the name Age of Empires and thought I would enjoy the game. And oh boy, were they wrong. I f***ing loved it. Age of Empires The Age of Kings on the DS is a turn-based game that has all the sound effects you know and love from the second game. It looks good, it feels great to play, it's not perfect by any means, and it definitely has some major issues which we'll touch on later. But for an adaption of an RTS game made seven years after the original, turning that into a turn-based game, I can't imagine it could have been done any better than this. Your game will start off with three units, although here one unit actually represents ten, but for the sake of not getting confusing and pedantic, we'll just call them singular. You start off with a villager, one militia, and if you choose to play with them, a hero, and we'll dive into heroes a little bit later. You will not start with a town center, but luckily for you, your villagers can build one right away. Some buildings can't be built on some terrains like water and mountains, so it's best to make sure you know where you're building your center. Town centers can allow you to train villagers, do researches, advance to the next age, trade resources, and build buildings in adjacent spots. You'll notice there are only two resources in the game, food and gold. There is no stone or wood, so every unit in building basically takes varying combinations of both food and gold. Units more on the food side, buildings more on the gold side. Collecting resources is pretty straightforward. If you see gold, build a mine on top, and you'll slowly start to earn gold every turn. 
There's no need to have a villager stand in mine, which is good because this being a turn-based game would make that extremely repetitive extremely quickly. Mills are the same, building them over wheat, and with mills you can place four farms within the four adjacent straightforward spots, which again do not require any sort of maintenance. The ground your units walk on also plays a pretty significant part in how you'll play. Characters walk differently on different terrain, and some have bonus stats depending on where they are. Characters can walk a lot farther than usual on roads, as you can see indicated by the boot icon. It only costs one move point to move one space, whereas grass it will cost two, swamp will cost three, mountains will cost four, there's a couple other ones I might be missing. Even the smallest rivers cannot be crossed unless there's some rocks over it, making siege units and even cavalry very difficult and hard to use depending on the map you're playing. Bonuses will vary. Some are unit specific, such as horses having bonuses when on grass, while others are statistical, like mountains giving you better vision, better defense, and accuracy. Different map types will have different terrains, which may or may not influence which civilization you choose. Alternatively, some buildings can't go on certain plains. On grass, anything is fair game. On mountains, it's strictly castle, and in trees, it's only town buildings, so no farms. You'll also occasionally see little things on the ground, little bags of gold or relics. The bags of gold are just gold, whereas the things that look like broken columns can be anything from food to gold to disease that instantly kills your troop, so it's always a little bit of a gamble. By far the most annoying is when it gives you an extra villager, because you can't just kill units whenever you want, you can't just press delete. And it always happens when you're late in the game and the last thing you want is a villager taking up your already little population space. It's also pretty important to note that units can pass over each other but they cannot stop on the same space. So it's pretty common for there to be long lineups to get across something like a bridge since you can imagine it's pretty easy for there to be two to three units waiting on both sides. Buildings can only be built right next to town centers, with the exception of the castle and of course the mills and the mines that we've already talked about. This means you'll need to build more than one town center to be able to get everything. Buildings can build one unit at a time, and it takes a full turn to get them, so you can't create and move a unit the same turn. Some buildings are needed to unlock specific researches, with the screen showing you a picture of what you need to be able to research it. I mentioned research, there's only one research that can be done a day, even if you have a barracks and a town center and a university and whatever else. It's kind of annoying, but in total there are less than 60 researches, and at least with my personal playstyle, you'll find yourself getting to a point where there's nothing meanwhile left to research way sooner than later. Depending on if you have them turned on or not, your turns will start with some random effects. These can range from getting extra food, resource growth cut in half for the day, and of course, our favorite, finding a random damn villager no one wants. Sometimes it's several. Outside of villagers and heroes, units have two actions, moving and attacking. You can move and then attack, but you can't move once you've attacked. All units start off with 100 HP and have stats in attack, defense, sight, and range. And then you can also see specialties such as terrain advantages. Based off these metrics, the game will actually tell you before combat what your odds are of winning an encounter. Not every encounter will result in a unit's death, but it will at least tell you how likely you are to take more than you lose. Two green arrows pointing up to two red arrows pointing down tells you how likely you are to come out on top. I'm not sure if having less health means your attack does less because there's technically less units. I'm pretty sure it does, especially considering if you have considerably lower defense than the person you're attacking, you're most likely just to be killed anyways. When you attack, the game will play a little animation and show you however much health remains, and I love cheering on my little guys. It is possible to heal your units either through the use of monks, abilities, or by placing your injured units on certain buildings. I say certain buildings because I'm not exactly sure which ones do and don't. I think the castle and the town center definitely do, but it might just be placing them in the building that they were created from. Another thing you can do is take two units of the same type and merge them. This will take up both of their turns, but technically you can combine with one that's already attacked. 
Although, if your unit is low enough to the point where you're merging two units anyways, chances are attacking with a weak unit could potentially kill it, unless of course it's a ranged unit. There is no attack bonus for merging units or anything like that, it is strictly just a way to take two almost dead units and combine them into a somewhat healed unit. Something very unique and something I very much dislike about this game is that units will actually level up. The more combat a unit sees and survives, the more powerful they will become. Generally on the 3rd, 6th, and 9th battle unless they have an ability that says otherwise. If your units are able to survive strong battles, be healed, or just be archers always on the outside of the battle, they become stronger with experience. Now you might be saying to yourself, Ghost Boy, how could you possibly hate a mechanic like this? And I will tell you how. I don't need more reasons to get emotionally attached to my units. You want to see a grown man cry? Fine. Watch what happens when I lose a 20 battle veteran on my team. He was so close to retirement. There are five civilizations in the game. The Japanese, the Saracens, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, the Mongols, the Franks, and the Britons. Just like in the RTS, each of course have unit specialization and a special castle unit, but they also come with a unique hero, should you choose to keep this option on. These heroes are extremely powerful, have multiple special unique abilities, and while they can be revived using a monastery late in the game, they are very expensive to bring back, but they do have a ton of value in the early game. Before I read off the abilities and their descriptions, it's also important to note that there is a difference between being adjacent to a unit and being diagonal, and the game will always differentiate between the two. The Franks have Joan of Arc. Her abilities include Inspiration, which heals her and her adjacent units by 20, Divine Purpose, which heals all units by 5, Blinding Faith, which lowers the defense of all enemies within her line of sight by 25%, and Weakened Resolve, which makes all adjacent units and diagonal enemies lose up to 25 health. The Saracens have Saladin, and hopefully I'm pronouncing both of those correct. Someone please in the comments let me know. His abilities include Benefactor, which will add 100 gold to the player if used on a town center. Reign of Arrows, which grants any friendly ranged units within his line of sight a 33% increase to attack. Aura of Invincibility, which increases the defense of all friendly units within sight by 33%, and Hit and Run, which allows adjacent friendly units to give 2 plus to their movement and 25% more attack. The Mongols have Genghis Khan, who has the Patron of the Arts, which when used on a town center, will lower the cost of a research by 50 food and gold. Nomadic Travel, which allows adjacent and diagonal units a plus 5 to movement, Overwhelming Siege, which allows all friendly units within sight to gain 33% attack against buildings, and Mongol Terror, where all enemies within sight suffer 25% defense lost. The Japanese have, and I'm sorry for how I'm about to butcher this, Minamoto Yoshitsune, whose powers include Pillage, which gives all friendly units a 50% attack when attacking mills, mines, and farms, Warrior's Code, which when used on a town center, discounts all units trained that day by 20 food and 20 gold. Minamoto's Guard, which gives all adjacent friendly units 33% attack and defense. And Inspiring General, where Minamoto and all adjacent units gain 15 health. Lastly, we have the Britons, who have Richard the Lionhearted. His abilities include Reckless and Fierce, where all enemy units diagonal and adjacent to him lose 20 health. Superb Leader, where all friendly units within sight gain 25% attack. Recruit for the Cause, which will lower unit training costs by 20% and gold if on a town center. And Firing Line, where all ranged units within his sight gain plus one range. As I'm sure you can tell by just listing all that off, all heroes have very different and distinct uses, which can come in handy depending on your playstyle. Some focus more on healing, others on the slow burn, some on the economy, others just overwhelming your opponents. There are also special abilities which are normal passive abilities that add another layer of complexity. Not only do the heroes have special abilities, but many units have them as well, such as skirmish where in a melee counter they'll always get to hit first, as if they were the ones initiating combat. There's also first strike which 
does this even for ranged attacks, and a side note, Genghis Khan has this ability and it drives me absolutely nuts. He is already such a powerful hero, but I can have my best ranged units attack him and they all get completely wiped out before I get a single shot. Some units have volley, where you do more damage if you have over half your health, some units heal after battles, some can't move and attack in the same turn but they do double damage, some units scare off horses. For the conversion from RTS to turn based, these add a ton of flavor and uniqueness to the game and make special units feel way more special. Generally in the base game you read how certain troops are better against others, but unless you're a pro player or maybe this is just me being really bad. It can actually be pretty hard to take advantage of this. More often than not, you're just going to make a random army full of the best troops you have available and send them off, rather than, okay, well, this guy has 12 horses, so I need 12 pikemen to take him down, and getting really specific about who's fighting who. But here, it matters a lot, and it's very prevalent in the game. On top of this, once you complete games, you will acquire Empire Points, which can be used to buy more maps and unlock units that are further upgrades to the basic units. Better bowmen, better swordsmen, better crossbowmen. You also get points from completing the campaign, which kind of feels more like a puzzle game than an Age of Empires game, but it's still fine. It's basically just figure out how to win this battle with these units. For second screen usage, I would give this a 2 out of 10. It's kind of helpful, and the fight cutscenes play on the top screen while all of the gameplay happens on the bottom, but the top screen is really just an information hub, and I honestly think this game probably could work fine on a single screen. I wouldn't be surprised if perhaps this was initially intended to be a Game Boy game, and then they just kind of quickly flipped things around. The video you're watching right now was inspired almost completely by this game and of course the Star Wars Battlefront one that I mentioned earlier. I moved back in August, and while packing I found my old DS games, and among them was Age of Empires The Age of Kings. I immediately played it and I fell in love with the game again, and I told myself that I should really make a video about it, and I honestly don't remember why I ever stopped playing this game. I mean it really- Oh. Yeah. That's why. This isn't a specific cartridge issue, the footage you're watching was actually recorded on emulator, and it's not an emulator issue either because it happened to my real game. There is a whole section on Wikipedia about how the game will just crash when you try to save, and sometimes the cartridge can just stop working altogether. It's really disheartening to get that far in a game and for it to end like that. If you're on emulator, you at least have save states so you can kind of keep playing through that. But if something goes wrong and you have to replay a bunch of fights you already did and make a bunch of new troops and stuff, it, it's too hard to get invested for me. I already have a hard time enough when I play single player games and have to do that. This is a whole other beast. I really do adore this game. It's not perfect by any means. The games are really, really long depending on the difficulties and map types. The maps really could use a lot of work in general. Mostly because so many levels seem to be based around this idea of having a single walkable path to your opponent. In late game, you can get tied up here pretty much forever and never make any progress. I'd also just love the ability to kill units whenever I wanted, because every time that damn event shows up and I get extra villagers, it takes several turns for me to walk them over to enemies and get them killed intentionally. And it also means I have no more room to make more guys that I need. But in the grand scheme, that's obviously a small thing. The biggest issue would have to be the fact that the game crashes a lot. Five civilizations may feel a little small, and they maybe chose some weird ones, but I honestly don't mind. They were limited and had to work within the limitations, the whole point of this video. And let's be honest, if there's a civilization with good archers, I'm exclusively playing as them anyways. That being said, for this video, I played games as all five civilizations, and they did a pretty good job at making sure they all feel pretty unique due to their special units. But in terms of what it does good, I have to say, it makes some of the slowest gameplay somehow feel exactly like Age of Empires. There's something so cool about it using some of the models, all of the same sounds, and bringing new life into the franchise. It would have been very easy to convert this into some very cheap and boring turn-based game, but I think they did a good job at making it a worthwhile addition, and I would absolutely recommend it to people, 
if it weren't for the fact that you probably won't be able to save your games. I really adore turn-based games like these where you have to traverse a map and walk around with multiple characters. I've mentioned XCOM on this channel quite a few times, and I've never had a chance to play Fire Emblem or Advance Wars, but I think I'll tackle all those sooner than later, so perhaps this really is the bottom of the barrel of these types of games, and this is just pure nostalgia talking. I used to have a free block in my last year of high school, and I was always reading a book, but this one kid would never leave me alone, so we started playing this game and passing the DS to each other so I would have an excuse not to speak to him, and it worked, and for that alone this game is a 15 out of 10. There will probably never be another Age of Empires turn-based game. I know that one point there was like an MMO, and I think maybe that was somewhat kind of turn-based, but I'm not exactly sure. Perhaps there's a crappy phone game that already exists that I don't know about, but truly I think it's a bit of a shame because I think a modern sequel or even just a remake with some balance fixes and new maps and more civilizations and not crashing when you play the game could really start off a whole spin-off of games like this, or even just one really good timeless one that people can play for years to come. But for what it is, while probably the least played and most forgotten of the Age of Empires series, Age of Empires The Age of Kings remains one of the boldest and yet one of my favorites of these weird little twisted handheld experiments. The Might and Magic series dates all the way back to 1986 with the release of Might and Magic Book 1, The Secret of the Inner Sanctum. The Might and Magic games contain 10 entries in total, with 9 of them being between 1986 and 2002 and the last game coming out in 2014. There are dozens of spin-offs for the series, ranging from first-person shooters to third-person hack and slashes. But easily the most popular spin-off that eventually became its own series started in 1995 with Heroes of Might and Magic, A Strategic Quest. The game looks a bit rough, but of course we're here to talk about the handheld versions as well, so we can go right up to the game that came out just before those handheld games. Lucky for us, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, this game is undoubtedly the most popular of the series, Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the restoration of Arathia. There are people who literally will stream this game to over 10,000 viewers still today, despite the fact that there have been four more Heroes games since this one. Also a note for the diehards, yes, much like Age of Empires, I am playing the filthy HD edition available on Steam, which means I do not have any of the expansions and mods and everything else people have created. Again, this is the way I played the franchise as a kid, and it's also the version of the game that the handheld versions are based off of, so I'm not really missing anything major, but of course if you want a fuller, more complete experience, then the version on GOG is probably the way to go. So while in the original Might and Magic games you played in first person while controlling four different heroes, each hit switching to the next, the Heroes of Might and Magic series gave you control over the entire kingdom. 8 playable factions, turn-based combat, building up from nothing to take over the entire map. It's a good time. Throughout the game you will have several resources that you need to keep track of. Wood, mercury, ore, sulfur, crystal, gems, and gold. These will be needed to upgrade your town as well and buy units. Every town is unique in appearance and troops will have different advantages and disadvantages, so beyond just picking one that looks cool, which is also very important, Finding a faction that best fits your playstyle can be a lengthy process, but an important one. Once per turn, you can build something in each town that you own. The screen here is separated into four kind of sections. Your top row are things that every faction has. Your hall, the thing that you click on to build and upgrade buildings and it gives you gold every day. Your fort or citadel or eventually castle, which makes it so that you can buy more units per week, we'll get into that in a little bit, and it will also increase your town's defense to give you a better chance to fight off an invasion. 
The next is your tavern, which is needed to recruit new heroes, and a blacksmith, which will give you either a ballista, a first aid tent, or a catapult. Your second row contains your marketplace and mage guild. Heroes can learn spells, and your marketplace can allow you to trade resources for other resources. Pretty important in a game like this, where some might elude you more than others. The rest of the second row and third row will be your unique to faction buildings. These can be literally anything, but there's a few basic ones, including production of a specific unit, increasing a stat on a visiting hero, being able to purchase artifacts or trade units in for resources, getting more gold per turn. Some factions will only have three or four, where others will have up to seven. It really depends on who you're playing as. The last seven buildings are your unit dwellings. At the start of the new week, your units will become available to purchase again. Oftentimes it will be smaller numbers to start off with and that will grow as time goes on, with maybe something like 24 weaker units available per week and maybe 2-3 to three of your strongest. Every faction has 7 unique units, all which can be upgraded and we'll dive more into these as we get into combat and faction dissection. As I said, you can only upgrade one building per turn per town that you own, so deciding what you're going to prioritize first is huge. You'll also need to get the necessary resources for most of the buildings, and the only way to do that is to go out and get them. Unless you have a building that gives them to you, you need to go out and get those resources, and even if you do have a building that gives them to you, you'll still need to trade and the rates are always horrible, so let's talk about resource collection and map travel. On the map, you'll see your towns and heroes on the right side. Heroes can carry up to seven different types of units with them, which is obviously perfect for these seven unique units per faction. The green bar represents movement, and the bar on the right represents mana. I think it's blue, but I'm colorblind, and so I won't be as bold as to claim it is blue for I will look like a fool if I am incorrect. These can be changed by a factor of things, including how many troops you carry and the overall speed of those troops, although this is considered to be a little bit more on the metagame side. And there are also artifacts and skills that help you travel more per turn and be able to cast more spells. It should also be noted that some terrains cost more movement points to get around or across, but I've never really paid attention to this because I'm a filthy casual and a dirty cheater who always types in cheat codes to get unlimited movement. There are many places to visit on a map, things to pick up. You'll certainly want more than one hero to do it all, but also remember that if you don't want that hero just to be a scouting party, you're going to need to supply them with troops, which also costs money and resources, which you need the hero to go get, not to mention the number of troops you get per week is limited, although if you want, you could send a scouting party with just one troop, but if they encounter any units, they won't be able to do anything and thus you begin to see the true power of this game unfold. Among the things you'll find in the landscape are piles of loose resources on the ground, water wheels and windmills which give you a random resource once per week if you go back to visit them. You'll also be able to flag mines, caverns, sawmills, and alchemy labs which will give you an amount of those resources once per day. However, these can be taken by any passing enemy hero, so you may not keep them forever. Controlling these can be a huge part of success in the game, especially when you get into the later stages of the game, where you potentially control more than one town and need as much as you need to upgrade and build troops. And not to mention, make sure your opponent has as little resources as possible to work with. My personal favorite items that you find are treasure chests. When you collect them, you will have a choice between a set amount of gold or a set amount of experience 500 less than the value of that gold. Right away, you can start to see different playstyles and different priorities. These aren't always the easiest choices to make, and one choice near the beginning of the game can end up being a late game changer inadvertently. Along with just set pieces and bits of art and level design, you can also find groups of units standing around. Most of the time they're there to defend treasure or an artifact or a pathway, sometimes they're just standing there and looking pretty, and you'll be able to battle them, or sometimes they'll even ask to join you or sometimes they'll ask to join you for cash. And if you have a big enough army, they'll straight up run away from you, meaning you don't have to waste your time on the smaller fights. However, sometimes there are benefits to playing the battle out with certain abilities your hero may have or experience gained. Another big important thing you can find are obelisks. If you can manage to find every obelisk on a map, which is a lot and does take a lot of time, 
it will slowly uncover a puzzle map where you can go to a location and dig to find a holy grail. The grail gives a unique bonus to every faction, but can take a long time to find. And digging takes a whole turn, meaning you can't move before that turn, and if you dig one spot wrong to the left by accident, you've wasted a whole day of movement. There are other buildings scattered throughout as well, some that you can buy items from, others that you can recruit units from, some things like the Altar of Sacrifice where you can sacrifice units for experience, some maps have garrisons to set up defenses near your castle, there are other random places you can visit which will give you stat boosts or luck boosts or a morale boost. As mentioned earlier, you only have a set amount of movement and so it's pretty much impossible to do everything all at once, but the more you can see, the more you can plan out your actions. There's a great website called homm-utopia.com. They even have a movement guide along with a bunch of other really great guides. So if you do find yourself wanting to play this game but are getting a little lost or confused on certain things, because the learning curve can be a little bit scary, there are super cool community resources out there, even if some sections are incomplete. Not in every map, but in most maps there is a body of water, and a boat that you're able to buy and hop on. Whenever you enter a boat, it will automatically drain the rest of your movement for that day. And the same with docking back on land. So it does take some time, but the water can offer quite a few things, including lots of wood and whirlpools where some of your troops will probably die, but it'll teleport you across the map. Generally, you'll also find small islands with lots of treasure or artifacts or various other things to do. Now is a great time to talk about heroes, artifacts, and experience because we've said those things several times already, but now it's time to add some context. First off, when picking a faction, you'll get to choose a starting hero. Heroes each come with a specialty, and sometimes it's a unit specialty, meaning that unit is stronger for them than they would be for any other hero. Sometimes it can be an extra resource per turn, or starting off with a power, spell, or skill. And while we mention it, when selecting your faction, you can pick a starting bonus of either a random artifact, extra gold, or some extra resources. While your level 7 unit will require a special unit to buy, none of the resources you can select for said faction will actually match the one you need, but they can still be useful regardless. Heroes have four stats, attack, defense, power, and knowledge. Attack gives your troop an attack bonus, defense is a defense bonus, power is the strength or duration of a spell, and knowledge is spell points. You've got two icons on the right side of abilities, which is morale and luck. These are both super important, and again, I'll recommend HOMM-Utopia's guide on it if you are considering giving this game a go, just to make sure you really understand how important they are. There are three levels to positive morale, there's neutral morale, and three levels of negative morale. Positive morale can actually give you a chance to attack twice in a single turn, which is huge for any unit. Negative morale can cause your units to actually miss a turn. Your hero morale affects your troop morale. Yes, every single unit in the game has their own morale levels, and this will increase or decrease depending on how they interact with the rest of your army. If your army of 7 units is all made up of units from different factions, then your morale will actually be lower. If they're all from the same faction, it'll be higher. Of course, this would ruin the idea of owning all the most powerful units, but luckily not all hope is lost, as you can get artifacts to raise your hero's morale, thus raising your troops' morale and balancing it out. But early game, when the option arises for you to have a random unit join your party, it may not always be a good thing, and it's something you'll have to consider. On the other side, you have luck. Most units have a range of damage. Just like morale, there are 7 stages of luck, and the lower the luck, the better chance you're afflicted and do the minimum damage, and the better luck, the better chance you'll actually have of doing straight up double damage. Luck and morale are huge factors that can easily sway a battle from one side to the other, and they should definitely not be ignored like I always did as a kid. As you're traveling around the map, you'll often find little spots where you can stop. Some will give you increases, some will give you the chance of decreasing or increasing. Sometimes you'll have to decide if it's worth the risk to look for an artifact if it means losing some morale if you can't find anything. To the left of morale and luck, we have the hero's specialty, and below that we have experience and spell points. Every time a hero levels up, they'll gain either attack, defense, power, or knowledge. 
This is dependent on your hero's class, and there's a chart on heroesofmightandmagic.com that shows this pretty well. Although I'm not a meta gamer, and I always thought it was random until just this moment, I literally didn't realize that there was a class. Up until level 20, every time your hero levels up, you will have a choice between two skills. These skills, I believe, are random and all have three levels to them. In total, you can have up to eight skills, but if you have a skill as a specialty, then technically you can have nine. Ideally, you want to select first level skills that you want when you see them, or you risk potentially not getting them later, as the last few levels will just be upgrading the skills you already have. There are 28 skills in total, each with three levels to them, basic, advanced, and expert. There are three categories of skills, that being combat, adventure, and magic. Again, there's a really great page on heroesofmightandmagic.com, which I'll be using for reference. It's another great resource, there's two of them, and you might be thinking that because I needed two websites just to help me convey information, that there is too much to learn about this game, but I promise you it is very natural once you get a few games in. I was playing this game when I was like 8 years old, so you can do it now. Believe in yourself. Let's start with the combat skills first. Note that your hero does not do any physical attacks themselves outside of casting spells. So when you hear things such as archery or melee for example, it's not your hero doing this damage, but it's the troops at their command. Offense will increase hand to hand or melee damage, archery will increase range damage, Armor reduces the amount of damage taken, Resistance helps resist enemy spells, Leadership gives a troop morale bonus, Luck gives a luck bonus, and there are three skills for each blacksmith item, Artillery, Ballistics, and First Aid. The cool thing about Ballistics and Artillery is that without these skills, you actually have no control over what they do, they just fire at random. But with them, you can actually select their targets. This is mostly notable when you're invading a castle and you want to try to get through walls. If you have the ability to aim with your artillery, then you can actually pick what part of the wall you want to attack and destroy, where sometimes it'll just go all over the place and you'll just have to wait until something breaks. The same unfortunately does not work for first aid, it will always just target who it believes needs the most healing. There's also necromancy which will resurrect enemies into skeletons, the most basic unit of the undead faction. However, they'll only be normal skeletons and not the armored ones, but if you're full with 7 slots and already have armored skeletons, you'll receive those instead, just at fewer numbers. The most unique skill that I've saved for last is Tactics, and I think this is a great game changer for pretty much every faction. It allows you to move your units around before combat actually begins, like a sneak attack in a D&D game. The higher level the skill, the further your troops can go. If you have slower units that generally have a hard time making it into the middle of battle, this is a great way to get them right in the middle of the field before the first turn even starts. Or you can send your slower and heavy units to stand in front of your ranged units so that no fast enemies can come and pick them off. Next we have our adventure skills. Most of them are pretty basic. Logistics helps you move farther, pathfinding helps you get rid of movement penalties for terrain type, scouting allows you to see farther, navigation helps you travel the seas faster, the three that don't really fit anywhere else are Diplomacy, Estates, and Learning. Estates can give you more gold per day, Learning will increase how much experience you get. However, these are not really worth getting because they become pretty useless in the late game, but Diplomacy is almost always useful. As I mentioned earlier, when you confront a group of units in the wild, they will sometimes see your army and try to run away. And you can let them and avoid the combat sequence, surrendering some XP gained but not losing any units. However, very rarely they will actually offer to join you, and with Diplomacy, that chance goes up significantly. Without Diplomacy, it can still happen, but it becomes a lot more rare. If you have skills based off of Diplomacy and artifacts helping your morale and luck, then this can become a very useful strategy. The rest of the skills all involve magic. Eagle Eye allows the hero to learn high level spells that other heroes use during combat, although if you have a mage guild in your city, it's generally not really a problem. Intelligence will increase your max spell points, Mysticism increases how many regenerate per day, Scholar allows you to learn spells from your other heroes when they meet up, which at that same time you can also exchange troops and artifacts. Sorcery increases damage effective spells. Wisdom allows you to learn better spells, which is a must if your hero intends to cast good decent spells. 
And then there are four specialized skills for air, earth, water, and fire magics that boost the effectiveness of those particular spells. I'm not going to go through every spell because there's a lot, and some of them are just generic damage, but there's a few worth mentioning that can give you just an idea of the range of these spells. There are both combat and non-combat spells. You've got your hastes, your lightning bolts, ways to increase luck and morale, create shields, increase range damage. You can hypnotize enemies, even summon some air elementals to help you out. For outside of combat, you can summon and destroy boats, disguise your troops so that enemies will think you have way more units than you actually do, reveal the locations of unclaimed artifacts, find all resources, cast a dimension door, and even get the exact information on if idle units are willing to join you, will flee from you, or try to fight you. As you can see, there are many slots on your heroes for artifacts. In total, there are 13 spots separated into 9 categories. Helmet, necklace, chest, right hand, left hand, two rings, feet, shoulders, and four spots that are kind of just random ones that wouldn't really fit on a person. There are also four different slots for war machines in the top corner, which you can buy from the blacksmith, a ballista, first aid tent, catapult, and ammunitions cart. There are well over 100 artifacts in the game. Again, I'm not going to cover them all, but they're worth talking about because they can be extremely useful and do some pretty cool things. You have a lot of pendants, most if not all I think make your units immune to certain spells. You've got items to increase combat speed, durations of spells, increase health, there are tons of basic ones, lots of swords that increase attack, shields that increase defense, some of these can go up to plus 6 which is actually pretty significant. Helmets will often increase knowledge, while torso pieces will often increase spell power. However that's not exclusive, there are some artifacts that increase all primary skills some torsos that do attack and defense. There's really a ton out there, and they're not any bad ones, but you'll just constantly be upgrading as the game goes on, and a huge part of winning fights with the opponent is taking their artifacts for yourself. The four slots are really interesting too, because it's not tied to a specific slot. There's a lot of things that can go in and out of them. There's quite a few things that affect morale and luck that go here, as well as items like the wood cart that gives you extra resources per day, or even give you more troops of a certain level once per week. My favorite is probably the boots of levitation, they just let you walk over everything. It's very satisfying when you don't have to walk around trees and you only have so much movement so every inch counts. Now we've somehow been talking all this time and not yet gotten into combat despite me showing quite a bit of it on screen, so let's talk about the combat. Combat consists of rounds. One round consists of every unit taking a turn. Every unit has the same set of attributes, health, attack, and defense, all self-explanatory, damage, which includes the minimum damage and maximum damage they can do. If the unit is a ranged unit, they'll also have a number of shots. However, if you have an ammunition cart, you have unlimited ammo, and rarely do battles go long enough where the amount of shots you have actually becomes a factor, at least in my experience. Health is per individual units, so if a stack of 100 has health of 10 and someone does 22 damage, that stack now has 98 in the stack. Finally, stat-wise, you have speed, which is not only which order the units take their turns in, but also how many spaces they can move on their turn. Below this is each individual unit's morale, luck, and any afflictions they may have on them. While other units can cast spells and conditions on your units, more often than not, these will come from heroes. At any point when you're in control, once per round, your hero can cast a spell. Spells can do damage, buff your units to take less damage, cast slow, haste, create quicksand on the field that only you can see. Any stack can be buffed or debuffed, and there's a multitude of ways you can shift the tides of battle, granted you need to have the mana points and the spells to do it. We'll talk about some of the unique afflictions that units can cast on each other when we actually dive into the units when we dive into factions in a bit. As I mentioned before, morale and luck are huge factors in combat with the chance to go twice or double your damage, or in some cases, skip a turn entirely and do minimum damage. One of the more interesting things to have to account for in combat is counterattacks. Generally in games like these you have attack of opportunity. When a unit leaves another unit's vicinity, the unit not moving will have a free attack. This game does not have that, but has counterattacks, which adds a ton of strategy on how you're going to play the game. 
When you move a unit to attack another unit, if you don't completely wipe out and kill that stack, which is, you know, very common, they will counterattack. Meaning if you're sending a weak stack of units to attack a much stronger stack in hopes to just whittle their health down a little bit, you won't just weaken them, you may potentially kamikaze your entire squad. I really like this mechanic, it means you can't just surround your enemy's top units with a bunch of weak ones and hope to slowly dwindle them down once per turn. If you do that, your troops will pay the price and you will lose them in the process. At minimum, you'll have to at least choose which unit will take the first fatal blow. Oftentimes you'll have two strong units going head to head, and pretty much everyone gets a chance to hit everyone twice per round. Outside of the turn based combat, you'll notice some options on the bottom bar. Wait will allow your unit to go last until after all of your opponent's units have made their move. Defend will essentially skip your turn but give your unit a pretty sizable and noticeable defensive boost while doing so. You've got auto combat for those smaller fights where you don't want to bother controlling everything. The only downside with this is that your hero will most likely cast unnecessary spells during combat, so if you're trying to save up mana, I would just recommend staying away from this entirely. Your last two options are surrendering and retreating, which sounds similar like logging off and logging out, but they're actually different. If you lose a battle, your hero should be recruitable again. I say should because some Google searches have led me to believe that this isn't always the case, sometimes they don't reappear. However, retreating is free and guarantees that your hero will be recruitable in the tavern once again with their artifacts. Surrendering is a step up, costing you some money and resources that you have to give to your opponent, but allowing that hero to be recruited again with their entire army and artifacts intact. Both scenarios also maintain your hero's level, so while you may lose your army if you don't have the extra gold on hand, keeping an extremely powerful hero and their artifacts may prove to be more valuable. As I said though, if your hero just normally dies during combat, they should be able to come back, but some people report that they haven't been able to find them or it takes them 20 cycles to go through, but either way, if you think you're going to lose a battle, play it safe, keep what you got. The ebb and flow of battle in this game is a lot more than just grabbing the most powerful units in the game and putting them into a grand army. There's a lot to consider, not only luck and morale, but having a mix of fast units and ranged units and tanks. You may see some units that are very fast but very weak and think they're completely useless, but ranged units cannot do ranged attacks if there is an enemy too close to them meaning if you send your fast unit right next to them, they'll have to either do a weak melee attack or spend a whole turn walking away. Just considering these elements alone, you can begin to see the appeal of this game. I like to compare it to that of a legal trial, where what you see in the courtroom or battlefield may seem like the most important and decisive part, but like an amazing show like Suits showed us, all the work that goes into the case before you get to that point may prove to be the actual difference. So you've been staring at these troops from 8 different factions for quite a while, let's dive into them. We'll go from my least favorite to favorite, because it's opinions and I'm sure someone's already in the comment telling me why I'm wrong before I've even listed them. Also again to remind everyone, this is the HD version, which is pretty faithful to the original version, which is what the mobile versions are based off of, so if I'm missing things from what you're familiar with, that is why. First up, we have the Stronghold. The Stronghold faction is your barbarian faction, consisting of goblin, orcs, ogres, giant birds, cyclops, and behemoths. They have two ranged units, the orcs with throwing axes, and the cyclops which throws rocks, and later has a laser eye. The cyclops are one of the most powerful ranged units in the game, and they have a unique ability that actually allows them to attack fortress walls, which is incredibly useful. Their level 7 unit is a behemoth, which is very slow, but also one of the cheapest level 7 units in the game. And when it comes to attack, it can ignore up to 80% of the target's defense. The faction also has some cool special buildings like an escape tunnel that will allow your hero to flee with their army during an invasion, but overall I just find them too slow and too weak defensively. They are, however, a very cheap faction, allowing you to use those resources elsewhere and build up a pretty strong army pretty fast. Next we have the fortress, which is filled with swamp-like creatures such as the serpent flies, lizard warriors, gnolls, basilisks, wyverns, and the almighty hydra. Also I should point out now, I think it's pronounced wyverns, fantasy names have very complicated pronunciations and there's 50 different pronunciations depending on who you ask, so. I'm sorry if I get something wrong. 
The troops have quite a few abilities here. The Serpent Flies can dispel buffs. The Basilisks can turn enemies to stone. The Gorgons have a Death Stare, which gives them a chance to kill one unit in a group of 10. Meaning if you have a lot of Gorgons, you can kill tons just with this ability. The Wyverns or Wyverns can poison opponents, and the Hydra is really cool because it attacks on all the spaces around it, and enemies can't counterattack it. While it is a very slow unit, if you can get it out in the middle of battle, it can do a good spread of damage. They're not a bad faction by any means, it's just not one that interests me. Next we have the dungeon, somewhat appropriately named as the creatures are all very reminiscent of Dungeons and Dragons beasts. Troglodytes, Harpies, Beholders, Medusa, Minotaurs, Manticores, and the red and black dragons. No, not the Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Every unit has some sort of ability, and some of them are incredibly useful. Troglodytes are immune to blind. The Harpy will return to the spot they've started on after they've attacked, meaning the opponent cannot counterattack. The Beholder doesn't suffer a penalty when attacking with melee like most ranged units do. The Medusa also has the same, as she shoots with a bow, but also has the ability to turn her opponents to stone if attacking melee. The Minotaur's morale can't ever drop below one, the Manticore has a chance to paralyze its opponents, and the Black Dragon, which is the evolved Red Dragon, is immune to all spells. This is also where we get introduced to the Hatred system. Black Dragons hate Titans, which we'll get into a little bit on about what a Titan is. When a unit hates another unit, they'll actually do more damage when attacking that unit, and also lose morale if they're in the same squad. This is really cool because none of the units have one-sided hatred. The Black Dragons hate Titans, but Titans hate them right back, and so they both get an attack bonus against each other. I think mostly this was done just to prevent people from having a perfect morale crew with 7 level 7 units, or at least make such a feat very difficult to obtain. The coolest unique building in the dungeon has to be its Portal of Summoning, where a random creature can be recruited once per week. So if you want to leave those nasty little troglodytes behind for a cooler newer toy, you can do that. We've talked about the morale loss of course, but don't underestimate what having a few extra troops can do to guard your castle while your main hero is off exploring. They've also got the Artifact Merchants, allowing you to trade resources for artifacts, not something every town has. Overall, they are one of the more powerful factions and have some incredible troops that have a multitude of uses. Next we have the Inferno, your Hellspawn group with Imps, Hellhounds, Demons, Pit Fiends, and Devils. Imps are the most useless and overly expensive unit in the game but their upgraded familiars have a cool ability that they'll absorb 20% of your opponent's spent mana and add it to your own pool. Magogs, which I hope I'm saying that correctly, have a fireball throwing attack that will hit adjacent spots, great if your enemy is pulled together. Hellhounds become Cerberus, which can attack three enemies at once and not be countered attack, much like the Hydra. Pit Fiends, which become Pit Lords, can resurrect a dead stack of allied troops and raise them as demons, which is super cool and useful to help you walk away with as little casualties as possible. Ifrit Sultans have a fire shield spell on them at all time, meaning you will be damaged by fire if you physically attack them, and they have a hatred of genies, a troop we'll see later on. Lastly, we have the Arch Devil, or Arch Devil. I've always said Arch Devil. I'm, someone's going to come after me for that, so apologies right away, but not actually. I'm sticking to my guns. I'm saying Arch. The Archdevil is an extremely fast unit that can teleport all over the map. He has a hatred of angels, cannot be countered attack, and lowers all enemy units luck by one while he's on the field. One really cool building they have is the Castle Gate, which allows heroes to teleport from one Inferno town to another if you happen to own another one. Not all maps have multiple towns for you to control, and even then not all of them will all be the same type. So it's not always the most necessary, but it can save you a ton of time and help you fend off invaders if you see an enemy hero marching towards one of your less guarded towns. The good units are really good, the bad units are pretty bad, but overall it's a fun group and a nice aesthetic. Completely opposite of Inferno, we have Castle, your typical medieval knights in shining armor. Pikemen, swordsmen, griffins, archers, monks, horse champions, and angels. The upgraded archer is a marksman who shoots twice per turn. The royal griffin has unlimited counterattacks. The swordsman, which becomes the crusader, can attack twice as well. The champions have an extra 5% damage for every space traveled to get to their opponent. And lastly, we have the angels. 
upgraded to the Archangels, they are arguably the most powerful unit in the game. A hatred of devils, they also have the ability to pretty much fly anywhere on the field, and they can resurrect allied troops once per combat. This is an extremely useful ability, albeit most of the time you want the Archangel attacking, but sometimes it's better to have it than not. The castle is also a great faction to pick if you're in a town near water as you can build ships from your city with the shipyard and the lighthouse will allow you to travel farther in water. Overall, I just love the aesthetics of this town. It reminds me so much of playing with my cousin's Lego set when I was younger, playing imaginary games where I was the knight in a shining castle. And overall, it's just very Narnia-esque, a movie I watched a ton as a kid and read the books before I was really able to read at that level. They're a pretty strong faction, and if you can get your hands on a group of Archangels, it should be pretty difficult for people to stand in your way. Now we're getting into my top three, and I think all of them are pretty interchangeable as to which ones I tend to play as the most. Necropolis is the undead faction, filled with skeletons, zombies, wraiths, vampires, liches, dread knights, and ghost dragons. One thing that really makes this faction special is the necromancy skill that we talked about earlier. Whenever you are killing enemies, you are constantly adding more skeletons to your army, meaning even your weakest troop can end up packing a serious punch when there are thousands of them. The wraiths also have a regeneration ability, where the wraith on top of the stack will heal itself, and they'll also drain two points of mana from the opposing hero every turn. The vampire lords can't be counterattacked, and they will actually resurrect themselves through their attacks, which combined with necromancy is really cool, because in theory, you can attack a group of units that would be fleeing otherwise, have your vampires heal themselves, and get skeletons and experience out of it with no losses. The liches do a death cloud attack, attacking living creatures adjacent to the one that you attacked. And I don't mean living as in it would attack a dead pile of troops, but as in it won't affect undead creatures of the necropolis faction. Meaning if you have your own units right next to the guy you want to shoot, have at it, they'll be fine, but it will still hit other adjacent living units next to that guy. While we're here, it's also a good time to mention that the undead actually have some pretty interesting perks. They are always at neutral morale. They won't go up, but they can't go down either. They're also immune to some spells like bless, curse, blind, and hypnotize. However, living creatures fear the walking dead. That's not an advertisement for the TV show, by the way, but if you want to pay me money, AMC, I'm down. And so if you have any living units in your group with undead, they will instantly lose morale, making it a lot harder to change your army outside of the standard Undead 7, which sounds like a cool rock band. The Dread Knight has a 20% chance to curse a stack of units, and on top of that, 20% chance to do double damage regardless of morale. Lastly, the Bone and Ghost Dragons will minus one morale to all of your opponent's troops just by being on the field, and they have a 20% chance to age enemies, which effectively just halves the hit points of the entire stack. Necropolis also has some of the coolest buildings in the game in my opinion. They've got the Skeleton Transformer, where you can take any unit and turn them into skeletons, basically keeping your faction nice and pure. They've also got the Cover of Darkness, which shrouds your entire town and surrounding area in a black fog that will regenerate every day. This may seem somewhat minor and trivial, but if your opponent has to come in closer to see what troops you have, realizes they're outmatched and can't get away in time, you can pop out and strike. It's all about forcing them to waste those extra movements. Overall, it's not the best, I'm aware, but I do find them tons of fun, and considering how afraid I was of skeletons and zombies as a young kid, I think this game and this faction probably helped me get over that and see the cooler side. In our penultimate faction, we have the Tower, the Wizard Tower to be precise. Gremlins, Gargoyles, Golems, Mages, Genies, Naga, and the Titans. Upgrading Gremlins are the only level 1 unit in the game that has a ranged attack, and although it's not the fastest, it's still very handy. In the AI, I tend to target them just because you'll quickly have a large number of these guys and they are pests. The Golems are pretty slow, but very tanky. The mages have no melee penalty and will also lower your hero's spell cost by 2 mana. Genies hate the Ifrits but can also cast random spells on your troops, all very beneficial buffs. And if you want, you can split them up and have multiple to get as many buffs as you can. The Naga Queens are just really solid damage units who can't be counterattacked, And the giant is where this faction gets really interesting. Initially, it can only attack with its sword, but when upgraded to a titan, it will actually become a ranged unit, becoming the only level 7 unit to do so. 
It can do an absurd amount of damage, does extra damage against black dragons, can still be used for close melee range with no penalty. The only downside is how expensive it is to get them. However, they are mostly the reason I love playing this faction so much. The tower has a lot of mage guild enhancements. The library gives your heroes extra spells. The lookout tower gives you a huge line of sight around your tower, which makes sense because it's a tower. They also have the artifact merchants. I really love playing with ranged units in this game and the Titan feels so satisfying to play with if you can get your hands on them. Meanwhile, you also have your weakest unit being ranged, so you pretty much always have ranged options on hand, and then you have your tanks to do the rest. While you can get in trouble early game because you need to upgrade everything to get the most out of its effectiveness, if you can survive that long to the end game, you will pack quite a punch in final battles. Last but certainly not least, we have the Rampart, the forest dweller, nature lovers, very 1950s high fantasy novel Tolkien-esque like faction. Centaurs, Dwarves, Elf Archers, Pegasus, Dendroids, Unicorns, and the Green and Gold Dragons. The Centaurs are very fast, the Dwarves are very slow but tanky and can pack a punch, the Wood Elf can shoot twice when it becomes a Grand Elf, Pegasus can fly across the map and also spells cost 2 more points for your opponent, Dendroids are very very slow but can root enemies to the ground making it so they can't move, Unicorns can blind enemies, and lastly the green and gold dragons which can attack up to two spaces. The units may not seem the most special, but I think this is my favorite just from a pure sentimental perspective, and that's okay. I have always played the ranged character in any RPG I play, and I fully believe this stems from playing the Grand Elves as a kid. I used to have one of those plastic bow and arrow sets with the rubber suction cups as a kid and I would spend countless hours just shooting at the wall trying to make it stick and of course it never did because those things sucked. And when I played this game, the elf archers were the most traditional bow and arrow shooters and so I think that just stuck with me, they became my favorite unit. Again, I know there are other factions I'm leaving out of other versions and DLC and a bunch of other stuff, but this is what comes in the base game and what's going to be mostly relevant moving forward. Heroes of Might and Magic 3 just feels like the very peak of what turn-based strategy games should be. And I don't want to sound like that guy that says, well they haven't made a good one in so long, this one's 20 years old and it's still the top. I truly just believe this is one of the top, the best of the best. It's a great blend of combat and map exploration, always being on your toes with enemies around. Having to manage your many resources while also building up your heroes. Keeping your armies full and refreshed while keeping morale high choosing whether to go on the offense or defense, all while potentially seven different opponents are deciding the same thing. Heck, just the name Heroes of Might and Magic 3 sounds awesome to play. It sounds like a made-up video game that nerds play in a Disney show. When I was a kid, we had some family friends who we would only see once a year, and when we'd travel to see them, the two kids of the house, who were quite a bit older than me, any game I saw them playing, I wanted to play. The first game was Oblivion, and the second was Heroes of Might and Magic 3. We used to play multiplayer games on the computer, where people would sit down, take their turns, and then leave the room. It took forever, and the games never got far, we'd almost always have to leave before the war started happening. I was often the first one eliminated, or I needed someone else's help, or I'd intentionally get eliminated and just watch everyone else play. But as I got older and still didn't really understand how to play properly, I would just fast forward a bunch of days, use cheats to get unlimited movement and an army of archangels, and then just take every single kingdom in one day. You may think that's boring, but for me it was never about the challenge of it, I just loved getting lost in these worlds where all these different fantasy kingdoms that reminded me of different properties collided into these big epic battles. It's like when you take two different brands of action figures and you make them fight. It was the ultimate crossover. It felt so wrong and yet it was so right. There is also a campaign in Heroes of Might and Magic 3, much like Age of Empires. There is a story attached. It's mostly the same thing. Here's what you start off with. Go have a blast. There's enough interesting campaigns in the regular game that I don't feel the need to do that. And they also cap off your hero's level, which is kind of annoying. But if you really need something more than just playing through random games, then there's that for you. Now that I'm even older, I can appreciate just how hard this game is because of all there is to manage, and I adore this game for its difficulty. It's just the time commitment I don't have to play as much as I would like. 
These games take a long time to complete, sometimes days even if you're a super expert or even familiar with every map setting. And the worst is when you take breaks from playing and come back and have no idea where you left off. But it is a game that I will always come back to. Year after year, it will always have a very special place in my heart, and clearly it does for many others as well. There is a Kickstarter for a Heroes of Might and Magic 3 board game happening as I'm writing this right now, and it has over 18,000 backers and $3.4 million in pledges. And I'm one of them. Stay tuned for when franchises go tabletop when I get this thing in two years. I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not, but also that would be such an expensive video. Give me some time. I might need some help on that one, but I would love to do that video. <laughs> still, it just goes to show you how popular this game was and still is. It's not a Heroes of Might and Magic board game. It's not Heroes of Might and Magic 7 the board game. It is Heroes of Might and Magic 3 the board game. As you can probably guess, there are people like me who play very casual and very poorly, and some who can amazingly manipulate every aspect of this game to pull off some really incredible things to watch. I highly recommend Norovo, who posted a great series of him doing a 1 vs 7 hard AI series, as well as a series where all he does is combat with skeletons. It's very chill, but it's very fun to watch, especially if you're a nerd like me and you're super into the game, and hopefully I will remember to link the playlist in the description somewhere. Now truth be told, there's actually a Heroes of Might and Magic game on the DS that was going to be a part of this video, but while doing research, I found that there are not one but two Game Boy Color games also based off of the Heroes of Might and Magic series. Now I grew up in the era of Game Boy Color, with the Game Boy Advance coming out when I was only 5, but I didn't actually get one until I was 7 or 8. So when I wanted to play handheld games, my go-to was the Game Boy Color, and it was mostly Pokemon Red. I just want to say this because I think it can easily sound like I'm picking on a game from 2000 and say, oh it's bad, it's not what I want. The truth is, is that when I searched for what people thought of this game, a lot of people had very fond and positive memories of it, and I'm looking forward to playing it for the first time, but I don't know if I'll be overly full of praise considering just how good the PC version is and how accessible it is to play now. I suspect the reason the game will probably do better than I think it will is because more so the fact that the game is turn-based. Doing something like a shooter or RTS is a lot more difficult because you need all those functions at your disposal at all times. However, with a turn-based game, you can add as many menus as you want, and ultimately all you need to be able to really play a turn-based game is to press A or B. So let's see how they managed to condense such a large-scale game with multiple mechanics into a Game Boy Color. Despite the original game coming out in 1995, Heroes of Might and Magic 3 coming out in 1999, and the first Game Boy Color game coming out in 2000, the first Game Boy game is actually based off of the 1995 game in terms of factions and general gameplay. However, it's mostly similar enough that I don't really need to break the whole thing down for you again, but I'll just tell you when it's the same and when it's not. And as you can see, the original is pretty crude, and you'd probably be not surprised to find out that the Game Boy Color game is even more cruder. Cr more cruder. That's not good English. If you're watching this, Dave, I'm, I'm sorry. I've let you down. The campaign works the same as the original game, although rather than picking your faction, your faction is assigned to you depending on which of the missions you play. Something I didn't really mention about 3 is that when you're not doing a campaign story mode, you still have to select a scenario to play through, which is basically the map. It may seem annoying if you just want to play through a game and not have to worry about collecting all the mines or getting all the treasure and whatnot, but rest assured there are many scenarios that are just kill everyone and win. Here it is very much the same thing. Every scenario is given a map size and difficulty setting and just the name alone gives you a good enough idea as to what the actual map itself will be like. There are four different factions, each are basically a simplified version of ones that we see later on in the third game. Plains, which is basically stronghold with goblins and orcs. Farm, which is the castle with swordsmen and cavalry. 
Mountain, which is Dungeon with Centaurs and Minotaurs, and Forest, which is Rampart with Elves and Unicorns and Dwarves. The character models, while probably best described as hard to identify, admittedly look pretty good for the Game Boy Color. While I definitely still need the description at the bottom to tell me what things are, considering how small things have to be to all fit on the screen, I was honestly expecting so much worse. It truly looks and feels like a pocket version of Heroes of Might and Magic, a game that you would see a bearded man playing on a crowded bus while listening to Weezer on his Walkman because he needed to scratch the itch until he could get home and continue the game that he'd been playing for seven weeks with his three friends from high school. That's a little oddly specific, I know, but don't deny it, you created that exact mental image in your head with no issues, and hey, there's no shame in being that guy either. I'm one of those guys, at least I was, minus the friends and the leaving the house part. The outside map is now a perfect grid, and of course there's no mini-map or anything, so navigating can be a little bit tricky. If you press select, you'll get a little menu at the bottom of the screen, and you'll be able to visit each of your castles and heroes on the map, making it pretty easy to find everyone. And this is actually the only way to switch which hero you're controlling. I actually played my entire first game thinking you could only have one hero, which I thought, you know, fair enough, I guess they had to downsize a lot, and multiple heroes would have been complicated to keep track of with such a small game, but no, if you click on the tavern where you'd expect to be able to get more heroes, it's just a video of a guy pouring beer. But if you select the castle, you'll be able to recruit more heroes. One thing about the first heroes game is that there are no upgraded troops, most buildings don't have second tiers, and you may very well find out that there's only 6 or 7 upgrades the entire game. And I think this works perfectly as well for the mobile format because I think any more and you risk just having a game last way too long, way too much to manage. Depending on your level of play, a typical Heroes of Might and Magic game could actually take up to days to finish, which I don't think is necessarily ideal for a Game Boy Color format. The game also feels very slow. I can't really in good faith criticize the game for that because the actual first game feels very slow as well, especially compared to Heroes of Might and Magic 3. It was in its infancy, and while it's still a bit weird that they based the first mobile game off the five-year-old game and not its second sequel which was much more popular, I also get it. It's turn-based so combat's gonna feel a little clunky regardless, but again, compared to the first game, it feels very appropriate. Despite the visuals looking so significantly different, it's the same game. There are things missing for sure, auto combat, status effects, just the general aesthetic would probably be very hard to see on a small dimly lit screen. But the things you want and expect that make it a Heroes of Might and Magic game are all still there. Morale, luck, counterattacks, creating an army, collecting resources, owning multiple castles, uncovering the map. The biggest things you'll find is that combat can be really hard to navigate, mostly because units can't walk through each other, which is consistent throughout the series, but also with a solid grid and way less spaces, it makes it very difficult to engage all of your units in combat, because they'll constantly get stuck behind others or the obstacles on the map, and you'll end up skipping a lot of their turns and just relying on your ranged unit to do all of the damage because you just can't move everyone in position. Every time I tried to find something that didn't work in the game for this part of the video, or a feature that they had to cut entirely maybe, it turned out there was a button combination I just hadn't tried yet, mostly pressing B. I initially thought, like I said before, that you couldn't buy extra heroes, but it turns out I just wasn't looking in the right place. I thought you couldn't analyze anything on the main map like you could in the original games, because you can't right click, but and it turns out if you press B, you can actually look at everything like you could before and see how many troops are where and what kind of building does what. I also thought that you couldn't split up troops when you were preparing your army, but again, the magical B button was right there waiting for me. When going through these games, the game was the first one I had seen where reviews and critics gave it under 50%. Really, it's actually the first game in this entire video that received a mostly negative review. And I really can't understand why, I can only assume people who didn't like this game must not have liked the original. Even with this being based off of the first game and not the third, if I didn't tell you that, or told you this was simply a dumbed down simplified version of Heroes of Might and Magic 3 that they put on the Game Boy, honestly I think that would still be extremely impressive, 
they've made almost no compromises and recreated the game exactly how it should have been done. To take such a complicated game and port it so well on such an underpowered machine, this really feels like the gold standard. I will be as bold as to say if they had a game exactly like this but on my phone, I would probably download it and play it. I'm sure someone's going to comment that there are Game Boy emulators on my phone. I'm, I'm not going to do it because I never leave the house. It's The game is always on my computer. I can just play it that way. To me, it kind of feels like playing Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. It may not feel perfect, but sometimes you just have to admit when you're as close as you can get to the real thing. It's probably no secret that in some videos I've made, I will play a game and say it's just okay or not really my thing when I really didn't like it. I did that a couple times in this video already because I try to see the merit in every game I play and oftentimes I understand that someone else's nostalgia or perspective could make the game more enjoyable for them. The last thing I want to do is have someone come over to my channel and feel bad because I didn't like a game that they love. That being said, I'm obviously not afraid to criticize games either, it's just important that you do it with respect to the original game. There are plenty of games in this video which I will never play again and I'm pretty positive I will never play Heroes of Might and Magic on the Game Boy again, but I will say I'm extremely impressed and this is nowhere near the bottom of the list of games I played in this video. They weren't even done here however as a year later they decided to build and expand upon the game and they created Heroes of Might and Magic 2. Which you know, titling they could have put GBA somewhere in there but this one is more so based off the second and third game. A lot of graphics and base game are exactly the same, you may not even have noticed that it's a different game at first, and a lot of the changes the game makes are simply just changes that happened with the actual second and third game of the series. The biggest graphical change you'll see are probably inside the towns themselves, and the factions are now all based off of the ones in the third game, the game that we covered initially. You still can't choose your hero or town when starting a scenario, however hero skills do return although in a diminished capacity, you can't have nearly as many. It also seems that status effects did not make it into this version of the game either. What's interesting about this game is that while the game uses heroes 3 factions, it maintains the combat of the first game, meaning while you have 7 faction troops, you can only bring 5 with you. It might seem obvious just to bring the best 5 with you, but they do get expensive and if you're trying to stock up multiple heroes then you're going to have to figure out how to best split everything up. Overall the town screen is a bit more to navigate and that can take a little bit of getting used to because of the first Game Boy game was just a menu, but I'm pretty sure you can see yourself that it's really not that different. There are still no upgraded troops, but you can upgrade more buildings. There are more buildings that just give you money or resources, little extra things, but nothing crazy unique like in the base game. I've always liked to kind of call these games the Mega Man sequels because you don't really need to create new formulas and mechanics and engines when you can just clean up the old ones a little bit, add some new maps, add some new characters, and overall, I really enjoy this port just as much as the first, if not more so, just for those few fixes and changes. The game adds campaigns, which the first game did not. While you get to choose which hero you play as, you don't get to choose your faction, but if you reset the game a bunch of times, eventually you'll manage to get the right faction for your hero, which is obviously helpful for faction morale. It's some sort of Dragon Slayer storyline, I honestly didn't look at it through much, I was just playing normal games. Again, as slow and monotonous as it may seem compared to some of the other games we've seen on this list, they kept every core mechanic they reasonably could and made it work. I will say that this compared to Heroes of Might and Magic 3 is not quite the same level as the first Game Boy game and the first Heroes of Might and Magic game but I expected it to be a bit of a struggle, and while it's obviously not as good as its PC counterpart, and I don't think I would have enjoyed this as a kid just because I had no patience to learn things, it didn't take as long as I thought for me to enjoy what was truly a faithful recreation. As I said at the beginning of this section, turn-based games really had a huge advantage when it came to handheld conversion. There are two buttons on the Game Boy, four if you include start and select, and that was all they needed to recreate the game to near perfection. 
I honestly don't know why more people don't talk about these ports. Every comment I saw on videos about them were people just as shocked as I was about how faithful the games remain to their source material. Now you might wonder why I decided to end with Heroes of Might and Magic of all games on this list. After all, the point of this video was to showcase how franchises changed for the handheld market, and I just finished pointing out how Might and Magic probably has the most truest and faithful to the source material as possible, hence why that section was maybe a little bit shorter than you would expect. And while I think they're incredible ports and should be talked about more, these ports are not why Might and Magic is in this video. In fact, they're kind of an afterthought. In 2003, Ubisoft bought the rights to the franchise for $1.3 million, and with the rights, they made a lot of immediate changes. First off, the main series of games went dormant for 11 years until 2014. They also restarted the entire story and continuity, starting with Heroes of Might and Magic 5. Looking back now, it's a bit apparent that their interest was not in the mainstay of games, but in the Hero series, which most people probably know the series from nowadays. Since then, they have slightly changed the name of the series and released Might and Magic Hero 6 in 2011 and Might and Magic Hero 7 in 2015, to which the current day, the series has now become completely silent. But they did make some games that weren't of hero style, but contributed to the hero storyline, or I guess the Might and Magic storyline. The most well-known of these is probably Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, another game that I'd really like to cover someday in some capacity. However, there is a lesser known game in this series, in this continuity, which actually acted as a prequel to Heroes 5 in terms of story. And it was the only handheld game in the franchise that was not a remake something that changed the game completely, but to this day still has a cult following and is quite frankly, one of my favorite games of all time. This is Might and Magic Clash of Heroes on the DS. I remember finding this game on the shelf of some random store and recognizing it right away because it had the Heroes branding, but with gameplay that looked totally unfamiliar to me. I took a chance on it and I instantly fell in love with the game, but as I stopped playing my DS, I stopped playing the game. Years later, a friend was over and coincidentally downloaded the HD remake of the game for free as some sort of Xbox Marketplace thing. And I was so excited because shortly after, I found the game on Steam. I had no idea they had remade the game, that people out there loved it just as much as I did and that there was a modern way to play the game. Within a month and a half of finding that game, I got six of my friends immediately addicted to it and we held a massive all night tournament. Now I'm going to cheat just a little bit. I'm actually going to show you footage from the HD remake on Steam and I'll address the balance changes they made when they ported it over kind of as we go. But really it's just way more pleasing to play a full screen game and it's probably much nicer for you to look at. Of all the games we've covered so far, I'd say this one probably is one of the ones that use the second screen the most. Meaning, if I want to show it to you, it has to look like this, a YouTube Shorts video with, you know, a lot of background for me to fill up. Whereas, I can just play it like this, and it's the exact same game. So, this is purely just for aesthetics purposes. So clearly this game is unlike any of the other Might and Magic games I've shown you so far, and just as well, it's also unlike any other game I've ever played. It's a formula that looks instantly recognizable. You can probably guess some of the mechanics involve matching up pieces without ever having played the game. But even when I've searched for something like it, I have not found anything that plays similarly. The screen is cut in half with one player on top and the other player on the bottom. The player on the bottom will always go first starting with two moves and every other turn after that will have three. Each player has an 8x6 grid to which they need to use to both launch attacks and defend their health. The first player to eliminate all of their opponent's health wins. So how do you do that? There are three types of units in the game. 
core units, elite units, and champion units. Every faction has three core units, two elites, two champions, and one secret unit that will be either an elite or champion that must be unlocked through the single player campaign. To charge a core unit attack, you need to line up three matching units of the same color in a column. Elite champions are two spaces tall and require two core units of matching color behind them. Champion units take up a two by two space and require four core units behind them, all of matching color to charge them. Once a unit is charged, a number will appear to tell you how many turns it will take for them to attack. Core units can take anywhere from one to three turns, elite units anywhere from two to four, and champion units anywhere from four to six. There are also fusions and links. Links are when two formations of the same color, regardless of the type of unit, have the same charge time left. While this won't affect the charging power, once the unit actually launches, they will both get a pretty decent increase to their damage. The more you can link, the more bonus damage they get. But this is pretty tricky because you do have a variety of colors, so you're not only going to get all of one color. Another thing you can do is fusions, which is probably a little bit trickier. If you have an already charged formation, setting up an identical formation behind it will cause the two to fuse, doubling their power, and also still keeping the charge time of the original. You may think it's better to send two attacks in two different spots, and while sometimes it is, this will also give you more board space to work with. Elites and Champions can be fused as well, but they are a little bit trickier because you need all of the space behind them clear in order to do that, and have no walls in front of them, and sometimes you want those walls to protect those champions while they're charging. Once it is a player's turn, the counters will all go down a number, and any charge hitting zero will be sent off, charging towards the enemy, losing bits of power to walls and idle units along the way, finally hitting your opponent and dealing damage to their health. Unless of course it's a straight shot, then you'll just do direct damage equal to the total attacking power. Now I've mentioned walls and haven't discussed on how to build them, so let me explain. While lining up three core units in a column will charge an attack, lining up three or more in a row will form a wall. Walls have a max strength unique to their faction with different abilities which we'll touch on shortly when we dissect it all. Walls will immediately move to the front of the grid, and most occasions smaller walls will combine into one. Although I find sometimes it doesn't do that and you just have two weak ones next to each other, I don't know why sometimes it doesn't fuse. I think sometimes walls have abilities where they heal or can get stronger, in which case they stay in layers. But I don't exactly know why, and there's not a ton of resources on this game that explain. Including charged units, you will have 35 of the 48 grid spots occupied to start a battle. Your starting board is completely RNG. You don't start with a mirror of your opponent or anything like that. So while a good starting board can give you a massive advantage in the game, I've rarely found anything that will end the game on a first few turns, but if you want to rage and say it was RNG that made you lose, that's a pretty valid complaint. During your turn, you can use one move to call in reinforcements. Again, the way reinforcements come in is completely RNG, and while sometimes can greatly benefit you, sometimes they can kind of screw you over. While units will not come in and automatically create formations, they can come extremely close and give you exactly what you need to get a unit built up quickly. In other instances, for example, you can have a champion unit and you can use reinforcements to try and fill the spot, However, sometimes you may end up accidentally burying them instead. The other main mechanic of this game, and arguably one of the most unique and fun features that makes this game interesting, is deleting a unit. Deleting a unit in itself isn't inherently the most fun thing, and obviously it makes sense that this game has it as an option. However, if you delete a unit, and the result of deleting that unit is creating a formation, it will actually give you that turn back. Meaning if you have three turns, delete a unit to create an attack, you will still have three turns. Even better is if you can create combos with multiple formations being made, which is obviously a lot harder to do but still very possible, you'll get extra turns for that as well, meaning you can have up to four or five or six turns in a battle. So it's definitely worth seeing what you have. Even if it's not the most ideal situation, you almost always want to go for the play that will get you more moves. 
Three turns really isn't a lot, especially if you call for reinforcements, so while you don't need to take every combo you see, using them will help you get the most of your turns. Another thing that this will help you do is gain mana, which will be needed to cast a spell. Each hero has a unique spell, but you need to fully charge your mana before you can use it. Mana can be gained by links, chains, fusions, deleting units to form walls or attacks, and also you gain mana anytime you deal damage and damage is taken. It's never explicitly said, but I believe you gain roughly half the damage you do in mana, and your opponent gains a little bit more than that. We'll cover the unique spells when we break down factions, and it's also important to note that using your spell does not cost a turn, so this is also very nice to factor in as well. Now building walls isn't the only way to protect yourself, so this is a good time to get into unit specifics. Units have three stats, a sword which is their attack strength when fully charged, toughness which is their idle strength, and a timer which is their charge time. Toughness is how much health an idle unit has, so if you have lots of walls set up but you're unsure if it'll fully protect you, lining up idle units behind the walls isn't necessarily a bad idea. It's also worth mentioning that units charging don't always have more health than units idling. Three units on their own might have three toughness giving you a total of nine, and together in one formation they may only have five attack power for the first turn. In total there are five factions in the game. Academy, Haven, Necropolis, Inferno, and Sylvan. The three latter are obviously based off of factions we saw in the Hero series, with Sylvan being Rampart, and the first two, Academy and Haven, are a lot like Castle and Tower, except instead of winter themed, the tower is desert themed. As I mentioned earlier, when Ubisoft bought the Heroes franchise, they reset the continuity and thus took some factions, but not all of them. Some factions in this game have multiple heroes, and there's also a DLC where you can get four more characters, but that's only for the console and Steam versions, and I'm not going to bother touching that because it's really not that interesting, unfortunately. The DLC characters are just based off of bosses you play in the game, and they also come with their own unique spells, which only really comes handy in free play or multiplayer. This is also a good time to talk about rebalancing. Technically, most of the information I'm about to read out loud is actually from the remake and not the DS original, and while I still play both versions because my DS is next to my bed and I'll play a few games before going to sleep, I'll try to point out the differences that I can, but I think it's fair to say that you're way more likely to play the HD version of the game rather than the DS version because it's way more accessible. Our first faction up is Haven, since it kind of feels like the most basic and generic faction of human warriors in your typical medieval armor. Haven has its three core units, the Swordsman, the Spearman, and the Archer. The Archer takes two turns to charge and has a total attack strength of 8, whereas the Swordsman takes three turns to fully charge but has an attack strength of 11, so you have to weigh out if an extra turn is worth that extra damage. Also important to note, there's no difference between melee or ranged combat whatsoever, all attacks happen the exact same way, there's no advantage if you use one troop over another, so that doesn't need to weigh into any decision making. You've also got the Spearman, who takes 3 turns but does 9 damage. You might wonder why on earth you'd pick the Spearman if overall it's just worse than the Swordsman but takes just as long to charge up. And that's because the Spearman has a special ability, where it strikes the enemy first. Meaning if you have, let's say, 9 attack and you hit a charging formation of 4 attack, normally you'd lose the difference and you'd advance with 5 attack power. However, with the Spearman, you will actually keep your 9 attack power. If you can manage to link or fuse Spearman, they have a ton of potential in this regard. The problem is that the game does not make a note of this anywhere. It simply says it attacks first, but doesn't tell you what the ability is. Not in the DS or the HD remake is it mentioned in the description, nor is it mentioned in campaign, and thankfully the game doesn't make a habit of doing this too often, but it does happen more than once. The two elite units are the Knight, which starts off fully charged, although this was changed in the HD version and instead he now has a shield that protects him while charging, and the Priestess who will heal your hero while charging. The two champions are the Angel, who heals your damaged formations as it charges, and the Griffin, who when it encounters a stronger enemy formation will do twice as much damage on that hit 
to ideally take it out. Meaning if you have a griffin with 40 attack power and it encounters an enemy with 60 attack power, then its final attack will actually do 80 damage, but it will not advance beyond killing that unit. The unlockable unit is the Swordmaster, which at the beginning of your turn will send a wave of damage into the two columns across from it, killing idle units and damaging walls and formations. Not a lot, mind you, but enough to pester the opponent and weaken defenses before they launch their incredibly powerful attack. Haven's walls have no special ability, but they are the most powerful in the game, with the max wall health being 14. The two heroes for Haven are Godric and Varkus. Godric's spell creates a wall worth 50% of his HP behind all of your units, basically a great shield to protect you from hits you wouldn't otherwise survive. In the DS game, this is all the ability does. However, in the HD remake, it will actually double all the remaining health left over after the waves of attack, if there is any, and send it back as an offensive strike, giving it some good usage and also making it so you don't have to hold on to it forever. Varkus is considerably more boring and just adds 30% boost to all power of charging formations. It's not bad, but it's probably the most bland and least exciting power-ups of the game. Next up are the Sylvans, the forest druid-like civilization. The three core units are the Hunters, Pixies, and Bears. The Sylvans are all pretty fast, with the Pixie and Bears both being two turn charges, and the Hunter being the only unit in the game that launches after one turn. The Pixies are also a unique unit as the 5 damage in 2 turns seems awfully weak at first, but they actually do more damage the more mana the hero has. So if you tend to hold on to it more, they are not a bad unit. The Sylvan's two elite units are the Druid, which if it hits an enemy formation that it doesn't destroy will extend their charge time by 2 more turns, which is nice but can be hard to set at the timing, and the Deer, which jumps over the first row of walls. The champions are the Treant, I hope I'm saying that correctly because some Tolkien nerd's gonna go after me if I don't, and the Emerald Dragon. The Emerald Dragon is very quick to fire off just four turns and will spray an acid onto the field that will stay there for a whole turn, basically causing damage to surviving formations or killing idle units and making it pretty annoying to navigate for the other player. The Treant is probably the most unique champion as it's the only one that doesn't leave the field if its attack reaches the enemy hero, but rather it stays and will slowly drain life, healing the player little by little each turn and damaging the enemy. It will basically act like a wall slowly doing damage until it's destroyed. This isn't exactly a good thing though, and I'll tell you why after I tell you that the unlockable unit for the Sylvans is a unicorn. The unicorn was also rebalanced from the DS game to the remaster. In the DS game, the unicorn basically creates an entire wall along the board, and any attacks weaker than 15 damage can't get past it, which is absurd. In the HD version, this is changed, so just the spaces in front and beside it which is significantly weaker and almost not really worth it. I understand the change, but it went from being one of the most overpowered units to one of the most underwhelming in one foul swoop. The biggest problem you'll find with Sylvans is not the lack of firepower because they're quick enough to make up for it, but the lack of space on the board. The Sylvans walls are very powerful and have a max HP of 12. However, the walls also regenerate health. With the health being so high and having the power to regenerate, most units will not be able to fully destroy a wall quick enough in one hit, and the walls will keep rebuilding. This is good. However, this means you'll often find yourself having to delete units to create walls, then realizing you have too many. Paired with the fact that the units all send so quickly, you'll often find you're using a turn to call for reinforcements every turn, and meaning if you do have too many walls, you don't have the turns to delete the extra ones because you're too busy calling for reinforcements. Now pair this with the fact that trees don't disappear after they've launched, and suddenly you find yourself being very tight on space and turns. The one thing that these Sylvans have going for them is their two heroes. Well, just one of their heroes. Finden is okay, their ability makes it so that all charging formations go down to one turn left. It's nice but also a little bit useless, especially if you're using archers of course because they only have one turn, 
but even just in general sylvan units are all the fastest so while it's nice it doesn't do as much as it could even if you have the pixies it's useless because you'd be using your mana to make them go sooner thus making your attack weaker but also you wouldn't want to use it if you're using pixies because the pixies are only two turn charge anyways so it, it's yeah but on when special move is just a straight attack and while maybe the most basic it's probably just the best one in the game by far in the original ds version her arrow was one single straight shot that did an ungodly amount of damage if you were playing an enemy on the hardest difficulty one single shot could do up to 75 damage on you and all you need is one straight opening to make that work and the player would only fire 50 since the damage was based off of your hero's max HP. In the remake, they changed it a little bit, so now she fires three arrows, with the middle one being the most powerful, and all three equal a total damage of 49, 25 for the middle and 12 for the sides. Even then though, while this may sound like a nerf, this is still very good damage. This can knock down your opponent's health considerably, this can destroy a lot of their walls, and this can be used to destroy champions that are currently in the process of setting up, or just damage them so that they can't really do as much when they actually do get off. Next up is Necropolis, the undead faction, similar to that of the one in the games we covered earlier. Their units are skeletons, zombies, and ebon guards. I apologize if that's not how you pronounce that. Zombies have a special ability where if you hit a charging formation, they'll poison them and do a little bit of damage, therefore making the formation not charge as much, and in some cases actually killing them if they are weak enough basic units. However, the zombies only have 8 attack, which is almost never enough to actually get an attack through a wall, so the chances of this happening are pretty slim, and I'm pretty sure it only does like 2 or 3 damage a turn anyways, so... It's nothing too intense, but hey, every bit counts. The two elite units are the Vampire and the Ghost. The Vampire will heal your health points by any damage it does to the opposing hero, and the Ghost formation cannot be destroyed. Units will still pass through and take damage, but the Ghost will stay behind and still be in a formation. This obviously works as a great defense and will allow you to quickly counter back to the offense, but you will take some extra damage because of it. The two champions are the Bone Dragon and the Death Knight. The Bone Dragon can be extremely powerful as when it encounters an idle unit, instead of taking damage from it, it will actually consume it and gain its toughness into its attack. So if your opponent is defending with idle unit toughness instead of walls or formations, then this could quite literally be a one hit KO as it will only get stronger as it approaches the enemy. The Death Knight is also very powerful, draining health from enemy formations and using it to power himself up. He only takes one per formation on every turn, which obviously isn't significant to the enemy, but considering your enemy can have up to 6 or 7 formations, the bonus to his attack can end up being pretty significant over a 6 turn span. Even without this, he still does a lot of damage anyways, so still a good choice. The unlockable unit is the Wraith, which is an instant kill champion. This means it will kill any formation it hits, even if it has less power, and if it hits the enemy hero, it's game over instantly. The biggest downside of the Wraith is that it only does 55 damage, which isn't bad, it's fair balancing obviously, but most people will be able to defend it because they have 5 turns to see it coming, that's about 5 walls and a couple of idle units and you're safe. The Necropolis walls are also very unique. When an idle unit dies, they turn into one health of a wall and will all stack up front. It's not like the Sylvans where it becomes cumbersome and takes up a lot of space. It's just a nice little layer of extra defense after you've had some idols wiped out. The two champions here are Fiona and Markal. Fiona consumes all of the idle units and sends them down a single lane for an attack which is honestly just a worse version of Onwin's arrow. It doesn't do as much, you have to sacrifice idle units. At most you'll do 25 damage because you can only have so many idle units on the field at one time, and it only sends down a single lane, but I guess you also get a tiny little bit of wall out of it as well because technically you are killing the idle units. 
Markhol is infinitely more useful as he will charge all elite and champion units on your side. So just by having them out there, you can instantly charge them up without having to set everything up, which can be a huge game changer considering half of the battle is setting up these units. Our penultimate faction is Academy, kind of a desert magical faction. They are mostly weak, but their units have a ton of abilities that make them pretty annoying to play against. The core units are the Apprentice, Gremlin, and Golem. The Apprentice and Golem are standard units with no abilities. The Gremlin has a very powerful shot, but will lose power with distance even if it's not hitting idle units. This means while it has 14 power, a fully powered shot with no defenses only does about 4 damage to the enemy hero. However, they are very efficient at destroying walls and charging formations, so they do have some use, but you can't really rely on them completely. The two elites are the Jin and the Mage. The Jin will freeze formations and units for three turns, which is incredibly useful, as when they're frozen, their power goes back to their toughness, essentially making them idle units and pretty easy to break. The Mage will send a lightning bolt through every idle unit and destroy them all. If all the idle units are connected, they will all just die. This is an incredibly useful ability, but the setup has to be just perfect to get the most out of it. They're not very good units at breaking through walls, and you could just be handing your opponent a fresh clean board to defend themselves with or launch attacks with if you're not ready to immediately follow up that turn, but it's still a pretty powerful ability for an elite unit. The two champion units are the Rakshasa and the Titan. When the rock shot, rock, rock shot, rock, rock shot, sh I can't say this dude. When the thing hits the enemy hero, it will damage both the HP and their MP. Whereas traditionally when your opponent takes a wave of massive damage, they're normally compensated with getting their spell or close to it. This attack will actually deplete their magic. When the Titan attacks, it will send shock waves through all the connected walls and weaken them. It won't destroy them like the mage and the idle units, but it's still pretty useful if you have more attacks coming right after the Titan, not to mention it still does a lot of damage on its own. The last unit is the Phoenix, which can resurrect your formations once they are killed before they attack. The walls of Academy are by far the most confusing, and the reason I generally don't play as this faction. They have an ability where the more walls you have, the stronger they are. Normally, if you have two weak walls, as I said, they'll combine into one strong wall of equal health. But in this case, if you already have two layers of walls and make a third, they will all be max health, so they won't combine. And this can make your walls stack up super quick and suddenly make the game feel very claustrophobic. Obviously, the answer is just don't build walls. But the only other alternative is to just never use your delete moves and hope that no one gets caught behind anything. The only hero from Academy is Nadia, whose spell is a random lightning strike that hits 5 times. It is completely RNG and whenever it's used against me, it's awesome and kills all my champions. And whenever I use it, maybe I'll be lucky to hit 2 idle core units on the side of the board where I have no units to attack anyways. It's just too RNG for me, it's not something that I really like using a whole lot, and that mixed with the walls just makes this the faction I use the least. But I have in fact saved my favorite for last, which is Inferno, the demon and devil-like faction based off of the same one from the original games. The core units are the Horned Demon, the Imp, and the Hellhound. The Horned Demon and Hellhound have no abilities, but the Imp will drain mana from the opponent with any damage it does. The two elite units are the Succubus and the Nightmare. The Nightmare takes four turns to charge, and when it attacks, it will launch all other charging Nightmares. This is quite cool if you have three or four, but the other ones won't go fully charged, they'll just all launch at once however they are, so it's still to your benefit to charge them sooner than later. The Succubus is probably my favorite unit in the game personally. She will attack in 4 blasts, but her attacks will also hit the surrounding columns. This can be extremely useful ability that will destroy idle champions before they're set up, or generally put a pretty sizable hole in your opponent's defenses, but it can also be quite annoying if they just hit a wall 4 times and never break through. The two champions are the Abyssal Lord and the Pit Fiend. The Abyssal Lord will gain power if a friendly formation is killed, and the Pit Fiend is the most powerful unit in the game, 
and leaves a trail of fire where units were killed. The Unlockable is an elite unit sorcerer which instantly breaks apart enemy formations and turns them idle, which is the ultimate troll move and reminds me a lot of the druid from the sylvan faction except it's one step above. The walls are actually the weakest in the game. They only have 10 HP, but they do some sort of burn damage to formations that are passing through. I've looked for clarification online and no one can seem to agree exactly what it means, so I can assume it's not very significant, but I can also assume that maybe the reason the walls are only 10 health is because they actually act like 12 health. I don't really know. This isn't what makes the wall so great for me though, it's Aiden's spell that makes this game so good to me. There are two heroes, Aiden and Jezebeth. Aiden's ability sends all walls into an attack, and not just one column, but whatever column the walls are in, meaning you can turn all of your defense into offense, and this is perfect for my type of playstyle. As you've maybe noticed through my gameplay if you're paying that close attention, I like to build walls and play a very defensive style. But as I mentioned with factions like Academy and Sylvan, you can get cramped up pretty fast and have too many. But with this ability, there's pretty much never a risk of too many because sooner or later, they will all be launched at the enemy. The other hero is Jezebeth, who also has a pretty good ability as it explodes the enemy's walls. It doesn't do any damage to their hero, but it will damage units surrounding the walls. The only problem is that spells are used after the attacks have already been made that turn, meaning yes you can destroy walls before a big attack, but your opponent will have a whole turn to make up for it. And if you're playing a human, they'll obviously be aware of this ability and they can play to compensate for it. There's one thing I haven't mentioned about the game yet, and that's the artifacts. The reason I haven't mentioned them is because they are optional, you can play without them, but they do add a great element to this game that I think can make all playstyles unique. There are some artifacts that every faction has, such as increasing fusion or link attack power by 50%, which aren't bad by any means, but there are others that offer some really unique ways to play and make some units even more viable. I'll list off a few examples and my favorite from each faction. For the Sylvans, the Ring of Life is definitely one of the better ones, which will revive your hero after death and regenerate 2 health every turn after, meaning you have to be killed twice. There's Tree and Sap, which doubles the amount of health your trees drain. Golden Roots, which means if a wall is destroyed, it immediately comes back with 1 HP. Or the Boost Boots, which give bonus damage for every road traveled across the field. This is my personal favorite. Something like this makes the archers very viable, as a shot will do a lot more if it can make it to the end unopposed, and you can just quickly fire them off like crazy. In Haven, the most powerful item is probably the Golden Spear, which enhances the Spearmen. As I mentioned before, the Spearmen have an ability where if they have more attack than the enemy formation, they will run straight through and not lose any attack. With the Golden Spear, this applies to wall units, meaning if they have more damage than any wall or unit in front of them, they will just charge straight through and do max damage to the enemy. My personal favorite, however, is the King's Crown, which makes it so that calling for reinforcements does not cost a turn. This is such a great ability and makes the game feel so much faster and allow you to do so much in a single turn. Necropolis has a ton of fun artifacts such as the Blood Ring, which gives you MP for destroying enemy units, the Cursed Shield, which weakens your opponent's walls by 50%, but my two favorite are the Ritual Dagger and the Spider Cloak. With the Ritual Dagger, anytime you delete a core unit, it will also delete a random enemy unit on the opposite side, which is just maximum troll capability. And the Spider Cloak is not something that I would use if I was playing competitively, which isn't really a thing, but it's just really fun to play every now and then. It reduces your HP down to 25, but increases the power of all of your formations by 75%. And fun fact, in the DS version, you actually went down to 10 HP for 90% power increase, but I think maybe they found this a bit too hard as pretty much one or two attacks on either side would end the game immediately. For the Academy, you've got the Golden Fist, so that the Titan's wall hitting ability will actually destroy the walls entirely. The Transform Gem, so that mages can be fused with any other mages regardless of color. The Mana Shield, where opponents have to drain your mana before they can start draining your HP. 
or my favorite, which is the Absorb Circlet, which allows you to gain magic from deleting a wall. Lastly, you've got the Inferno, which admittedly has some of the more boring ones, but my favorite by far is the Celerity Ring, which just gives you one extra move per turn. In the DS game, this actually just made it so you had five moves on your first turn and that was it. And it was changed here and honestly, having an extra turn in the game almost makes this game feel like a completely different game and in a very good way. It makes me wish they had customizable match options where you could set health and amount of turns. If this video makes you want to go out and play the DS version, just be aware that a lot of the artifacts were changed, including most of the ones I talked about, and they're just harder to find information on on the wikis and whatnot, so that's why I went with the HD remake, so I can only compare so much. There's also a few artifacts that are exclusive to online play. You don't start off with all of these artifacts, you have to gradually unlock them, and this is a good time to talk about the campaign. I started with the base game rather than the campaign because the base game on its own is very good and different and fun, and the campaign has bits and pieces of the base game, but rarely is it actually that game. Allow me to show you. The campaign actually has a pretty deep story to it, one that I've honestly never paid attention to, but I've never really paid attention to any of the story in any of the Heroes games. The campaign actually kind of feels like a very slimmed down version of the Heroes games. You play through one of five factions and go through each character's story. You only start with one core unit, and as you make your way through the game, you'll start to acquire more. Same goes for artifacts. Some you'll acquire naturally through the story, others you'll have to go out of your way to get. Once you unlock them in the campaign, you'll be able to use them in your free battles outside the campaign. You'll also collect resources, gold, stone, and gems, which you'll need to buy elite and core units later on. Something I didn't really touch on that's in the remake, but not in the DS version, I think, is that in a standard match, you have a set amount of elite and champion units. You'll have 10 elite units and 5 champion units. And if one is destroyed idly or while charging, you won't get that back meaning you can potentially have all of your better units destroyed and not be able to bring any back via reinforcements, and then you'll have to just finish off the match without them. It works similarly in campaign, but it carries over from battle to battle, meaning you'll have to find spots to buy units in order to get more. Resources generally don't tend to be too big of an issue because you find a lot naturally just through playing the game, but if you're learning and losing a lot of units, it's something that can become a problem later on. Everything has to be leveled up, and I really do mean everything. Your character starts at level 1 with low health, your units all start at level 1 and are significantly weaker, and they'll only become stronger the more you use them. This means it might actually be worth grinding for some parts, but every level I'm pretty sure has a set amount of encounters, meaning if you really needed those mages leveled up for the final fight and you weren't using them, I'm sorry, that's tough luck for you. Not only do your troops and heroes need to be leveled up, but your walls and how many units you can have on the field also do. This is the main reason I wanted to cover the base game first, because it actually feels like the complete end game, whereas in the campaign, there are very few battles that actually feel this way since you're always working your way up to that point, and generally your final battle is a boss fight, which is some sort of puzzle. Outside of battles, there are sometimes tiny little timing puzzles like avoiding the guards or pushing down logs to line up trees. It's not that fun. It's not that clever. It's my biggest criticism of the game because it's just kind of annoying and it's easy enough to ignore it when it happens, which is maybe once per character as you go through the five factions. Honestly, the parts in between the fights are more annoying than anything. Your character sometimes doesn't react to what you want them to do pathways aren't necessarily super clear, so sometimes you think you can go somewhere, but you can't. Even little things like to go off screen, you can't click to where you want to go, but you have to click close to the circle you're standing in in the direction that you want to go. That's really small and petty stuff, but I've been playing this game for years and I still forget small things like that. There are three main things you'll do in the game. The first is bounties, which are really just standard fights, but you have to go find them first and most of the time you'll get resources as a reward. The second is the puzzle fights, normally found in tavern-like settings. 
The goal of these are to basically defeat your opponent in one turn. Using your best knowledge of the leap moves, links, chains, creating enough formations in one turn, you have to destroy your opponent's entire field. These are really fun, albeit very challenging, and remind me of the Pokemon Puzzle League where you had to do similar things, you only had a certain amount of moves to make those blocks appear. Normally these are how you get your artifact. My only real complaint here is that there's no give up and try again button, you have to watch your attempt fail and then try again, which is kind of taunting, but it does give you that big brain moment that you crave so much, like when you finally beat a level in Portal that you got stuck on. Again, this is something that just begs for community-made challenges or something like that. I think that would be so much fun. The last type of fight you'll find are what I call the gimmick fights. I could say boss fights, but you'll encounter quite a few fights like this that aren't actually boss fights. I don't want to spoil too much because there's a possibility you might want to play this game after seeing it and I think part of these fights is analyzing what's going on and understanding ways around it and in general really help your board IQ and help you understand how units work better and whatnot. Sometimes your target will be moving, sometimes you'll have to hit two spots at the exact same time, sometimes you have to avoid hitting a certain thing. The last thing I'll talk about is the quick battles, which has been what most of this section has been about. I know I've mostly been talking about the remake, but there are a few things worth mentioning, the difference between the two. The enemy AI in quick battles is much better on the DS. You can actually choose a level of difficulty, and level 5 makes their abilities do more damage and gives them 150 health. The AI can be tricky in the campaign, but in quick play it's not that good. Sometimes it makes really dumb decisions, and I can't really blame them because they basically made a new chess and then had to teach the AI how to be good at it, and there are some things it just naturally won't be able to detect. However, I really miss the difficulty sliders and giving the enemy more health to make it more of a fair fight. The game has many unique playstyles, so much strategy to consider with every turn. The RNG aspect isn't ideal, and it is unfortunately pretty unavoidable. I've personally never felt like RNG has won or lost me a game, but I understand if you're being competitive, it can be an annoying thing you feel like you have to overcome. I find it hard to express how much I love this game. It's truly one of my favorite games of all time, not just in this video, but of every game I've ever played throughout my life. And I've always wanted to make a video on it, so here you go. I just shoved it at the end of this one where no one's going to see it. Unfortunately, the online community is mostly dead. I know there's a Discord somewhere with active players that I used to be in, and there's a whole thing with the game We're no longer receiving support, and it works for some people now and doesn't work for others. I don't really play online anyways. I just like pulling up the game when I have a few minutes free, or maybe I'm rendering, or I just need to take a break from whatever I'm doing for a quick minute, and then maybe I'll play a game or two on my DS at night. Okay, just a quick update here. Uh, in the time that it took me to make this video, which of course was about a year, um, six months ago in July of 2023, they re-released the game as Might and Magic Clash of Heroes Definitive Edition. So unfortunately, the version I'm playing isn't actually available anymore. It seems like for whatever reason, it's been removed and they've replaced it with this version, which apparently has very few changes. It's like a few balanced things and then the artwork just doesn't look as good. I don't know why they decided to do this. Um, it seems to be a different publisher as well. Like there's T Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games, Pharaoh games, Streets of Rage, um, a Metal Slug, um, the original Heroes of Might and Magic HD edition, so I guess this publisher just c picks up the games and redistributes them and puts definitive editions, I don't know. So, I don't know if this has revived the online community or not. Most of the reviews basically say don't buy this if you have the original, but if you don't have the original, then this is, I think, your only way to play the game. I have not personally played it, so I cannot vouch for it. I don't know if it's better or worse than this, but if you happen to like this game and you buy the Definitive Edition, uh, let me know. And if it's revived the online community, which I highly doubt it will, then I will hop on and play with some people. But yeah, just putting that out there. You will see this game everywhere on lists of underrated DS games, unique DS games, 
it's truly a sleeper game that most people who have played it speak very highly and fondly of. And I do wonder how much of this game was conceived before the Might and Magic branding got involved or if it was always meant to fit this way. The story, the little I know, does fit in nicely with the new lore of the series. It has that sense of familiarity, but completely unique gameplay that isn't found anywhere else. While some people may have been annoyed that they didn't get a Might and Magic experience like this out of the game, I for one am extremely grateful because I never would have played a game like this otherwise. Ironically, a Might and Magic game on the DS in the traditional sense probably would have worked out even better than the ones on the Game Boy did. The only real issue I have with the game, deep down annoyance, something that maybe you've already noticed and if you have noticed then I'm sorry you're just like me and if you haven't noticed then it's not going to bother you at all. There is no colorblind mode in this game. What's worse is that the remake used different colors for some units than in the DS version, and it somehow made it worse and harder to tell. I will stare at my screen and wonder if I'm setting up the right champion, and sometimes it'll just turn out that I'm not. I literally had a rule when I played with friends that if I asked what color something was, they had to tell me and they had to be honest, but the AI is very rude and doesn't help me at all. I know they wanted different faction colors for aesthetic purposes, I get it and I think it's cool, but also just a simple option where I can press start and maybe have yellow, blue, and red options so I could see everything would have been lovely. Don't worry my fellow colorblind clan, we will have our day. The game is usually less than $10 on Steam and I'm pretty sure there's a mobile version out there as well but I've never played it so I can't attest for that. Campaign is maybe 10 to 15 hours, and if you're like me, you can do matches against the AI endlessly, and I've got close to 100 hours of mostly doing that. You can play online, and there's even a 2v2 mode that I didn't touch on because imagine having three friends to play with, but it's super cool, and it makes me sad that I'll never get to do it. If what you have seen interests you, I really can't recommend it enough. And if you know of any game that plays like this, please let me know in the comments because I've never been able to find anything like this puzzle style combat and I would love to dig into this more. As I mentioned earlier, I was going to make a whole video on just this game on its own, but I think it fits perfectly in here. It's a franchise that went handheld and instead of repeating a formula, they changed it up and went a completely different direction, and they created something magical. It's not a perfect 5 stars by any means, but those who play the game love the game. This has to be the most unique franchise to handheld adaption that I've seen, and it's worthy of being the final one on this list. It feels like we essentially covered a long gone era. Handheld gaming limitations are very few now, and franchises don't really have to make compromises to get their brand on a 3DS or Switch or whatever PlayStation has going on, if anything. Heck, with the Steam Deck, you can literally play the same games on the go, and that technology is only going to get stronger. I'm sure there's a whole other video in here somewhere about franchises going to mobile phone markets and maybe that's one I'll make in the future, but a lot of those really feel like copycats of other formulas just trying to cash in on whatever growing market there is, and it's a lot harder to find some positivity in that. I want to try to focus on the good in gaming, and as much as I criticized a lot of the games and decisions in this video, I loved seeing all the crazy and wacky things that companies did. You never knew what you were going to get. Expectations were simultaneously so low and yet so high at the idea of playing your favorite games on the go. Some went in not expecting a lot, others went in expecting the world, and it created this surreal market where literally every purchase was a complete gamble. Were you going to get the same game you fell in love with? something completely different and despise it and you just have to pretend it doesn't exist? Or even better, something completely different but you found something you loved in it. I've made no attempt to hide my love for Clash of Heroes but 
It is funny to think that a spin-off DS game that could not be more different from its source material was so popular they made it its own PC game. They wouldn't have done that if people didn't love it, and I probably wouldn't have found the game without the title. But that's also the best case scenario. For many others, people bought the game because they loved the title and maybe felt genuinely disrespected at what they spent their money on. This was a time before you could just YouTube a game to see what it looked like. Sometimes you just didn't know. And it doesn't necessarily ruin the old games for you, but maybe it makes you worry a bit about the future of the franchise if you're going to see more cash grab games. People can sense the love and care that went into these projects, and it's not hard to tell the difference between a quick cash grab and a game where the developers cared about what they were delivering to the players. There are loads of these games. There are many where the gameplay is just slightly different, enough to maybe be worth mentioning. Games that manage to copy the formula exactly. Maybe there's a game you saw flash on screen that I didn't really talk about, and you feel it's worth mentioning. Please feel free to leave in the comments. I undoubtedly missed something interesting, I'm sure. But I went with the games that I felt represented my topic the best. A full spectrum of not changed a lot to completely changed. And I chose franchises that for the most part I was familiar with because I just think that makes a better video. Maybe, maybe I've been too harsh in this video. I guarantee you some people will feel I went way too hard on some games, and others will feel I went way too soft on others. A lot of it is just nostalgia for me. And I noticed that word a lot when going through comments on gameplay videos. Did people really love these games? Or did they love the time of their lives that they were in when they played them? Do I really love these games? Or is this entire video me displaying the nostalgia I'm speaking of right now? I'd like to think that we're getting a little bit more self-aware the further we go along this gaming thing, and it was kind of nice and refreshing to see comments just straight up admit, hey, this game sucks, but I still love it. I think that some of the harshness towards these games comes from a place of knowing how good these games can really be. There are plenty of incredible games on all of these consoles, and while it's easy to look at the behemoth franchises and say, why didn't they just do that even though those games had an absurd budget, there's also tons of games that had no star power, no name to bank off of, and they started off on the handheld platform and did incredible things. Obviously they weren't held back or restricted by an old formula, but I guess it's hard not to wonder what a world would look like if some games weren't so afraid to change things up and make something brand new for their franchise. It's maybe harder to relate to a younger audience who have grown up with phone games or a DS or heck there are tons of kids growing up with Switches right now. If you're young and only started playing games a few years ago, you could be one of them. But back then it was such a thrill to be able to play video games on the go for the first time. No more long boring waits at the restaurant while you're waiting for your food. Those long car rides suddenly become a lot more bearable. Sunday at grandma's house when the adults were having adult conversations could be spent grinding a few levels out. The biggest worry wasn't school or paying bills or finding a place to live, it was how are we going to keep gaming when mom makes us leave the house. Any game was the perfect game as long as we were playing. And just thinking about that makes me appreciate the worst of the games that we just talked about. It's a nostalgic era that a lot of us were lucky to find ourselves in, and it's one that really won't ever be again. If I spoke negatively about a game you love, regardless of whether or not you love it purely for nostalgia or if you actually enjoy it, don't let me take that enjoyment and those memories away from you. These games are special to so many of us, even if a lot of them we'd never dare play again. Even if it's the worst game you've ever played, nostalgia will win overall. It's only human. I'm a firm believer in not critiquing every game I play because it honestly just takes a lot of the fun out. Some games are bad, and we like them anyways, and that's okay. A lot of these games were built for the era. We all knew that handheld gaming was going to continue evolving once it started to take off, 
and so companies made games for then, not now. I doubt many of these games were ever intended to have a longer replayability factor than a few years because the technology was changing so fast. Once the next handheld system came out, they remade the classic games again but just a little closer to the original, or they opted to sit out and wait for the mobile phone market, or the Switch, or the Steam Deck, or VR, or whatever comes next. Some have still and never will touch the handheld market, whether it just be for the lack of willing to compromise, or a stigma that surrounds this subset of game, one that I think has slowly faded but in many regards is still there. And for some, they just need that separation. They feel there is only one right way to enjoy the game and that's from the comfort of your own home. I have so much respect for the developers who worked in such an ever-changing market where you could spend maybe years of your lives on one single game. And as soon as the game was out, the technology was outdated and you had to start all over again. Or the creators that were given a massive franchise name to add to but none of the creative freedom needed to properly make it stand out. I'm sure to work on these names were dreams come true, and some of the final products were more like nightmares. We're now entering this era where games are starting to blend in with each other. Even the games that are truly unique and stand out from the crowd have games that look very similar or exactly like it. And on the other hand, you have games in their 10th, or 15th or 20th installments and sometimes it just feels a bit uninspired. I can't remember the last time I heard about a game standing out in a franchise anymore as opposed to them all just being a piece of a bigger picture. And in some cases that makes sense, they should be just a piece of a bigger picture. But the handheld market always felt to me like that one chance to tell a different story, to do something completely weird and different. And I'm glad to see so many companies embraced that, for better or for worse. In a modern gaming world where everything is slowly starting to feel the same, can something that forced creativity really be that bad? But maybe that chance to be different is gone for good. The equivalents are maybe making a game for VR or a mobile phone app with way too many microtransactions. Sometimes it's a piece of art's limits that made it interesting and compelling. And while I like the idea of living in a creative world with no limits, it's kind of the end of an era in many regards. I don't play handheld games anymore, and truthfully, I haven't really since I was a kid. I never bought a 3DS or a DSi or a Switch. I don't have any DS games that are older than 2011. The one game I do play, I play a Steam remake, so I don't even know if that counts. But I will always respect this era of games because of the creativity it forced. It forced developers to think outside the box. It forced them to make compromises or change the game plan altogether. To make even the smallest game feel just as important. And when a game sold out and didn't care, it hurt. And you could feel it. But when a game did something so unique and it hit so perfectly, there was no better feeling. Every game was a journey, a discovery, a chance to be severely disappointed, but the risks were worth it to find those hidden gems. And so many of these games are slowly becoming unplayable without emulation keeping them alive as physical copies get more and more obscure and forgotten. Hardware changes keep on happening, and more and more new modern titles keep coming out. My generation started playing games at home, and the addictions formed when suddenly we could take it out on the road. We started getting trouble for playing games in class. In this current generation, kids have always grown up being able to do this, being able to play whenever and wherever. Gone are the days of needing link cables to connect with a friend, of having to carry around a large case with all of your games. It's all on your phone. There's no need to pay for some of them. A lot of them are riddled with ads. It's a whole different topic, and I'm not bashing any modern kids who just live conveniently or follow what everyone else is doing, but it's what handheld gaming has largely become. Regardless, this is an era that I'm glad I got to experience. As we move closer and closer to what seems like the end point of what's possible in games where technology can only go so much further, how lucky am I? 
and so many others that we got to live through. Such a period of experimentation and creativity. To the handheld market that no longer is and never will be again, thank you. For the long nights with the Game Boy under the sheets, for the nights in hospitals and hotels when we just couldn't sleep, the times we got in trouble at school for not keeping them in our lockers, for making the long road trips just a little more exciting, and to these games specifically for allowing us to play our favorites on the road and share them with friends. Portable handheld gaming will never go away, but it'll never be what it once was. And if you made it to the end of this video and you take away anything from it, whether you're from my generation or the one after, I hope you have just a little bit more appreciation for what a unique time we got to experience. Thanks for watching.